I pulled my truck into the clearing, gravel crunching under the tires like the sound of a campfire. The fire tower loomed above the trees, a skeletal structure that seemed both out of place and yet perfectly suited for this isolated patch of wilderness. I killed the engine and sat there for a moment, taking in the silence that only nature can offer. It was a silence that spoke volumes, filled with the whispers of the wind through the pines and the distant calls of nocturnal creatures waking to their dark world. I grabbed my gear and locked the truck. As I approached the base of the tower, I noticed a small, weather-beaten shed nearby. The door creaked open and out stepped Jim, the ranger I was relieving. He was a grizzled man, his face etched with lines that told stories of years spent under the sun and against the wind. Evening, he greeted, extending a hand roughened by years of labor. You must be the new guy. That's me, I said, shaking his hand. First night on the tower. Jim's eyes narrowed slightly, as if measuring me up, weighing my metal. Well, it's not a job for everyone. Gets lonely up there, and quiet, too quiet sometimes. I think I can handle it, I replied, a hint of youthful arrogance coloring my words. Jim chuckled, a low, rumbling sound like distant thunder. We'll see. Here, he said, handing me a small, tattered manual. Read this. It's got some rules you'll need to follow. I glanced at the manual. It looked like something from a bygone era, its pages yellowed and corners dog-eared. Rules? Yeah, Jim said, his voice dropping a notch. Important ones. Don't ignore them. I flipped open the manual and skimmed through the list. Do not leave the tower. Turn off all lights between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. Do not answer the radio during this hour. The rules read like a cross between standard operating procedures and superstitious folklore. Are these for real? I asked, skepticism lacing my voice. Jim locked eyes with me, and for a moment I saw something there. A flicker of earnestness, a shadow of concern. Deadly real, he said. You'd do well to remember them. I nodded, not fully convinced but not willing to dismiss him outright. All right, I'll keep them in mind. Good, Jim said, clapping me on the back. You've got the radio if you need anything, but remember, no calls between two and three. That's your time to be vigilant. With that cryptic advice, Jim headed toward his truck, leaving me standing there with the manual in hand. I watched him drive off, his taillights disappearing into the darkening forest, and then turned my attention to the tower. Taking a deep breath, I began my ascent, each step echoing with a metallic clang that shattered the natural silence. When I reached the top, I unlocked the hatch and stepped into the cabin. It was a small, utilitarian space equipped with the basics, radio, binoculars, a first aid kit, and a bed. I set my gear down and took a seat, flipping on the radio and adjusting the binoculars. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky with hues of orange and purple, I felt a sense of isolation envelop me, as if the tower were an island in a sea of darkness. And so, my vigil began. I had no idea then how crucial those strange rules would become, how they would test the very limits of my sanity and courage. But for now, I was alone, perched high above the world, a guardian in a tower of secrets and silence. And I was ready, or so I thought. The night settled in like a heavy blanket, the kind that smothers you in its weight. I leaned back in the chair, my eyes scanning the dark expanse of forest through the binoculars. The radio buzzed with occasional chatter mostly mundane updates from other rangers or weather reports. I had the manual open beside me, its list of rules a curious distraction. I chuckled to myself. Too quiet sometimes, Jim had said. Well, quiet was part of the job description, wasn't it? It was around midnight when the first oddity occurred. A soft glow appeared in the distance, like a campfire that had learned to float. It hovered over the trees, casting an eerie luminescence that seemed to pulse. I squinted, trying to make sense of it. Then I remembered rule four. Do not look at any glowing lights in the forest. I quickly averted my gaze, a chill running down my spine. What kind of place was this? I shook off the unease, attributing it to first night jitters. I reached for the radio, intending to check in, when a static-laden voice broke through. Ranger Tower 6, do you copy? The voice was distorted, almost robotic. I picked up the radio. This is Tower 6. Go ahead. The voice crackled again. All clear. Over. Something about the transmission didn't sit right with me. It was too... emotionless. I glanced at the manual again, half expecting to find a rule about not trusting the radio. 
There wasn't one, but Rule 3 did say not to answer the radio between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. I checked the clock. It was only midnight, but the rule suddenly seemed less arbitrary. I decided to step outside onto the platform for some fresh air, thinking it might clear my head. The wind had picked up, rustling the leaves and carrying with it the earthy scent of the forest. I leaned against the railing, looking out into the darkness. That's when I heard it, a low growl, coming from the trees below. It was a guttural sound, filled with menace and intent. My hand instinctively went to the flare gun hanging by the door. Rule 5. If you hear an animal in distress, do not go outside. Instead, fire a flare. But this didn't sound like an animal in distress. This sounded like a predator, one that knew exactly what it was doing. I stood there, my senses heightened, every nerve tingling with anticipation. The growl came again, closer this time, followed by the snap of twigs and the rustle of underbrush. Something was moving down there, something big. I backed into the cabin and locked the door, my eyes darting to the manual. I had scoffed at the rules earlier, dismissing them as the ramblings of superstitious minds. But now, alone in this tower, surrounded by an impenetrable darkness that seemed to close in with each passing minute, I felt a creeping realization. The rules were there for a reason, and as the clock ticked closer to the forbidden hour, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was about to find out why. The clock on the wall seemed to tick louder as the minutes crawled by, each second stretching into an eternity. I had returned to my seat, my eyes now darting between the binoculars and the manual. The radio sat silent, as if holding its breath along with me. I couldn't shake the feeling that the forest was watching, waiting for me to make a mistake. It was then that I heard it. A high-pitched wail echoing through the trees like a siren's call. The sound was gut-wrenching, filled with agony and despair. My first instinct was to grab my flashlight and head out. But then I remembered Rule 5. If you hear an animal in distress, do not go outside. Instead, fire a flare. I hesitated, my hand hovering over the door handle. The wail came again, more desperate this time as if pleading for help. My heart pounded in my chest every fiber of my being screaming to go out there and do something. But the rules, those damn rules, they were etched into my mind now, each one a warning, a boundary not to be crossed. With a sense of resignation, I reached for the flare gun. I loaded it, stepped onto the platform, and aimed it skyward. As I pulled the trigger, the flare shot up into the night, its red light painting the sky like a brushstroke of fire. For a moment, the forest was bathed in a crimson glow and I held my breath, waiting for whatever would come next. What happened then was beyond explanation. Another light appeared in the sky, mimicking the flare's trajectory. It hovered for a moment before descending into the forest, its glow extinguishing as suddenly as it had appeared. I stood there stunned, my mind struggling to process what I had just witnessed. It was as if the forest had responded, had mimicked my action in a grotesque display of mockery. I retreated into the cabin, my hands trembling as I locked the door behind me. I sank into the chair, my eyes fixed on the manual. Rule 5 had saved me from stepping outside, but what had I just invited in? What kind of place was capable of such unnatural phenomena? I picked up the radio, my fingers hovering over the dial. I wanted to call for help, to hear another human voice, to be told that everything was going to be all right. But then I remembered Rule 3, do not answer the radio between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. I glanced at the clock. It was 1.45 a.m. The forbidden hour was approaching and I was running out of time. As I sat there, contemplating my next move, I realized that the rules were more than just guidelines. They were lifelines, each one a key to survival in a place that defied logic and reason. And as the clock ticked closer to 2 a.m., I couldn't help but wonder what other horrors awaited me what other rules I would be forced to follow. But for now, all I could do was wait, my eyes fixed on the clock, my mind racing with thoughts and fears. And so I braced myself for the hour that was to come, the hour that the manual had ominously referred to as your time to be vigilant. And God help me, I was. The clock struck 2 a.m., its chimes echoing in the small cabin like a funeral dirge. I reached for the light switch and hesitated, my fingers trembling. Rule 2. Turn off all lights between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. 
I took a deep breath and flicked the switch, plunging the room into darkness. My eyes strained to adjust, but it was a darkness so complete, it felt like being swallowed by a black hole. I sat there, my back against the wall, my senses heightened to a razor's edge. The radio sat silent on the table, its mute form a grim reminder of Rule 3. Do not answer the radio during this hour. I glanced at the manual, its pages now invisible in the dark, but its rules etched into my memory like commandments on stone tablets. The wind howled outside, its mournful cries weaving through the trees like the wails of lost souls. I strained my ears, listening for any sound that might break the oppressive silence. And then I heard it. Footsteps. Slow, deliberate footsteps crunching on the gravel below the tower. My heart pounded in my chest, each beat a drum roll of dread. I thought of reaching for the flare gun, but what good would it do in this darkness? And who, or what, was I up against? My mind raced through the possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. Was it a person, defying the rules for some nefarious purpose? Or was it something else, something that called this dark forest its home? The footsteps grew louder, ascending the metal stairs with a rhythmic clang that sent shivers down my spine. I held my breath, my eyes darting to the door, half expecting it to burst open at any moment. But it didn't. The footsteps reached the top of the stairs and then... Silence. A silence so complete it felt like the world had stopped breathing. Minutes ticked by, each one an eternity of anticipation and fear. I dared not move, dared not make a sound, as if my very breath could shatter this fragile moment. And then, as suddenly as it had started, the silence was broken. A scratching sound, like nails on a chalkboard, reverberated through the room. It was coming from the door, from just outside the door. I clenched my fists, my nails digging into my palms, my body taut like a bowstring. The scratching continued, each stroke a violation, an intrusion into this sanctuary I had thought impregnable. And then, just as suddenly, it stopped. The room fell silent again, the tension lifting like a fog, leaving in its wake a sense of relief so profound, it felt like a physical weight being lifted off my shoulders. I glanced at the clock. It was 3 a.m. The forbidden hour had passed. With a sense of disbelief, I reached for the light switch and flicked it on. The room was bathed in light, its familiar contours a stark contrast to the darkness that had enveloped it just moments ago. I was alone, but the sense of isolation had been replaced by something else. A realization that I was not alone in this forest. That I was a guest in a world governed by rules I could neither understand nor ignore. And as I sat there, my eyes fixed on the manual, I couldn't help but wonder what the next rule would bring, what the next hour would hold. But for now, all I could do was wait. And listen. And hope that whatever had visited me during that forbidden hour would not return. But deep down, I knew it was only a matter of time. The clock read 3.15 a.m., and the cabin was once again a sanctuary of light and normalcy, or as normal as it could be, given the night's events. I had just begun to entertain the notion that the worst was behind me when the radio crackled to life. Ranger Tower 6, do you copy? The voice was clear, human, and filled with a sense of urgency that sent a jolt through my spine. I picked up the radio, my hand still trembling from the adrenaline of the past hour. This is Tower 6, go ahead. Thank God, the voice exhaled. I'm Ranger Mike Thompson. I've been trying to reach you. I need to come up. Can you unlock the door? My fingers hovered over the lock, ready to comply, when a flicker of doubt crossed my mind. Rule 6. If someone claims to be a ranger and asks to be let in, ask for their full name and badge number. Can you confirm your badge number, Mike? I asked, my voice tinged with caution. There was a pause, a momentary lapse that filled the airwaves with static and uncertainty. Badge number 4,579, he finally replied. I was about to unlock the door when another transmission broke through, this one weak and filled with static. Don't. Let. In. The voice sputtered, barely audible over the crackling airwaves. My heart sank. The voice was distorted, but the message was clear. I pulled my hand away from the lock, my body frozen in a state of indecision. Who is this? I demanded, my voice rising in pitch. No answer came, but what followed was worse. A gut-wrenching scream that tore through the radio, filling the cabin with its echo of pure terror. Then, silence. I sat there, the radio now a heavy weight in my hands, my mind racing with questions and fears. 
Had I just heard a man die? And what had he been trying to warn me about? I backed away from the door, my eyes fixed on its sturdy frame as if expecting it to betray me. I thought of the scratching sounds from earlier, the footsteps on the stairs, the rules that had become my lifelines in this night of unimaginable horror, and I realized, with a sense of dread, that the rules had not been written to protect me from the forest. They had been written to protect me from what lived within it. I sank to the floor, my body trembling, my mind a whirlpool of thoughts and emotions. I had been so close to letting whatever it was into this sanctuary, so close to breaking the one rule that might have cost me my life. As I sat there, my eyes fixed on the clock, I knew that the night was far from over, that the rules would be tested again, that my sanity and courage would be pushed to their very limits. But for now, all I could do was wait, my eyes darting between the door and the radio, my ears straining for any sound that might pierce the silence. And so, I waited, my body curled into a ball on the floor, my mind a fortress preparing for the next siege. And God help me, it came. The first rays of dawn filtered through the windows, casting long shadows across the cabin. I had survived the night, but at what cost? My body felt like a wrung-out rag, my mind a labyrinth of questions with no answers. I glanced at the clock, 6.30 a.m. The night was over, but its echoes still reverberated through my soul. I heard the distant rumble of engines and looked out to see a convoy of vehicles approaching. Emergency medical technicians, park rangers, and what looked like a couple of unmarked SUVs. They pulled up to the base of the tower, and people began to spill out. Their movements hurried, their faces etched with concern and curiosity. I unlocked the door and began my descent, each step a reminder of the night's terrors. As I reached the ground, a pair of EMTs rushed over, their eyes scanning me for injuries. Are you okay? One of them asked her voice tinged with professional concern. I'm not sure, I replied, my voice barely above a whisper. They led me to an ambulance where they checked my vitals and shone a light into my eyes. You're in shock, the EMT said, but otherwise you seem okay. Okay, I thought. I'm far from okay. A park ranger approached, his face stern, his eyes searching. We're going to need a statement, he said. I looked at him, my mind wrestling with the decision. Could I tell them what had happened? Would they even believe me? And what about the rules, the manual that had become my Bible in that godforsaken tower? I can't explain, I finally said, my voice tinged with defeat. The ranger stared at me for a long moment, then nodded. All right, you're free to go, but we'll need to talk eventually. I nodded and walked away, my eyes catching sight of a group of rangers examining the base of the tower. They were collecting something shell casings, spots of blood, evidence of a night that defied explanation. I climbed into my truck and started the engine, my hands gripping the wheel as if it were a lifeline. As I drove away, I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw the tower receding in the distance, its skeletal frame now a monument to a night I would never forget. And then I saw it, a deer standing at the edge of the clearing, its eyes meeting mine in a moment of shared recognition. As I passed, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. The deer had a shred of a ranger's patch impaled on one of its antlers, and its nose and mouth were stained with what looked like blood. I pressed the accelerator and didn't look back, my eyes fixed on the road ahead, my mind a whirlpool of thoughts and fears. I had survived the night, but the questions remained, each one a haunting reminder of a world that existed beyond the boundaries of reason and logic. And as I drove away, Leaving behind a tower of secrets and a forest of nightmares, I knew that some questions were better left unanswered, some rules better left unbroken, and some places better left unvisited. The city lights appeared on the horizon like a distant galaxy, a stark contrast to the inky darkness of the forest I had left behind. My truck ate up the miles, but my mind was still trapped in that tower, in that night of unimaginable horror. I had made it out, but the scars were etched deep, not just on my soul, but on the very fabric of my understanding of the world. I had already made up my mind. I was quitting the ranger service. The city offered anonymity, a refuge of concrete and steel where the rules of nature didn't include cryptic manuals and unspoken horrors. I could find a job, 
maybe go back to school. Anything to escape the memories, the questions, the rules. As I pulled into my driveway, the weight of the past hours seemed to lift slightly. Home, safety, normalcy. I killed the engine and sat there for a moment, gathering the strength to step out, to cross the threshold into my old life. That's when I saw it, the manual lying on the passenger seat, its pages now dog-eared and stained with the sweat and fear of the night. Rule six flashed through my mind. If someone claims to be a ranger and asks to be let in, ask for their full name and badge number. I grabbed the manual and stepped out of the truck, my eyes scanning the quiet suburban street, half expecting to see a figure lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing. I was alone. I unlocked the front door and stepped inside, the familiarity of my home wrapping around me like a warm blanket. I tossed the manual onto the kitchen table and headed for the shower, desperate to wash away the grime and fear of the past hours. As the hot water cascaded over me, I felt my muscles relax, the tension draining away like water down the drain. And for a moment, just a moment, I allowed myself to believe that it was over, that I had escaped. That's when I heard it, a knock on the door. Three slow, deliberate knocks that cut through the sound of the shower like a knife through flesh. My heart stopped, my blood turning to ice in my veins. I turned off the shower and stepped out, my eyes darting to the bathroom window. It was dark outside, the world shrouded in a cloak of night that seemed to stretch into eternity. I wrapped a towel around me and crept to the kitchen, my eyes falling on the manual, its presence now a mocking reminder of the world I had left behind, but that had not left me. Another knock, louder this time, more insistent. I approached the door, my body trembling, my mind screaming at me to run, to hide, to escape. But there was no escape, not from this. I looked through the peephole and saw a figure standing outside, its features obscured by the darkness. And then it spoke, its voice a chilling whisper that seeped through the door like a malevolent mist. Ranger, let me in. It's safe now. My hand hovered over the lock, my breath caught in my throat, my soul teetering on the edge of an abyss from which there was no return. And then I remembered the final unwritten rule, the one that now filled me with a terror beyond words, beyond comprehension. Some rules are meant to be broken, but some doors are meant to stay closed, forever. I've been a park ranger at Yosemite for a good chunk of my life. Most folks think it's all about chasing down poachers or rescuing lost hikers. Don't get me wrong, that happens. But most days it's more like being a tour guide with a badge. You answer questions, give directions, and sometimes play referee between nature and those who think they can conquer it with a selfie stick. The park is a place of contrasts. One minute you're marveling at the grandeur of El Capitan, and the next, you're dealing with some city slicker who thinks it's a good idea to feed a bear. Yeah, a bear. As if those claws and teeth were just for show. But it's not all headaches and face palms. There are moments that make you laugh so hard you forget you're wearing a uniform. Like the time I stumbled upon a group of grown adults dressed as forest animals, frolicking around like they were auditioning for a Disney movie. They scattered the moment they saw me, their fake tails bobbing through the underbrush. I couldn't decide whether to write a report or a comedy sketch. Then there are the moments that stick with you, the ones that don't make it into the brochures. I remember a night under a sky so clear it felt like you could reach out and pluck the stars. I was sharing that silence with a family who had never seen the Milky Way before. The awe in their eyes, that's the stuff that keeps you going. But let's get one thing straight. Yosemite is not just another patch of earth. It's a living, breathing entity. It has its moods, its secrets, and sometimes, just sometimes, it swallows people whole. You hear stories, whispers really, about hikers who go missing without a trace. Most times they turn up, a little embarrassed, but none the worse for wear. Other times, well, let's just say not every story has a happy ending. That's why when the call came in about a missing hiker on the Cathedral Lake Trail, I figured it was business as usual. A guy named Greg was on the line, all frantic, saying his brother Dave had vanished into thin air. Now I've heard that phrase a lot, but the tremor in Greg's voice told me this was different. He mentioned something about other mysterious disappearances, 
as if Yosemite had suddenly turned into the Bermuda Triangle of national parks. I sighed, put on my hat, and grabbed my gear. This was no time for skepticism. If someone was lost, it was my job to find them, no matter what lurked in the hidden corners of this majestic but unforgiving landscape. As I headed out, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was more than just another rescue mission. Yosemite was stirring, and I was about to step into one of its untold stories. Little did I know, this one would be unlike any other. The Cathedral Lake Trail is one of those places that can make you forget you're in the 21st century. No cell service, no Wi-Fi, just you in the wilderness. It's a place that demands respect, and most people give it. But every now and then, someone thinks they can outsmart nature. That's usually when I get a call. I pulled up to the trailhead in my Ranger SUV, dust billowing behind me like a bad omen. Greg was pacing near the signboard, his face flushed and eyes wide. He looked like he'd seen a ghost, or worse. Greg, I called out as I stepped out of the vehicle. He turned, relief washing over his face. Oh, thank God you're here. It's Dave, my brother. He's gone, just vanished. I motioned for him to calm down. Start from the beginning, what happened? We were hiking, just like we've done a hundred times. I stopped to tie my shoe, and when I looked up, he was gone. Just gone, man. I eyed him skeptically. People get lost here all the time. He probably wandered off the trail. He'll turn up. Greg shook his head vehemently. No, you don't understand. I've heard stories, man. People go missing in places like this, and they never come back. What if that's what happened to Dave? I sighed. Yosemite had its share of myths and legends. But this was no time for campfire stories. Look, I understand you're worried, but let's stick to the facts. Did he have any reason to wander off? Was he acting strange? No, nothing like that. We were having a good time, and then he was just... gone. Something about the way Greg said gone sent a chill down my spine. This wasn't just another lost hiker. I could feel it. All right, let's go find your brother, I said, grabbing my pack from the SUV. We set off down the trail, Greg leading the way. The forest was eerily quiet, as if holding its breath. We called out for Dave, our voices echoing through the trees. But there was no response. After about a mile, Greg stopped abruptly. This is where it happened, right here. I looked around. It was a nondescript part of the trail, no different from the miles we'd just covered. But then I noticed it, a narrow opening between the trees, like a doorway to another world. Did you check there? I pointed to the opening. Greg's face paled. No, I didn't even see it. Do you think he went in there? There was only one way to find out. I took a deep breath and stepped toward the opening. As I did, a shiver ran through me, as if I'd just crossed an invisible line. Stay close, I warned Greg. We don't know what's in there. But as I stepped into the darkness, I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever was in there already knew all about us. And it was waiting. The forest has a way of swallowing sound making each step feel like a solitary journey even when you're not alone. Greg followed close behind me, his breaths shallow and quick, like a hunted animal. I couldn't blame him. The atmosphere had changed. The woods felt denser, the air thicker. It was as if we'd stepped into a different realm altogether. We moved cautiously, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig seemed amplified as if the forest itself was whispering warnings we couldn't understand. And then, there it was, a dark maw in the side of a hill, like a wound in the earth, a cave. Greg's flashlight flickered as he pointed it toward the entrance. Do you think he's in there? I studied the cave. It looked natural, but something about it felt off. Only one way to find out, I said, my voice betraying a hint of reluctance. Greg didn't wait for a second invitation. He rushed toward the cave, his flashlight beam dancing erratically on the walls. Dave, are you in here? I hesitated at the entrance, my instincts screaming at me to turn back. But this was my job, my responsibility. I took a deep breath and stepped inside. The cave was colder than I'd expected, the air damp and heavy. Our flashlights revealed a narrow tunnel that seemed to stretch on forever, its walls slick with moisture. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were descending into the belly of some ancient beast. We hadn't gone far when Greg stopped abruptly, his light focused on something on the ground. What's this? I moved closer and saw what had caught his attention, a shoe, caked in mud and worn from use. 
It looked like it had been there for a while. Is it Dave's? I asked. Greg shook his head, his face pale. No, but it could belong to someone else who went missing. What if this cave is where they all end up? The thought sent a shiver down my spine. Let's not jump to conclusions. We need to keep moving. But as we ventured deeper, the cave seemed to close in around us. The walls narrowed and the ceiling dropped. I felt a growing sense of unease, as if we were trespassing in a place we had no right to be. Finally, I stopped. We should go back and get more help. This could be dangerous. Greg looked at me, his eyes filled with a mix of desperation and fear. But what about Dave? What if he's in here? I understand, but we're not equipped for this. We need to be smart. Reluctantly, Greg nodded. All right, let's go. As we turned to leave, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The cave seemed to sigh, as if disappointed. But I knew better than to let my imagination run wild. We made our way back to the entrance, the weight of the cave lifting as we stepped into the open air. But as we did, I knew that this was far from over. The cave had revealed a glimpse of its secrets, and I had a sinking feeling that it wasn't done with us yet, not by a long shot. We emerged from the cave like men reborn, the sunlight hitting our faces like a slap of reality. I radioed for backup, my voice tinged with an urgency I couldn't fully explain. Greg sat on a fallen log, his face etched with a mix of relief and dread. He knew as well as I did that we were far from solving this mystery. Within the hour, a search party arrived, armed with ropes, flashlights, and a sense of purpose. I briefed them quickly, pointing to the cave that had swallowed more than just our courage. We go in, we search, we come out, no heroics. But when I turned to lead them to the cave, my heart sank. The cave was gone. In its place, a smooth hillside, as if the earth had healed its own wound. I blinked, thinking my eyes were playing tricks on me. But no, it was gone, vanished. The team looked at me, their faces a mix of confusion and disbelief. Where's the cave, ranger? I had no answer. I felt like a fool, a man chasing his own tail. It was right here, I stammered, my voice tinged with doubt. Greg stood up, his eyes wide. I told you, man, this place is cursed. It swallows people, and now it swallowed the cave. The team exchanged glances, their expressions saying what they didn't dare speak. Had the stress gotten to me? Was I seeing things? We'll spread out and search the area, I ordered, trying to regain some semblance of control. Maybe there's another entrance. We combed the woods for hours, our flashlights piercing the gathering dusk. We found nothing. No cave, no sign of Dave, no answers. As darkness fell, I made the call to head back. We were chasing shadows. Back at the station, I filed my report, each word a struggle. How do you document the indescribable? How do you explain the unexplainable? I considered leaving out the cave, but that would be a lie. And I was many things, but not a liar. As I handed in the report, my superior looked at me, his eyes searching for something. Sanity, perhaps. You sure about all this? I nodded, my pride swallowed by the enormity of what we'd experienced. Yes, sir. I don't expect you to believe it, but it's the truth. He sighed, setting the report aside. Get some rest. We'll pick this up in the morning. But as I drove home, the weight of the day pressing down on me, I knew there would be no rest. Not for me, not for Greg, and certainly not for whoever, or whatever, was lurking in the hidden corners of Yosemite. The cave had vanished, but the mystery had deepened, and I couldn't shake the feeling that we were all pawns in a game we couldn't begin to understand. A game that was far from over. A year had passed since the cave incident, but not a day went by that I didn't think about it. The questions, the doubts, they gnawed at me like a persistent itch I couldn't reach. I needed answers, even if it meant going against protocol, even if it meant facing whatever had driven me and Greg out of that cave. So I found myself back at the Cathedral Lake Trail, off-duty and heavily armed. I had a GPS, a satellite phone, and enough gear to make a prepper jealous. If the cave was there, I was going to find it. And this time, I was going in prepared. The forest greeted me like an old friend, its towering trees and rustling leaves a familiar comfort. But as I reached the spot where the cave had been, my heart sank. It was just as it had been a year ago, a smooth hillside, no sign of any opening. I was about to turn back, chalk it up to a figment of my stressed imagination, when I felt it. A subtle shift in the air, like the static before a storm. 
I looked again, and there it was, the cave, its dark entrance like an open wound in the earth. I took a deep breath, steadying my shaking hands. This was it. I stepped inside. The cave was as I remembered it, cold, dark, and unwelcoming. But this time, I was ready. I moved cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the darkness, my other hand gripping the pistol at my side. I hadn't gone far when I saw it, the creature. It was more horrifying than I remembered, a grotesque blend of plant and animal, its tentacles writhing like snakes. And it was consuming a human face, one that looked disturbingly familiar. My heart pounded in my chest, but I held my ground. I had come for answers, and I was going to get them. As I moved deeper, I discovered the cave's other inhabitants, people, or what was left of them. They were alive but incomplete, missing arms, legs, faces, and among them, I saw him, Greg. His eyes met mine and for a moment I saw a flicker of recognition, but then it vanished, replaced by the vacant stare of someone who was no longer fully human. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, but I fought it back. This was bigger than me, bigger than Greg, bigger than all of us. This creature, this cave, it was an abomination, and it had to be stopped. As I turned to leave, the creature let out a guttural growl, and I felt a wave of dizziness wash over me. It was trying to hypnotize me, to add me to its collection, but I was ready. I shook off the feeling, my resolve hardened by the horrors I had witnessed. I made it to the entrance, the creature's growls echoing behind me. As I stepped into the sunlight, I knew what I had to do. This cave, this creature, they couldn't be allowed to exist. I was going to seal them off, once and for all. I didn't waste any time. I drove straight to the hardware store, my mind racing faster than the engine. I bought fast-drying cement, a mixing tub, a trowel, and a few other supplies. The cashier gave me a curious look, probably wondering what kind of home improvement project required such urgency, if only he knew. As night fell, I returned to the Cathedral Lake Trail. The forest was a different beast in the dark, its familiar landmarks transformed into looming shadows. But I had no time for fear. I had a job to do. I reached the cave, its entrance like a dark scar on the earth. I mixed the cement, my hands steady despite the gravity of what I was about to do. This was it, the point of no return. I started sealing the entrance, each scoop of cement a step closer to trapping the creature inside. I worked quickly, my body running on adrenaline and sheer will. I couldn't afford to make a mistake, I had to get this right. As I laid the final layer, I heard it, a guttural, inhuman shriek from deep within the cave. It was a sound of pure rage, of primal fury. It echoed through the forest, sending a shiver down my spine. The creature knew what I was doing, and it was not pleased. But then, something unexpected happened. The shriek turned into a chorus, a cacophony of voices joining in. It was as if all the souls trapped inside had realized their predicament, and were crying out in despair. Among those voices I thought I heard one that sounded familiar. Greg. My heart sank. I had warned him not to enter the cave, but he hadn't listened. And now, he was part of this nightmare. I'm sorry, Greg, I muttered, my voice barely a whisper. I'm so sorry. I laid the final scoop of cement, sealing the cave and its horrors inside. As I stepped back, I felt a wave of exhaustion wash over me. I had done it. The creature was trapped, its reign of terror over. But as I made my way back to the car, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. The creature was trapped, yes, but it was still alive, and as long as it lived, the threat remained. I drove home in silence, my thoughts a jumble of relief and regret. I had done my duty, done what had to be done, but at what cost? As I lay in bed that night, the events of the past year replaying in my mind, one thought kept nagging at me. Had I really solved anything, or had I merely contained it? The creature was trapped, but it was still out there lurking in the hidden corners of Yosemite, a dark secret in a place filled with natural wonders. And as I drifted off to sleep, one question haunted me. What happens when a creature with an insatiable hunger runs out of food? I didn't have an answer, and that terrified me more than anything. Days turned into weeks, and the weight of what I'd done settled in like a permanent fog. I kept up with my duties, patrolled the trails and assisted hikers, but a part of me was always back at that sealed cave. I'd done my job, protected the public from an unimaginable horror, but the cost was a burden I'd carry for the rest of my life. 
I avoided the Cathedral Lake Trail, made excuses to stay away, but fate has a way of pulling you back to the places you'd rather forget. A group of hikers had reported strange noises, unsettling cries that didn't belong to any animal they knew. My superior insisted I investigate. You know that area better than anyone, he said, unaware of how true that was. I arrived at the spot in the late afternoon, the sun casting long shadows through the trees. I approached the sealed cave cautiously, half expecting to find it just as I'd left it, but what I saw made my blood run cold. The cement seal was cracked, chunks of it scattered around like the aftermath of an explosion. The cave was open. A wave of dread washed over me. Had it escaped? Was it out there, hunting, feeding? I considered calling for backup, but what would I say? That a mythical creature had broken free? They'd think I'd lost my mind. Summoning every ounce of courage, I stepped into the cave. The air was thick, suffocating, but there was something else. A smell, sweet and rotten at the same time. I flashed my light around, my hand trembling. And then I saw them. Bodies, or what was left of them, strewn around like discarded dolls. They were drained, hollow, as if every ounce of life had been sucked out of them. Among them, I saw the creature, or rather its remains. It was shriveled, lifeless, its tentacles limp, and its eyes dull. As I stood there trying to make sense of the scene, I heard it, a soft, almost inaudible whisper. I turned around, my flashlight beam landing on a figure standing at the entrance of the cave. It was Greg, or something that looked like him. His eyes were black, soulless, and his mouth was twisted into a grotesque smile. Before I could react, he spoke, his voice a chilling monotone. You thought you could trap it, contain it, but you don't understand. It's not just a creature, it's an idea, a hunger that can't be contained. And now, it's a part of me. Before I could move, he lunged at me impossibly fast. The last thing I felt was an excruciating pain as darkness enveloped me. My final thought was a realization, a terrifying truth I'd failed to see. The creature was never the real horror. The real horror was what it awakened in us, what it unleashed. And that horror was now free, unbound by cave walls or cement barriers. As my consciousness faded, I understood one terrifying fact. The hunger had found a new host, and it was insatiable. I was 24, restless, and carrying the weight of a life that had already seen too many wrong turns. The city was a maze I couldn't navigate anymore, a labyrinth of mistakes and missed opportunities. So, when I saw the job posting for a park ranger position in a state park, it felt like a lifeline thrown my way. I grabbed it without a second thought. The park was a sprawling expanse of wilderness, a place where nature still held dominion, towering pines, endless trails, and the kind of quiet you can't find just anywhere. It was the kind of place where you could lose yourself and maybe, just maybe, find something too. My duties were straightforward. Maintain the trails, assist visitors, and most importantly, keep an eye out for fires. The park had a history, you see. Old timers would talk about the great fire of 76 like it was yesterday, a cautionary tale whispered around campfires. But it was the North End Watchtower that caught my attention from day one. They called it the Sentinel, a 100-foot-tall structure made of old pine. It stood there like a guardian, overlooking the park, a small cabin perched on stilts. It was as if it had sprouted from the earth itself, a part of the landscape yet apart from it. The first time I climbed those wooden stairs, each step creaking under my boots, I felt a strange mix of awe and unease. The tower was equipped with the bare essentials, a wooden chair, a table, and a single light bulb that dangled from the ceiling, swaying gently as if moved by some invisible hand. From up there, the world looked different, smaller, yet infinitely expansive. I could see the winding trails, the darkening forest, and the distant hills rolling away like waves in a frozen sea. But what I couldn't see was what lay hidden in those shadows, the secrets that the trees whispered when they thought no one was listening. The park was considered safe, a haven for families and nature enthusiasts alike. But every paradise has its serpents. We were not far from a correctional facility, and the park had its share of unwelcome visitors. Criminals, squatters, 
and others who sought the anonymity that only a vast wilderness could provide. As I sat there in that tower, the setting sun casting long shadows that seemed to reach for me, I felt a shiver run down my spine. It wasn't just the chill of the evening air, it was the realization that I was a small, fragile piece in a much larger, unfathomable puzzle. I shook off the feeling, reminding myself that I was there to do a job. I was the eyes and ears of this place, its first line of defense. And so I settled into my chair, my gaze scanning the horizon, my hand resting on the walkie-talkie that connected me to the outside world. But as the darkness deepened, enveloping the tower and everything it stood watch over, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me too. And whatever it was, it wasn't just passing through. It had been there long before me, and it had stories to tell. Stories that I wasn't sure I wanted to hear. And so began my first night at the Sentinel, a watchtower that had seen more than its share of fires, but none like the one that was about to ignite inside me. The ranger station was a modest building, a rustic cabin that served as the nerve center of the park. It was where we clocked in, got our assignments, and occasionally heard stories that made us question the wisdom of wandering too far off the beaten path. That evening, as I was going through the logbook, noting the day's activities and incidents, the door swung open. A woman walked in, her face flushed, eyes wide with a mix of fear and disbelief. She was in her early thirties, dressed like someone who had come to enjoy a simple hike, but had found something else entirely. Can I help you, ma'am? I asked, setting aside the logbook. I, I think someone's following me, she stammered, her voice tinged with panic. Sit down, please. Take a deep breath and tell me what happened, I said, motioning to the chair across from my desk. She sat, her hands trembling as she recounted her experience. She had been walking on the Cedar Ridge Trail, a popular route that offered stunning views of the valley. But today, she said, the beauty of the landscape was marred by something unsettling. She had heard strange noises, whistles that mimicked the calls of a wood thrush, but were too mechanical, too deliberate to be natural. And then I saw it, she continued, her voice dropping to a whisper, a shadowy figure. Just beyond the trees, it was watching me. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach. This was not the first time we had reports of suspicious activities, but something about her story struck a chord. Maybe it was the way she described the whistles, or perhaps it was the genuine fear in her eyes. We'll look into it right away, I assured her, picking up the walkie-talkie to alert the other rangers. The search yielded nothing. We combed the area, flashlights piercing through the gathering dusk, but found no signs of anyone lurking in the woods. The woman left, grateful but not entirely convinced. And who could blame her? The forest has a way of holding on to its secrets, of swallowing up traces of any transgressions. As I prepared to head out for my night shift at the Sentinel, my thoughts kept drifting back to the woman's story. I tried to shake it off, to chalk it up to an overactive imagination, or perhaps an animal that had strayed too close to the trail. But deep down, I knew better. The park was a sanctuary for many, but it was also a hiding place, a vast expanse where one could easily become predator or prey. I grabbed my gear and made my way to the tower, the woman's words echoing in my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that her story was a harbinger of things to come, a warning sign that I couldn't afford to ignore. As I reached the base of the sentinel, I noticed something that made me stop in my tracks, a new carving on the wooden frame, a pair of eyes staring back at me. It was as if the tower itself was watching, waiting to see what I would do next. And in that moment, I realized that the night ahead would be a long one, filled with uncertainties and shadows that couldn't simply be explained away. I climbed the wooden stairs of the Sentinel, each step creaking under the weight of both my boots and the apprehension that had settled in my gut. The tower loomed above me, its timbers aged by years of weather and watchfulness. It was a relic, a sentinel in the truest sense, standing guard over a wilderness that was as beautiful as it was unforgiving. Reaching the top, I unlocked the cabin door and stepped inside. The room was sparse, functional, a space designed for vigilance rather than comfort. A wooden chair, a table cluttered with maps and a radio, and that single dim light bulb hanging from the ceiling its glow more a suggestion than an illumination. I set my gear down and took a seat, my eyes instinctively scanning the horizon through the cabin's windows. 
The sun had dipped below the tree line, casting the world in hues of twilight. It was that in-between time, when day gives way to night, and anything seems possible. I picked up the walkie-talkie and checked in with the station. All clear at the Sentinel, I reported, my voice steady despite the unease that tingled at the base of my skull. Copy that, came the reply, a static-laced acknowledgement that did little to dispel the growing tension in the air. I leaned back in my chair, allowing myself a moment to breathe. That's when I saw it, a new set of carved eyes on the railing of the tower's stairs. They were crude but deliberate, etched into the wood as if to say, I see you. My heart skipped a beat. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped outside, shining its beam on the railing. There they were, those twin circles staring back at me, accompanied by something new, a piece of reflective material, torn and tattered, wedged into a crack in the wood. I felt a shiver crawl up my spine. This was no random act, no idle defacement. It was a message, a silent communication from someone, or something, that knew more than it should. I returned to the cabin, my mind racing. Could it be related to the woman's report? Or was it something else? Something born from the hidden corners of this vast, untamed land? I couldn't say, but the weight of the unknown settled over me like a shroud. I sat back down, my eyes now darting between the windows and the radio, the outside world, and my only link to human contact. I considered calling it in, reporting the new carving and the reflective scrap, but hesitated. What would I say? That I was spooked by a piece of cloth and some etchings in the wood. As I grappled with the decision, a sound broke the silence, a dragging noise, like something being pulled across the wooden floor above me. My blood ran cold. There was no floor above me, just the roof and the open sky. I gripped the arms of my chair, my knuckles white with tension. Whatever was happening, whatever was unfolding in the shadows of this ancient watchtower, it was clear that I was no longer the sole watcher in this wilderness. And as the night stretched on, I couldn't shake the feeling that those carved eyes were not just markings on a railing. They were a pair of lenses, and behind them lay a gaze that saw right through me. The night was settling in, a thick blanket of darkness that seemed to absorb sound as much as light. I sat there, my eyes straining to make out shapes in the gloom, my ears tuned to the subtlest of noises. The radio sat silent on the table, a mute witness to the tension that filled the cabin. Then it came, a creaking sound, low but distinct, rising from the wooden bones of the tower. It was the kind of noise you'd expect from an old structure, but this was different. It was as if the tower itself was shifting, adjusting its stance in preparation for something. I grabbed the walkie-talkie. Did anyone else hear that? I asked, my voice tinged with a nervousness I couldn't quite conceal. A moment of static, then a reply. Probably just the wind, or the tower settling. These old structures make noise. I wanted to believe it, to accept the simple explanation and return to my watch. But as I sat there, another sound reached my ears, a scraping noise, like wood being dragged across wood, coming from the stairs leading up to the cabin. My pulse quickened. I rose from my chair and cautiously stepped outside, flashlight in hand. I swept the beam down the stairwell, half expecting to catch a glimpse of something, someone, lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing, just the empty stairs descending into darkness. I was about to turn back when my flashlight caught something on the railing, a fresh set of carved eyes, their gaze meeting mine as if challenging me to look away, and beside it, another piece of reflective material this one larger, as if torn from a piece of clothing. My mind raced. This was no coincidence, no trick of the light or the wind. Someone was out there, watching me, marking their presence in the most unsettling way. I retreated to the cabin, my back against the door as if that could offer some measure of protection. I considered my options. I could call for backup, but what would I report? Sounds, carvings, torn fabric? It was hardly enough to warrant an emergency response. Yet every instinct screamed that this was anything but normal. I sat back down, my eyes now darting between the windows, each pane a potential entry point, each shadow a hiding place. I felt trapped, caught in a web that was tightening with every passing minute. I picked up the radio one more time. If anyone's near the Sentinel, maybe swing by, just to check things out, I said, 
my words a mix of request and plea. Will do, came the reply, but the words offered little comfort. As I set the radio down, another creak echoed through the tower, this one louder, closer, as if whatever was out there had taken another step toward me. I gripped the arms of my chair, my senses on high alert, my body a coiled spring ready to snap, and in that moment I knew, with a certainty that chilled me to my core, that I was not alone. The tower, the sentinel, was living up to its name, but the question remained. Was it guarding me, or was it guarding something from me? The night was a tapestry of shadows, each one darker than the last, each one a potential hiding spot. My eyes were drawn to the windows, to the world beyond the glass that seemed both near and infinitely distant. I was a sentinel in a tower that had become a cage, and the bars were closing in. Then I heard it, a soft, deliberate footfall on the stairs below, followed by another, and another. Someone was climbing the tower, their movements slow and calculated, as if savoring the ascent. At the same time, another sound reached my ears, a rustling from above, like fabric scraping against wood. My blood ran cold. I was trapped, sandwiched between two unknown entities, one ascending, one descending, both converging on my position. Adrenaline surged through my veins, drowning out reason, amplifying instinct. I had to act, and fast. I grabbed my boots and flung them onto a lower landing, their thud echoing through the wooden structure. Almost immediately, the footsteps below quickened, rushing downward to investigate the noise. Seizing the moment, I stepped out onto the landing, my heart pounding in my chest. With a quick glance up and down the stairwell to confirm I was alone, I climbed over the handrail and hung off the side of the tower, my fingers gripping the wood, my feet searching for purchase on the narrow ledge below. It was a desperate move, a gamble that left me exposed to the elements in the sheer drop below. But it was also my only option, a Hail Mary in a game where the stakes were life and death. I hung there, my arms burning from the strain, my breath shallow and rapid. Time stretched, each second an eternity as I waited, listened, prayed. Then I heard it, the sound of footsteps returning, this time ascending the tower, but bypassing my position, the person or thing unaware of my precarious perch. I waited until the footsteps receded until I was reasonably sure I was alone, then pulled myself back onto the landing, my muscles screaming in protest. I didn't waste time. I sprinted up the stairs, taking them two at a time, my focus singular. Reach the cabin, secure the door, prepare for what comes next. I burst into the room and slammed the door shut, locking it and bracing it with the chair. I was back in my cage, but at least it was a cage with walls, a fortress however fragile. As I stood there, catching my breath, another sound filled the air, a low guttural laugh coming from just outside the door. It was a sound devoid of humor, a sound that promised things dark and terrible. And as I braced for impact, for the inevitable clash that would determine my fate, I realized the trap had sprung. But the question remained, was I the predator or was I the prey? And in the darkness of that moment, as the walls of the sentinel seemed to close in around me, I couldn't tell which was more terrifying. The air was thick with tension, each second stretching into an eternity as I stood there, my back against the door, my body a makeshift barricade. The laughter outside had ceased, replaced by a silence that was somehow even more unnerving. Then it came, the sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, approaching the door. A moment later the handle jiggled, a soft, almost polite gesture that belied the menace behind it. I braced myself, my muscles taut, my mind racing through scenarios, each one darker than the last. The door shuddered as something, someone threw their weight against it. Wood creaked, metal groaned, and for a moment I felt the barrier give, felt the inevitability of what was to come. And then, as if summoned by the very gods of the wilderness, lightning struck. The world exploded in a flash of light and sound, a cataclysmic burst that shook the tower to its very foundations. I was thrown off my feet, my body airborne for a split second that felt like a lifetime, but as I hit the ground, I realized something miraculous. I was unharmed. In the chaos, I had instinctively moved to an insulated stool, a lone piece of rubber in a sea of wood and metal. It had saved me, shielded me from the electric fury that had engulfed the tower. I scrambled to my feet, my senses returning, my eyes adjusting to the darkness that had reclaimed the cabin. And as I looked out the window, 
I saw them, two figures, sprawled on the ground below, their bodies twisted in postures of finality. I grabbed the radio, my hands trembling as I keyed the mic. Emergency at the Sentinel, I gasped, my voice a hoarse whisper. Lightning strike, possible casualties, I need help. The response was immediate, a flurry of voices, of coordinates and protocols, a symphony of action that shattered the night's malevolence. And as I stood there listening to the cavalry mobilize, I felt something else, a sense of relief, of deliverance, as if the storm had been a judgment and I had been found worthy. It didn't take long for help to arrive, for the night to be pierced by the wail of sirens and the glare of headlights. I was escorted down the tower, my legs shaky, my soul lighter than it had been in hours. The two figures were indeed casualties, their lives extinguished in that fateful moment. And as I looked at them, as I saw the handcuffs that dangled from one's belt and the shiv that lay beside the other, I realized the depth of the peril I had been in. They were escaped convicts, men with nothing to lose, men who had seen in me an obstacle to be removed. As I sat in the ambulance, a blanket around my shoulders, a cup of hot coffee in my hands, I knew that this was my last night as a park ranger, my last night in a tower that had been both prison and sanctuary. And as I looked back at the sentinel, its timbers charred but standing, its presence as imposing as ever, I felt a strange sense of gratitude. For in that moment of chaos, of life and death, it had been more than a watchtower. It had been a witness. Days turned into weeks, and the events of that fateful night became the stuff of local legend. A tale told in hushed tones, a cautionary story that parents whispered to their children. The sentinel was repaired, its timbers replaced, its purpose renewed. But for me, there was no going back. I had handed in my badge, my uniform, my identity as a park ranger. The wilderness had shown me its face, both beautiful and terrible, and I couldn't unsee it. I took a piece of the charred wood from the tower before leaving, a memento not of what could have happened, but of what did. It sits on my mantle now, a silent reminder of the night when nature itself seemed to pass judgment. But as the days stretch into a semblance of normalcy, as the memories fade into the recesses of my mind, something else lingers, a question, a doubt, a shadow that refuses to be banished. It happened a week after the incident. I was at home, going through the motions of a life that had been irrevocably changed, when I received a package. No return address, no note, just a small box wrapped in plain brown paper. I opened it cautiously, half expecting to find something innocuous, something that would make me laugh at my own paranoia. But what I found inside made my blood run cold, a pair of carved wooden eyes, identical to the ones I had seen on the railing of the Sentinel, accompanied by a piece of reflective material, torn and tattered just like the one I had found. I stood there, my hands trembling, my mind racing, Who had sent it? How had they found me? And what did it mean? As I grapple with these questions, as I lock my doors and check my windows and jump at every sound, another thought occurs to me, one far more terrifying than any I've had before. What if the storm wasn't a judgment but a reprieve, a temporary stay in a trial that is yet to conclude? What if the eyes that watched me, that watch me still, belong not to a human, but to the wilderness itself, a force ancient, relentless, and insatiable. And as I sit here writing these words, I hear it, a creaking sound, low but distinct, coming from outside my window. I want to believe it's the wind, or a stray animal, or my own imagination playing tricks on me. But as I look out into the darkness, as I see a shadow move where no shadow should be, I realize the truth. The watch is not over. It has only just begun. And the eyes that see me, that see into me, are not just watching, they are waiting. I've always believed there's no better therapy than a weekend in the woods. Fresh air, the scent of pine needles underfoot, and the kind of silence that's hard to find in the city. These were the thoughts playing on my mind as the SUV rumbled along the dirt trail with the four of us sharing laughter, past camping tales, and the kind of comfortable banter that comes from years of friendship. Remember last summer at Red Creek? Jack said with a chuckle. 
Gary fell right into the water trying to catch that trout with his bare hands. Gary scowled, though there was amusement in his eyes. In my defense, I nearly had it. Lucy, always the peacekeeper, intervened before the friendly banter turned into a full-blown reminiscence war. Let's just hope this trip doesn't involve anyone taking an unplanned swim, she said, her eyes sparkling with mischief. I focused on the road, guiding the vehicle past a particularly gnarly stretch of terrain. It wasn't my first time driving through rugged landscapes, and there was something about maneuvering through nature's obstacles that I always found satisfying. Still, today's destination was a new one for all of us, a secluded part of the forest that came highly recommended by a fellow hiker. By late afternoon, the dense trees parted to reveal our campsite. It was a quiet, serene spot, a small clearing bordered by tall pines and spruces. A gentle stream bubbled nearby, its waters clear and inviting. Looks perfect, Lucy commented, stepping out of the vehicle and taking a deep breath. Her hair, which was typically confined in a neat bun, was now surrendering to the gentle breeze, loose strands framing her face. Gary and Jack were already unloading the gear, their earlier banter replaced by the kind of efficient teamwork you'd expect from seasoned campers. We had a system in place. Lucy and I would handle the tents while the guys took care of gathering firewood. As the sun began its descent, casting golden hues upon the forest floor, I couldn't shake off a particular thought. The woods around us were silent, but not the usual tranquil silence I was accustomed to. This was deeper, more profound. It was as if nature itself held its breath, watching and waiting. Lost in my musings, I almost didn't hear Lucy's voice. Everything okay? I nodded, brushing off my concerns. Just soaking it all in, I replied, forcing a smile. She seemed to accept this, and we got to work. Soon our tent stood proud, and a fire was crackling cheerily in the makeshift pit Jack had dug. As darkness began to creep in, stealing the vibrant colors of the day, we all settled around the campfire. The logs popped and hissed, throwing sporadic bursts of sparks into the night. We talked, laughed, and shared stories, the camaraderie a welcome distraction from the lingering unease I felt. But as the flames danced higher and our shadows grew longer, I couldn't help but wonder if we were truly alone in these woods, or if something else was quietly observing our intrusion into its domain. The night was still young, but an underlying tension had settled, like the prelude to a storm. And deep down, I feared the night had more in store for us than just stories and laughter. The fire was our anchor, its warmth countering the creeping cold of the night. But as the shadows lengthened and deepened, there was an underlying note of anxiety in our conversation. The city's ambient noise was something we had left behind, and out here, the silence was amplified. At first, it was just the random, barely audible rustling of leaves. But soon enough, there were noises that didn't fit the usual pattern of the forest. A twig breaking, the soft thud of something heavy touching the ground. Probably just deer passing through, Gary remarked, trying to inject some reason into the growing unease. But his voice lacked the usual confidence, and it didn't do much to dispel the tension. We tried to drown the unsettling forest murmurs with our own tales and laughter. Lucy, in a valiant attempt to divert our attention, began recounting her encounter with a bear during a solo hike. Jack, not to be outdone, launched into his story about being stalked by a mountain lion. I strained my ears, trying to discern the sources of the sounds around us, and then, quite suddenly, the distant thud of footsteps. Heavy, deliberate, closing in. Did anyone hear that? Jack whispered, his jovial demeanor gone. Everyone nodded, eyes wide. It's strange how shared fear can create a bond, and how it can draw people closer without words. We all shifted subtly, forming a tighter circle around the fire. Lucy, ever the voice of reason, tried to reassure us. It could be another camper or hiker, right? But the logic didn't quite land. This part of the woods was meant to be secluded, and besides, there was something off about the footfalls. They weren't the regular rhythm of a human. They were too... irregular. It wasn't just footsteps. Now there were other noises. The soft whisper of something brushing against a tree trunk. The faintest hint of... breathing? As the reality of our isolation set in, a genuine fear began to take hold. The darkness beyond our campfire was thick, impenetrable. 
It felt as if it was pressing in on us, trapping us. A pair of eyes glowed momentarily in the distance, catching the fire's light, then disappearing just as quickly. I felt Lucy's grip tighten on my arm. Jack and Gary, meanwhile, had grabbed hold of the larger sticks from our woodpile, holding them like makeshift weapons. It's just an animal, Gary tried to reassure himself more than anyone else. A raccoon, perhaps, or a deer. But deep down, I knew better. Deer didn't have eyes that glowed like that. And they didn't make footsteps that sounded so... deliberate. The noises circled our camp, the unseen presence making itself felt but not seen. Hours seemed to pass, though it was likely only minutes. Finally, as abruptly as they started, the noises stopped. The forest returned to its previous stillness, the silence even more oppressive than before. We sat there, too stunned to speak, the weight of what had transpired pressing down on us. Whatever had been out there in the dark had chosen to retreat, for now. But as we tried to gather our composure, one question loomed large in my mind. What was it watching and waiting for? The forest seemed to come alive with every imagined horror my mind could conjure. Each rustle of leaves, each brush of wind against our tent, magnified by the consuming darkness, was a reminder of our vulnerability. Jack broke the silence with a murmur. We need a plan, something better than sitting here like bait. But even as he spoke, the dread grew palpable. We were surrounded by an oppressive weight, the kind that pushes down on your chest, making every breath an effort. Lucy, ever the resilient one, tried to rally us. We stick together no matter what. Maybe it's gone. But any hope of that vanished when it happened. A scream, raw, visceral, echoing through the trees with a chilling resonance. A sound that was neither animal nor completely human. A cry of anguish mixed with an unearthly fury. Gary's face drained of color. What the hell was that? He whispered, barely able to find his voice. The scream faded as quickly as it had appeared, but it left a void, a silence so complete that my own heartbeat sounded like a drum in my ears. And just when I thought the tension was insurmountable, Lucy's voice, trembling but determined, broke through. We need to check if everyone's okay. We did a hurried roll call. Jack, Lucy, Gary, and me. All present, all shaken. The initial shock gave way to an adrenaline-fueled need to act. We can't stay here, I said. Whatever's out there might come back. Jack, ever the pragmatist, countered. But we don't know what's out there. It's safer to stay put until dawn. Debate ensued, but the woods had another plan. That haunting scream returned, louder, closer, and more desperate. It was as if the forest itself was resonating with the agony of that cry. This time it was unmistakably clear. The sound was drawing nearer. Panic spread like wildfire. We abandoned thoughts of leaving and instead huddled together in the largest tent. Gary and Jack, gripping their makeshift weapons, took guard at the entrance, their silhouettes framed against the dim light filtering through the tent fabric. Lucy and I sat close, flashlights in hand, casting weak beams that seemed to be swallowed by the overwhelming darkness. We didn't speak. Words seemed inadequate, and the only communication was the silent exchange of glances, each one asking the same question, what is out there? Time lost its meaning. Moments stretched into hours, and each sound, each hint of movement outside, sent a fresh wave of terror coursing through us. And just when the night seemed endless, the scream echoed again, right outside our tent, its volume overpowering, its pain palpable. Then, just as suddenly, silence. Dawn felt like a distant dream, a forgotten memory of safety. The oppressive weight of the forest, the unknown entity lurking just beyond our sight, held us captive. The only certainty was our shared fear, the realization that we were trapped in a real-life nightmare, one that showed no sign of ending. Yet, even as hope dwindled, a shared resolve grew amongst us. We might be prey, but we wouldn't go down without a fight. And as the night wore on, with every shiver and every shared look of determination, our bond strengthened forged in the fires of shared terror. The first light of dawn pierced the trees, providing a meager but welcome reprieve from the suffocating darkness. With the veil of night lifted, the forest took on a different feel, a deceptive serenity masking the terror of the previous hours. I cautiously unzipped the tent, the sound almost unbearably loud in the morning stillness. 
The campsite, which had been a source of joy and anticipation just yesterday, now resembled a war zone. Overturned belongings, scattered embers of a long-extinguished fire, and our once cozy tents, now looking vulnerable and exposed. Jack emerged from another tent, rubbing his eyes but alert. We need to pack up fast. Lucy nodded in agreement, her usually radiant face drawn and pale. Let's get out of here before whatever that was comes back. Yet, as we hurriedly began to dismantle the camp, Gary's voice brought us to an abrupt stop. Guys, come see this. We gathered around where he stood, and a collective gasp escaped us. Encircling our tents was a series of symbols, intricately etched into the earth. A chilling mix of runes and patterns that seemed both archaic and menacing. The realization hit us hard. While we had huddled together in fear, something had been here, silently marking its territory, taunting us. Is this some kind of sick joke? Lucy whispered, looking at each of us, searching for an answer. But the raw fear in our eyes mirrored hers. This was no prank. We had unknowingly trespassed on hallowed or cursed ground. It's a warning, Jack murmured, tracing one of the symbols with a shaky finger. The pattern seemed to exude a cold energy, making the air around them drop several degrees. With a newfound urgency, we worked in unison, packing up our gear. Every rustle of the leaves, every chirp of a bird, made us jump. Our sanctuary had turned into a prison, and we were the hunted. As we prepared to leave, I couldn't shake off a feeling of being watched. I scanned the tree line, half expecting to see those glowing eyes again, or perhaps some shadowy figure observing us. But there was nothing, only the oppressive weight of the woods and its secrets. Gary, who had been silent for a while, suddenly spoke up, his voice laced with fear. We need to make sure we don't take any of this with us. He pointed towards the symbols, suggesting that they might somehow attach or transfer their malevolence to our belongings. Although it sounded like a stretch, none of us were in the mood to argue. We carefully checked our gear, making sure no trace of the ominous symbols came with us. The forest, once a playground, had revealed its hidden teeth, and we weren't about to take any chances. As we finally left the campsite, the forest felt different. The trees, which had stood silent sentinels during our ordeal, now whispered among themselves, as if discussing the intruders who had dared disturb their realm. Every step toward civilization was a step away from the harrowing nightmare, but the scars of the experience were indelible. The forest had shown us a glimpse of what lay beyond the known, a dark underbelly that existed alongside our everyday reality. And even as the sounds of the city grew louder, signaling our return to safety, the woods' eerie whispers seemed to follow, a reminder of the night we'd never forget. The days turned into weeks, and the city's hustle and bustle, once annoying, now felt like a comforting embrace. But the shadows of that ill-fated camping trip clung to me like a second skin, refusing to be shed. I'd taken to avoiding any semblance of wilderness, parks, Tree-lined streets and even potted plants felt like portals to that dreadful night, but it was the nights that were the worst. The veil of darkness would descend, and with it the memories would come flooding back, visceral and raw. Jack, Lucy, Gary and I had become inseparable after the incident. We met often, holding on to each other as lifelines. There was solace in shared trauma. During one such gathering, Lucy whispered what we'd all been thinking. It followed us back. We'd all felt it. The oppressive weight, the sense of being watched, the nightmares that seemed almost real. And then there were the symbols. The ones we'd found encircling our campsite had started appearing elsewhere, scribbled in the margins of a newspaper, etched faintly on a frosted window, even in the shadows cast by the evening sun. Gary, always the researcher, had dived deep into ancient texts, searching for any reference to these symbols. He'd found something. An old legend spoke of a forest spirit, neither good nor evil, but fiercely protective of its territory. Any who trespassed with ill intent or disrespected its domain would be marked. These symbols were its claim, a sign that the trespassers belonged to the forest. It says here that once marked, there's no escape. The forest will reclaim its own, Gary had said, his voice quivering. We'd scoffed, attributing our experiences to trauma and shared hallucinations, but deep down, a seed of dread had been planted. It grew with every whispered wind, every rustling leaf, and every shadow that seemed to stretch just a tad too long. One evening, 
As the sun cast its golden hue over the city, I found myself drawn to a park. The trees bathed in that golden light seemed inviting. The memories of the camping trip felt like a distant dream. Maybe it was time to face my fears. Stepping into the park, I felt an immediate chill. The world around me seemed to blur, the city sounds replaced by an eerie silence. Before me stood the forest, its trees tall and imposing, their branches stretching out like gnarled fingers. It was as if I had been transported back to that fateful night. A familiar rustling caught my attention, and I turned, half expecting to see my friends. Instead, I was met with those haunting, glowing eyes. They were not alone. All around, the forest seemed alive with similar eyes, all focused on me, their intensity unwavering. A cold wind blew, carrying with it that blood-curdling scream. But this time, it wasn't a singular scream. It was a cacophony, echoing from every corner of the forest, closing in. I tried to run, but my feet were rooted to the spot. The symbols, once outside, were now under my feet, glowing with a sinister light. They seemed to pulse, each beat drawing the eyes closer. The realization hit me with icy clarity. I was being reclaimed. As the shadows closed in, a final thought crossed my mind. We had never left the forest. We'd merely been allowed a temporary reprieve. And now, the forest with its age-old secrets was taking back what it believed was rightfully its own. From a young age, I have seen or experienced things that could be terrifying to some. When I was seven, I would stay on my grandparents' farm in Colorado, and while there, I frequently had dreams about a young boy with a brutally injured head speaking to me. When I woke up, I would swear to my parents that I saw a little boy running across the room, and I would see flashes of light across the basement where I slept. They always calmed me down, explaining that I had an active imagination and put me back to sleep. It wasn't until I was much older that my mother revealed, hoping not to scare me mindless, that a little boy had died on my grandparents' property. The interesting part is that he had died from falling off his horse and being dragged through the back pasture, his foot caught in the ropes, killed by being dragged headfirst into a rock on the ground. That was not the only incident I had that was unexplainable, but as I grew older it became challenging for me to distinguish what might be paranormal and what might just be my imagination acting up. I had nightmares constantly, two or three a night most nights. My parents slept on my floor on many occasions throughout my childhood, as my nightly terrors frequently resulted in me knocking on their door, ashamed, asking for help to make it through the night. The weird thing about these dreams, however, was that sometimes they followed me after waking up. After some dreams, I would lie in bed and feel like there was something else in the house, wandering around, it felt like whatever was in my dream piggybacked a ride into my house by using me. Over the nights, I began to put together, whether from imagination or actual experience, that when I woke up from a nightmare and sensed something in the house, they could also sense me. More importantly, I felt they wandered around with supernatural hearing, hearing every single small thing I did, sensing my every movement. I would hear a rustling down in our kitchen, so quiet that only someone awake and actively listening could catch it, and I would freeze, trying to not make a single sound to hear better. Eventually I would need to swallow, and every time I did, I noticed the movement downstairs would change. Sometimes it directly related to how many times I swallowed, as ridiculous as it sounds. I would swallow, and I would hear a footstep going up one of the stairs, swallow again, and another step was taken. Naturally, this terrified me which was part of how I ended up running to my parents' door every night. Luckily, the footsteps never really made it to the top of the stairs, and for the most part, I became used to the process. However, there was one night when everything changed, and the dream I had frightened me in a way none of my previous dreams had before. I was about eight years old at this time, and in the dream, I was standing in the living room of my grandparents' house, with my mother, sister, and father standing next to me. My grandparents were nowhere to be found, but the three of us were conversing with smiles, happy about something I was unable to put together in the haze of the dream. In the middle of saying something, my father turned and looked down the hallway from the living room where we were all standing, his smile dropping and his demeanor changing instantly. It was at this point that I noticed how dark the house was and how the end of the hallway melted into a suffocating, 
pitch black. My father remained transfixed on the end of the hallway, and I saw my mom's expression change similarly, as if they were coming to the same conclusion in their head that I was unable to attain myself. What did they know? Suddenly, my mom frantically pushed my sister and I onto the couch a few feet behind us. She handed us a pillow, and as she was talking to us, I witnessed my father begin walking down the hallway into the darkness. Hold these as tight as you can to your face and think about the funniest joke you can remember. Do not remove these pillows from your eyes no matter what. Do you understand? I recognized that she was battling to appear as if she was not worried, while still conveying an intense sense of urgency and seriousness to us. Without saying anything, I pressed the pillow against my eyes, fear beginning to swell in my stomach like a balloon. I knew something was horribly wrong, but I could not understand what. I heard my mom's footsteps softly move away from us on the carpet, towards the direction my dad had gone down. I began to see fuzzy shapes from how tightly I had my eyes forced together. The faint presence of my sister sitting on the faded leather couch a few feet to my right comforted me slightly, but it was not enough to counter the unexplainable terror that soaked me like cold water. My attention shifted as I heard the smallest commotion from the end of the hallway, not a crashing or a banging, or even a sound as loud as a normal conversation. The way I remember it, with the sound muffled by the corners of my ears being folded into the coarse pillow, was like a quiet slicing noise, like what it would sound like to cut through a ripe peach, only a little louder. What happened after this was unexplainable to me. After years of nightmares, I had developed the ability to sense when I was in a nightmare, and use that realization to calm my nerves with the rebuttal that it was all fake. In this dream, I did not feel that way. I felt a paralyzing fear, and even recognizing that I was dreaming, I knew something was different. There was a weight of dread that had never been in any of my previous dreams, something that clearly separated what was happening now from anything I had experienced. After hearing the noise and concluding in my head that the sooner I could figure out what was happening, the sooner I could wake up, I slowly removed the pillow I had been forcing against my face to reveal the room. I could still taste the leathery fabric of the pillow. The first thing I noticed was that my sister was no longer on the couch next to me. Her pillow was, but it was torn, and stuffing was falling out of it. In a normal dream, I would have found blood on the pillow, and that would have been the end of it. But this was not a normal dream, and the lack of blood or apparent horror unsettled me even more. I have never had a nightmare that has built suspense intentionally. I felt trapped in my dream, it was an inescapable prison, and my conscious mind was screaming attempting to wake up so violently that my mind was ringing, but I could not get out. How did I hear something down the hallway, but not hear my sister leave from a few feet next to me? Terror and confusion intertwined in my head as a blaring siren, indistinguishable from one another, but both begging for me to wake up. I panned over the room, from where my father had been standing to the left where the hallway he had walked down lay, meeting the corner of the living room. The next thing I noticed was how the overwhelming darkness at the end of the hallway had seeped out into the living room I was in. It reached just over the first quarter of the room, about ten feet away from where I sat on the couch. My body filling with the indescribable lead of panic, I scanned for an explanation of where my family had gone. As I finished my scan, I finally found what I had been dreading, In the darkness at the corner of the living room, buried beneath layers of black nothingness, it was hiding. I couldn't see its shape from the darkness. I had no idea what it was or how large it was. The only thing visible from the darkness was a pair of stunning bright white eyes, and a few inches beneath them, an inhuman white smile that jutted out of the darkness. The smile consisted of clearly human teeth, but was double the length of any normal person's best grin, and it leered at me smiling directly and intentionally at me across the room. It was mocking me, and it had been waiting for my eyes to find it. My heart sank, and dread swallowed me whole, and as the smile widened, I was thrust back into my bedroom, finally awake. Upon waking up, for half of a second relief relaxed me, thinking the horror was finally over. The rustling in the kitchen quickly eliminated this feeling. In tandem with the rustling, the almost instant sense that something was in my house draped over my mind. I tried to calm myself, stating that I had done this hundreds, maybe thousands of times over the past few years, and I was used to it. 
But deep down, I wasn't consoled. I was terrified. Even the presence, which I felt everywhere, was infinitely more overwhelming than any I had experienced before. The part most frightening was that I knew it sensed me. I felt it crawling around the walls of my mind, listening to me, mocking me. I tried not to swallow, but after about 20 minutes, I failed for the first time. Hyperfixing on not swallowing makes it so incredibly hard not to. You notice how dry your throat is. It feels as if it is swelling with sand. You are drowning in your own saliva, and eventually, you always fail. The normal goal for me was not to make it through the night without swallowing, though. It was only to swallow few enough times to fall back asleep, before whatever was in my house took enough gentle steps to make it to my room. I had never allowed anything into my room before, and I tried to reassure myself of that fact after my first failure. Following my swallow, the slight commotion downstairs in my kitchen stopped immediately, and there was a painful silence for a few seconds. I knew better than to be relieved, and following the few seconds of silence, there was a pounding of footsteps downstairs, as if someone was sprinting from the kitchen towards the stairs, as fast and as violently as they could. Fear crawled across my skin and down my spine, and I panicked, unsure of what to do but too paralyzed by terror to move. I envisioned the smile standing on the steps, pointing at me as if it could see me through the layers of walls. It felt like more than a vision. I knew the smile was doing exactly what I pictured. I knew it as if it were a fact. I felt it. I lay flat in bed, frozen, and listened as the stampede of footsteps stopped with the first one on the staircase. I knew when the first step had hit the staircase, as it always gave off a recognizable squeak from the old wood under the carpet. I tried to compose myself and shut my eyes, desperately trying to recite the lyrics to a song in my head, a trick I used to try and fall asleep faster and distract myself. I was much too terrified for this to work, unable to get the vision of the smile out of my mind, and after about another ten minutes, I swallowed again, furious with myself for failing. Like the first time, the house went quiet, even though there was virtually no noise in the previous minutes, as whatever was on the stairs had remained motionless since finishing its sprint. Three seconds later, I heard the staircase shake as something pounded up the stairs towards my room, the wood in the banister shaking and the steps squealing with each progression. At this point, the fear was nauseating for me. I began to feel like I was going to either throw up or pass out, and I hoped for the latter. I found myself wishing for death just to escape the feeling, but I couldn't. I couldn't do anything. I tried to weigh my options with the few minutes I had before I would fail and swallow again. I could run for my parents' door at the opposite end of the hallway, but I would go right past the top of the stairs to do so, which eliminated that option for me. My door was open, so I considered trying to shut and lock it and scream for help, but again from the top of the stairs, there was a direct line of sight into my doorway, which I could not see as my bed was tucked into the corner of the room parallel to the door. Yet this option felt vain as well. I knew there were only a few steps from the top of the stairs to my doorway, and based on the speed at which it had been moving, I knew it would reach me before I could close the door. All these options felt meaningless anyway. I was glued to my bed like a plank of wood, my legs cramping from how tightly I coiled myself every one of my muscles now painfully stiff. As the minutes went on, I realized that I was stuck, and I genuinely thought I was going to die. There was nowhere to go, nothing to do, and I couldn't fall back asleep or stop swallowing for the rest of the night. I fought as hard as I could, but after 25 painful minutes, I eventually swallowed as the rest of my body fought it, making a sort of half-swallow. There was complete silence, and I heard no footsteps for at least a few minutes. At the exact point that I began to wonder if I had survived and maybe that thing had left, my thought was interrupted by the feeling that something was in my room. It had chosen not to sprint into my room this time, but I knew it was here. I had been squeezing my eyes shut out of fear, listening intently, and had heard nothing walk towards my room and enter it. Nonetheless, I knew it was within a few feet of me, somewhere, everywhere, surrounding me and laughing at me. Again, I wished I could die to escape the fear, unable to move at all or even open my eyes. Without hearing anything out loud, I knew something was in my closet across the room. I don't know how I knew, but I did as if someone placed the thought in my head intentionally. For the same reason we can't look away from car crashes, 
With logic gone and the anticipation taking over my mind, I opened my eyes, just as I had done in the dream about an hour ago. Exactly as it was in the dream, across the room, in the endless darkness of my closet, the same pair of eyes and smile looked back at me. The smile widened, just as it did in my dream, but this time there was nowhere for me to go. I couldn't wake up like I did from my dream. Instead, I forced my eyes shut, praying to all gods that might exist to please offer me salvation from what was smiling at me across the room. I prayed and squinted my eyes shut as hard as I could, using all my willpower to not open my eyes again. There was no noise, no movement in my room, but as I lay on my left side, facing the room and the closet across from me with my eyes forced shut, something leaned over my right shoulder and exhaled a shaky warm breath into my ear. Within the first second of feeling the breath in my ear, I flew out of my bed, my leg catching on my sheets for a second before I kicked it loose. Refusing to look at my bed or the closet to my left, I tunnel visioned on my door and took off, propelled by an insurmountable amount of fear. I raced down the hallway toward my parents' room, wasting no time in shrieking as loud as I possibly could. I reached their room, banging on the door, until they opened a few seconds later, petrified that something was wrong. As you can probably expect, they checked my room, and nothing was there. Though that was the first time I encountered him, it certainly wasn't the last. That smile followed me through the next six years or so of my life, appearing randomly every few weeks or months to ruin one of my nights and reignite the fear I had of it. The dreams always started the same. I was with people I trusted, happy and having fun, and suddenly the entire mood of the dream would switch and despair would cover every surface. The people I loved and trusted would mysteriously disappear, with something always indicating that they had been killed, and at the very end of it all, hidden somewhere in my vision, was that smile leering at me from the darkness. That continued for a while until the first real relief I found was when we moved to Pennsylvania when I was 14, and I saved up and bought a cute little pug to keep me company. Rosie, my new pug, slept at the end of my bed around my foot, and since the night I bought her, my nightmares reduced by nearly half. Whether it was from the move or Rosie or both, I had a few year stretch where I didn't see the smiling thing, and I finally thought I shook it. It took me a little while to realize that maybe I didn't. When I was at the end of my senior year of high school, now 18 years old, I slept over at my closest friend's house on the last weekend before graduation. Having smile-free dreams for years now, the thought of the man reappearing never even crossed my mind. In a way, he didn't reappear for me. I just found it strange that the following morning, while we were eating breakfast, my closest friend Charlie mentioned that he had the worst dream of his life the night before. Still suspecting nothing, I asked what happened and felt the dread creep back into my body as he mentioned his dream. He had been with his family at an amusement park and then his family had disappeared. Following that, he had been looking around and found a roller coaster that was going with only one person on it. He said that the person on it was flailing around with a huge smile on their face, and it was the only thing he could see from where he was at. Yeah, that does sound scary, I told him the conclusion of his story, trying to mask my own fear. No, no, you don't get it, he insisted, now way more serious than he had been before. That wasn't the scary part. The scary part was when I saw it when I woke up. I was now too scared to want to hear more details and wanted to move on. I'm sorry, Charlie, that sounds freaky, but I am glad it's gone now. It probably was just your imagination messing with you, I consoled, hoping to convince him. He shook off the fear, trying to regain his normally humorous and unconcerned mood. I don't know, man. I'm just glad it wasn't looking at me. He chuckled nervously. I stopped in the middle of my walk to his kitchen sink, with the dirty cereal bowl in my hand. Wait, what? What do you mean? What do you mean it wasn't looking at you? I felt my heart picking up pace, my nerves were on end, and I began to feel like I was being watched. No man, it wasn't looking at me thankfully. I thought it was looking at you. The eyes were looking to the left of me, down where you were, and the smile kept like getting wider and narrower in the same pattern of your breathing. It would like widen every time you inhaled, and then get smaller when you exhaled again. My heart was bursting through my chest at this point, and I didn't feel safe in his house. Why would you not wake me up? Why didn't you shake me or something? I questioned, the panic beginning to come off like irritation. I'm sorry, man. 
I scooted forward to reach out and touch you, but as I was reaching out, I looked to the doorway again, and it was gone. I just figured it was tweaking out like you said. Why does it matter? He questioned, apologetically. It doesn't. That's a creepy dream, though. I reverted, trying to downplay it. I left his house that day terrified to go to bed at night, convinced that the smile would visit me as soon as my eyes closed. Luckily, though, he didn't. I never fully understood why. A few years later, I went to college and met someone in my hallway whose family friend was apparently a psychic. My college friend knew a little of my history after asking one time why I was so tired, and I briefly explained that I had multiple nightmares a night. She recommended I visit this psychic, and curious for myself, I obliged. When I met with her, I explained everything weird that had happened to me, cynically, noting how I didn't really believe in any of it, and knew it was just my imagination. She met with me for free as a friend, so I felt fairly convinced she wasn't playing anything up for money. After hearing my story, she said she suspected, among other things, I had an ability to dead talk, simply just meaning that those who have died could communicate with me. She said most of the time their communication is unintelligible, and they only really try to show me feelings. Most of the spirits that are strong enough to appear in a dream or make a noise in my house were spirits that were traumatically trapped, whether it be from a painful death or something along those lines. Thus, when they tried to converse with me, it often came across as fear, confusion, and anger, explaining how they concocted nightmares for me every night with little tie to my life. When I went into detail about the smiling thing, I could tell she was a little bit more uncomfortable, and I almost got the sense she was trying to relax me the same way I had tried to relax my friend Charlie, without letting him know the full story. She essentially said that if something terrible had been following me for a few years, I had somehow found a way to force it out. Except, if it was still appearing to those that slept near me because apparently sleep was its way in, it was never fully gone. Instead of having free reign in my head, torturing me whenever it wanted, I had unintentionally created a barrier that prevented it from reaching my dreams, according to her. I thanked the psychic lady for meeting with me, unsure of what to make of her information, and continued with my life. About six months later, in the summer after my freshman year of college, the next incident occurred. My girlfriend, who I had been dating for a year, was over at my house one afternoon, while my father and mother were home as well, working. My sister was living in Colorado, having moved there during college. My girlfriend was taking a nap in my bed while I was working on my computer to the right of the bed. My mom and I had planned to go to Lowe's. I was going to buy her some flowers and plant them for her as part of her Mother's Day gift. My father tagged along, and I left my girlfriend, not wanting to disturb her. I sent her a little text saying we would be back in an hour or two in case she woke up and headed out. Thirty minutes later, I was in Lowe's when I got a call from her. I picked up and stepped to a side aisle while my mom continued looking at flowers and was bombarded by her, blurting out words in a frenzy. She was clearly upset and was choking out sentences between flowing tears. Eventually, she was able to calm down enough to get out a few broken sentences. I just had the worst dream of my life. Can you please get back home? I really need you. Yeah, yeah, I will be home in maybe 30 minutes or so. Can you make it that long? I was looking for my mom to get an estimate of what flowers she still wanted to look at, calculating in my head how quickly I could be home. No, I think I'm just going to go home. I don't really want to be here right now, she responded, improving slightly from her last sentences. Okay, okay, I'll stop by your house when I am done. Please get home safe and we can talk later. I wasn't too worried about the drive because she was literally one street away from her house, but I was still concerned about her. When I stopped at her house an hour later, she was still visibly upset, but obviously much more put together than she had been before. She was reluctant to talk about it, but I finally was able to coax her into telling me what happened. She informed me that she was in a dream where she was standing in my driveway, with me next to her, and we were laughing while talking about something. She said it looked like a pretty day, and it was a nice dream. There were lots of birds flying around, and she was happy. Well, I was happy, and then everything changed really fast, she explained. The birds that were flying through the air froze in place, and I turned to ask you what was happening, and you were laughing at me, and then you were just gone. I grabbed her hand and looked at her intently, pushing her on without saying anything. 
So I was turning around and trying to look through all of these frozen birds, and then the day felt a lot worse. I felt like it was the worst day of my life, even though nothing had happened, and it felt so dark. This fit the formula so far, so I was pretty convinced it was him. Sure enough, she continued, I walked out into the street in front of your house looking for you, and I just felt like something horrible was next to me. I felt like something terrible was looking at me and I couldn't find it. I did circles around the street with all those birds frozen everywhere around me, and then I saw this thing on the roof of your house. Just by saying that, she clearly grew more upset and tears welled up in her eyes. Bursting with fear and anticipation now, I squeezed her hand and asked what it was she saw. Well, it was like a bird, but a lot bigger. It covered the entire roof, and it was lying flat on it, not standing up, she continued, fighting back tears. It had a long neck that was missing feathers, so it was all red and bloody, and the worst part is that its neck was all twisted and broken, so its head was completely upside down, while the rest of its body was lying flat on the roof. Any doubt that I had left was eliminated, and she confirmed my suspicion. But its head wasn't normal. It had these huge human teeth, and it was smiling at me with its upside-down face from the roof, and I swear it was looking directly at me. Now that I had all the information, or at least I thought I did, I shifted into comforting mode instead of interrogation, reaching forward to try and rub her arm and begin working on making her feel better. She winced back, though, and continued talking. No, I'm not done. I kept trying to wake up after that thing was grinning at me, and I couldn't wake up. I was trying so hard to get out and there was nothing I could do. I just felt stuck. And then I did wake up, but not because I wanted to because there was something tapping me on the shoulder. It was at this point that she began to burst into tears again, overwhelmingly upset from the recollection of the feeling. Something w was tapping me, and then I rolled over because I thought it was you napping with me. But it wasn't you. There was something just smiling at me an inch from my face. Her voice picked up, and she began to lose control of herself. I tried my best to help her as she finished. It was smiling at me, right next to me, and I saw its finger still poking out. She was now standing, pointing her shaking finger at me to display what she saw. The smiling man had never gotten that close to me, so at that point, I was beginning to panic as well but I didn't want to make her feel worse, so I did my best to hide it. What happened after that, I asked, my voice shaking for the first time. I jumped out of the bed and it was gone. She was incredulous, and I could tell she was worried about what I thought of her. I grabbed her and held her, not asking anything else while my mind raced through what to do. I had never told her about the smiling man, and there was no way that many coincidences could line up. When I returned home later that day, as it was getting late, I noticed that my room felt particularly uninviting. This could have been a placebo from the story, but the room seemed to hold hostage, an all-too-familiar sense of dread. I slowly cased my room, not sure what I was looking for, but unsure of what else to do. I eventually gave up, thinking that I was going to have to sleep in my bed at some point. So it might as well be tonight. I was thinking about how scary it was that this smiling thing appeared in the sunny hours of the day, for the first time ever when I felt my leg brush against something. I reached down under the blankets, pushing my precious Rosie a little to the side to see what I had felt. What I pulled out from under the blankets made my heart drop again. In my bed was a large bird feather, one about four times the size of a crow feather, but of similar color. There was no blood on the feather, no smile, no other message, but it was enough. I knew what he was saying. After years of searching for a way in, a way to finally get close enough to impact me physically, he had done it. This all brings me to today, about a week after I discovered the feather, and my girlfriend experienced the terror I grew up with. I began writing this yesterday afternoon, and I have not slept since. The night after finding the feather, and every once since then, I have seen him in my dreams. When I woke up, the past few days at least, I have not seen anything. It was almost worse, not being able to see the smile somewhere in my room. I feel his presence. The helplessness looms over me as I sit paralyzed in my bed every night, waiting for him to finally appear. At this point, I am confident this is all part of his game. Years of interacting with him have shown me how clever, 
and more accurately, evil the smiling man is. Whether he gains something from it, or just does it because he enjoys it, he will bleed out my fear until it is impossible to live with, and I feel like I would tear off my own skin just to escape. Even worse, he is smart about the way he appears, and does it almost insultingly, as if to add emphasis to how powerless I am. For example, the birds my girlfriend saw in her dream were all mourning doves. Birds that I had told her a few weeks before gave me comfort and made me feel safe because I grew up with them. I find it no coincidence those were the same birds in her dream. He mocks me in every little detail, dragging out the torture. Now I don't even need to be sleeping to sense him arrive. Even in the middle of a warm summer day, I notice something watching me while I'm out mowing lawns. The trees sway in the wind, and I catch the silhouette of something behind the leaves every few seconds. I never can find him, but I know exactly when he appears, feeling the cold seep into my skin. I put up with it for a few days, but concluded that if he was this powerful while I was awake, the next time I slept would be the last for me. Thus, that is why I haven't slept in a day, and that is why I have begun writing this as both a coping mechanism for what I believe is my final day alive, and hopefully a warning to anyone else. You may be wondering why I am giving up so easily, why I am not going to a priest, or calling anyone, or trying to stay near my family. The simple answer is, I don't think it will matter. He clearly has found a way into the minds of any of my friends or family just from sleeping in the same room as me, and now that he is apparently more alive than ever before, I don't know what sanctuary anyone could provide from me. In fact, they would probably just be eliminating themselves as well. As far as a priest or supernatural help goes, I did try. I called the psychic lady I talked to a few days ago, and clearly sensing my panic, she tried to reason out with me what was going on. A few minutes into our call, I began to feel like I had someone I could rely on for support. Yet, while detailing which crystals to buy, she concluded her recommendations by saying, in the end, you know it won't really matter anyways. He is already there. He is all around you, watching and laughing, and no crystal will be able to stop him. Can't you see me right now? The switch to first person at the end of the sentence paired with the lowering of the voice into a deep, guttural octave, confirmed to me that I was not talking to the psychic lady over the phone. I did not know if I ever had been. That's my entire point. I don't know what is real or what is a game anymore. His real form is so well shrouded by layers of false security that reaching out for help only stresses me out more. I would prefer to just die than to be built up and let down repeatedly. My eyes are watering typing this, and I feel the exhaustion beginning to catch up to me. However, I have one last act of defiance, residing in the plate of sleeping pills I have resting on my bedside table. Or maybe that is exactly what he wants. Either way, I don't care. I am tired of being terrified. As I type this, it grows later into the nighttime, and I feel his presence waiting for the right time to begin the show. Panic is bubbling in my gut slowly, and though I am tired, my mind still provides me no peace from the fear. Right on cue, I hear a pan drop in my kitchen downstairs, shocking me and making me jump from where I am sitting on my bed. My mind pumps adrenaline, and I am painfully aware that this time he has a lot more capabilities than just a breath in my ear. My typing is speeding up, and as I am finishing the sentence, he is already on the first step toward my room. I heard the squeak. His steps are slow and intentional, different than the first time I met him. Now he is at the top of the stairs, pacing towards my room. My parents sleep blissfully, and my girlfriend one neighborhood over. They all have no help to give. There is nothing more dangerous than being the last person awake in the house. There is a quiet, gentle knock on my door. Three slow, intentional knocks. I feel the smile through the door as if the door is not even there and I am looking right at it. My muscles tense and I feel thrown back in time to the days of paralyzing fear in my younger days. Rosie, the last shred of comfort these last few days, looks up and tilts her head at the door, her ears raised. Tears are welling in my eyes, hopelessness battling fear to be the victor of my emotions. My attention shifts as I hear my closet doors rattle with three gentle drawn out knocks. I see the doors rustle over the top of the laptop I am typing on. I have closed it anticipating in the night's past he might try to make an appearance there. Nonetheless, he smiles at me through the closet, and my shaking hands take a few tries to spit out each of these sentences. 
I don't want to waste any time waiting for the sleeping pills to kick in, so I grab the plate next to me and get down as many as I can. Ironic that a few years ago I would fight so hard to not swallow in the presence of this smile, and now I do it as a form of escape. The pills are down, and I can only hope for them to kick in quicker. The window on the left side of my room has the blinds open. How could I have forgotten that? In my peripheral vision, as I continue to type, I see two bright white shapes stab through the darkness of the night sky, dropping down slowly from the top of the window. I refuse to look at the window, knowing as the third, wider white shape lowers over the window, it is him, smiling upside down. I live on the second floor of my house. A shadow extends over the white shapes, reaching down towards the bottom of my window. I see a dark movement of what I can assume to be a hand, reach forward and exert three knocks, all of which are substantially more intense than the past ones, though they are delivered at the same slow, intentional cadence. I see the triangular smile widen after the third knock finishes. The fear-induced nausea ignites in my stomach, and dread drops like a kettlebell in my stomach, weighing me down against the bed. It takes all my willpower to not look out of the window. I turn to my right, blocking the window out of sight. There are three more knocks on the door to my room and my closet at the same time. I want to scream and run and cry and go faster. I want to do anything to remove myself from where I am right now. Something is scratching on the other side of the wall to the right of my bed, and I feel the smile a mere two feet away from me, separated only by a thin layer of plaster looking directly at me. Rosie jumps off my bed and is now in the center of the room, turning to track all the knocks across my doors, walls, and now the tapping on the window as well. He is begging me to look at him, to see the smile. I know he is, but I won't. My mind keeps reiterating that my parents are only a couple of steps away, down one hallway, and that I can make it somehow. But the pills are already down, and at this point, I don't know if I want to continue on. I sympathize with the survival instinct periodically giving me desperate pushes to do something, knowing it will not win tonight. Suddenly the noise stops, all at once, and I freeze. I hear my heart pounding, and my mind races through instances of our interactions. I remember the first time I recognized this silence before he began sprinting across the first floor of my house, the first night I met him. This is not a good silence. The noise may have stopped, but the weight of all the smiles around the room has not. This is his final act, and he mocks me before eliminating me. I am frozen in place, my heart beats erratic and loud. I focus on Rosie in the middle of the room, refusing to give him what he wants. My beautiful, perfect pug is the only thing I will devote my attention to. I feel his smile waiting for me from every corner, and I feel my stomach climbing into my throat, my vision getting blurry. I will myself to go faster. I focus on the details of Rosie's fur, the patterns I have grown up identifying, and try to find the memories I have with her from the depths of my fear-scattered mind. I study her floppy ears and the back of her head as she continues to watch my door. I love her more than anything, and my heart sinks as her head begins to turn, her body not turning with it. Her head rotates, her neck creaking as it turns towards me while the rest of her face doesn't, her poor smushed nose replaced by a smile that wraps around nearly half of her entire head, filled with human teeth that gleam at me. Alright, so this is going to be a pretty long story, but bear with me. I did change names for privacy. Also, fun fact, this story doubles as the tale of how I met my fiancé, but let's move on. So, this entire ordeal took place around August 2017, when I was 16 years old. A couple of months before, at the beginning of summer break, my mom unfortunately lost her battle with breast cancer. I'm an only child, so growing up I was really close to my mom. She also had a wonderful marriage with my dad. After she passed away, both dad and I were absolutely wrecked by the loss. Sure, we'd had some time to brace ourselves. Her health had been slowly deteriorating for quite a while but that didn't make it any less excruciating when the day finally came. Once mom's funeral wrapped up, dad and I stayed cooped up at home pretty much every day for a while. Having just wrapped up my sophomore year in high school, I only had a small circle of friends, 
who I gradually started ignoring over the summer months. During those days, Dad and I barely spoke to each other. There was this crazy tension between us that we couldn't shake, even though neither of us really made any effort to talk through it all either. About two weeks in, Dad gradually returned to work while I remained isolated in the sanctuary of my bedroom. As summer vacation drew to a close, Dad began to grow increasingly concerned about my reclusive tendencies. After all, who wouldn't grow worried seeing their child spend their days locked away in their room? His only reprieves from his concern were when my door would creak open for chores, mealtime, or the bathroom. In an attempt to help us reconnect, Dad suggested a good old camping trip, something our family had always loved doing together. I decided to give it a shot, figuring it'd be nothing more than a night or two at our usual wilderness retreat. We lived in the Pacific Northwest, which was abundant with beautiful camping spots. In fact, our go-to option wasn't too far from home. And so, on a sunny afternoon, we departed around noon and arrived at our beloved campground around two in the afternoon. Like clockwork, we rolled into our regular camping spot as we had so many times before. However, before settling down for the night, we had to check in at a quaint ranger cabin where you paid $10 to park your car. Our campsite was nestled about 600 feet away, and though it wasn't located right beside the lake, its close proximity made for an enjoyable experience nonetheless. For context, the campground featured campsites situated quite close to each other, with only a sparse line of trees separating each one. You could easily spot cars and large tents through these thinly spread trees. When we arrived, we noticed the adjacent campsite was already occupied by an RV, much to my dad's dismay, as they tended to play music and be noisier at night. The campground sits right by a vast lake, which served as our primary source of food due to the abundance of fish. Consequently, we didn't need to pack much food for the trip. A short distance away, across the road and down a slightly rocky decline, there was a small pebble beach that granted full access to the lake, you could even catch a glimpse of the water from our campsite. Strolling down the shoreline would reveal more charming pebble bays. In fact, whenever my parents swam in the past, they preferred to choose a secluded pebble bay free from crowds for their dip. I've personally had an aversion to large bodies of water and swimming ever since I can remember. Sometime around five in the afternoon, my dad and I headed down to the main pebble beach. Its descent was fairly steep and scattered with rocks that could easily trip someone up and cause scrapes and bruises. We managed to catch three fish before scaling the incline back towards our campsite. Once there, my dad asked if I could gut and fillet the fish, a task I agreed to take on. The knife I used turned out to be sharper than I anticipated and accidentally sliced into my lower palm. Unfortunately, we hadn't packed any bandages or other first aid supplies. Reluctant to ask our RV neighbors for medical supplies due to my anxiety-riddled teenage self, my dad stepped up and went over to seek their assistance. As it turns out, an older couple was staying at the RV site, and they couldn't have been more gracious. After handing my dad an entire box of band-aids, they claimed to have too many, I tended to my wound and tried to put the incident behind me. The rest of the evening followed a rather uneventful but pleasant script. We enjoyed our meal and played poker for a few hours before calling it a night. The next morning, I didn't wake up quite as early as my dad did. When I emerged from the tent, I found him cooking up some potatoes and bacon on a griddle over the fire. He was engaged in conversation with the friendly elderly couple we'd met the previous day, along with a boy who seemed to be around my age and was busy typing on his phone. Following an initially awkward introduction, I discovered that this boy, let's call him Lee, was staying with his grandparents at the campsite. As we all sat down to enjoy breakfast together, Lee and I struck up a conversation. He turned out to be pretty funny. We spent the entire morning together, and at some point, my dad mentioned how great it was for me to have a new friend. To be honest, it annoyed me a bit, more embarrassment than anything, so I decided to take some distance from my dad and asked Lee if he'd like to catch bass for lunch. He was up for it, so we grabbed our fishing gear and followed the same short trail we had taken the day before to reach the rocky bay. When we arrived, we noticed other families enjoying themselves, swimming and playing. There was this one kid with his sister, I assume, building a rock tower, the kind that people use as trail markers. 
We fished for approximately an hour with me doing most of the work, as Lee had never fished before. We managed to catch two fish, not much, but enough for lunch. As we left the area, the siblings were still working on their rock tower. It wasn't huge or anything, but about three feet tall, made out of large rocks that would stand sturdily against the wind. After hiking back up, we continued chilling together for a few more hours. Around eight in the evening, Lee asked if I'd like to go swimming during sunset. Truthfully, I was scared of swimming in that lake, but didn't want to pass up on hanging out with him any longer, so I agreed. We put on our swimsuits and brought along t-shirts to keep warm after leaving the water. I also brought my pack of cigs and lighter, mostly to impress Lee. As we headed off on our little adventure, my dad was relaxing on a towel near the fireplace engrossed in a book. I let him know that we were going for a swim at the bay and would be back in about an hour or so. He advised us to be careful and enjoy our time. By this point it was beginning to get darker, but it was still light enough for us to see our path and directions. The forest, however, was turning into a blend of shadows and mystery. We followed the exact same trail we'd taken before to reach the beach. Upon reaching the beach, I glanced to my left and noticed the rock tower from earlier had vanished without a trace. There were no rocks piled up in that spot. The ground lay flat as if there had never been a tower. Someone must have scattered the rocks haphazardly. Both Lee and I saw this anomaly, but remained silent regarding the toppled tower. We hung out at the main beach for a short while, and then it struck me that I could show off to Lee with my cool little cigarettes. But I didn't want my dad to find out so I suggested we go to a more secluded beach nearby. Lee agreed and we strolled along the shore for about 100 feet. Although the campgrounds were never more than 1,000 feet away during our walk, navigating the somewhat steep bank proved slightly challenging. Eventually we discovered a smaller beach surrounded by a dense forest. Cutting through the woods would mean crossing roughly 300 feet before reaching a campsite. I was confident about our location and knew we wouldn't get lost. At the secluded beach, I took out my cigs, lit one up, and passed it to Lee. We chatted for about 20 minutes as he took a drag and I tried my best not to cough, an attempt to appear cool. Afterward, I left the lighter and cig carton on a rock next to both our shirts. By this time, darkness was settling in, making it difficult to see the stars. The eerie lake was formed over an abandoned town, a fact that has always terrified me, and still does. So when Lee enthusiastically removed his shirt and jumped into the water for a swim, I hesitated, but eventually joined him, despite the water being way too cold. We swam for roughly half an hour before boredom started kicking in. When we climbed out of the water, our shirts had vanished. Strangely enough, my cigs and lighter were still there. We hadn't noticed anyone nearby while swimming and there was no wind either. Just like that, our shirts were gone. Desperation prompted us to search using only the dim light of my lighter, but we found nothing. Then we heard it, an odd, deafening groan that didn't resemble any bird or bobcat I knew. It was more akin to a guttural scream, unlike the familiar cougar cries some people would attribute such sounds to. Lee and I were petrified, and without a second thought, we sprinted along the beach with the frightful noise growing louder. Visibility was minimal at this point. We relied on the faint starlight to illuminate the ground. As we reached the main beach, all seemed as we'd left it earlier. Out of breath, we raced up the incline towards our campsite, which should have been merely 400 feet away since we had sprinted roughly 600 feet from where we were swimming. The sound, or growl, was so intense that I was sure everyone in the camp would hear it. Yet, Lee and I remained silent as we rushed up the slope, continuously glancing back to ensure nothing was chasing us but we didn't see anything throughout our nerve-wracking escape. After both of us painstakingly climbed the hill, scraping our hands and knees on the rocks, we sprinted towards the campsite. I'm certain we didn't make any wrong turns. Despite running about 600 feet, the camp just wasn't there. We found ourselves in the heart of the forest, surrounded by trees with soft ground beneath us, as though it hadn't been tread on for ages. I could hear Lee sobbing, and I was on the verge of tears myself. The mysterious figure or creature behind us kept getting louder or closer, so we dashed away from the ominous sounds as far as our legs could carry us. Lee trailed right behind me, hoping I knew an alternate route back to camp. As the grunts closed in on us, I fought the urge to glance back, 
knowing that doing so would have caused me to collide with a tree at our breakneck pace. We continued running until the eerie sounds faded into the distance. Exhausted, cold, and drenched in sweat, we stopped to catch our breaths and leaned against a tree for support. Neither of us spoke, too frightened to make even the slightest noise that might attract whatever was pursuing us. We remained in place until we could no longer hear those menacing groans. At that moment, it hit us that we were just two shirtless teenagers sitting in the middle of the woods, crying our eyes out and looking utterly maniacal. Finding ourselves too drained to run any further, we began walking with weary steps. Whispering softly to each other, we confirmed that neither of us knew what had transpired or where on earth we were. We must have strolled for roughly an hour when it occurred to us that it was likely around 10.30 at night or later. Overwhelmed with fear, yet determined to return to camp or find some helpful souls nearby. Having walked at least three miles by then, we spotted a road in the distance and followed it until we stumbled upon a ranger station. Though empty, I quickly realized it was the very station where we paid entry fees for the camp. Located on the opposite side of the lake, we decided to rest there for a bit. Then, I escorted Lee back to our campsite. Upon our return, everything appeared unaltered. The fire still crackled where my dad had been sitting. Lee clung closely to my arm as we approached our campsite. Getting closer, I saw my dad in the exact same spot he'd been when we left, with his book still open on his lap. Since it wasn't particularly long, I figured he should have finished reading by now. As soon as he saw us, his shocked expression startled me. I assumed it was due to our odd entry route, but what he said next will forever be etched in my memory, and I despise it so deeply. Are you back so soon? Have you even gone in yet? I was on the verge of losing it. He informed us that it was merely nine and we had only been gone for about 30 minutes. I attempted to describe the bizarre events that had transpired, but I abandoned my efforts after asking if he had heard anything peculiar. He stared at us as if we had lost our minds. There was no way I could sleep in the tent, wanting to be as far away from the ground and the forest as possible. Thankfully, Lee suggested that we both sleep in the RV's fold-out bed. The following morning, we awoke and discussed everything none of which made any logical sense. Our memories of the prior night were identical. After having breakfast together, we proceeded to pack up our separate campsites around 11 a.m. We exchanged phone numbers and bid each other farewell. To this day, my father remains skeptical about our experience that night. As for Lee and me, we have since become engaged and frequently reminisce about what might have transpired during those mysterious hours. Upon returning home, I made sure to write everything down in a journal which I've consulted while writing this account to ensure it remains consistent over time. It's still unclear what happened on that unforgettable night, but all I know is that we're never going back. I'd always been an avid explorer. Being able to uncover history, as inconsequential as it may be, was the best feeling in the world. I had spent plenty of time exploring abandoned parks and buildings around my city. My house was on the outskirts of town, bordering a massive forest. I went for hikes every once in a while to clear my head. Usually I would choose a different path each time. That was until I found a small wooden cabin that had clearly been abandoned. The door was missing, the wood was rotting and it was overgrown. The first time I stumbled upon it I was unprepared. Usually I carried a knife and some pepper spray with me when I explored these places, just for my own protection. You never know who might be hiding in there. I didn't have any of it with me that day though, since I hadn't planned on anything more than a short walk. Besides, I hate to admit it, but something about that cabin shook me. As soon as I laid eyes on it, my heart beat faster than it ever had before. My whole body was jittery, so I left. I went back home and tried to forget about it, but I didn't forget about it. The next few days, I couldn't focus on my work. I couldn't do anything. My mind was consumed with the thoughts of what could possibly be in there. Soon, the thoughts took over my sleep. At first, I dreamt about the cabin, but would wake up in a cold sweat before I could step inside. Then the thoughts progressed to the point where I was unable to sleep at all. Exactly a week after first discovering the cabin, I decided it was the day. I was going to finally see for myself what was hiding in there. With the knife and pepper spray safely tucked away in my belt, I set off on my journey, 
retracing my steps from seven days before. My pulse rose higher and higher as I got close to the cabin. When I finally saw it again, it appeared exactly as it had on my previous visit. I walked in through the empty doorway. The floorboards made loud creaks with every step. The first room was completely empty. An orange glow shone through a door on my right that was hanging on by one hinge. My palms covered in sweat, I pushed the door aside. The source of the glow was a set of five identical candles sitting upright on the floor. It's a miracle this place hasn't burnt down, I thought to myself. One by one, I picked up the candles and blew them out. As I was about to put out the last one, something red on the wall caught my eye. I raised the candle near the wall, using the light to inspect further. Written on the wall, over and over again, was a name. Peter Sherrill, my name. The candle slipped through my fingers and fell onto the floor, but I no longer needed it. Even without the light, I could now clearly see my own name written in blood on every inch of this room's walls. I instinctively stomped out the fire on the floor, still processing what I had just seen. My whole body shook as though there was an earthquake. My knees gave out, and I fell harder than I'd ever fallen before. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, repeating forever in my head. Tears fell from my eyes as I struggled to comprehend the meaning of this cabin. When I finally regained the strength to stand, I tried to walk out of the cabin, to leave it behind, to pretend this never happened. But something in my own head told me that, no, I had to stay. There was more to this place than just the writing. There was something else that I needed to see. Maybe it was my own instinct. Maybe it was some mysterious force that science can't explain. Whatever it was, it was convincing enough that I turned around and went further into the house. At the back of the cabin, there was a staircase heading down. I didn't know where it led, but again, something in my own head told me to continue. So I did, further and further down. The staircase was now made entirely of stone and lit by torches on the walls. When I arrived at the bottom, I was met with laughter. A man stood ahead of me with his back turned. He had long hair that clearly hadn't been cared for in years. He was thin and decrepit. I stood frozen in place, even as every natural instinct in my mind was telling me to run. The man turned around. What I saw, standing directly in front of me, was my own face, my own body, me. The only difference was that he was clearly older by a few years. But his eyes, his nose, everything, he was absolutely unmistakably me. I stood in place, jaw dropped, for what seemed to be an eternity. How is this possible? The sound of my heartbeat echoed through my entire body, drowning out everything else. The ground felt uneven, and the basement began to spin around me. My vision started to fade. It was only when I noticed the knife in his hand that my mind snapped out of its broken state, and my body allowed me to move. I had to act fast, so what were my options? I could have stayed put, but this person, or this thing that was imitating me, showed no signs of being peaceful. I could have run, but what if he caught up to me? With my mind clouded by panic, I could only think of one other viable choice. I quickly unclipped the pepper spray from my belt and squirted it directly into his eyes. Into my eyes. I had half expected it to hurt myself as well, but it didn't. The older version of me covered his face and stumbled backwards. I had an opportunity and pounced, drawing my knife and piercing his chest. He almost immediately fell to the ground, limp. After taking his knife and my own, I ran back up the stairs, horrified by what I had just done. After contemplating my options, I decided I couldn't risk leaving the cabin. I had just committed a murder, even if there was no reasonable explanation for the existence of the person I had eliminated. I had to stay in hiding. A knot tightened in my stomach as I realized I would have to take care of the body, just to be safe. The cabin was secluded, but it was still too conspicuous if someone did find it. When night fell, I dragged the body all the way out of the cabin and into the woods, trying not to throw up. I went deeper into the woods, ensuring nobody would ever find it. I walked with the body of my older self for a couple of hours. As it turned out, there was one more surprise in store for me that night. I stopped in my tracks when I realized I was walking toward a seemingly endless series of deep holes in the ground. A shovel lay in front of my feet. I let go of the body as I went to investigate. I peered over the edge of one of the holes, my breath hastening, as my new greatest fear showed up in front of my eyes. Another version of myself was lying dead in the hole. It was a gravesite. 
Running from one grave to another, it was repeatedly confirmed that this was a gravesite entirely populated by dead versions of myself. My body, my thoughts, my feelings, all went numb. I stopped thinking. I did the only thing I could do. I picked up the shovel and dug another grave. Immediately after tossing the body in, I began my multiple hour walk back to the cabin, back to my new home. That brings me to the present. I'm sitting in the middle of the cabin, typing this out on my phone that's almost dead as a cry for help. In the days following my discovery of the cabin's secret, my mental state went from numbness to horrified understanding. I fear I may be stuck here until a younger me comes to take my place. Even worse, I fear that new versions of me are continuously cursed to fulfill this disgusting prophecy for all of eternity. Just yesterday, I returned to the room that had my name covering its walls, only to find one more piece of writing hidden amongst the names. The cabin must always have a resident. Today is my birthday. I'm spending my birthday with my father. Since my mother is out of town on a business trip, I had to spend my birthday with my father alone. My father is a very relaxed person. He is calm and collected and enjoys time hunting. I decided that I wanted to go on a hunting trip. I only went with him once when I was little. He seemed pretty surprised, considering I spent much time at home building small wooden projects. It was going to be my first time hunting with a rifle, so my father had to get me prepared. My father took some time teaching me how to hold my rifle. It was really heavy on my arms. My body also fell with it as it fell into my arms. Considering that I am only 15 years old and never had any experience outside my home away from my crafts. He had a couple of rules that were pretty understanding, but the last one kind of shook me a bit. He told me, if you ever hear me say your name, it isn't me. He said that in a joking tone, but I could tell he was being serious at the same time. He never called me by my name. He always told me, anyone can know your name, but not everyone can know your nickname. It was getting cooler outside, coming down to around 3 in the afternoon. Since my father lives out near some woods, it wasn't too far of a walk for us. He obviously saw me as tired, so he looked around for a point where we could relax and hunt in place. Over an hour has passed and nothing came around. My father told me, I'm going to go take a walk around Dev, as his patience was coming to a stop. I decided I was going to stay. I felt secure and all of our stuff was here. Neither did I feel like carrying everything on my back again. I nodded as he headed into the forest, hearing all of the noises of the forest around me. I was understandably scared, knowing this is one of my first times in the forest. I heard twigs snap all around me, clutching my rifle as I was shaking sitting on this log. After a while of waiting around, I decided it was best to meet up with my father. Heading into the same direction as him, I was still a bit shaken. My rifle was the only thing keeping me from running away. Seeing my father a few more minutes following the same path, I slowly crept up on him and said, Dad, are you alright? He turned his head to me, looking a bit frightened, with lost color on his face. My father never gets scared like this even when he told me about his past hunting experiences. I was asking what was wrong and then we heard it. Devin, I was hit with an immediate sense of danger. A wave of fear hit me that I've never felt before. I wanted to throw up in fear. My father grabbed his rifle and rested it on the rock. He whispered to me, can you see anything? I calmed down and lifted my head up, trying to be as quiet as possible. I looked up, trying to let my eyes focus considering the circumstances. As my eyes started to focus, I saw a man, but not a man. His body was disfigured, not seeming to look like a normal human. I couldn't really seem to make out much more. We were about 40 to 50 yards out. My dad told me, whatever that is, it isn't human. My father seemed like he was going to break down in fear, but he held his composure for me. We need to leave now, Dev. He slowly lifted his rifle up and turned around, trying not to make a noise as we were going to head back. He couldn't catch his footing and slipped. The noise caught the creature's attention, who was still yelling my name, seeming more desperate and louder. I was watching it closely, still not being able to make out its face or anything. Squinting more and more, I saw it. It turned its face to me. My body was telling me to get out of there now, but I was frozen with fear. I waited for my father to go farther down, as he is heavier than me, 
so I can move faster and quieter than he can. It fled behind a tree out of my vision, which signaled us to run. I swung my body out of its frozen state. I said in a hurry, Run! My father left me in a full-on sprint, following behind him. My gun fell from me, and I know it was my only protection. I needed to stop to grab it. When I was looking up after grabbing my rifle, it was around 20 feet away from me and could make it out now. The figure was tall with very lengthy arms, with hind legs as a dog but much longer. It was a darkish brown color with its head shaped like a human but it's not normal. The creature's face looked more human-like. It stared at me saying Devon over and over in a comforting tone. I tried to lift my rifle up and shoot but it was faster. It flew its body at me covering a heavy pace. I was standing 30 yards away. My father took a shot from afar, yelling at me to get out of there, pumped with adrenaline and fear. My body was in overdrive. I ran so fast it felt like I was slipping on ice, running past my father. After it felt like ages, I made it to the rest point. Too scared to know what happened to my father, I held the rest point, not knowing whether my father made it. As quick as worry and sadness started to fill my body, it was soon at ease when my father appeared only moments after me. He was limping, seeming to be having a tussle with whatever that creature was. We packed in a hurry, knowing it could return whenever it wanted. We were taking a fast pace back to our house. Not looking back, we breathed heavily, having our first near-death experience in the woods. My mom was home looking worried as we headed into the house. Because we had been gone for over two to three hours, it took us another 45 minutes to make it back home. My father and I headed back in. We both sighed as mom was cooking dinner for the both of us. I heard the phone ring from the living room. It was pretty late at night, so my father told me to go check who it was as he walked into the bathroom to clean himself up. When I got to the phone, it was a voice message from over 15 minutes ago. Hi Dev, sorry I missed your birthday. My flight got delayed and I won't return till tomorrow. I love you. I hope you get this message today since I know your dad wants to take you hunting all day. The caller ID was mom. My body was frozen, scared even to move. As I slowly put the phone down, I could hear my mother's voice from behind me in a comforting tone. Devin, dinner is ready. The high peaks of the Rockies always did look like a siren call to me. From my childhood bedroom window in Montana, I'd stare at those distant blue silhouettes, crafting tales of adventure. During a Sunday afternoon matinee, while engrossed in the movie Wild, my old dreams reignited. Reese Witherspoon's gritty journey on the Pacific Crest Trail spoke to the very depths of my wanderlust. As the end credits rolled and the theater lights came up, I decided then and there that I'd tread that same path all by myself. Weeks were spent buried in maps, trail logs, and weather charts. I transitioned my daily runs into long hikes, training my body for the upcoming journey. The local outdoor supply store became my second home. The young cashier, Mike, with freckles scattered across his nose, knew me by name. Getting ready for a big adventure, ma'am? He'd ask each time I came in for yet another piece of equipment. Campo, California, the starting point of my adventure, greeted me with a dry warmth. The arid air, filled with the scent of wild sage, was nothing like the crisp mountain air I was accustomed to. At the start, the PCT sign faded, worn by the elements and the touch of countless hikers before me. I couldn't help but run my fingers over it, wondering about the stories of those who'd come before. On the morning of April 30th, I tightened the straps of my backpack, took a deep breath, and started my solo hike, my steps echoing my heart's fervent beat. The trail was both my challenge and my refuge. The first day was grueling, the desert, with its vast stretches of golden sand and sporadic shrubs, didn't offer much reprieve. Yet as the sun lowered in the sky, casting long spindly shadows, the horizon transformed into a canvas of oranges, purples, and deep blues. By dusk, I'd covered 25 miles. My body ached, but my spirit soared. The days melded into one another, each sunrise heralding new terrains, encounters, and challenges. Sometimes the trail was a straight, arduous path. At other times, it meandered through the landscapes, playfully hiding behind rocks or dipping suddenly into valleys. But it wasn't all breathtaking views and mesmerizing sunsets. The desert had a dual nature. 
It was as perilous as it was beautiful. While lost in my thoughts one afternoon, a soft rattle pulled me back to reality. Just a few feet ahead, a rattlesnake sunned itself. Realizing how close I'd come to stepping on it sent chills down my spine. Nature's warning was clear. While she could be a comforting mother, she wouldn't think twice before revealing her fierce, wild side. As I set up camp each evening, the solitude began to sink in. It was just me, the vast open trail, and the stories it whispered through rustling leaves and distant animal calls. My dreams were now a reality and more challenging than I'd imagined. But with every mile, I felt more alive, more connected to the raw, untouched world around me. The trail tested my limits and gave me insights into its intricate secrets. It was a journey of self-discovery, understanding the world and finding my place in it. Kennedy Meadows, often hailed as a hiker's paradise, appeared before me as a patch of green amidst the starkness. Tired, dusty, and grateful for some semblance of civilization, I made my way there, feeling every bit like a cowboy returning from a cattle drive, seeking rest and refuge. The first thing that struck me about the meadows was the laughter. Other hikers, some lounging, others animatedly sharing stories, brought an unexpected yet welcome sense of camaraderie. We were all, in our own ways, explorers of the vast expanse that was the PCET. Different beginnings and reasons, but the same path had brought us together. I met Dan, a middle-aged man with laugh lines crinkling around his eyes. Over shared cans of beans, he told me about how he was hiking the trail in memory of his late wife. They'd always planned on doing it together. Then there was Lucy, barely out of her teens, taking a gap year to figure things out. Every face and every story added layers to my journey. The few days I'd intended to spend became a blur of storytelling sessions, group meals, and stargazing. The skies at Kennedy Meadows were a thing of wonder. As night descended, the stars came alive, scattered across the inky black like a handful of diamonds, their brilliance reflected in the eyes of fellow dreamers below. As the days unfolded, though, that eerie feeling of being watched, which I'd managed to suppress amidst the company, started to crawl back. It was an itch between my shoulder blades, a constant sense of someone just out of sight. Maybe it was other hikers' tales of strange encounters or wildlife on the trail. Perhaps it was my own mind playing tricks. But at night, nestled in my tent, every rustle of the wind, every distant footstep seemed amplified. Lucy approached me on my last night as the campfire's flames dwindled and conversations lulled. Her usually vibrant eyes seemed shadowed. You ever get the feeling, she whispered, her voice barely audible over the crackling embers, that you're not alone on this trail? I swallowed, my earlier apprehensions suddenly validated. Sometimes, I admitted, but I tell myself it's just the wild playing tricks on me. Lucy glanced around nervously. I thought so too, but last night, just outside my tent, I heard something, a voice. And not just any voice. It sounded like my mother. She looked away. But my mother's been gone for five years. The weight of her confession hung heavily between us. We both knew the wilderness could be deceiving. But this? This was something else. Promising to stay alert and to check in with each other when we could, we parted ways for the night. As I slipped into my tent, the unease was palpable. As lively and communal as they were, the meadows held secrets whispered tales that perhaps weren't just tales after all. The morning sun brought a new resolve. I packed up, said my goodbyes, and returned to the trail. The vastness awaited, and so did its mysteries. While I was more determined than ever to conquer the PCT, I couldn't shake off the feeling that the trail, in its silent, watchful way, was slowly pulling me into its enigmatic embrace. The sweeping vistas of Yosemite felt like they'd been ripped right from the pages of a storybook. Towering granite cliffs gave way to lush meadows, and roaring waterfalls provided a musical backdrop to my every step. But even nature's majesty couldn't deter the unease in my bones. Each sunrise brought a fresh start, and the hope that the unsettling feelings from Kennedy Meadows would fade. But as the sun journeyed across the sky, the sensation of being watched grew more robust. The whispering wind seemed to carry murmurs, and the rustling leaves seemed to conceal whispers. On one of these sunlit mornings, while refilling my canteen from a stream, I first spotted the figure, a vague silhouette on a ridge, stark against the morning sky. 
Squinting, I tried to make out details, but it remained indistinct, like a smudged charcoal drawing. Shaking my head, I continued my hike, trying to chalk it up to fatigue or a trick of the light. But the sensation persisted. Glances over my shoulder, straining ears for footsteps, and double-checking my tent zippers became habitual. One evening, while making my way towards a marked campsite, a sense of urgency propelled me forward. My trusty GPS showed the camp was just a short distance away. The promise of the company seemed like a beacon. Breaking through a thicket, I was met with a welcome sight. Tents of various sizes dotting the clearing and the gentle hum of fellow hikers sharing their day's experiences. Safety, I thought, was in numbers. Eagerly setting up my tent amongst the others, I shared a meal with a couple from Colorado. Their easygoing nature and the light-hearted conversation made the shadowed figure seem like a distant memory. But as night crept in, casting long, dancing shadows from the campfire, the sense of foreboding returned tenfold. Sometime around eleven, at night, nestled in my sleeping bag, I jolted awake to a sound that sent chills down my spine. My name was being called out from the darkness in a voice I couldn't quite place, an eerily familiar voice, yet distorted, like a warped recording. Kim. Kim. For a moment I lay paralyzed, doubting my senses. But when it came again closer this time, terror gripped me. Who was it? What did they want? I remembered Lucy's words from Kennedy Meadows and shuddered. Was I, too, hearing the voices of long-lost loved ones? The night seemed to stretch endlessly, every sound amplified in the haunting silence. Morning couldn't come soon enough. The campsite stirred to life, with hikers preparing for another day on the trail. But I felt like a shell, the previous night's experience casting a long, cold shadow over my spirit. Sitting by the campfire remnants, Dan from Kennedy Meadows approached, concern evident in his gaze. Rough night? He inquired gently. I hesitated, then spilled the events of the night. To my surprise, Dan nodded slowly. You're not the first and won't be the last. This trail, as beautiful as it is, holds many mysteries. His words, while comforting, held a warning. Whatever was out there was very accurate, and it seemed it had its eyes set on me. The trail ahead seemed to stretch endlessly, its undulating path framed by the towering pines and broken only by the odd outcropping of rocks. The sheer vastness of the PCT never ceased to amaze me, but it also held a sense of isolation that was both overwhelming and eerie. A misstep on a loose stone brought a sharp, searing pain to my ankle. I crumpled, a curse escaping my lips. Panic, immediate and pressing, welled up as I realized the gravity of the situation. Alone, miles from any town, and now with a potentially sprained ankle. After a moment of collected thought and testing, I realized it wasn't broken, but walking on would be a painful endeavor. A nearby campsite indicated on my GPS became my immediate target. Using my hiking stick as a crutch, I hobbled along, the pain a constant reminder of my vulnerability. Setting up camp took longer than usual, but once inside my tent, the weariness of the situation settled in. An early dinner was followed by a deep, albeit uneasy, slumber. The darkness outside seemed oppressive when I was jolted awake. An unnatural silence had settled as if the forest was holding its breath. Then, I heard it. The voice, more insistent this time. Please help me, Kim, it pleaded, over and over in rapid succession, echoing in the stillness of the night. My blood turned cold. As familiar as it was strange, the voice seemed to be right outside my tent. Armed with only my flashlight and a steely resolve, I decided I had to know. I slowly began to unzip my tent, the sound deafening in the silence. Just as the flap opened, a chilling scream cut through the night. Heart racing, I shone the flashlight in its direction, and my breath caught. A figure, humanoid but devoid of apparent features, stood at the edge of the campsite. Its silhouette was stark against the night sky. Challenging my fear, I shouted, Who are you? To my horror, it responded with my question, Who are you? Its tone was mocking a nightmarish echo. The figure began to circle my tent, its movements erratic. Every instinct screamed at me to run, but my injury and the unsettling presence outside trapped me. Hours felt like days until finally, dawn began to break. The figure had vanished when the sun's first rays filtered through the trees. 
but a closer look around my campsite revealed a terrifying sight. Distinctly non-human footprints circled my tent. The raw reality of the night's events sunk in, leaving me trembling. Mustering all my strength, I packed up, using the daylight to my advantage. Each step was a painful reminder, but the need to distance myself from the sight drove me forward. I was determined to reach the nearest town, to seek solace in civilization, and perhaps find an answer to the enigmatic presence that seemed determined to shadow my journey. The quaint town that nestled at the foot of the mountain range offered more than just a break from the wilderness. It promised safety. At least that's what I had hoped. My ankle, wrapped tightly, was healing, but the emotional scars of the last few days seemed rawer than ever. While recuperating, I dived into local legends and folklore, seeking explanations for the haunting events on the PCT. Nights were spent poring over old texts, and days were filled with conversations with locals, many of whom regarded me with pity and wariness. Two names repeatedly emerged from the shadows of these tales, skinwalkers and wendigos, creatures that could mimic voices, stalk silently, and instill sheer terror in their victims. Though I pride myself on being a skeptic, the stories hit too close to home. A local old Mrs. Thatcher whispered a chilling addition, taunts they've marked you, these beings never truly let go. Regardless, after a week in town, and with a renewed determination, I made my way back to the trail. Canada was the goal, and I wasn't about to let legends or my fears deter me. The days blurred together, but an uneasiness persisted. It was as if the very air around me had grown dense. Every rustle, every distant sound seemed to whisper threats. But I pressed on, grit and resolve my constant companions. However, as the days turned to nights and the wilderness swallowed me whole, that nagging sensation of being watched and followed became undeniable. Campfires, usually a source of comfort, seemed to cast more shadows than light, each dancing menacingly in my vision's periphery. Then one evening, as the fiery hues of sunset gave way to the creeping blues and blacks of night, the voice returned. It wasn't outside my tent or off in the distance. It was right by my ear, intimate and terrifying. Kim, it breathed, a chilling parody of familiarity. The fabric of my tent seemed to pulse with the voice, the thin nylon offering no protection from whatever lurked mere inches away. The night was agonizingly long. Every fiber remained alert, waiting for an attack that never came. By dawn, my nerves were frayed, exhaustion weighing me down. The last stretch of the trail before reaching Canada was, ironically, one of the most beautiful. Dense forests opened up to sweeping views of pristine lakes, the horizon a tantalizing promise of the end. Yet, as I took those final steps, completing my long journey, the elation I had expected was overshadowed by dread. Standing there, marking the end of the PCT, was the silhouette that had haunted my journey. As the wind picked up, it seemed to dissolve into the breeze, but not before leaving behind a chilling message. You may leave the trail, Kim, the voice echoed, but the trail will never leave you. The vast Canadian wilderness stretched ahead, inviting and menacing all at once. I realized then that some journeys have no true end, and some shadows, no matter how fast you run, cling to you forever. I pulled my truck off the dirt road and into the dense woods of East Tennessee. The leaves crunched under the tires as I maneuvered through the winding path, the forest towering on either side of me. It was a place of legends, of stories whispered around campfires and shared among locals. A place where reality and myth blurred, and the line between fact and fiction was as thin as the mist that hung in the air. I had spent most of my life dismissing those stories, chalking them up to the overactive imaginations of people who spent too much time in the woods. But something had changed. The stories had taken root in my mind, growing like an obsession I couldn't shake. So here I was, a park ranger in this vast wilderness, fueled by curiosity and a desire to uncover the truth behind the legends. My particular fascination was with the Dogman, a cryptid that resembled a humanoid dog. I had read the accounts, heard the eyewitness testimonies, and seen the grainy photographs that were said to be evidence of its existence. It was a creature that shouldn't exist, that defied the laws of nature and reason, and yet the stories persisted. 
As I parked the truck and stepped out, the forest embraced me. The air was crisp, carrying the scent of pine and damp earth. The sun filtered through the canopy above, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. I should have felt at peace, surrounded by the beauty of nature, but a sense of unease gnawed at the edges of my consciousness. I adjusted the brim of my hat and shouldered my backpack, the weight of it a reassuring presence. The trails stretched out before me like winding veins leading to the heart of the wilderness. I took a deep breath and began my hike, my footsteps blending with the rustling leaves and the distant chirping of birds. The wind whispered through the trees, carrying the faintest hint of something otherworldly. It was as if the forest held its secrets close, revealing them only to those who dared to seek them. I walked for hours, the rhythm of my steps a comforting cadence. When the sun began its descent, I was in a secluded clearing. The light filtered through the trees, painting the ground with patches of gold. I settled down on a fallen log, my thoughts drifting as I gazed at the beauty surrounding me. And then, a sound cut through the stillness. A faint rustling, like the cautious footsteps of an unseen creature. My senses went on high alert, every muscle in my body tensing. I slowly stood up, my hand instinctively moving to the holster at my hip. The rustling grew louder and closer. I scanned the trees, my heart pounding in my chest. And then, I saw it. A movement in the underbrush, a flash of fur and shadow. My breath caught as I caught a glimpse of something that shouldn't be there, and defied explanation. A creature emerged from the shadows, its form a grotesque blend of man and beast. Its eyes gleamed in the dim light, fixed on me with an unsettling intensity. It was like nothing I had ever seen, a creature from the realm of nightmares. Fear surged through me, a primal instinct that demanded flight, but I stood my ground, my fingers tightening around the grip of my gun. The creature recoiled from the light, emitting a low growl that sent a shiver down my spine. I could feel its menace and otherness as if it existed on a plane separate from ours. Without thinking, I raised my gun and fired. The shot echoed through the woods, a loud sound that reverberated in my ears. The creature roared, a sound that seemed to come from the depths of hell itself. And then, it turned and fled, disappearing into the forest's darkness. I stood there, my heart racing, my ears ringing from the gunshot. The clearing was silent once more. The only evidence of the encounter was the faint smell of gunpowder in the air. I took a deep breath, my hands trembling as I lowered the gun. The legends had become a reality, the stories given form. I had come face to face with the unknown, the unimaginable. As the sun sank below the horizon, casting the woods into shadow, I knew that I had stepped into a world where the line between reality and myth was as thin as the mist that hung in the air. The distress call came in on a crisp autumn day, cutting through the forest's quiet like a sharp blade. The woman's voice trembled with worry and fear as she recounted the details of her family's disappearance. Husband, son, and brother-in-law, all gone during what should have been a routine fishing trip to Fontana Lake. I listened intently, my fingers tightening on the steering wheel of my truck as I jotted down their descriptions and the last known location. The woman's desperation was palpable, her words carrying the weight of a nightmare that had come to life. As a park ranger, it was my duty to respond and bring my training and experience to bear on such situations. But this was different. This was personal. The stories of the cryptids that haunted these woods had taken root in my mind, fueling an obsession that drove me to become a part of this wilderness. The Dog Man, a creature that defied logic and reason, had become more than just a legend to me. It had become a challenge, a puzzle I was determined to solve. As I navigated the winding roads leading to Fontana Lake, I couldn't shake the unease that hung in the air. The forest surrounded me, a sea of towering trees and hidden secrets. The mist clung to the underbrush, obscuring the path ahead and lending an eerie quality to the landscape. I parked the truck near the lake's edge and stepped out, the chill of the air seeping through my jacket. The water lapped gently at the shore, a mirror of gray and blue that held its mysteries beneath the surface. I glanced around, my senses on high alert, as I prepared to embark on a search mission that could lead to answers, or something far more sinister. I followed the clues and tracks left by the missing trio, my footsteps mingling with theirs as I ventured deeper into the wilderness. The forest seemed to close around me, 
the trees casting long shadows that whispered secrets in the darkness. The leaves rustled with anticipation, as if the woods held their breath, waiting for me to uncover the truth. I found signs of a struggle at the campsite, torn tents and drops of blood that painted a grim picture. A diary left behind by the missing hiker's son chronicled the events that had unfolded during the ill-fated trip. As I read the entries, a chill crept down my spine, a feeling that the line between reality and myth was again blurring. The diary's pages were filled with fear and desperation, the son's words conveying the terror of a family's encounter with a creature that defied belief. Curious sounds in the woods had escalated into terrifying encounters with a monstrous dogman-like being. The creature's eerie roars and relentless pursuit painted a portrait of a nightmare that refused to end. As I read, a sense of foreboding settled over me, the weight of the unknown pressing down my chest. The hiker's words were a chilling reminder that the legends were more than just stories. They were warnings, cautionary tales of the dangers that lurked in the shadows. The sun began to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows stretching like grasping fingers. The forest grew darker, the rustling leaves carrying whispers of something watching, waiting. I closed the diary with a sense of dread, a feeling that I was on the cusp of uncovering a terrifying and inexplicable truth. The night was settling in, the air growing colder as I returned to the truck. The woods felt different now, charged with an energy that was both electrifying and dangerous. The cryptid that had once been the stuff of legends had become a tangible presence, a threat that I could no longer dismiss. As I drove back through the winding roads, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The woods seemed to close around me, their secrets hidden in the shadows. The stories of the dogman had taken on a new significance, their warnings echoing in my mind as I navigated the darkness. As I approached the cabin where the hiker's family awaited news, I felt dread. The unknown entity that haunted their trip was no longer just a legend. It was a reality I had to face head on. As I stepped out of the truck, the weight of that reality pressed down on me, a reminder that the line between fact and fiction was as thin as the mist in the air. I followed the trail deeper into the woods, each step filled with determination and apprehension. The clues I'd gathered had led me to the ominous Wolf Creek area, a place that seemed to hold secrets in every shadow. The forest canopy above cast dappled sunlight on the ground, creating a mosaic of light and darkness that danced with my every movement. As I ventured deeper into the woods, the air grew calmer, and I felt uneasy. The tension was palpable, like a tight string ready to snap. Every rustle of leaves and a whisper of wind seemed to carry a hidden meaning, a warning that I was not alone in this place. The path ahead was uneven and littered with fallen leaves, making each step a careful negotiation. I moved silently, my senses on high alert, straining to catch any hint of movement or sound. The eerie quiet of the forest was broken only by the occasional chirp of a distant bird or the rustle of a small animal in the underbrush. I rounded a bend in the trail and came upon a clearing, the remnants of a campsite scattered haphazardly across the ground. Torn tents flapped in the breeze, and drops of dried blood marked the earth like a gruesome trail of breadcrumbs. The scene painted a vivid picture of struggle and chaos, leaving no doubt that something terrible had happened here. I knelt to examine the ground, my fingers brushing over the leaves and dirt as I searched for more clues. The soil was disturbed, footprints marring its surface in a pattern that spoke of urgency and fear. I followed the tracks with a growing sense of trepidation, the realization sinking that the missing trio had encountered something far more sinister than a simple camping mishap. The sun was beginning to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows, stretching like the fingers of the unknown. The forest seemed to close in around me, the trees leaning in as if to whisper their secrets. I stood up, my heart pounding, and took a deep breath. There was no turning back now. I was committed to following this trail to its end, no matter how harrowing that journey might become. A glint of metal caught my eye, and I moved toward it, my boots crunching softly on the forest floor. There, partially buried beneath a layer of leaves, was a diary. I carefully retrieved it, the pages worn and weathered from the elements. As I flipped through the entries, the story of the hiker's son began to unfold, a tale of terror and survival in the face of the unknown. 
The words on the page vividly depicted a fishing trip gone wrong. Curious sounds in the woods had escalated into bone-chilling encounters with a creature that defied explanation. The diary chronicled the family's attempts to evade the creature's relentless pursuit, capturing the fear and desperation that had become their constant companions. As I read, a shiver ran down my spine, and I looked up to the surrounding woods with a renewed sense of caution. The creature the hiker's family had described was no mere legend. It was real and here, lurking in the shadows. The air grew colder, and the rustling leaves seemed to whisper its presence, a reminder that danger was never far away. With the diary in hand, I followed the trail, the urgency growing with each step. The woods had taken on an otherworldly quality, the fading light casting long, twisted shadows that seemed to reach out for me. The forest was alive with unseen eyes, and I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. As I pressed on, I couldn't ignore the gnawing sensation that I was entering a realm where reality and myth converged. The creature described in the diary was no longer a figment of imagination. It was a genuine threat, lurking in the darkness, waiting to reveal itself. As I delved deeper into the woods, the line between fact and fiction blurred, leaving me to confront the unknown with each step I took. The woods had a way of swallowing sound, leaving only the distant call of a bird and the soft rustle of leaves underfoot. The crisp air carried a faint scent of pine, a reminder that nature's grip was unrelenting even in the face of the unknown. I followed the trail of clues more profound into the heart of the wilderness. My senses heightened and every nerve on edge. The signs of struggle grew more pronounced as I moved forward. Torn tents, scattered belongings, and the telltale drops of dried blood that marked the passage of something violent and predatory. I knelt by the bloodstains, a chill crawling down my spine as I tried to piece together what had transpired in this desolate clearing. The scent of iron lingered in the air, a haunting reminder that danger was closer than I dared imagine. As I stood up, I was drawn to a piece of paper caught on a branch, its edges weathered and frayed. Carefully, I reached for the paper, unfolding it to reveal a handwritten note, a letter of goodbye addressed to loved ones, and penned with a trembling hand. My heart sank as I read the words, each sentence a testament to the hiker's fear and desperation. They spoke of a creature beyond reckoning that defied the laws of nature and sent shivers down the spine of anyone who encountered it. The hiker's tale unfolded with each line, a harrowing account of strange sounds in the woods, escalating into terrifying encounters with a creature that could only be described as a nightmare given form. The words spoke of its haunting roars, and the primal fear that gripped them as they fled through the darkened forest, pursued by an entity that seemed more animal than human. As I read, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was standing on the precipice of something ancient and evil, a force that had existed long before my time and would persist long after I was gone. The woods held secrets, and this creature was one of its darkest mysteries. I folded the letter and tucked it into my pocket, a sad reminder of the lives this creature had disrupted and the terror it had wrought. The sun began its descent, casting long shadows stretching across the forest floor. Time was slipping away, and I knew I had to continue my journey before darkness descended and the creature's reign of terror began anew. The thick canopy above obscured the path before me, and I moved forward with cautious steps. The woods seemed to close around me, the trees leaning in as if whispering their own tales of fear and survival. Every crackle of a twig underfoot and every rustling leaf made my heart pounding, a constant reminder that danger could strike any moment. The air grew calmer, and I felt uneasy as I ventured deeper into the woods. Each shadow held a hint of movement, each rustle of leaves a potential threat. I was no longer a mere observer. I was a part of this landscape, a player in a game where the rules were dictated by the creature that haunted these woods. As the light dimmed, I could feel the weight of the unknown pressing down on me. The hiker's diary entries echoed in my mind, their words painting a picture of relentless pursuit and unending fear. I pressed on, my determination unwavering, my senses alert to every environmental shift. The trail led me further into the forest's heart, where the darkness seemed to converge and the trees loomed like ancient sentinels guarding their secrets. I knew that I was closing in on the source of the hiker's terror, 
that soon I would come face to face with the creature that had haunted their nightmares. My flashlight cut through the darkness, casting a narrow beam of light that danced over the trees and underbrush. Every shadow seemed to twist and writhe, taking on a life of its own. The air was heavy with anticipation, the stillness broken only by the distant call of an owl. And then, in the distance, a sound, a low growl, like a warning whispered by the very woods themselves. I tightened my grip on my flashlight and moved forward, guided by a mixture of determination and dread. The subsequent encounter with the creature was inevitable, and I knew that this time there would be no turning back. The night had settled around me, the forest alive with the symphony of unseen creatures. The moonlight filtered through the canopy in scattered patches, casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. Every rustle of leaves, every distant hoot of an owl seemed to amplify the tension in the air. My footsteps were careful and deliberate as I navigated the unfamiliar terrain. The hiker's diary had guided me this far, leading me deeper into the heart of the woods where the creature's presence was most pronounced. The drops of blood were my breadcrumbs, marking a path of fear and desperation. The trail led me further into the woods, where the trees seemed to close around me like silent sentinels. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that unseen eyes followed my every move. I gripped my flashlight and my gun, my senses on high alert. The diary entries had grown increasingly ominous, the hikers' words reflecting their growing terror. They described a creature that defied the laws of nature, a monstrous being that hunted with relentless determination. The woods themselves had become a prison, each step fraught with the possibility of a deadly encounter. I paused to catch my breath, my eyes scanning the darkness for movement. The only sound was the faint rustling of leaves, the forest holding its breath in anticipation. The diary's words echoed in my mind, a chilling reminder that the creature's pursuit had been unrelenting. The following entry was a jumble of frantic sentences, the hiker's handwriting growing shakier as they recounted their narrow escape from the creature's clutches. It had been a battle of survival, a clash between predator and prey that had left its mark on both. The diary's pages were stained with blood, a testament to the violence that had unfolded in these woods. The hiker's words described the creature's roars, reverberating through the forest like a primal cry. It reminded me that I was not alone in these woods. The beast was lurking in the shadows, waiting for its chance to strike. As I read on, the sense of dread grew. The hiker's entries had become more sporadic, their words a testament to their waning hope. They spoke of exhaustion and despair, of being driven to the brink of madness by the relentless pursuit of the creature. The forest had become a labyrinth of fear, each step taken with trepidation. I continued down the trail, each footfall echoing in the silence. The air was heavy with the weight of the unknown, the darkness a canvas for the creature's evil presence. My flashlight cut through the blackness, revealing the twisted underbrush and gnarled trees that seemed to hold their secrets. And then, a sound, a low growl that seemed to emanate from the depths of the woods. I froze, my heart pounding as I scanned the darkness for movement. A rustling of leaves followed the growl, a chilling reminder that the creature was near. I raised my gun, my grip steady despite the adrenaline coursing through my veins. The creature was out there, watching, waiting. I knew that this encounter was inevitable, that the darkness held the promise of a deadly confrontation. As I moved forward, every sense on high alert, I couldn't shake the feeling that the woods were alive with anticipation. The hiker's diary had led me to this moment of truth, where I would finally come face to face with the creature that had haunted their nightmares. The forest seemed to close around me, the trees becoming a labyrinth of shadows and uncertainty. I moved forward cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the darkness like a beacon of defiance. The growls grew louder and closer, and I felt the weight of the creature's gaze upon me with every step. I raised my flashlight, the light beam revealing the creature's monstrous form. It stood before me, a twisted hybrid of human and beast, its eyes glowing with an otherworldly intensity. Its roars echoed through the forest, a primal challenge that sent shivers down my spine. I tightened my grip on the gun, my heart pounding as the creature advanced. This was the moment I had been preparing for, the climax of a battle brewing in the depths of the woods. 
The air was charged with tension, the darkness alive with the promise of violence. I took a deep breath, my finger poised on the trigger. The creature's roars reverberated in my ears, drowning out the sounds of the forest. And then, with a surge of determination, I squeezed the trigger, unleashing a barrage of gunfire that echoed through the night. The creature staggered, its form illuminated by the flashes of my gun. It was a moment frozen in time, a clash of predator and prey that held the fate of the woods in its balance. I fired shot after shot, each bullet finding its mark, until finally, with a guttural roar, the creature fell to the ground. The forest fell silent, the gunfire echoes replaced by the rustling of leaves in the wind. I stood there, chest heaving, my gun still raised, as I stared at the fallen creature. Its once menacing form now lay motionless, a testament to the human spirit's capacity for survival. As I approached the creature's lifeless body, I felt a mixture of triumph and sorrow. The battle was over, the darkness had been defeated, but the woods would forever bear the scars of its presence. I looked around, the moonlight casting an ethereal glow over the forest that had been the backdrop of this harrowing journey. The woods held secrets, secrets that I had uncovered in the course of my investigation. But as I looked at the fallen creature before me, I couldn't help but wonder if more mysteries were lurking in the shadows, waiting to be revealed. The cabin's warm light spilled into the fog-covered landscape, casting an eerie glow that danced on the mist. The hiker's family gathered around the fireplace, their faces etched with relief and grief. I stood in the doorway, my heart heavy as I watched the emotional reunion. The woman embraced her son, tears streaming down her face as she held him close. The man clapped me on the shoulder, gratitude in his eyes. The hiker's son looked at me, his expression mixed with sorrow and curiosity. Thank you, the man said, his voice choked with emotion. You brought us closure. I nodded, my gaze lingering on the family. It was a bittersweet moment, a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there was still a glimmer of hope to hold on to. As the family shared their memories and stories, I excused myself and stepped outside. The fog had settled in even thicker, the landscape shrouded in a suffocating blanket of white. I took a deep breath, the air cool against my skin as I gazed into the night. The woods were silent, the forest wrapped in an unsettling stillness. The moon hung low in the sky, its pale light barely piercing through the fog. I felt a chill run down my spine, a sense of unease that I couldn't shake. I had taken care of the creature and defeated the threat plaguing these woods. But as I stood there, a nagging doubt gnawed at the edges of my mind. Had I ended the nightmare, or was something more lurking in the shadows? A rustling of leaves broke the silence, my instincts kicking in as I turned toward the sound. My hand instinctively moved to my gun, my heart racing as I scanned the fog-shrouded landscape. The mist seemed to move and shift, taking on a life of its own. And then, emerging from the fog, a figure materialized. It was a silhouette, a monstrous shape that sent a jolt of fear through my veins. The moonlight caught its eyes, casting an otherworldly glow that seemed to pierce through the darkness. I raised my gun, my fingers trembling as I aimed at the figure. But the creature didn't move. It stood there, its eyes locked onto mine. The silence was deafening, the tension in the air suffocating. I squeezed the trigger, the gunshot echoing through the night as the bullet hit its mark. The creature staggered, its form illuminated by the flash of gunfire. But then, to my horror, it didn't fall. It simply straightened, its eyes glowing with an intensity that defied comprehension. A primal fear gripped me, realizing that I had underestimated the darkness in these woods. The creature took a step forward, its movements deliberate and unhurried. It was a dance of predator and prey, a deadly game that had just begun. I fired repeatedly, each shot hitting its mark, but the creature remained unfazed. Its eyes bore into mine, a chilling reminder that I was no longer the hunter, but the hunted. The gunshots punctuated the silence, the fog closing around us like a shroud. I turned and ran, my heart pounding as I plunged into the woods. The branches clawed at my skin, the underbrush a maze of darkness that threatened to swallow me whole. Every rustle of leaves and every twig snap sent a shiver down my spine, a reminder that the creature was still out there, still hunting. My breath came in ragged gasps, my footsteps echoing in the darkness. The fog enveloped me, 
The world was reduced to shadows and uncertainty. I knew that I was no match for the creature, that its evil presence was an unstoppable force, and as I ran, I couldn't escape the feeling that the woods themselves were alive with its presence, that every rustle of leaves, every gust of wind was a taunt, a reminder that I was never truly alone. I stumbled through the underbrush, my heart pounding as I realized there was no escape. The creature was out there, in the fog, its eyes watching, its presence a constant threat. The darkness had consumed me, and there was no way out. As I ran, a chilling thought gripped me, a realization that the creature was not simply a monster, but a manifestation of the primal fears that lurked within us all. It was a reminder that in the heart of the woods, in the depths of the unknown, there were forces beyond our understanding that could not be defeated. And then, with a bone-chilling howl, the creature emerged from the fog, its eyes glowing with a hunger that sent a shiver down my spine. It was a dance of predator and prey, a battle for survival that had only begun. As its form closed in on me, the darkness consumed everything, leaving only the echoes of my screams in its wake. The air was crisp, and the autumn leaves crunched under our feet as Sarah and I ventured into the dense wood behind our small town of Harrow's Edge. The day I had begun innocently enough, with me suggesting a walk motivated by more than just the pleasure of nature, I had hoped to find a moment alone with Sarah, maybe steal a kiss. The thrill of possibility tingled in my chest, making me feel alive in a way I hadn't felt in years. We laughed and talked the forest's embrace drawing us further from the familiar paths and into the wilderness. It was a connection, a moment of shared discovery I hadn't anticipated, but something I eagerly welcomed. Then, as the shadows lengthened and the sun descended, we realized we were lost. Panic set in slowly like a rising tide. Our laughter died, replaced by worried glances and urgent whispers. Once a place of wonder and connection, the forest became a labyrinth, its twisted paths leading us further into uncertainty. And then we heard it, a soft rustle, barely perceptible, like the distant whisper of wind through the leaves. We stopped, straining our ears, looking around but seeing nothing. What was that? Sarah asked, her voice barely above a whisper. I don't know, I replied, my heart pounding. We continued, our pace quickened, and the conversation stilled. The rustling followed us growing louder, more insistent and invisible. The forest seemed to close around us, the trees leaning in, gnarled branches like skeletal fingers reaching us. The fear grew, an unspoken dread that gnawed at our insides. We were not alone. Something was following us, something unseen, something hungry. We stumbled upon a clearing, our breaths ragged, our faces pale. The rustling had stopped, but the silence was even more terrifying. It was the quiet of anticipation, the hush before a storm. What is it, Matt? Sarah's eyes were wide, her face pale. What's following us? I don't know, I admitted, my voice cracking. But we need to keep moving. The forest seemed to mock us, its paths leading us in circles, the shadows growing more profound, the temperature dropping. Our shared adventure had become a nightmare, and the terror was palpable. The rustling returned, closer now, more pronounced. It was not the sound of an animal. It was something else, something unnatural. A chill ran down my spine and I knew in my bones that we were being hunted. We ran. The forest became a blur, our breaths ragged, our hearts pounding. The rustling followed us, relentless, closing in, a predator stalking its prey. Time lost meaning as we stumbled through the darkness, guided only by instinct and fear. The world narrowed to the sound of our breath, the beat of our hearts and the rustling that followed us, ever present, ever hungry. Finally, we stumbled upon an old cabin hidden deep within the forest, a relic of a forgotten time. Its windows were broken, its door hanging ajar, but it offered the promise of shelter. We rushed inside, barricading the door, our bodies trembling, our minds numb. The cabin was cold and dark, filled with the musty smell of decay, but it was a refuge from the horror that lurked outside. We huddled together, listening to the silence, waiting for the rustling to return, but it never did. Hours passed, the terror subsiding, replaced by exhaustion. We were safe, for now, but the nightmare was far from over, for we were lost. 
trapped in a forest that had become a maze, hunted by something we could not see or understand. And as I looked into Sarah's eyes, I knew our journey had only begun. The forest had taken us, drawn us into its dark embrace, and it was not done with us yet. The kiss, the connection, the innocent adventure had turned into something else, something darker, something that would change us forever. The night wore on, every sound amplified by the silence, every creak of the old cabin a sinister whisper. Sarah and I huddled together, our bodies racked with fear, our minds haunted by the unknown terror outside. Sleep was impossible. We were prisoners of our dread, trapped in a never-ending nightmare. Finally, as the first rays of dawn began to pierce the gloom, we ventured outside. The forest was still, its silence no longer a comfort but a threat. The rustling was gone, but the terror remained, a shadow hanging over us, a chill in our bones. We stumbled on, guided by some primal instinct drawn deeper into the forest's dark heart. Our senses were heightened, our nerves frayed, every snap of a twig a warning, every gust of wind a taunt. And then, just when we thought we were free, the rustling returned. This time it was different, more pronounced, more menacing. It was no longer just a sound. It was a presence, a dark force that lurked just beyond our sight, stalking us, toying with us. We ran, our terror fueling us, our bodies propelled by pure fear. The forest became a maze, its paths twisted, its trees gnarled, its shadows alive. The rustling followed us, relentless, closing in, a predator playing with its prey. We were no longer lost. We were hunted. We stumbled upon a cliff, our way blocked, our escape cut off. The rustling was all around us, a cacophony of terror, a symphony of horror. We were trapped, cornered, our fate sealed. And then, as the terror reached its peak, it revealed itself. It was not a creature, not a beast, but a manifestation of the forest itself, a living nightmare born of the twisted trees and dark shadows. Its form was ever-changing, a swirling mass of branches, leaves, and darkness, its eyes glowing with malevolence, its mouth a gaping maw of terror. It spoke, its voice a whisper, a rustle, a sound that chilled the soul. Its words were a riddle, a puzzle, a challenge. Lost you are. Lost you'll be unless you answer true to me. We were paralyzed, trapped in its gaze, our minds numb, our bodies frozen. The forest had become our tormentor, our judge, our executioner. It asked us questions, dark riddles that probed our deepest fears, our darkest secrets. It knew us, knew our desires, our regrets, our sins. It taunted us, teased us, tortured us with the truth. We answered, our voices trembling, our minds unraveling the terror becoming a living thing, a force that consumed us, a darkness that swallowed us whole. Finally, it was satisfied, its hunger sated, its thirst quenched. It retreated, its form dissolving, its presence fading, leaving us broken, shattered, forever changed. We found our way back, guided by some unseen hand, drawn by some unspoken force. We emerged from the forest, our bodies intact, our minds scarred, our souls forever marked. We had faced the terror and survived the nightmare, but the forest had taken something from us, something intangible, something irreplaceable. We had ventured into the darkness, seeking connection, seeking adventure, but we had found something else, something more, something terrifying. The forest had spoken, its voice a rustle, its words a riddle, its lessons a horror. We were no longer lost, but we were no longer whole. The forest had taken us, shown us the darkness within, and left us forever haunted by the rustling, the terror, the nightmare that lurked just beyond our sight. We had wanted more and received it. A lesson in terror, a journey into darkness, a glimpse into the abyss. And the rustling still follows us, a whisper in the wind, a chill in our bones, a reminder that the terror is never truly gone, that the darkness is always waiting, that the forest is forever watching. Midday sunshine streamed down as I crossed into Colorado, the SUV's engine humming like a hive of distant bees. I'd been on the road since California, the hours blending into one another, stealing away the sharp edges of my alertness. Every swig of caffeine or sugar from the snack sprawled on the passenger seat felt like throwing pebbles at the looming wall of exhaustion, urea. 
That was the name of the town I passed. The radio's voice turned into static, and cold air blasted from the vents, prickling my skin, trying in vain to keep me awake. I'll stop at the next motel, I promised myself, eager for a few hours of sleep. But the exit I chose seemed to lead nowhere. No gas stations, motels, or neon fast food signs. Just a winding road through the heart of the mountains. As I rubbed my tired eyes, the silhouette of a man appeared out of nowhere. There was no time to react or swerve on this tight mountain road. The impact is 45 miles per hour. I felt my heart race as the man's body hit the front of my car, smashed against the windshield, and then crumpled over the hood, leaving a sickening smear before tumbling onto the road. Panic took over as I skidded to a stop. In the rearview mirror I saw him lying there, his skin pale as if all the blood had been drained. Questions fired in my mind. Should I call the police? Should I flee? I approached him. His skin bore brutal gashes that seemed more like deliberate carvings than injuries from the accident. They bled profusely, crisscrossing his body entirely. His limbs were at unnatural angles, defying human anatomy. And then, in a sight I will never forget, he began to move. Bones cracked and snapped. His limbs contorted as he began to rise. I watched in horror. His entire body seemed to twist and reshape. His head with an unhinged jaw and eyes open wide, he snapped towards me. Adrenaline spurred my feet back to the car. The engine roared to life, tires screeching as I tore away from the horror I had encountered. Only when I looked in my rearview mirror did I realize this was no man. It wasn't anything remotely human. It just looked like one. This thing, or whatever the hell it was, started chasing after my car. Its body grotesque and fast, moving in a manner no human ever should. Every nerve screamed at me to go faster. The miles slowly stretched between us, and it faded into the distance. Filled with pure terror, that encounter coursed through my veins to Indiana. Sleep, it seemed, would have to wait for another time. I floored it down the road until I saw a sign welcoming me into Indiana. When I reached the city, it was only then that I felt a sliver of safety for the first time in hours. Being amidst other cars and seeing the lights from buildings was, without a doubt, the best feeling I had ever felt. It's strange how much you come to appreciate life when your very existence is threatened. This encounter made me value my life much more, yet it also lessened my desire to travel. I can't even begin to imagine what that thing might have been. My only hope is that any person venturing down that road steers clear of it. Luck might not favor them as it did me. If ever you spot a figure, something resembling a man on that stretch, press on the accelerator and don't look back. Suddenly we got a call from a nearby city police station. Our uncle, who was taking care of me and my sister while our parents were away, answered the phone. We were confused about why our uncle was crying until we learned the news. Our parents were found dead over 11 miles away from where they started hiking three days ago. I was horrified. I felt as if my world had just splintered into nothing, and my sister just fell to the floor while I just sat there, blank face and warm tears running down my cheeks. The sheriff was obligated to ask us where we wanted the funeral and other questions. Thankfully, my uncle pulled himself together and scheduled his brother and sister-in-law's funeral. The weeks flew by as the weekend was over, and I was left in a well of grief, still processing all that had recently happened. Eventually, we got another call, telling us that another piece of evidence had been found. We initially dismissed it until they told us that it belonged to our parents. As they told us, the more intrigued we were, until my uncle decided to drive us all down there. After all, all of us at least wanted to see their faces one more time, since, mysteriously, the funeral was closed casket. Once we got there, we waited in the waiting room until a man guided us in. They said they had not yet reviewed the footage, and that when they found it, it was covered in blood and still recording even though it was damaged. Finally, we got to a room where they were ready to play the footage, and we all sat before the man who let us in started the video. At first, it was just my parents walking, we fast forward more walking, some fishing, picking up sticks, and skipping rocks. I was happy to see my parents again, even if it was just a recording. We watched the following video. My parents were walking but looked tired and anxious. Eventually, while they were resting, my mother broke the silence. Did you hear any of that last night? My father responded. Yeah, it sounded so odd, like it was directly in my ear. 
but also near a mile away. She gave him an agreeing nod. Eventually they kept walking, not breaking the silence until they camped. Do you think it will happen again? My mother asked. My father responded, It had to have been just some animal. No creature would follow us that far just to make some noises and not do anything to us. But what if it... My mother was cut off. Just trust me. We'll leave tomorrow and forget any of this happened. My father tried to reassure her. It worked. And they went to bed. On the third day, though, something was off. My mother no longer had her bright energy accompanying her, and my father seemed to suffer from sleep deprivation. It felt as though my parents were just husks of their former selves. And more ominous than that, there was a strange faint background noise constantly playing for the first three hours. Then it just stopped. My parents looked around and seemed to sigh and become way more relaxed. And then they stopped for a food break at a slight creak. It seemed reasonable until that noise started back up and louder than before. This caused notable dread in my parents, as the fear in their eyes was visible. They both ran away, leaving all their food behind, as the noise got louder. Eventually, my mother tripped, and her bone-chilling screams could be heard in the background as the noise seemed to stop with her. After two hours of non-stop running, my father ended up in our backyard. I heard him sobbing uncontrollably. He was a mess just by the audio. He started to get it together and approach our house until the light around him seemed to wash away like fresh paint reacting to water. We sat there watching this overwhelming silence and darkness until a faint sound broke it, and it got louder and louder until it felt like my eardrums were about to pop. My father appeared back in the woods but was not alone. As he turned, a part of the screen seemed to warp and glitch out. My father looked at it and started screaming as the thing approached him in the blink of an eye. My father seemed to be crying as something was inserted into his mouth, and then it stopped when his bone snapping was heard. The GoPro fell onto the ground, and it filmed my father floating over the glitching part of the screen. Then, both seemed to phase out of focus and into nothingness. I was shocked by what I saw and everyone else in the room. My sister was pale, and my uncle looked utterly petrified. Finally, the police escorted us out. The drive home was silent, and we all seemed not to dare to speak a word because in the silence, we all heard it. The faint sound of the thing that killed my parents slowly approaching. During my college years, a night of boredom and relentless curiosity, we were led to an unforgettable adventure with my friends Paul and Simon. Restless and seeking an escape from the mundane, we dove into the depths of the internet, scouring for a thrilling escapade to ward off our boredom. Little did we know, however, that this exploration into the unknown would take us to the very boundaries of our imagination, blurring the line between reality and the supernatural. As we delved deep into the cesspool of online legends and spooky tales, our restless souls were enticed by the lore surrounding an abandoned hospital nearby. Whispers of its haunted reputation reached our ears, luring us with the promise of the unknown. With our curiosity piqued and an insatiable desire to escape the monotony of life, we set our sights on that forsaken building, determined to uncover its secrets. The tales painted a vivid picture of a place forgotten by time, its walls echoing with whispers of the past. Shrouded in darkness, it stood as a testament to resilience and decay beckoning adventurous souls to push the boundaries of their reality. Rumors of apparitions and strange occurrences only fueled our anticipation, blurring the line between skepticism and belief. Filled with a potent mix of excitement and fear, we embarked on our journey that fateful night. The moon cast an ethereal glow upon our path as we approached the crumbling structure, its warped windows and crumbling facade a testament to the passage of time. A bitter breeze rustled through the overgrown foliage surrounding the building, adding an eerie soundtrack to our expedition. As we neared the entrance, the aura of the forsaken hospital enveloped us, sending shivers down our spines. The air felt heavy, charged with a palpable sense of anticipation. Our flashlights pierced the darkness, their beams cutting through the thick veil of night, revealing glimpses of the world we would soon be leaving. The atmosphere instantly weighed upon us as we cautiously entered the abandoned hospital. 
The worn linoleum floors creaked beneath our feet, echoing through the lonely halls. The air was stagnant, heavy with the scent of decay and the lingering memories of a bygone era. Our flashlights pierced the suffocating darkness, revealing the remnants of a once bustling medical facility, now lost to time. Each room held its secrets, a tapestry of forgotten stories etched into the peeling wallpaper and broken windows. With a mix of trepidation and curiosity, we ventured forth, mindful of the ghosts that whispered in the silence, driving us deeper into the mysteries of the haunting hospital. With trepidation, we moved from room to room, cautiously examining the remnants of the hospital's past. Each door we opened revealed a bygone era, frozen in time. Some rooms were filled with stacks of long-forgotten medical equipment covered in dust. Others held patient beds, their disheveled sheets hinting at the hasty departures of those who once sought solace within these walls. The dim beams of our flashlights bathed each room in an eerie glow, casting long shadows that danced upon peeling wallpaper and cracked ceilings. Every step further into the hospital yielded a sense of fascination and apprehension as we pieced together the haunting fragments of its history. Occasionally we stumbled upon remnants of the lives that had once filled these spaces. Old photographs, faded and weathered, provided a glimpse into the past. Smiling doctors and nurses, patients in various stages of recovery, all captured in moments that now felt trapped within the walls. The black and white images, now tinged with a haunting nostalgia, served as a reminder of the lives in these now desolate rooms. As we continued our exploration, we discovered a door slightly ajar that led to a staircase descending into the depths of the hospital. The musty scent that wafted from below only intensified our curiosity, drawing us further into the enigmatic unknown. With shared glances filled with both hesitation and determination, we decided to venture into the uncharted basement territory, uncertain of what awaited us. But one thing was clear. We were stepping into a realm where darkness intertwined with the past and where answers, perhaps even more questions, awaited. As we descended into the murky depths of the hospital's basement, the air grew colder, dampness clinging to our skin with each step. The narrow stairway seemed to go on forever, leading us further away from the safety of the upper floors. Our flashlights struggled to penetrate the thick darkness, casting eerie shadows that danced along the damp walls. Unease settled in the pit of our stomachs, but curiosity pushed us onward. The basement was like a labyrinth of forgotten secrets, with corridors branching off in various directions. The faint sound of dripping water echoed through the passageways, adding to the sense of foreboding that enveloped us. A sudden piercing scream shattered the silence as we cautiously explored the underground maze. Panic surged through us like a lightning bolt, our fight-or-flight instincts kicking into overdrive. Without a second thought, we turned and sprinted back towards the stairway, our hearts pounding in our chests. The darkness seemed to close around us, our footsteps echoing with a frantic urgency as we desperately sought an exit. Fear clenched our throats, making breathing difficult, but the adrenaline propelled us forward, fueled by the dire need to escape this nightmarish hospital. We raced through the narrow hallways, and the thought of the unknown horror awaited us, propelling us faster and faster. The cold, damp air whipped against our faces as we strained to find any sign of an open door or a glimmer of light leading us to safety. As the inhumanly fast footsteps grew louder, a chill coursed through our veins, tingling with a mix of fear and anticipation. We glanced at each other, wide-eyed, the weight of our decision to explore this abandoned hospital now pressing heavily upon us. The echo of the haunting wail still lingered in the air, intensifying the sense of impending doom. Heartbeats thundered as we hurriedly scurried around, searching for a hiding place or an escape route. The flickering light from our flashlights cast eerie shadows on the peeling wallpaper, exaggerating the twisted figures that seemed to dance along the walls. The air itself felt charged, crackling with an otherworldly energy. In this moment of desperation, our gaze fell upon a nearby door, partially open. With a shared understanding, we silently approached it, hoping it would offer refuge from the approaching unknown. As we pushed the door open and stepped inside, relief washed over us. It was a small office, cluttered with disorganized paperwork and dusty furniture. The scent of old books mingled with the musty air. 
We quietly shut the door behind us, attempting to muffle any sounds that might betray our presence. As we huddled together, our hearts still pounding in our chests, we strained to listen for any sign of the inhuman pursuer. The footsteps had reached a crescendo, echoing through the corridors outside. There was a disturbing urgency to their rhythm, as if a relentless craving drove the entity behind them. Suddenly, the loud footsteps abruptly stopped, replaced by an eerie silence that was almost unbearable. Our breaths caught in our throats, apprehensive of what might come next. Every whispered creak and rustle of paper echoed like cannon fire in the stillness of the office, making our nerves stand on end. Time slipped away as we held our breath, waiting in the suffocating darkness. It felt like an eternity, the silence broken only by our hearts thundering in our ears. Every creak of the floorboards, every distant whisper of the wind, sent shivers down our spines, amplifying the tension that gripped us. Minutes turned into hours, or so it seemed, as we remained hidden, hoping that our pursuer would lose interest or move on to another part of the hospital. The anxiety and anticipation threatened to overwhelm us, but we clung to the flickering flame of hope lingering at the edges of our consciousness. Suddenly, the silence was shattered once more. It started as a distant shuffle, growing steadily louder with each passing moment. Heavy footsteps reverberated through the tightly packed space, the force of each step sending vibrations through the room, our hearts caught in our throats as we exchanged panicked glances. With bated breath, we waited, our bodies and minds on high alert. The footsteps paused just outside the office, and in that agonizing moment, time seemed suspended. The sound of our breathing seemed deafening, threatening to give us away. Then, as if by a miracle, the footsteps receded, growing fainter and fainter until they eventually faded into the distance. A sigh of relief escaped our lips, though we knew our ordeal was far from over. I cautiously exited the office, leaving our hiding spot, followed by Paul and Simon. The air was thick with tension as we moved, our footsteps muffled by the carpeted floor. Just as we began to believe that we had successfully evaded whatever danger lurked in the building, the sudden creak of a floorboard pierced through the silence. Panic gripped us as the sound echoed through the hallways, quickly followed by a symphony of approaching footsteps. Without hesitation, our survival instincts kicked in, and we broke into a sprint once more, adrenaline coursing through our veins. Every corner turned, every door pushed open, propelled us closer to our only chance of escape. Fear fueled our movements, causing us to run faster than we ever thought possible, desperate to outrun the haunting echoes behind us. The abandoned hospital echoed with the haunting sound of pounding footsteps as we raced through the dimly lit hallways, our pursuer not far behind. Fear gripped our hearts, urging us to find an exit before the looming threat caught up. Adrenaline surged through my veins, propelling me forward. Each hallway seemed like a maze, with doors leading to dead ends and corridors stretching endlessly. The sense of panic threatened to consume me, but I fought to keep my focus, searching desperately for any sign of an escape route. We sprinted through the corridors, our breath ragged and bodies fueled by sheer determination. With every door we encountered, we anxiously checked for any glimmer of hope amidst the chaos and decay. The air inside the hospital weighed heavy with the scent of decay, intensifying the growing dread that pressed upon us. And then, as if the universe granted us a reprieve, a dimly lit sign caught my eye. An arrow pointed toward the direction of an emergency exit, beckoning with a faint glimmer of hope. Hope surged through our veins, fueling our determination to escape the clutches of this forsaken place. With a renewed sense of purpose, I rallied my friends leading them toward the promising beacon of escape. Pushing harder and running faster, we navigated the treacherous hallways, passing broken stretchers and shattered windows as if each step brought us closer to salvation. Our pursuers' distant screams and thunderous footsteps pushed us onward, increasing the tempo of our desperate escape. The flickering lights above seemed to mirror the pounding of our hearts, fueling our drive to break free from the grips of impending doom. As we raced towards the exit, our footsteps pounding against the cold linoleum floor, my heart raced with the adrenaline coursing through my veins. Every breath burned in my chest as I pushed my body to its limits, running as hard as possible, driven by a primal survival instinct. Fear gripped me, 
urging me to put as much distance as possible between myself and the otherworldly creature that pursued us. As I glanced back, my trembling hand still tightly clutching my flashlight, I saw the creature illuminated in its eerie glow. My heart skipped a beat, and a shiver of terror coursed down my spine. The sight before me etched a haunting image into my memory, an idea I knew would haunt my dreams for years. The creature appeared as a twisted apparition from a dark and dreadful nightmare. It resembled a woman, but her form was broken and bent, her body contorted in unnatural angles that defied logic and reason. Her once beautiful features were marred by a grotesque distortion, her pale translucent skin appearing drained of life. Those vacant glassy eyes stared ahead, devoid of humanity or recognition, giving me the eerie sensation of being watched by something far beyond comprehension. Despite the sight that chilled me to my core, I refused to let fear consume me entirely. With every cell of my body screaming for me to stop, I pushed myself even harder, determined to outrun this monstrosity. The thrum of adrenaline pulsed through my veins, numbing the pain in my legs as I raced forward, my mind focused on the singular goal of survival. In an explosion of sheer willpower, we burst through the door, our bodies propelled into the open air outside. The cool breeze kissed our sweat-drenched skin, starkly contrasting the hospital's oppressive atmosphere. For a brief moment, the world seemed to hold its breath as we stood in the aftermath of our escape. As we caught our breath, relief and disbelief settled upon us. Silence enveloped our surroundings, broken only by the distant howling wind and the stark realization that we had evaded the clutches of the otherworldly creature. A sense of awe washed over me as I gazed back at the abandoned hospital, its windows shattered and its walls peeling, a testament to the dark secrets that would remain forever locked within its decaying confines. As we huddled together, our bodies trembling with exhaustion and relief, we knew that we had narrowly escaped the clutches of the abandoned hospital. The sense of camaraderie and shared survival transformed our ordeal into something that bonded us on a deeper level. We may have been basked in darkness, but the light of our resilience, unity, and a healthy dose of luck had guided us towards a new dawn. The hospital hallways seemed to stretch endlessly, a never-ending labyrinth threatening to consume us. But we would not surrender. We would not allow ourselves to be lost within those forsaken walls. With sheer determination and the strength of our collective spirit, we pushed forward, the pursuit behind us fading into the background as we raced toward the light of the exit, longing for the embrace of safety and the promise of a new day. Until the following weekend, that is. The last golden glimmers of the sun painted the quiet streets of our small town. A soft evening breeze tousled my hair as I latched the leash onto Max's collar. My trusty golden retriever wagged his tail, eager to stretch his legs after a day indoors. We both loved our evening strolls. They were our routine, our moment of peace. With every step, the comforting tap of Max's nails on the pavement became rhythmic. But today, something felt different. I couldn't place it but the stillness of the evening felt more pronounced, more pronounced than usual. We approached our usual route past the park, and the tall trees cast lengthy, twisted shadows across the lawn. But my gaze was instantly drawn away from nature's beauty when I spotted him, a solitary figure sitting on the park's weathered bench. He was oddly out of place. He seemed like an ink blot on a pristine page, dressed head to toe in black in a town where folks preferred plaid and denim. But it wasn't his attire that caught my attention. It was how he stared. He looked right at me, unblinking, with an intensity that made my skin crawl. It was as if those eyes were trying to communicate a message I wasn't sure I wanted to understand. Max picked up on my unease, his ears pinning back. He let out a soft whimper, pulling slightly on the leash. Easy boy, I whispered, patting his head while trying to maintain a casual pace. Every instinct screamed at me to escape the park and that man, and when I dared a glance back my heart nearly stopped. The man had risen from the bench. Now standing, his silhouette was even more imposing, his gaze continuing to track me. Like a scene out of one of those thriller novels I'd occasionally pick up, I felt the weight of his eyes, watching, assessing. I felt the urge to run, but didn't want to draw more attention than necessary. So I walked faster clutching Max's leash tighter, 
praying that I was overthinking this, that it was just another townsperson I hadn't met yet, perhaps lost in thought and looking my way coincidentally. But as the gravel crunched behind me in a consistent rhythm, it became crystal clear. He was following me. Max growled a low rumble that seemed out of place for such a friendly dog. It's all right, Max, I murmured, though it was more for my sake than his. My home was just a few blocks away. If we kept our pace, we'd be safely inside in no time. Turning the corner onto my street, the familiar sight of my quaint little house appeared. The porch light was on, casting a warm glow on the wooden steps, promising safety. I risked another glance back, and while I couldn't make out the man clearly in the dimming light, the absence of his shadow was both a relief and a mystery. Once inside, I locked the door and sank to the floor, Max nuzzling my face. Peeking through the blinds, I exhaled shaky when I saw the man's figure receding in the opposite direction. For a moment I thought the ordeal was over, but deep down, a nagging feeling told me this was just the beginning. I had always taken comfort in the familiar surroundings of my bedroom, the pastel walls adorned with old family photos and the quilted blanket, hand sewn by my grandmother, had always been a beacon of solace. But that night, the room felt alien, tainted by the day's unsettling events. Max was restless, pacing by the window, occasionally letting out a low growl. I tried immersing myself in a book, but every word blurred together, the eerie image of the man in black plaguing my every thought. As the clock ticked on, my eyelids grew heavier, coaxing me into an uneasy sleep. Just when the pull of dreams overshadowed reality, a soft, rhythmic tapping jarred me awake. The sound was faint, almost like the fluttering wings of a moth against a light. I strained my ears, hoping to dismiss it as just a figment of my heightened paranoia. However, the tapping grew louder, more insistent. Each tap seemed calculated, designed to resonate within the silent confines of my room. I glanced at Max, who was already fixated on the window, his fur bristling. I hesitated. The logical part of me wanted to brush it off as a stray branch or some innocent creature of the night. But every nerve in my body buzzed with tension, sensing something more sinister. Drawing a deep breath, I summoned the courage to approach the window. As I neared, the tapping paused, replaced by an oppressive silence. Taking a steadying breath, I gripped the curtain's edge and slowly peeled it back. And there he was. The man from the park, his features now hidden behind a ski mask, stood mere inches away from me, separated only by the thin pane of glass. The intensity in his eyes mirrored that of our earlier encounter, but this time, there was something else, anticipation. I stumbled back, a scream trapped in my throat as Max barked furiously. The man seemed to relish in my terror for a split second before quickly retreating, leaving behind only the chilling trace of his presence. In a whirlwind of fear and adrenaline, I dashed to my parents' room, my voice a frenzied mix of words as I recounted what had just transpired. Their faces turned ashen, and within minutes, the familiar ring of the police hotline echoed in the room. As we waited, we discovered the ladder the man had used, propped against the house, providing access to my window. The implications made my stomach churn. A chill ran down my spine when we spotted the abandoned crowbar on the ground below, its purpose hauntingly evident. When the police arrived, their flashing blue and red lights cutting through the night's darkness, they took in the scene with grave expressions. Despite their best efforts to reassure us, it was evident. This man hadn't simply been stalking me. He had plans to get inside. The night dragged on with questions, photographs, and statements. The house, once a symbol of warmth and memories, now bore the shadow of the unknown threat. Sleep eluded me as my mind wrestled with a single burning question. Why? Why me? Why my home? What had drawn this man, this predator, into my life? Morning light did little to dispel the shadows that seemed to have permanently lodged in our home. Sleep had been fleeting, with the haunting image of the masked man outside my window visiting me in every nightmare. The town was abuzz with rumors, whispered speculations passing from one mouth to another, each more terrifying than the last. Police patrols had increased, their presence a constant reminder of the threat lurking just beyond our sight. They combed through every alley, every thicket, searching for any sign of the man. But days turned into weeks, and all they had were vague descriptions and dead-end leads. Support poured in from every corner. 
Friends dropped by with casseroles and comforting words. Neighbors set up a neighborhood watch, their vigilant eyes scanning the streets for any anomaly. But in the midst of this communal embrace, I felt more isolated than ever. Max, too, was on high alert, his cheerful demeanor replaced by a constant wariness. Our bond deepened in these trying times, our senses attuned to each other's fears. One evening, as I was trying to lose myself in the pages of a book, a familiar tapping sound cut through the stillness. My heart raced, a cold dread spreading through my veins. Max growled, his gaze fixed intently on the window. I approached it hesitantly, memories of our last encounter flashing before my eyes. Peering out, I saw nothing but the vast darkness of the night. The tapping had ceased, replaced by an eerie silence. Was my mind playing tricks on me? Was the trauma finally taking its toll? I decided to step out, needing to shake off the unease. The porch light cast a small pool of light, revealing nothing amiss. The streets were silent, the world seemingly holding its breath. Then, a whisper broke the silence. It was soft, almost inaudible, coming from the shadows just beyond the edge of the light. You can't hide, it hissed, dragging on in a chilling sing-song manner. Panicking, I turned back to the safety of my house, only to find the front door slowly creaking shut. Max barked furiously from inside, his cries growing distant as the door latched with a definitive click. Desperation surged through me. I pounded on the door, screaming for help. The whisper grew louder, closer. You can't escape! I scrambled to find an alternate entry, circling the house to the back door. To my horror, standing there masked as before was the man. He wasn't tapping or whispering now. Instead, he just stood there, silent and still, the moonlight reflecting off the sharp blade he held in his hand. Hard in my throat, I made a split-second decision and darted to the woods, my only thought to get as far away as possible. The trees enveloped me, their shadows thick and disorienting. I could hear him behind me, his steps measured and confident. As I ran deeper into the woods, I suddenly stumbled upon a clearing, and there, to my horror, stood multiple figures, all masked, all silently watching me. The man's voice, now clear and chillingly calm, echoed, you finally joined us. The circle of masked figures tightened around me, their intentions clear. There was no escape. The terrifying realization hit me. This wasn't just one man's obsession. It was something much larger, much more sinister, and I was right in the middle of it. The old oak door to my office always creaked, a warning that someone was coming in. The sound itself was a reminder of the countless days spent within the confines of the university, but today that sound carried with it a certain magic. There she stood, Priscilla, with that half-smile of hers, her auburn hair loosely pulled back, those eyes shimmering with mischief. Got a moment, Professor? I swirled the contents of my cold coffee. For you, Priscilla? Always. She leaned against the desk, her fingers tracing the grain of the aged wood. Ever been to the Pennine Hills? I quirked an eyebrow, intrigued. For a city guy like me? No. Why don't we change that? Her voice dropped to a conspiratorial whisper. How about we run away together? Just for a little while? I chuckled. Run away? You make it sound so dramatic. She shrugged. Maybe it is, but it's a place I know, secluded, breathtaking, and I'd like to share it with someone who'd appreciate it. There was an earnestness in her tone, a genuine invitation, mixed with a challenge. I knew she wasn't just talking about camping. I'd always seen Priscilla as someone out of reach, like a puzzle with pieces missing, a mix of vulnerability and strength, youth and wisdom. Looking out the window, the campus green seemed a world away from the wild expanses of the Pennine Hills. Is this your way of telling me to step out of my comfort zone? Her grin grew wider. Maybe. The entire idea was ludicrous. I was two decades older, and she was my student. Yet the idea of a getaway was tempting. What harm could come from it? All right, I conceded, a grin forming. When do we leave? The journey took us through a patchwork of fields, villages, and then increasingly remote landscapes. The beauty of the Pennines was undeniable, but desolation was the word that came to mind as we trekked deeper into its core. Every so often, Priscilla would look back, her face breaking into a gleeful smile. Tired yet, Professor? We've barely started, I retorted, ignoring the twinge in my ankle. She vaulted a metal gate with ease. 
waiting for me on the other side. The vastness of the moorland stretched endlessly, and in the distance, wind turbines painted a modern contrast against the wild backdrop. It was silent, save for the distant cawing of crows and the howl of the wind. The terrain turned treacherous soon. My foot landed awkwardly, causing a sharp pain to shoot up my leg. You brought me out here to kill me, didn't you? I grumbled. She laughed, helping steady me. Not yet, Professor. The place I have in mind is a little further. Can you keep up? Her playful challenge was all I needed. Despite the discomfort, I followed, drawn in by the mystery of it all. As we set up camp that evening, the sun cast long shadows across the hills. The wind whispered tales of old, and for the first time in years, I felt truly alive. That night, with the canvas of our tent flapping softly, Priscilla whispered, Thank you for coming with me. I smiled in the dim light. The adventure's just begun. But neither of us realized just how true that was. The sun had barely broken the horizon, a faint orange glow turning the hills into a canvas of shifting shadows. Priscilla and I had a quiet understanding, a shared look, a touch, a secret smirk. As I stretched out, the pain in my ankle reminded me of the previous day's trek. I started up the portable stove, and soon the aroma of brewing coffee filled the air. Priscilla stirred in her sleeping bag, mumbling softly before sitting up with a start. She rubbed her temples. Had the oddest dream, Professor. Children's voices, whispering outside our tent. I frowned, recalling the unsettling sensation I'd experienced in the night, a feeling I'd tried to dismiss. You heard them too? She nodded, her face pale. I thought it was just the wind. As we sipped our coffee in silence, I scanned the surrounding area. There was no one in sight, just miles and miles of heather and the distant wind turbines. We decided to take a hike that day. Despite the bleakness, there was an allure to this place. Priscilla led the way, pointing out hills and other landmarks. I nodded along, but the chill in the air made me wrap my jacket tighter. Midway through our hike, I paused to take out my binoculars. In the distance, four small figures appeared. Priscilla, look, I pointed. She squinted. Just some locals, maybe? We continued on our path, but a feeling of unease settled in. The rain began to drizzle, and soon the figures disappeared. Evening found us back at our campsite. As I set out our meal, Priscilla suddenly tensed, her eyes darting to the tent entrance. A voice broke the silence. Who's camping on my land? I got to my feet, finding myself face to face with a rugged man wearing a flat cap. Three children clung to him, their eyes wide with fear. There was an unmistakable resemblance. The man adjusted his cap, eyeing us suspiciously. Got a permit to be here? I cleared my throat, trying to keep my voice steady. Sorry, we weren't aware. My student here mentioned this was public land. The man grunted. Student, eh? Not causing trouble, I hope? Priscilla stepped forward, her voice firm. We meant no harm. We can pack up and leave. The man's demeanor suddenly changed, his lips curving into a smile. Nah, it's all right. Just pull in your leg but you scared my kids here. I glanced at the children, their faces still filled with apprehension. Apologies, we didn't mean to intrude. The man gave a curt nod. Just be mindful next time. With that, he and his children left, their figures slowly disappearing over the ridge. Priscilla and I exchanged glances. That was odd. She shivered. Let's pack up tomorrow. This place feels off. I agreed. We climbed into our sleeping bags, but sleep was hard to come by. The wind seemed to carry those whispered voices again, more pronounced, more insistent. Professor, Priscilla whispered, her voice shaky. Do you hear them too? I nodded, pulling her close. Whatever was happening, we'd face it together. Morning dawned gloomy and gray. Despite the uneasiness of the previous day, I tried to shake off the feeling. Maybe we were just letting our imaginations run wild but Priscilla's demeanor had changed. The vivaciousness I loved was replaced with quiet contemplation. I think I know a place, she whispered, poring over a map. There's a small cairn nearby. Might be a good spot to rest. I agreed, hoping a change of scene would lift our spirits. The hike was silent. Priscilla seemed lost in thought, pointing occasionally to some hill or a landmark. The air felt heavy, the overcast sky pressing down. When we arrived at the cairn, I felt an eerie stillness. These stones, stacked meticulously, 
stood as silent sentinels in this desolate landscape. Priscilla leaned against the cairn, her face pale. I've been here before, Professor, with my grandparents. They told tales of the children of the moor, spirits lost, searching for a way home. I frowned, remembering the whispered voices. You think there's some truth to it? She sighed. I thought it was just a story to keep kids from wandering off. But after last night, a chill wind blew making the heather dance. Priscilla wrapped her arms around herself. There's a legend about this cairn. It's said to be a beacon for lost souls guiding them. I tried to laugh it off. Old tales, Priscilla, meant to give explanations to the unexplained. She shook her head. I have a bad feeling, Professor. We should leave. Just then a mist started to roll in, enveloping the moorland. Visibility dropped, and a sense of foreboding gripped me. All right, let's head back. But the way back seemed distorted. The landscape, once familiar, now felt alien. Every direction looked the same. The whispers grew louder, more insistent. It felt as though they were right next to us. Priscilla clutched my arm. They're here. I shone the torch around, but all I saw was the swirling fog. No shapes, no shadows. Yet the feeling of being watched was undeniable. Suddenly Priscilla screamed, pointing at the ground. There, appearing and disappearing in the mist, were faint footprints of children. They seemed to circle us, closing in. Stay close, I shouted, pulling Priscilla with me. We needed to get out of this fog, out of this cursed moorland. As we trudged on, the whispers became voices, discernible words. Stay. Join us. Don't leave. I could feel my heart pounding, every shadow a potential threat. After what felt like hours, the fog started to lift, and the familiar shape of our tent appeared in the distance. Exhausted, we stumbled in, but the relief was short-lived. The tent flap rustled, and the farmer's voice cut through the silence. Leaving so soon? I turned, flashlight illuminating his gaunt face, but there was no sign of Priscilla. Panic gripped me as I realized she had vanished. The moors, with their ever-shifting mists and undulating landscapes, had always seemed like a different world to me. But now, with Priscilla missing, they felt like an unyielding maze. Where is she? I demanded, staring into the farmer's eyes, searching for any hint of deception. His cloudy eyes remained impassive. I warned you, he whispered. His voice graveled with age and wisdom. The moors don't like visitors. Cut the riddles! Where is she? My voice echoed across the vast expanse, making the nearby birds scatter into the dreary sky. He took a deep breath. I've seen this before. People who don't respect the land end up becoming a part of it. A sinking feeling gnawed at me. I had to find her and quickly. Help me, I pleaded. He studied me for what felt like an eternity before nodding. There's an old stone circle east of here. It's said to be the gateway between our world and theirs. If she's anywhere, she'll be there. Without wasting any time, we set off. The farmer's pace was surprisingly fast, and his knowledge of the treacherous landscape was evident. Every so often, he'd mutter something in a language I didn't understand, making signs in the air. As we walked, I couldn't shake the feeling of unseen eyes on us, whispers brushing past my ears. The moorland was alive, watching our every move. After hours of trekking, we reached the stone circle. The stones, worn by time, stood tall and menacing. At the center was a flat stone altar, stained dark. My heart raced as I thought of what might have transpired there. The farmer spoke, breaking the silence. You have to call out to her, but be warned, the spirits might answer too. Swallowing hard, I stepped into the circle. Priscilla, I shouted. My voice echoed back to me, carried by the wind. I called again and again each shout more desperate than the last. Suddenly, a soft voice whispered back, Professor? I whirled around. There she was, standing just outside the circle, her face pale, eyes distant. Relief washed over me as I rushed to her, pulling her into an embrace. But she was cold, her body rigid. Priscilla, I murmured, pulling back to look at her. Her eyes slowly focused on me, and she whispered, They want something, Professor. I glanced at the farmer who was watching us intently. What do they want? He sighed. A trade. A life for a life. I felt a chill run down my spine. What does that mean? He looked at me, sadness evident in his eyes. To save her, you might have to give up something or someone. Desperation clouded my judgment. 
I'll do whatever it takes. The farmer nodded solemnly. Very well. But remember, once the trade is made, it can't be undone. As the sun began to set, casting an eerie glow over the moors, I prepared to make the most challenging decision of my life. The cold was unbearable. With every passing moment, the moorland seemed to close in, the atmosphere growing heavy with anticipation. The farmer, with his ancient wisdom, stood outside the stone circle, observing silently. I'm ready, I said, trying to sound confident, but the quiver in my voice betrayed my fear. Priscilla, her form now more tangible, looked at me, her once bright eyes now clouded. Professor, I've seen them. They're not of this world. A shiver ran down my spine. Who are they? She hesitated, searching for words. Shadows, whispers, memories of those long gone. They roam these lands, searching for souls. The stone circle seemed to pulse with energy, the very earth vibrating beneath my feet. From the shadows, ethereal figures began to emerge, their forms flickering like old film footage. We seek balance, one of them hissed, its voice echoing through the chilly air. I took a deep breath. What do you want in exchange for Priscilla's safe return? The shadows seemed to move and merge, communicating in a dance of light and dark. After what seemed like an eternity, one of them spoke. A memory, a cherished moment, the best of your life given to us, never to be remembered again. My mind raced, trying to comprehend the gravity of the trade. To give up a memory, my most cherished one, felt like tearing away a piece of my soul. Priscilla's gaze met mine, her eyes pleading. Do it, Professor. Set me free. Gathering every ounce of courage, I nodded. Take it. Take my most cherished memory. A collective hiss of approval came from the shadows. One of the figures extended a smoky hand toward me. As it touched my forehead, I felt a searing pain, as if something was being pulled out of me. The world spun and I gasped, trying to recall the memory I'd just sacrificed. But it was gone, an empty void in its place. As the pain subsided, the figures retreated into the shadows, and the land grew silent. Priscilla, now solid and real, collapsed into my arms. We did it, I whispered, relief washing over me. But the farmer's grave voice interrupted our brief moment of reprieve. You've made your trade, but remember, this land is alive. It remembers. I frowned. What do you mean? He gestured to the horizon where dark clouds were gathering. The moors are ancient and they've seen many trades. Your memory will feed them, but for how long? A cold wind picked up howling and carrying with it the whispers of a thousand lost souls. Priscilla clung to me, her eyes wide with terror. They're coming! The horizon darkened as a tidal wave of shadows surged towards us, their hungry cries echoing across the vast expanse. The stone circle, once a place of safety, now seemed like a trap. The farmer, his voice filled with resignation, murmured, The balance is never truly met. The moors always hunger for more. I held Priscilla close realizing the horrifying truth. Our escape, our brief victory, had only angered the land more. The shadows closed in, their cold embrace promising an eternity of darkness. As the terrifying force consumed us, one thought rang clear. The Moors never forget, and they never forgive. The world has a way of slipping through your fingers when you least expect it. The colors of a sunset, the vivid hues of a blooming flower, the nuances of an expressive face, all stolen from me. Glaucoma, a term I never thought I'd have to reckon with at 21. I used to take pride in picking the perfect shade of lipstick or matching my shoes with my outfits. Now I measure my world in decreasing percentages. Currently it stands at a mere 10%. 10% of blurry shapes of shadowed impressions, and in darkness, nothing. Sitting on the porch, I tried to memorize the fading outlines of our home, a comfortable space neither grand nor shabby, a place where every corner was etched in my memory, now more from touch than sight. My fingers grazed the railing, feeling the grooves and notches that came from years of wear. This tactile world was my new reality. Our neighborhood was as familiar as the back of my hand, a hand that had lately become my eyes. Children's laughter from the Johnsons next door. The scent of Mrs. Baker's pies wafting from two houses down. The soft hum of traffic from the main road. All sensory landmarks that helped me navigate my day. The door creaked open, breaking my reverie. Dad returning from his long shift at the hospital. 
He might have aged five years in the short span since my diagnosis. The weight of my condition etched deep worry lines onto his face. Hey, kiddo, he called out softly, a warm smile in his voice. I turned towards the sound, offering a grin. Long day, Dad? He sighed. The usual, but it's all worth it when I come home to you. How was your day? I chuckled. The same. You know how it is? The kids at school keep me on my toes. Their questions about my sight never end. Dad settled next to me, his arm wrapping protectively around my shoulders. They're just curious, honey. It's a testament to your strength that you keep teaching. Keep pushing forward. I leaned into his embrace, drawing strength. It's them, Dad. Those kids. They don't pity me. Their genuine curiosity, their resilience reminds me to push forward. Before he could respond, the distinctive ring of the house phone echoed. Mom's shift at the 911 dispatch was unpredictable. Calls at any hour were commonplace. Dad rose, planting a soft kiss on my forehead. I'll get it. Probably your mother checking in. As his footsteps receded, I thought of the anchor that my parents had become. Their strength, their undying faith in me, their silent struggles. It fueled my determination to adapt, to conquer this darkness inch by inch. The soft chime of my phone disturbed my thoughts. Tiara, my lifeline in this shifting world, had texted. Her messages were always full of life, pulling me out of my introspective moments. Movie marathon tonight? Let's drown in some drama. I chuckled, typing back, only if we binge on popcorn and ice cream. Her reply was instant. Deal. See you at seven? Can't wait, I texted back. Life had thrown me a curveball, but in the grand scheme of things, I wasn't alone. The darkness might be encroaching, but with the love of my family, the loyalty of friends like Tiara, and the innocent wonder of my students, I had an army by my side. And with that army, I was ready to face anything. The slow hum of the ceiling fan created a soothing backdrop to our marathon night. Tiara and I sprawled out on the living room floor, an array of snacks spread between us. Every once in a while, my fingers would bump into hers as we both reached for popcorn. She'd laugh, and I'd playfully swat her hand away, relying on memory and our shared chemistry. She'd been my pillar through the toughest moments. Where others hesitated, Tiara just understood. Our bond had grown deeper, more intricate with my loss of sight. This episode, she whispered, leaning close, it's the one where Anna discovers her sister's betrayal. I felt her words more than heard them, the vibrations, the subtle shifts in her tone. Don't spoil it for me, I laughed. I want to experience the drama, Tiara giggled. Of course, of course, though I still find it a little weird watching TV with someone who, well, can't really watch. I nudged her with my elbow. Hey, I see in different ways now. It's all about the sounds, the story behind the dialogue, the emotions in their voices. As the evening wore on, Tiara painted the visuals with her words, her description so vivid that I felt I was seeing it all. It was our ritual, my ears, her eyes. Together we made a whole. We reached the climax of the series, both of us hanging on to every spoken word, every background score. The emotions were palpable, and when the credits rolled, we were left with a bittersweet cocktail of satisfaction and sorrow. Tiara's sigh echoed my sentiments. Wow, she whispered. I didn't see that coming. I chuckled. Neither did I, in a manner of speaking. She playfully threw a cushion at me. Always the joker, huh? We cleaned up, the silence between us comfortable, reflective. You know, I began, nights like these, they make everything feel normal. For a few hours, I forget. Tiara squeezed my hand. That's what friends are for, right? To be the light in each other's darkness. I blinked away sudden tears. She had a gift, the ability to always say the right things. Thanks, T, for everything. She was silent for a moment. I should head out. Early day tomorrow. Her voice held a hint of regret. I nodded, escorting her to the door. We said our goodbyes, and I locked up behind her, letting out a sigh. The house felt emptier, the shadows more pronounced without her lively presence. I grabbed the leftover popcorn, wanting to wrap myself in the remnants of our evening. Shuffling to the kitchen, I decided to load the dishwasher and put on a podcast to keep me company. As I settled into the routine, the gentle chime of my phone signaled a message. Without looking, I knew it was from Tiara. I'm home, good night and thanks for the fun day, Siri read out loud. I smiled, comforted by her safe arrival. My podcast droned on, discussing strange occurrences a few towns over. While the events sounded intriguing, 
I couldn't shake the chill it brought. Maybe it was the contrast of the joyful evening with Tiara and the eerie stories. Shutting off the lights, I made my way to the living room, letting the familiar textures guide me. Curling up on the couch, I reached for the bowl of popcorn, the familiar crunch a reminder of the laughter and camaraderie of the evening. But as the house settled around me, I couldn't help but feel the weight of the oncoming night and the unpredictable darkness it brought with it. The stillness of the house amplified the quiet, rustling sounds outside. I'd always prided myself on my heightened sense of hearing, but tonight it felt like a curse. Every little noise drew my attention, an errant leaf, a bird shifting in its sleep. My ears picked up on them all. But then, that distinct chime from my phone cut through the silence. My heart sped up. Not many people messaged me at this hour. Person detected backyard, Siri's voice mechanically droned. I frowned trying to make sense of it. A squirrel, perhaps? Or had Tiara forgotten something? Maybe she was trying to sneak back to surprise me. Shaking my head, I pushed those thoughts away. I knew she was home. She'd told me herself. Returning to my podcast, I felt a hint of unease but tried to focus on the storyteller's voice. Yet the night wasn't done with its surprises. Another chime, the same announcement. This time I couldn't brush it off. The safety of the four walls felt compromised. I paused the podcast, letting my ears stretch into the darkness, trying to discern any sign of movement. The pulsating silence was broken only by the rhythmic thud of my own heart. The system had never given false alarms before. I muttered a curse, reaching for my phone to call the security company, but the device chimed again before I could dial. Person detected backyard. Chills raced down my spine. This was no glitch. I knew it. Stumbling to the back glass window, I strained my ears, desperate for some clue, some sign that would either confirm my fears or put them to rest. The thick darkness clung to the glass, reflecting the dim lights from the living room. I pressed an ear to the window. A soft exhale on the other side made my heart jump. Someone was there, so close that I could feel their breath against the glass. Fear took over. My voice quivered as I dialed 911. The waiting tone felt agonizingly long. The familiar soft voice on the other end surprised me. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Mom? My voice cracked. The dread and familiarity intertwined, making it hard to breathe. It was a cruel irony that my mother, with her calming presence, was the one to take my distress call. I choked out the details, every second feeling like an eternity. The fear was punctuated by her composed voice, guiding me, offering solace. But as the lights blinked out, plunging the house into abyssal darkness, even her soothing words couldn't stave off the rising panic. In the pitch black, my world shrunk further. My every step was hesitant, each moment tense. My mother's frantic guidance in my ear was the only tether I had to sanity. But as I tried to navigate the familiar yet suddenly foreign terrain, a cold realization dawned on me. I hadn't locked the front door after Tiara left. I relayed my thoughts to mom, her voice echoing my dread, urging me to hide, but some primal instinct propelled me to the door. I needed to lock it, to secure my sanctuary. But just as I reached for the latch, a sinister voice, cold and taunting, sent fresh waves of terror coursing through me. The question remains though, did you just lock me in or out? The uncertainty was the worst part, the not knowing. But there, on the precipice of my darkest fears, I realized that sometimes, the monsters we imagine are far worse than the ones that lurk in the shadows. I was paralyzed in the spot, his chilling voice echoing in my head. My hands trembled as I reached out, fingers brushing the cool metal of the door handle, in or out. The thought played on a loop, consuming my mind. Then a thud, distant but unmistakable. The sound reverberated through the silence, snapping me back to reality. It was coming from the back. My initial instincts had been right. The intruder was still outside. My mom's urgent whispers in my ear brought back the gravity of the situation. I needed to move, to find a hiding spot. Under the bed, in the closet, anywhere. Her voice pitched higher with panic, but it was a controlled kind of panic, one shaped by years of handling crises. With slow, calculated steps, I started moving upstairs. The familiarity of my home worked in my favor as I navigated through the darkness, the memories of each nook and corner guiding me. 
I made my way to my room and slid under the bed. The space was tight, my breaths shallow. The world felt smaller from down there, and the weight of my vulnerability pressed hard against my chest. A muffled thud echoed from downstairs, followed by the creak of a door. The intruder had made it inside. My heart raced, threatening to burst out of my chest. Time felt suspended in that dark void under the bed. Each second stretched into an eternity. The house was silent save for the distant footsteps which grew louder with each passing moment. Suddenly my phone vibrated with an incoming call. I stifled a scream, covering the glowing screen with my hand. The glow seemed almost blinding in the pitch darkness. Damn, I whispered, ending the call and silencing the phone. But the damage was done. A shadow loomed at the doorway. My breath caught in my throat, and I forced myself to lie still, praying the intruder wouldn't notice me. The room remained in tense silence. Moments ticked by. It felt as though the intruder was sniffing the air, sensing for a sign of life. And then the unexpected sound of sirens in the distance. Their wailing grew louder, piercing the silent night. The intruder hesitated and then retreated hastily. I held my breath, waiting, listening. The footsteps grew fainter until they disappeared altogether, and the sirens grew closer, more insistent. It felt like hours before I finally dared to crawl out from under the bed, my limbs stiff, my body soaked in sweat. The red and blue lights flashed through the windows, painting the walls with an eerie glow. Voices outside grew louder as officers approached the house. I stumbled downstairs, unlocking the door and letting in a rush of cool night air. The first officer that entered was a familiar face, Officer Daniels. He had once given a safety talk at my school when I was younger. You okay? He asked, concern evident in his eyes. I nodded, still in shock. The reality of the night's events was beginning to sink in. As the officers scoured the house, they found no trace of the intruder, just a lingering sense of unease that would forever mark this home. But what they did find, chillingly close to the back door, was a mask and a knife, glistening ominously in the flashing police lights. Days became a haze after that night. The police combed every inch of the house for evidence, their gloved hands turning over our personal items as they searched for prints or clues. The air in the house felt different, tainted, as though the intruder had left a part of his darkness behind. I kept reliving that night. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle outside made me jump. Sleep was elusive. Nightmares of the man's eyes glistening with malice in the dim light of our living room haunted my dreams. Officer Daniels came by often, updating us on the investigation. They had no leads. The mask and knife they found were clean. No fingerprints, no DNA. It was like the intruder was a ghost. I'd sit on the porch for hours watching the world go by, finding solace in the chirping of the birds and the distant hum of the neighborhood. A constant stream of friends, neighbors, and well-wishers came by, offering support and comfort. One such day, as the evening light painted the sky in hues of pink and gold, Tiara sat next to me. We'd been through so much, shared so many memories, but this silence between us was a new one. It was a silence filled with understanding, with shared pain. I keep thinking, she whispered, breaking the silence. What if I had stayed a little longer, or if I'd remembered to lock the door behind me? I squeezed her hand. You can't blame yourself. We can't live our lives wondering about the what ifs. She sighed, resting her head on my shoulder. You're stronger than I gave you credit for. I chuckled softly. I have to be. The world didn't stop because I lost my sight, and it won't stop because of this. But it doesn't mean I'm not terrified. We sat like that for a while, drawing strength from each other. The world felt a little less heavy with her by my side. The next week, Officer Daniels had some news. They'd found the intruder, a man with a string of burglaries and a few assaults to his name. They'd caught him attempting to break into another house, wearing the same mask. Relief flooded over me, but it was bittersweet. The knowledge that he was behind bars brought a semblance of peace, but the scars of that night remained. Life slowly began to return to normal. I returned to work, facing my young students with a renewed sense of purpose. Their innocent questions and wide-eyed wonder served as a balm for my wounded soul. Months later, I stood before a gathered crowd, sharing my story. The room was filled with people from all walks of life, each with their own tales of resilience. As I recounted that fateful night, the terror, the uncertainty, I also spoke of hope, 
of the human spirit's ability to rise above adversity. The applause was warm, but it was the faces in the crowd that stayed with me. Faces etched with understanding, with empathy. In sharing my story, I'd found a community, a sense of belonging. And as I stepped off the stage, Tiara's proud hug enveloping me, I knew one thing for certain. While darkness might momentarily cloud our lives, it's our inner strength, our bonds with those around us that lights our way forward. I'd always been a sucker for the great outdoors. The smell of pine, the rustle of leaves underfoot, the promise of solitude. It was a siren's call I couldn't resist. Today was supposed to be no different. A TikTok video had shown me the way to some rare fungi, and I was hell-bent on finding them. A modern-day treasure hunt, if you will. I parked my truck by the trailhead, laced up my boots, and set off with a sense of purpose. The main trail was familiar, almost comforting, with its well-worn path and occasional markers. But today, I had my sights set on something less traveled, a side trail that promised the kind of adventure you can't find on a map. The moment I stepped off the main trail, I felt it. A shift, subtle but palpable. The air grew thicker, the silence deeper. I shrugged it off, attributing it to the thrill of the unknown. But as I ventured deeper, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. It took me a while to put my finger on it, and when I did, it sent a chill down my spine. The trees, they were all the same, identical, down to the last twig and leaf. It was as if someone had taken a single tree and copied it over and over, filling this part of the forest with its clones. It was unnatural, eerie, like walking through a hall of mirrors where every reflection is a towering pine. I should have turned back then, but curiosity is a powerful force. I convinced myself that it was a trick of the light, an illusion born of solitude. I pressed on, my eyes scanning the forest floor for the elusive fungi that had lured me here. But the deeper I went, the more disoriented I became. The identical trees seemed to close in on me, their sameness disorienting, like a maze with no exit. And then, as if on cue, the sky turned. Clouds rolled in, thick and inky, blotting out the sun in a matter of minutes. The forest grew dark, the air heavy with the promise of a storm. I looked up, and through the thick canopy I saw the sky churn with an unnatural energy. Shapes formed and dissolved in the clouds as if something was roiling within them. Panic set in. I knew I had to get out, find shelter before the heavens broke open. But in a forest of identical trees, every direction looked the same. I was lost, disoriented, a lone wanderer in a forest that defied the laws of nature. Just as I was about to give in to despair, a deafening crack of thunder shook the sky. It was a sound so primal, so terrifying, that it jolted me out of my paralysis. I knew I had to move, and fast. I turned back toward what I hoped was the direction of the main trail, my heart pounding in my chest. As I broke into a run, the first raindrops began to fall, heavy and cold, like the fingers of some unseen giant reaching down to claim me. And that's when I heard it, a sound that would haunt me for the rest of my life. A wet slapping noise like bare feet on mud, coming from behind me, growing louder with each step I took. I ran my breath ragged, my fear absolute, knowing that something was coming for me, something born of this cursed forest. And as I ran, the storm broke open, unleashing a torrential downpour that would become my baptism into a nightmare I could never have imagined. The rain was a deluge now, each drop a miniature missile, stinging my skin as I barreled down the trail. The thunder roared again, a monstrous growl that seemed to shake the very ground beneath me. But it was the other sound that wet slapping against the mud that drove me to the edge of terror. It was getting closer, and whatever it was, it was fast. I had no time to think, only to run. The trail twisted and turned, a labyrinth in the darkening forest. My boots slipped in the mud, my breaths came out in ragged gasps, but I pushed on. I had to. The alternative was unthinkable. Then, in a moment that seemed to stretch into eternity, I slipped. My foot caught on a root, and I went sprawling into the mud my world a blur of earth and sky. For a split second I lay there, stunned, the rain pelting down on me like a shower of icy needles. It was a flash of lightning that saved me. In that brief, blinding moment I saw it, the outline of a cabin just a few yards ahead, a haven in the storm, a chance for survival. 
I scrambled to my feet, my body screaming in protest, and lunged forward. But as I did, I heard it again, that wet slapping sound, now accompanied by something new. The crashing of trees, the splintering of wood, as if something or someone was tearing through the forest, obliterating everything in its path. My heart sank. Whatever it was, it was almost upon me. I reached the cabin and practically threw myself against the door, my hands fumbling for a knob, a latch, anything. To my immense relief, the door swung open, and I stumbled inside, slamming it shut behind me. I was in darkness now, but it was a darkness I welcomed, a barrier between me and the terror outside. I leaned against the door, my breaths coming out in shallow sobs, my body trembling from exertion and fear. I fumbled in the dark, my hands finally finding a bolt, and I slid it into place with a sense of finality. I was safe, at least for the moment. But even as I stood there, trying to catch my breath, I heard it. The sound of trees crashing just outside the cabin, each thud a seismic event that seemed to shake the very walls around me. And then, above it all, that dreadful wet slapping, now so close, it was as if it were right outside the door. I backed away, my eyes straining to adjust to the darkness, my mind racing. The cabin was my sanctuary, but it was also a trap, a single room with no other exits, no place to hide. I was cornered, and I knew it. And that's when it came, a loud slam against the door so violent it made the whole cabin shudder. A scream followed, a sound so shrill and inhuman it seemed to pierce my very soul. I was not alone, and whatever was out there it wanted in. The slam against the door reverberated through the cabin like a gunshot, leaving a silence so thick you could cut it with a knife. I stood there frozen, my back pressed against the far wall. The bolt held, but for how long? Whatever was outside had just announced its presence with a violence that left no room for doubt. It was strong, and it was angry. I forced myself to move, my eyes scanning the room for anything that could help me. The cabin was a time capsule of neglect, its wooden walls aged and weathered, its furniture reduced to a single overturned table and a couple of broken chairs. Dust hung in the air, visible in the slivers of light that penetrated the boarded-up windows. It was a place forgotten by time, but I had no luxury to ponder its history. I was writing my own, and it felt like a final chapter. My eyes settled on the windows. They were old, their glass tinged with the grime of years, but they were intact. I moved cautiously toward one, my ears straining for any sound from outside. The rain was still coming down in sheets, a curtain of water that distorted everything. I wiped a small patch clean and peered out, my heart pounding in my chest. Lightning flashed, and for a split second, the world outside was illuminated in stark relief. And there it was, a figure crouched just beyond the window, its form a grotesque parody of the human shape. But it was the head that caught my eye, a deer skull empty sockets staring back at me. The sight was so shocking, so utterly unnatural, that I stumbled back, a scream catching in my throat. The figure moved, its form blurring in the darkness, and I knew I had been seen. I was out of time. My eyes darted around the room, desperate for a way out, and that's when I saw it, the fireplace. It was old, its hearth filled with the ashes of long-extinguished fires, but it offered a glimmer of hope. Could I fit? Could I climb up and out, escaping this nightmare through the chimney? I had no time to weigh the odds. I lunged for the fireplace just as another slam shook the cabin, this one so powerful it seemed to lift the whole structure off its foundation. I heard wood splinter, nails groan, and I knew the door wouldn't hold much longer. I scrambled into the fireplace, my hands grasping at the brick interior, my feet finding purchase on the narrow ledge. I began to climb, each movement a battle against gravity and fear. I was a few feet up when I heard it, the sound of wood giving way, the crash of a door flying off its hinges. It was followed by a thud, heavy and final, as if something had just landed inside. I froze, my body pressed against the chimney's narrow walls, my breath shallow and rapid. I was cornered, like an animal in a trap, and as I clung there, suspended between hope and despair, I knew one thing with chilling certainty. It was inside, and it was coming for me. My muscles screamed with each inch I climbed, my fingers digging into the soot-covered bricks. I was a few feet up the chimney, but it felt like miles. My mind raced with thoughts of escape, of somehow reaching the top and pulling myself out into the storm. But even that grim prospect was better than facing whatever had just entered the cabin. 
Then I heard it, the slow, deliberate thud of footsteps on the wooden floor below. Each step was a seismic event, shaking the very foundation of the cabin and sending a fresh wave of terror through me. I held my breath, praying that it wouldn't look up, that it wouldn't discover my desperate hiding place. The smell hit me first, a putrid mix of earth and rot, tinged with the metallic scent of blood. It filled the narrow chimney, choking me, making my eyes water and my stomach churn. I gagged, my body convulsing involuntarily, and that's when I heard it. A low growl, a sound so full of malice it seemed to freeze my very blood. I looked down, and through the darkness I saw it, its head thrust into the fireplace, its empty sockets staring up at me. It snarled, a sound of pure primal hunger, and began to climb. I scrambled higher, my movements frantic, my hands slipping on the sooty bricks. I was running out of chimney, running out of time. My arms ached, my legs trembled, but I pushed on, driven by pure adrenaline and terror. I could hear it below me, its movements slower but no less determined, its growls echoing up the narrow shaft. Then, just when I thought I couldn't go any further, my hand found something. A ledge, a break in the chimney, just big enough for me to crawl into. I pulled myself up, my muscles screaming in protest, and squeezed into the narrow space. I was trapped, cornered, but at least I was out of reach. Or so I thought. I heard it snarl, a sound of frustration and rage, and then, to my horror, I felt it. The chimney walls shaking, bricks dislodging, falling past me in a shower of soot and dust. It was tearing the chimney apart, its strength unimaginable, its determination relentless. I pressed myself into the ledge, my body shaking, my mind numb with terror. I knew I couldn't escape, couldn't climb any higher. I was stuck, and it was only a matter of time. As I sat there waiting for the end, my phone buzzed, its screen lighting up the darkness. Battery low, it flashed, and then went dark. My last link to the outside world, gone. And that's when I heard it, a final triumphant growl, followed by the sound of bricks giving way, tumbling down into the fireplace below. It was coming, its ascent now unimpeded, its victory assured. As I sat there, my body paralyzed with fear, I knew one thing with chilling clarity. I was not alone. I've always felt at home in the woods. The smell of damp earth, the rustle of leaves underfoot, the distant chatter of woodland creatures. It's like a symphony to me. My name's Rick, and I've been hunting in the Ozark since I was old enough to hold a rifle. But this trip was different. It had a different air about it, like the woods themselves were holding their breath. Jeremiah, my best friend since grade school, was with me. He's Choctaw, and his family's been in these parts longer than anyone can remember. We were packing up my truck, stowing away our 30, 30 Marlins, .44 Magnums, and hunting knives. We had tags for almost anything that moved in the Ozarks, but we were really hoping for an elk or a big buck. As we were double-checking our gear, Jeremiah's mom came out onto the porch. She had that look on her face, the one that said she was about to impart some kind of wisdom that we'd probably ignore. Boys, she began, you know the Ozarks aren't just trees and animals. There are stories, old stories, my parents and grandparents would tell. Yeah, Mom, we know, Jeremiah interrupted, rolling his eyes. Sasquatch, shapeshifters, the whole nine yards, she sighed. I'm serious. Be careful out there. Those legends have been around for a reason. We both nodded, more to humor her than anything else. I mean, come on, shapeshifters? This was the 21st century. We had rifles with scopes, for heaven's sake. What could go wrong? We hit the road the truck's tires crunching over the gravel as we left civilization behind. The deeper we went into the Ozarks, the more alive I felt. The worries of school, family, and the future seemed to fade away, absorbed by the towering trees and endless sky. We reached our spot, a secluded area we'd scouted weeks before. It was perfect, a small clearing surrounded by dense forest, a natural corridor for game. We set up our blind, a makeshift structure of camo netting and branches, it wasn't the Ritz, but it would keep us hidden. As we settled in, I couldn't help but think about what Jeremiah's mom had said. I looked over at him. He was cleaning his rifle, focused and methodical. You ever think there's something more out here? I asked. He looked up, locking eyes with me. What do you mean? You know, like what your mom was talking about. 
Sasquatch, shapeshifters, that sort of thing. He chuckled. Man, those are just stories to keep kids from wandering off into the woods. We've got guns. We've got ammo. What's there to worry about? I nodded, but a small voice in the back of my mind whispered, What if the stories are true? I shook off the thought. We were here to hunt, and daylight was burning. I chambered around into my marlin and peered through the scope, scanning the tree line for movement. Little did I know, the Ozarks had something planned for us, something that would make me question everything I thought I knew about these woods. And so, with the sun sinking lower in the sky, we waited. But we weren't alone. The sun was a golden disk hanging low in the sky, casting long shadows that danced with the wind. The woods were alive with the sounds of nature, a cacophony that could lull you into a false sense of security. But Jeremiah and I knew better. We were predators in this landscape, but we weren't the only ones. We'd been in the blind for a couple of hours, our eyes peeled for any sign of game. The anticipation was like electricity, buzzing through my veins, making every sense heightened. That's when I saw it, a flash of tawny fur, a ripple in the sea of green and brown. Over there, I whispered, nodding toward the spot where I'd seen the movement. Jeremiah shifted his position, his eyes following the line of my gaze. I see it, he murmured, mountain lion. My heart pounded in my chest. A mountain lion was a rare sight and a dangerous one, but we had tags and we had the firepower to take it down. This was the kind of story you'd tell for years, the kind of hunt that made legends. Jeremiah shouldered his marlin, his finger hovering over the trigger. He took a deep breath, steadying his aim. I held my own breath, as if that could somehow help him make the shot. Time seemed to slow down, each second stretching out, taut as a bowstring. And then the mountain lion moved. It wasn't a sudden dash or a leap. It simply walked behind a tree, its tail flicking out of sight like a wisp of smoke. Jeremiah let out his breath, his finger easing off the trigger. Damn, he muttered, lost the shot. We waited, our eyes glued to that tree as if we could will the animal to reappear. Minutes ticked by, turning into hours. The sun dipped lower, the light fading, turning the world into a canvas of grays and blacks. But the mountain lion didn't come back. You think it knew we were here? I finally asked, breaking the silence. Jeremiah shrugged. Animals are smarter than we give them credit for. Maybe it sensed something was off. Or maybe it was something else, something we couldn't understand. I thought back to the legends, the stories of shapeshifters and creatures that walked between worlds. It sounded crazy, but out here, in the gathering dark, anything seemed possible. We should pack up, Jeremiah said, breaking into my thoughts. It's getting too dark to shoot. I nodded, but as we started to gather our gear, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. It was like a prickling on the back of my neck, a whisper in the wind. I scanned the tree line one last time, half expecting to see a pair of glowing eyes staring back at me. But there was nothing, just the trees and the shadows and the secrets they kept. As we left the blind, I took one last look at that tree, the one where the mountain lion had disappeared. And for the first time, I wondered if Jeremiah's mom was right. Maybe there were things in these woods that defied explanation. Things that existed only in the space between legend and reality. And maybe, just maybe, we had come closer to that space than we'd ever wanted to. The next morning broke clear and crisp, the air tinged with the scent of pine and damp earth. We were back in the blind, rifles at the ready, but the atmosphere was different. The events of the previous day hung over us like a cloud unspoken but palpable. I was scanning the tree line, my eyes still not fully trusting what they saw, when Jeremiah nudged me. Look, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. I followed his gaze and saw it, a bobcat emerging from behind the very tree where the mountain lion had vanished. My mind raced. Bobcats were common enough in the Ozarks, but this was something else. This was the same spot, the same eerie feeling of being watched. That's not right, I muttered. It can't be the same animal. Jeremiah shook his head. I don't know, man, but something's off. The bobcat seemed to hear us. It turned its head, its eyes locking onto ours. Those eyes were a deep yellow, almost golden, 
and they seemed to bore right into my soul. Then, as if making a decision, the bobcats started walking toward us. My heart pounded in my chest. Bobcats usually avoided humans. They were solitary creatures, more likely to run than confront. But this one was different. It moved with purpose, as if it had something to prove. It stopped a few yards from the blind, right under the window where we'd set up our rifles. It crouched low, its body coiling like a spring, its eyes never leaving ours. Jeremiah, I said, my voice shaky. Do something. He didn't need to be told twice. He grabbed his .44 magnum and aimed it at the bobcat. I'm going to give you to the count of three, he said, his voice steady. One, two. We both held our breath, waiting for the inevitable. The bobcat seemed to sense what was coming. Its muscles tensed, its eyes narrowed, and then, just as Jeremiah was about to say three, the bobcat relaxed. It stood up, turned around, and walked away, as if it had made its point. But before it vanished into the woods, it looked back over its shoulder, its eyes meeting ours one last time. It was a look I couldn't describe, a mix of defiance and something else, something almost human. We sat there in stunned silence, our weapons forgotten, our minds racing. What had just happened? What had we just seen? Was that a warning? Jeremiah finally asked, breaking the silence. I don't know, I replied, but it felt like one. We packed up our gear, our movements mechanical, our minds elsewhere. As we left the blind, I couldn't shake the feeling that we'd crossed a line, that we'd ventured into a world we didn't understand. And as we made our way back to the truck, I thought about the legends, the stories of shapeshifters and creatures that defied explanation. I thought about the warning from Jeremiah's mom, the one we'd ignored, and I realized, maybe for the first time, that there were things in these woods that were beyond our understanding, things that existed in the shadows, in the space between the known and the unknown. And whether we liked it or not, we were now a part of that world. We were back at my place, the walls closing in after the vast openness of the Ozarks, the air felt heavy, saturated with questions we didn't want to ask. Jeremiah had left, muttering something about needing to talk to his mom. I was alone, staring at the screen of my laptop, my fingers hovering over the keys. I'd started to research the legends, the folklore that we'd laughed off as mere stories. Shapeshifters, skinwalkers, beings that could change their form at will. The more I read, the more the pieces started to fit like a jigsaw puzzle revealing an image too unsettling to contemplate. The bobcat, the mountain lion, the inexplicable feeling of being watched, they all pointed to something beyond the realm of the natural, something that defied explanation. And the most terrifying part? These beings were said to mark those who'd seen them, to claim them as part of their world. I was so engrossed in my research that I didn't hear the sound at first. A soft scratching, like claws against wood. It was coming from outside, from the direction of the woods. My heart started to pound, each beat echoing the sound that was growing louder, more insistent. I grabbed my .44 Magnum from the table and made my way to the window. My hands were shaking as I pulled back the curtain, my eyes scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. And then I saw it, a pair of eyes, glowing in the dark, staring right at me. I aimed my gun, my finger trembling on the trigger. But before I could shoot, a voice echoed in my mind, as clear as if someone were standing right next to me. You are marked, it said. You are one of us now. I staggered back, my gun slipping from my grasp. The eyes vanished, swallowed by the darkness, but the message was clear. I was marked, claimed, a part of a world I'd never wanted to enter. My phone buzzed, breaking the silence. It was a text from Jeremiah. We need to talk, it read. Mom says there's something we have to do, a ritual to cleanse ourselves. She says it's the only way to break the mark. I started to type a reply, my fingers fumbling over the keys. But before I could hit send, another message popped up on my screen. It was from an unknown number, a string of digits that made no sense. Don't bother, it read. You're already one of us. My blood turned to ice, my fingers freezing over the keys. The room seemed to close in the walls pulsating like a living thing, and in that moment, I knew. The legends were real, the mark was real, and my life, as I knew it, was over. I heard the scratching again, louder this time, more insistent. It was coming from the door, 
from the other side of the thin barrier that separated me from the darkness. And as I sat there, paralyzed by fear, I realized the terrifying truth. I was not alone, and I would never be alone again. My Uncle Jack and I had been hunting these Illinois woods since I was old enough to hold a rifle. We knew every deer trail, every thicket, every hollow like the back of our hands. But familiarity can sometimes breed a dangerous sort of confidence, the kind that makes you forget that even well-trodden paths can hold secrets. It was deer season, and the woods were alive with the promise of a good hunt. Uncle Jack and I had spent the day checking tree stands and marking new trails, Poaching had been a problem in these parts, and we wanted to make sure we had the upper hand this season. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple, we called it a day. I headed home, my mind already drifting to the hunt ahead. The phone rang just as I was cleaning my rifle. It was Uncle Jack. Hey, I think I dropped my wallet somewhere in the woods, he said, his voice tinged with annoyance. You mind taking a look? You're closer, and it's going to be dark soon. I glanced at the clock. 8 p.m. Late, but not too late. Sure, I'll go take a look, I said, my voice more eager than I intended. A chance to be back in the woods? I'd take it, lost wallet or not. I grabbed my flashlight and headed out, my truck's tires crunching on the gravel road that led to our usual hunting grounds. The woods welcomed me like an old friend, its towering trees forming a dark canopy against the night sky. I switched on my flashlight its beam cutting through the darkness as I retraced the trail we'd walked earlier. As I moved deeper into the woods, I couldn't shake off a nagging feeling that something was off. The air felt heavier, as if charged with static, and the usual night sound seemed muted, distant. I shook my head, chiding myself for letting my imagination run wild. I was about to turn back when my flashlight beam caught something unusual on the ground, a patch of freshly disturbed earth as if something had been digging. Curiosity peaked. I moved closer, my senses on high alert. That's when I heard it, a soft rustling sound, like the whisper of leaves in the wind, but different, more deliberate. I swung my flashlight around, its beam darting from tree to tree, but there was nothing, just the dark, impenetrable woods staring back at me. I took a deep breath, steadying my nerves. It's just the woods, I told myself. You've been here a thousand times but even as the words left my mouth, I knew something had changed. These woods were no longer the sanctuary I had always known. They had become a labyrinth of shadows, hiding secrets that I was not sure I wanted to uncover. I turned back, my steps quickening as I made my way to my truck. Uncle Jack's wallet would have to wait. Right now, all I wanted was to put as much distance as possible between me and whatever was lurking in those woods. As I reached my truck, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was not alone, that something was watching me, hidden in the darkness. And for the first time in my life, the woods felt like a place where I did not belong. I drove away, but the unease stayed with me, a dark cloud hanging over my thoughts. I knew I would have to go back, but the thought filled me with a dread I had never felt before, because I knew that these woods were hiding something, something that I was not sure I was ready to face. I couldn't shake the feeling that last night had left me with. The woods had always been a second home, a sanctuary, but now they felt like a maze with walls closing in. Still, Uncle Jack's wallet was out there, and I couldn't let my newfound apprehensions keep me from doing a simple favor for family. I waited until daylight had fully settled in before heading back. The sun was a reassuring presence, its rays filtering through the canopy of leaves, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. Daylight makes all the difference, I told myself gripping the flashlight in my pocket, just in case. I retraced our steps, my eyes scanning the ground for that familiar piece of leather. I reached the spot where I'd turned back the night before, the patch of freshly disturbed earth. It looked different in the daylight, less menacing, but I couldn't shake off the unease that tightened in my chest. That's when I saw it, a figure in the distance, hunched over, sniffing the ground. My heart skipped a beat. A poacher? No, this was different. The figure moved in a way that was almost animalistic, its motions too fluid, too deliberate. I felt a chill crawl up my spine as it lifted its head, as if sensing my presence. For a moment, our eyes locked, 
and a wave of dread washed over me. This wasn't just some lost hiker or a poacher. This was something else. Something I couldn't, didn't want to, identify. My fight-or-flight instincts kicked in hard. I turned and bolted, my boots pounding against the earth, every snap twig echoing like a gunshot in my ears. I didn't look back. I couldn't. The only thing that mattered was the growing distance between me and whatever that thing was. As I neared my truck, a guttural scream ripped through the air, echoing through the trees. It was a sound I'd never heard before, a sound that no animal I knew could make. It was as if the woods themselves were crying out, warning me, urging me to go faster. I reached the truck, my hands trembling as I fumbled with the keys. Just as I slammed the door shut, something, someone, rushed past me, a blur in the corner of my eye, disappearing into the other section of the woods. I jammed the key into the ignition and turned, half expecting to see that figure emerge from the trees, but there was nothing. As I drove away, my heart still pounding in my chest, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd escaped something terrible. But what? My mind raced through the possibilities. A ghost, a demon, a skinwalker? I didn't know and I wasn't sure I wanted to find out. The woods had always been my sanctuary, a place where I felt most alive. But now, they felt like a tomb, hiding secrets darker than the shadows that danced between the trees. As I left, I looked in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see that figure standing in the road behind me. But there was nothing, just the empty road and the towering trees, their branches swaying in the wind as if waving goodbye. I knew then that these woods would never be the same for me. And as I drove away, I couldn't help but wonder, what else was out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to venture too deep? Years slipped by like water through a sieve, but the memory of that night in the woods remained, lodged in my mind like a splinter I couldn't remove. I'd taken to hunting in different areas, places where the trees didn't seem to whisper secrets, and the shadows didn't dance with hidden figures. But the woods have a way of following you, even when you try to leave them behind. It was my Aunt Sarah who brought it all rushing back. She lived closer to those woods, in a house that bordered the fields, leading to that tangled maze of trees. One evening she called me, her voice tinged with a nervous energy I'd never heard before. I saw something, something I can't explain, she said, pausing as if searching for the right words. It was a figure, all black, walking in the field, but its head, its head looked like that of a crow. I felt a chill creep up my spine, a haunting echo of the dread I'd felt years before. Did it see you? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. I don't know, she replied, but when I looked again, it was gone, just vanished. Not long after that call, a fire broke out in the woods. It raged for hours, consuming acres of trees and underbrush, as if trying to cleanse the land of some unspeakable evil. The firefighters managed to contain it, but the damage was done. The woods were scarred, changed, as if bearing the physical manifestation of the darkness I'd always felt. But it didn't end there. Aunt Sarah started hearing things. Voices that whispered in the wind. Strange noises that echoed in the night. Something tapping on the walls of her house. Even her dog, Max, seemed to sense something, growling at unseen threats and pacing restlessly through the house. We need to do something, she said when she called me again. I can't live like this. I'm putting up cameras around the house. I agreed, more for her peace of mind than any real belief that we'd catch something on film. But deep down, a part of me hoped we would, that we'd finally get some tangible proof of the darkness that lurked in those woods. We spent a weekend setting up the cameras, positioning them to cover the fields, the edge of the woods, and the perimeter of her house. We tested them, made sure they were working, and then we waited. It didn't take long. Just two nights later, the cameras triggered, motion sensors picking up something that moved in the field, near the edge of the woods. My heart pounded as I clicked on the video file, my eyes straining to make out the shape that flickered on the screen. For a brief moment it was there, a shadowy figure, its form indistinct but unmistakably real. And then the screen went black, the file corrupted, unreadable. We caught it, Aunt Sarah said when I called her, her voice tinged with both relief and fear. We caught something, but even as she said it, I knew we'd caught nothing at all. Whatever haunted those woods had shown itself, 
but it remained elusive, a darkness that refused to be caught in the light. And as the screen flickered back to black, I couldn't shake the feeling that we'd only scratched the surface of something far deeper, far more terrifying than we'd ever imagined. The corrupted video file sat on my computer like an unopened letter from a long-lost friend, both inviting and foreboding. I tried every trick in the book to recover it, but it was as if the file itself resisted being viewed. Finally, I had to admit defeat. The cameras went offline shortly after, their lenses clouded as if touched by some unseen hand. They never worked again. I couldn't shake the feeling that we'd poked the bear, stirred something that should have been left alone. Aunt Sarah felt it too. She sold her house, moved to a small apartment in town, far from the whispering woods and haunting fields. But you can't escape something that doesn't want to be escaped. I took to hunting in other places, far from those cursed woods. But no matter where I went, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that I was the one being hunted now. The woods had eyes, and those eyes had followed me. Then came the call that I'd been dreading. It was from a local hunter, a guy I'd met a few times at the local bar. He'd been out near those woods, the ones I'd sworn never to return to. You should come see this, he said, his voice trembling. There are holes, man. Fresh holes, like someone's been digging. My heart sank. The old legend about the man who killed his wife and buried her in those woods, searching for the money she'd hidden, flashed through my mind. The low spots, the freshly disturbed earth, it all connected in a horrifying clarity. I met him near the woods, my hands shaking as I parked my truck. We walked in silence, the weight of our unspoken fears as heavy as the rifles slung over our shoulders, and then we saw them, holes freshly dug, the earth upturned as if in a frenzied search for something. Look, he said, pointing to one of the holes. Inside it was a wallet, old and weathered, its leather cracked and faded. It was Uncle Jack's. As I picked it up, a scream echoed through the woods, a guttural, inhuman sound that froze my blood. I looked up, and for a brief moment I saw it, the figure, its eyes glowing in the dim light, its form an indistinct shadow that seemed to absorb the very darkness around it. And then it was gone, vanished into the depths of the woods, leaving nothing but the chilling echo of its scream and the haunting emptiness of its gaze. I dropped the wallet, my hands trembling, my heart pounding in my chest. We turned and ran, our feet barely touching the ground, our breaths coming in ragged gasps. We didn't stop until we reached the truck, and even then, the feeling of dread remained, a dark cloud that hung over us like a shroud. As I drove away, my eyes caught a glimpse of something in the rearview mirror, a figure, standing at the edge of the woods, watching. I don't know what haunts those woods, ghost, demon, skinwalker, or something far worse, but I do know this. It knows me now, knows that I've seen it, that I've touched a piece of its dark world. And as I drove away, leaving those cursed woods behind, I couldn't shake the feeling that a part of it had followed me, a shadow that would forever linger at the edge of my life, waiting for the moment when it could step fully into the light. I've always been a believer in the things that lurk just beyond the veil of our understanding. Maybe it's the Mexican blood that runs through my veins, or the countless nights I spent as a kid listening to my grandma recount tales of La Llorona and El Chupacabra. So, when my brother Alex decided to move to Kirtland, New Mexico, to finish his college degree, I couldn't shake the feeling that he was stepping into a landscape ripe for the inexplicable. Kirtland wasn't just any town. It sat across the river from a Native American reservation, primarily occupied by the Danae tribe, or as most folks know them, the Navajo. My grandparents had been living there for years, their home a cozy but aging structure that had seen better days. I helped Alex pack up his old Ford truck, throwing in boxes of textbooks, clothes, and that old guitar he never seemed to play, but refused to leave behind. Take care of yourself, hermano. I said, slapping him on the back as he climbed into the driver's seat. Don't I always? He grinned, his eyes alight with the kind of youthful excitement that comes from embarking on a new adventure. The drive from Kansas to New Mexico was a long one, but Alex said it was uneventful. He called me the moment he arrived, his voice tinged with exhaustion, but also a hint of awe. This place is something else, man. 
he told me. There's a kind of stillness here, a quiet that makes your skin prickle. He settled into life quickly, enrolling in classes at the college in Farmington, a neighboring town, and even landing a part-time job at a hardware store. It was a small, family-run place, the kind where the paint on the signs had started to chip and fade, but nobody really minded. The store was frequented by locals, many of whom were Native Americans from the reservation. Alex was a social guy, always had been, and he soon struck up friendships with some of the regulars. They'd talk about all sorts of things, from the weather to local politics. But what really caught Alex's attention were the stories they'd share. Ghost stories, legends, tales that made the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Only a select few ever mentioned the word skinwalker, and when they did, their voices would drop to a whisper, as if saying the word too loudly might invoke something terrible. Man, you wouldn't believe the stories these guys have, Alex told me one evening over the phone. Makes you wonder what's really out there, you know? I chuckled. Well, just remember, curiosity killed the cat. Yeah, but satisfaction brought it back, he retorted, and we both laughed, comfortable in the knowledge that whatever was out there, it was simply part of the grand tapestry of life's mysteries, or so we thought. As April rolled around, the days growing longer and the nights warmer, a sense of normalcy settled over Alex's life. Classes, work, the occasional night out with friends. It was easy to forget that he was living in a place where the boundary between the known and the unknown seemed so permeable. But all that was about to change. Late one night, as Alex sat in his room watching TV, he heard it, a sound that would shatter his sense of normalcy and plunge him into a world he had never imagined existed. And that was just the beginning. The clock on the wall read 11.17 p.m. I was sprawled out on my bed, half watching some late night talk show, when I heard it, a soft scraping sound like gravel being shuffled in the driveway. My first thought was that it was grandma, maybe letting the dog out for a late night bathroom break. But then it hit me. It was way past her bedtime. She'd be sound asleep by now. I muted the TV, straining my ears. The sound came again, closer this time, more deliberate. A shiver crawled up my spine. I got up and tiptoed to the window, my heart pounding in my chest like a drum. I parted the blinds just enough to peek through. What I saw out there froze me to my core. It was crawling across the driveway, this thing. It had hind legs like a bear, a torso that seemed to ripple with muscle, and a head that was canine but not quite. Its snout was shorter, more grotesque, and its eyes, those bright yellow eyes, seemed to glow in the darkness, locking onto something I couldn't see. For a moment it stopped, as if sensing that it was being watched. Then, in a movement that defied all logic, it rose. It stood up on its hind legs, towering over the ground, and sniffed the air. I felt like it was sniffing for me. I was paralyzed, caught in some sort of trance I couldn't explain. My mind screamed at me to move, to close the blinds and back away, but my body wouldn't listen. I was locked in its gaze, those yellow eyes piercing through the night, through the window, through me. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it dropped back onto all fours. With a speed that seemed impossible for its size, it darted toward the property gate. It didn't jump over it, didn't break it down. It crawled over it, its body contorting in ways that made my stomach churn. And then it was gone, swallowed by the darkness. I stumbled back from the window, my legs weak, my breath shallow. What had I just seen? Was it a figment of my imagination, a trick of the light? Or had I come face to face with something otherworldly? I grabbed my phone and dialed my brother's number. It rang once, twice, then went to voicemail. I hung up, my hands trembling. I needed to tell someone, to share what I'd seen, but the words caught in my throat. Who would believe me? Hell, did I even believe myself? I sat back on my bed, my eyes darting to the window every few seconds. The TV host was laughing at some joke, the audience joining in, a world so blissfully unaware of the darkness that lurked just beyond the veil of our understanding. I knew one thing for certain. I had stepped over that veil tonight, and there was no turning back. Whatever this was, whatever I had seen, it was only the beginning. And the most terrifying thought of all, it knew I was here. I didn't sleep a wink that night. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the wind against the window, sent my heart racing. By the time dawn broke, painting the sky with hues of orange and pink, I was a mess of frayed nerves and unspoken fears. 
I went to work that day like a zombie, my movements mechanical, my interactions forced. The hardware store was busy, a constant stream of customers needing help with this or that, but my mind was elsewhere, lost in the haunting images of the previous night. Hey, you okay? It was Tom, a Navajo guy who'd been working at the store long before I got there. He was older, maybe in his fifties, with a face that looked like it had seen its fair share of hard times. I hesitated, unsure of how much to reveal. Had a rough night, I finally said, opting for vagueness. Tom looked at me, his eyes narrowing. You saw something, didn't you? The directness of his question caught me off guard. What makes you say that? He leaned in closer, lowering his voice. This land, it's old, filled with stories and spirits that most people don't understand, but sometimes they make themselves known. I felt a chill run down my spine. Like a skinwalker? Tom's eyes widened and he quickly made the sign of the cross. Don't say that word out loud, it's bad medicine. But you know what I'm talking about? He nodded, his face grave. I do, and if you've seen one, you need to be careful. They're not to be taken lightly. I told him about the creature I'd seen, about its yellow eyes and the way it had sniffed the air, as if searching for something or someone. When I finished, Tom was silent for a long moment. Sounds like you had a close encounter, he finally said. You should speak to a medicine man, get some protection. Protection? You mean like a talisman or something? Something like that. But more importantly, you need to understand what you're dealing with. These beings, they're not just legends or folklore. They're real and they're dangerous. I thought about my grandparents' house, about its proximity to the river. Is it true that they use rivers for rituals? Tom nodded. Water is a conduit for spiritual energy, both good and bad. If your grandparents' house is near a river, it could be a pathway. A pathway for what? For them to enter our world. I felt my blood run cold. So what do I do? First, speak to a medicine man. Second, be vigilant. These beings, they're cunning, manipulative. They'll try to trick you, to lure you into their world. And then what? Tom looked at me, his eyes filled with a mixture of fear and sadness. Then you'll be lost, forever. As I left the store that day, Tom's words echoed in my mind, filling me with a dread that was as palpable as it was intangible. I was entangled in something far greater and more terrifying than I could have ever imagined, and the worst part, I was in it alone. Mid-May brought with it a sense of celebration. My graduation was a milestone, a beacon of hope in the midst of the chaos that had become my life. My family, ever supportive, made the journey to Kirtland. We laughed, shared stories, and for a brief moment, I allowed myself to forget the terror that lurked in the shadows. We set up a pop-up camper behind my grandparents' house. It was cozy, filled with the familiar sounds of my cousin's laughter and the comforting aroma of my grandmother's cooking. That night, as the stars painted the sky, we sat around a campfire, the warmth of the flames warding off the chill of the desert night. But as the embers died and we retreated into the camper, a sense of unease settled over me. The darkness outside seemed thicker, more oppressive. I tried to shake off the feeling, attributing it to the stories and warnings that had consumed my thoughts in recent weeks. I was jolted awake in the dead of night by a soft, almost inaudible sound. It was a rhythmic tapping, like fingers drumming on a window pane. My heart raced as I remembered the creature, its yellow eyes and its haunting presence. I lay still, hoping it was just a dream. But then, my grandmother's voice pierced the silence. Who's out there? She whispered, her voice trembling with fear. I sat up, straining my ears. The tapping had stopped, replaced by a soft, almost melodic humming. It was a tune I recognized, one my grandmother used to hum to me as a child. But this was different, distorted, as if coming from far away. I mustered the courage to peek out of the window. The moonlight bathed the yard in a silvery glow, casting eerie shadows on the ground. And there, standing in the middle of the camper, was a silhouette. It was tall, its frame reminiscent of my uncle's. But there was something off about it. It stood still, its head tilted, as if listening. My grandmother's voice broke the silence again. It's watching them, she whispered, her voice filled with terror. I followed her gaze to the trailer where my cousins and uncle slept. The silhouette was now closer, its form clearer in the moonlight. It was not my uncle. Its limbs were too long, its posture too unnatural. 
and its eyes, those familiar yellow eyes, stared intently at the sleeping forms inside. Frozen in fear, I watched as it leaned closer, its breath fogging up the window of the trailer. It seemed to be studying them, its head tilting from side to side as if trying to understand. And then, in a swift, fluid motion, it turned its gaze to our camper, our eyes locked, and a cold dread washed over me. It knew. It knew I had seen it, that I was aware of its presence. With a guttural growl, it lunged at our camper, its form blurring in the darkness. I screamed, the sound echoing in the still night, but before it could reach us, it vanished, leaving behind only the chilling memory of its presence. The next morning we found the trailer empty. My cousins and uncle were gone without a trace. The only evidence of their presence was the fogged up window and a single chilling message written in the condensation, we are always watching. The terror of that night will forever haunt me, for I know that somewhere out there, in the shadows, they are waiting, watching, and one day they will come for me. I turned 16 on a hot June day, the kind where the air sticks to your skin like a second layer. Birthdays had lost their shine over the years, but this one felt different. 16 meant freedom, or at least the promise of it. But freedom was still a year away, I couldn't drive yet. So I decided to spend my newfound maturity visiting my sister Morgan in Cleveland. Morgan had moved to Cleveland a couple of years back, chasing some dream job in marketing. She lived in a small house with creaky floors and an attic that smelled like old books and mothballs. It was a far cry from the sprawling Wyoming landscapes I was used to, but it was a change, and at 16, any change felt like an adventure. Morgan was seven years my senior, the responsible one, with a boyfriend named Nate, who had a beard and drove a pickup. Nate was okay, a bit too serious for my taste, but he treated Morgan well, and that was what counted. I'd been in Cleveland for a few days, mostly confined to the attic Morgan had converted into a makeshift guest room. It was hot up there, the kind of heat that makes you feel like you're breathing through a wet cloth. I passed the time playing GTA on an old console, the sounds of virtual car chases filling the small space. It was a way to kill time, nothing more. Morgan worked most days, and Nate was often busy with whatever it was he did for a living. So, it was a surprise when they both showed up in the attic one evening, beers in hand, with a proposal. How about we go light some fireworks for the fourth? Nate asked, scratching his beard as if pondering the complexities of the universe. There's a secluded park not far from here. Could be fun. I looked up from my game, pausing to consider the offer. The attic was stifling, and the thought of spending another evening up here was less than appealing. Plus, fireworks meant a break from the monotony a chance to feel like a normal teenager, if only for a night. Sure, I said, setting down the controller. Why not? Morgan grinned, her eyes lighting up in a way I hadn't seen in years. Great, it's a plan then. As they left the attic, I couldn't shake the feeling that this 4th of July would be different. Maybe it was the promise of fireworks, or perhaps the simple joy of doing something, anything that broke the routine. But deep down, a small voice whispered that this adventure would be unlike any other. I shrugged off the thought, attributing it to the overactive imagination of a bored 16-year-old. But as I'd soon find out, some instincts are better left unignored. The night was warm, the kind of summer evening that makes you forget about the passage of time. We piled into Nate's pickup, the engine rumbling to life like a beast waking from slumber. Morgan sat shotgun, flipping through her phone, while I claimed the back seat, my eyes fixed on the darkening horizon. Nate drove with a steady hand, his eyes focused on the road as if he were deciphering some hidden message in the asphalt. We left the city lights behind, venturing into the outskirts where civilization gave way to untamed land. The road twisted and turned, leading us deeper into the wilderness. We're almost there, Nate announced, breaking the silence that had settled over us like a thick fog. It's just past this hill. As we descended, the world around us seemed to change. The sky turned a deeper shade of black, as if someone had thrown a dark cloth over the moon and stars. The headlights cut through the darkness, two beams of light in an ocean of nothingness. That's when I saw it, a deer standing by the side of the road, its eyes catching the light in a way that made them glow an eerie yellow. 
but before I could get a good look, it vanished. One moment it was there, and the next it was gone, as if swallowed by the night itself. I blinked, trying to make sense of what I'd just seen. Deer were common in these parts, but something about this one felt off. Its eyes had glowed in a way that seemed almost unnatural, and its disappearance was too swift, too silent. You okay back there? Morgan asked, her eyes meeting mine through the rearview mirror. Yeah, I said, forcing a smile. Just thought I saw a deer is all. Morgan shrugged, turning her attention back to her phone, but Nate glanced at me, his eyes narrowing as if he were weighing my words. We drove in silence for a few more minutes, the tension in the car thickening like quicksand. Finally, we reached a parking lot, a small patch of civilization in the middle of nowhere. Nate pulled in, killing the engine. We're here, he said, a hint of excitement creeping into his voice. I looked out the window, taking in our surroundings. We were parked next to a large field, the tall grass swaying gently in the night breeze. On the other side was a dense forest, its trees standing tall like ancient guardians. As I stepped out of the car, a chill ran down my spine. The air had turned cold, a stark contrast to the warmth of just a few minutes ago. I wrapped my arms around myself, trying to shake off the sudden drop in temperature, but the chill remained, clinging to me like a second skin. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone, that something was watching us from the shadows. I glanced at Morgan and Nate, but they seemed oblivious, caught up in the excitement of the night. As Nate began setting up the fireworks, I couldn't help but wonder if we were making a mistake. But before I could voice my concerns, a loud pop echoed through the air, signaling the start of our 4th of July celebrations. And so, with a sense of foreboding hanging heavy in the air, we stepped into the unknown, blissfully unaware of the eyes that watched us from the darkness. Nate wasted no time. He pulled a box of fireworks from the back of the pickup and began setting them up in the field. The air was thick with anticipation, each of us lost in our thoughts as we waited for the show to begin. Morgan was busy capturing the moment on her phone, her face illuminated by the soft glow of the screen. I leaned against the car, my eyes drifting to the forest that bordered the field. The trees stood like dark sentinels, their branches swaying gently in the wind. It was a peaceful scene, but the tranquility did little to ease the sense of unease that had settled over me. The temperature had dropped noticeably since we arrived, and I found myself shivering despite the warm clothes I was wearing. It was as if the very air around us had changed, growing colder, denser, as if warning us to leave. Ready? Nate called out, lighting the fuse on the first firework. A loud pop echoed through the air, followed by a burst of color that lit up the night sky. For a moment, all thoughts of unease were forgotten as we watched the display our faces lit up by the vibrant hues of the fireworks. But as the last firework exploded in a shower of sparks, the sense of foreboding returned, stronger than before. I looked around half expecting to see something lurking in the shadows, but there was nothing, just the empty field and the dark forest beyond. That's when I heard it, the sound of breaking branches, followed by heavy footsteps that seemed to come from the forest. My heart began to race each beat echoing in my ears as I strained to hear over the sound of my own breathing. Did you guys hear that? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Hear what? Morgan replied, her eyes meeting mine. Those footsteps, I said, pointing toward the forest. Something's out there. Morgan laughed, dismissing my concerns with a wave of her hand. You're just being paranoid. It's probably just an animal. But as she spoke, I saw it. A silhouette in the tree line, barely visible in the darkness. It looked like a deer, but there was something off about it. From what I could make out, it was standing on its hind legs, its eyes fixed on us as if watching, waiting. We should go, I said, my voice tinged with urgency. Something's not right. Morgan rolled her eyes, clearly unconvinced. You worry too much, just relax and enjoy the night. But as we climbed back into the car... I couldn't shake the feeling that we were making a grave mistake. The eyes that had watched us from the forest seemed to bore into me, filling me with a sense of dread that I couldn't explain. As Nate started the engine, I took one last look at the forest, half expecting to see the creature emerge from the shadows, but there was nothing, just the empty field and the dark trees beyond. 
their branches swaying gently in the wind as if waving goodbye. And so, with a heavy heart, we left the park, each of us lost in our thoughts as we drove back to Cleveland. But as the city lights came into view, I couldn't help but wonder if anything had followed us home. The pickup's engine roared to life, shattering the silence that had enveloped us. Nate shifted into gear, and we began the ascent up the hill, leaving behind the field, the forest, and whatever it was that had been watching us. Morgan seemed lost in her own world, her fingers dancing over her phone screen as she scrolled through social media. Nate was focused on the road, his eyes scanning the darkness ahead as if expecting something to leap out at us. I sat in the back, my mind racing, my eyes darting to the rearview mirror every few seconds. John, you've been quiet, Morgan finally said, breaking the silence. You okay? I hesitated, unsure of how to put my unease into words. I just think we should have left sooner, I finally said. Morgan chuckled. You're such a worry wart. What's the worst that could have happened? I wanted to tell her about the eyes I'd seen, the footsteps I'd heard, and the inexplicable chill that had settled over me. But I held back, fearing she'd dismiss it as the overactive imagination of a 16-year-old. As we drove, the city lights of Cleveland began to appear in the distance, like stars breaking through a cloud-covered sky. It should have been a comforting sight, but it only intensified the feeling that we were bringing something back with us, something dark and malevolent. We're almost home, Nate announced as we entered the city limits. I nodded, forcing a smile, but my eyes were drawn to the rearview mirror one last time. For a split second I thought I saw something, a shadowy figure standing at the edge of the road, watching us as we drove away. But when I blinked, it was gone leaving me to wonder if it had ever been there at all. As Nate pulled into the driveway, I felt a wave of relief wash over me. We were back, safe and sound, in the heart of civilization. But as I stepped out of the car, I realized that the sense of dread that had gripped me in the park had not dissipated. It had followed me home. See you inside, Morgan said, giving me a playful nudge as she headed toward the front door. I nodded, forcing a smile, but my eyes were drawn to the trees that lined the property. They stood tall and imposing, their branches swaying gently in the night breeze, as if whispering secrets to one another. As I made my way inside, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had been part of something much larger than ourselves, something we couldn't understand or explain. And as I closed the door behind me, I knew that whatever it was, it wasn't over, it was just beginning. And so, with a heavy heart, I climbed the stairs to the attic, each step taking me further away from the events of the night, but not from the sense of foreboding that had settled over me. As I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, I couldn't help but wonder what we had left behind in that park, and what, if anything, had followed us home. The attic was a sanctuary of sorts, a place where I could escape the complexities of the world below. Morgan joined me, and we settled in to watch some late-night TV, the room was filled with the soft glow of the screen, casting shadows that danced on the walls like restless spirits. I left the window open, welcoming the night breeze that usually carried the comforting sounds of Cleveland, distant traffic, the occasional laughter of people enjoying the summer night, crickets singing their endless songs. But tonight, the air that flowed through the window was different. It was colder, heavier, as if carrying the weight of unseen eyes. As we sat there engrossed in some forgettable show, I realized that the usual sounds of the city had vanished. The room was enveloped in an eerie silence, the kind that presses against your eardrums, demanding to be acknowledged. Do you hear that? I finally asked, muting the TV. Hear what? Morgan looked at me, puzzled. The silence, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. It's too quiet. Morgan laughed dismissing my concerns with a wave of her hand. You really need to stop worrying so much. It's just a quiet night, that's all. But before I could respond, a sound pierced the silence, a loud, unnatural whistling that seemed to come from all directions at once. It was a haunting melody, one that seemed to resonate with the very air around us, filling the room with a sense of impending doom. Do you hear that? I asked, my eyes meeting Morgan's. Hear what? She replied clearly not sharing my experience. 
The whistling, I said, my voice tinged with urgency. Tell me you hear it. Morgan shook her head, her eyes narrowing as if questioning my sanity. I don't hear anything. Are you sure you're okay? But as she spoke, the whistling grew louder, its melody twisting and turning like a snake searching for its prey. It was as if the sound was coming from everywhere and nowhere at the same time, a ghostly symphony that defied explanation. Unable to bear it any longer, I rushed to the window and closed it, shutting out the night air and the haunting melody that filled it. But even as I latched the window, I knew that it was too late. Whatever it was that had been watching us, that had followed us home, was already here. I turned to Morgan, my eyes searching hers for some sign of understanding, some acknowledgement of the terror that gripped me. But there was nothing, just the blank stare of someone who had not heard the whistling, who had not felt the chill in the air, who had not seen the eyes that watched us from the darkness. And as I lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling, I knew that I was alone in my fear, isolated by an experience that defied explanation. But as the clock ticked toward morning, one thing became clear. Whatever it was that had found us, it had no intention of leaving. And so, with a heavy heart and a mind filled with questions, I closed my eyes, praying for a sleep that I knew would not come, and a peace that seemed forever out of reach. The morning light filtered through the attic window, casting a golden glow on the room. It should have been comforting, a new day wiping the slate clean, but the events of the previous night hung over me like a dark cloud, refusing to be forgotten. Morgan had already left for work, leaving me alone in the house. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The air still felt heavy, as if charged with an energy that I couldn't see but could definitely feel. I decided to go downstairs, make some coffee, try to act normal, but as I descended the steps, each creak of the wooden floor seemed to echo unnaturally, as if the house itself was warning me. I reached the kitchen and started the coffee maker. The familiar gurgling sound it made was oddly reassuring. That's when I heard it, the whistling. It was back, but this time it was coming from inside the house. My heart pounded in my chest as I followed the sound, each note guiding me like a siren's call. It led me to the front door. Taking a deep breath, I opened it. There was nothing there, just the empty driveway and the trees swaying gently in the morning breeze. But then I looked down and saw them, hoofprints leading right up to the doorstep and then disappearing, as if the creature had vanished into thin air. I slammed the door shut, my hands trembling. It was real, all of it, the deer-like creature, the whistling, the sense of dread. It was all real, and it had found me. I retreated to the attic, locking the door behind me. I sat there for what felt like hours, my eyes fixed on the window. The daylight was fading, giving way to the dark of night, and as the room grew darker, so did my thoughts. That's when I saw it, the face at the window. It was the deer-like creature, its eyes glowing an eerie yellow, but it was the expression on its face that terrified me the most. It was smiling, as if savoring a secret that only it knew. Before I could react, the creature let out a whistle, the same haunting melody that had filled the air the previous night. But this time the sound was accompanied by words, whispered so softly that they were almost lost in the wind. We see you, it said, its voice tinged with a malevolence that made my blood run cold. And then it was gone, disappearing into the night as quickly as it had come. But its words remained, echoing in my mind like a curse. I was left with a sense of dread that no morning light could dispel, a fear that clung to me like a shadow. I knew then that I was not alone, that I would never be alone again. And as I lay in bed that night staring into the darkness, I realized that the most terrifying thing of all was not the creature or the whistling or the eyes that watched from the shadows. It was the unanswered question that haunted me, a question that I feared I already knew the answer to. What did it mean when it said, we see you. And so, with a heart filled with terror and a soul forever scarred, I closed my eyes, praying for a sleep that I knew would never come, and a peace that had been shattered beyond repair. I've always had the ability to find myself in places where the map ends and the wilderness begins. My home is one of those dots on the map that you'd miss if you blinked. Nestled in the mountains, it's a town so small that calling it a town feels like an overstatement. 
we're a hundred souls, give or take, and I've only ever laid eyes on about a fifth of them. I recently landed a job in a city that requires a drive through winding mountain roads, a journey that's as treacherous as it is isolating. The road is a mess, potholes the size of craters, stretches of uneven pavement that'll rattle your bones and no shoulder to speak of, just ditches and steep drops that make you wonder if anyone would ever find you if you went over. And then there's the wildlife, raccoons, possums, coyotes, and deer. They saunter across the road like they own it, turning my 30-minute commute into a 40-minute obstacle course. Tonight, as I prepared for work, my ADHD was acting up worse than a rattlesnake in a heat wave. I was all over the place, scattered, unfocused, a whirlwind of half-finished tasks. My work uniform, soaking in the washer, my coffee, cold and forgotten, my eggs, burning in the pan while I stared at them, lost in a maze of thoughts. I finally managed to pull myself together. Uniform in the dryer, I sat down to a meal of cold coffee and slightly burnt eggs. My phone was in my hand, and I found myself doom-scrolling through social media, another rabbit hole that I couldn't afford to fall into. But I did. Time slipped away like sand through my fingers. Finally, I snapped out of it. I put on my shoes, hoping the worst of my scatterbrain was behind me. I tossed the dishes into the sink, grabbed my keys, and headed out the door. I knew I had to be careful. Spacing out at home was one thing, but on that road? A momentary lapse could mean hitting a deer or worse, driving off a cliff. I sat in my car, gripping the steering wheel, trying to collect my thoughts. I'd seen some meditation techniques on TikTok. Yeah, TikTok of all places, and figured it was worth a shot. I closed my eyes, took deep breaths, and focused on the here and now. When I felt like I had a grip, I started the car and eased out of the driveway. Driving with full attention was a revelation. I noticed houses I'd never seen, churches that had blended into the background, even a rock quarry that was news to me. It was like driving down a brand new road and for a moment I felt good, I felt in control, but then it hit me. My uniform, it was still in the dryer. I'd been so focused on the road, so wrapped up in not screwing up, that I'd forgotten the one thing I absolutely needed for work. And just like that, my newfound focus shattered into a million pieces. The realization hit me like a bullet. My uniform was still in the dryer, warm and forgotten. I'd been so hell-bent on keeping my focus on the road that I'd let the most crucial detail slip through the cracks. The irony wasn't lost on me. I'd mastered the road but failed the basics. I was about halfway to work, and the clock was ticking. My options were limited. Either show up to work out of uniform and face the consequences, or turn back home and risk being late. I chose the latter. I had about five minutes of driving before I could safely turn around, and that's when I approached Evans, a small town that was more of a blip on the map than a community. Evans had always been my favorite part of the drive. It was a flat stretch of road surrounded by tree-covered mountains, a stark contrast to the winding uphill battle I usually faced. It reminded me of where I grew up, flat as a pancake but comforting in its simplicity. Evans was the only place to turn around after leaving my house, and as I drove into its boundaries, I felt a sense of calm wash over me. But that calm was short-lived. My mind started to drift again, replaying the events of the evening, cursing myself for forgetting my uniform. Before I knew it, I was pulling into a small mechanic shop at the edge of Evans. It was the only place to turn around, and I figured I could also take a moment to refocus. I parked the car and sat there, gripping the wheel tightly. My mind was a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces, and I needed to find them before I could move forward. I closed my eyes and took deep breaths, mimicking the TikTok meditation techniques that had worked earlier. After a few minutes, I felt like I'd regained some semblance of control. I started the car and made the U-turn, mentally berating myself for the oversight, but grateful for the chance to correct it. As I drove back, my mind kept circling back to that mysterious hill I'd passed earlier. How had I never noticed it before? Was my attention that fragmented? The hill seemed to beckon, a dark enigma that I couldn't shake off. But I pushed the thought aside. I had more immediate concerns, like making it to work on time. I was almost home when I saw it. The rock quarry, the churches, the houses that had caught my attention earlier. But this time they seemed less significant, overshadowed by the looming presence of that hill. 
It was as if the landscape had shifted, rearranging itself to highlight its most unsettling feature. I pulled into my driveway, rushed inside, and grabbed my uniform from the dryer. It was still warm, a small comfort in an evening that had spiraled out of control. I changed quickly, got back into my car, and headed out again, my mind a whirlpool of thoughts and emotions. As I drove past Evans for the second time, I couldn't help but glance at the mechanic shop. It was closed now, a dark silhouette against the night sky. But something told me that it held secrets. Secrets that were intertwined with that mysterious hill. And as much as I wanted to ignore it, I knew that I was being pulled into a mystery that I couldn't easily escape. I was back on the road, uniform on, and a fresh cup of coffee in the cup holder. I'd lost time, but I was still in the game. The road stretched out before me, a winding path through the mountains that I'd come to know like the back of my hand. Except, of course, for that hill. As I approached the spot where I'd noticed it earlier, my heartbeat quickened. There it was, rising up like a dark wave against the night sky. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was out of place, like a puzzle piece jammed where it didn't belong. It was steep, lined with trees on both sides, and had a single streetlight at its base that seemed to struggle against the encroaching darkness. I slowed down as I reached the bottom of the hill. Something about it felt off like static in the air before a storm. I could see the moon in the sky, mostly full, but its light seemed to stop at the edge of the hill, as if swallowed by some unseen force. I hesitated, my foot hovering over the gas pedal. Then I shook off the feeling and started the climb. Halfway up I felt it, a strange smell that seemed to seep into the car. It was a mix of roses, cedar, and honey, but with an underlying stench of rotting meat. My stomach churned and I rolled down the window, hoping for a breath of fresh air. But the smell only intensified, and I quickly rolled the window back up. I reached the top of the hill and drove on, but my mind was racing. What was that smell? Why did the hill feel so out of place? And why, for the love of God, had I never noticed it before? I was so lost in thought that I almost missed the turnoff for the mechanic shop in Evans. I pulled in, my tires crunching on the gravel. The shop was closed, but the lights were still on, casting a warm glow on the empty parking lot. I sat there for a moment, my mind a swirl of questions and half-formed theories. Then the front door of the shop creaked open, and out walked the owner, a scruffy older man with a weather-beaten face. He approached my car, and I rolled down the window. You all right? He asked, his eyes narrowing as he looked at me. Saw you turn around earlier. Everything okay? I hesitated, unsure of how much to reveal. Thought I'd forgotten something at home, I said finally. Turned out I didn't, just heading back to work now. He stared at me for a moment, then grinned, a slow, unsettling grin that didn't reach his eyes. I saw you turn around earlier, he repeated. I'm sure whatever you left back there is better off that way. You should just keep going. A chill ran down my spine. What did he mean by that? And what did he know about the hill? I nodded mumbled a quick, thanks, and pulled out of the parking lot. But as I drove away, his words echoed in my mind, adding another layer of mystery to an already puzzling night. I was being pulled into something dark and inexplicable, and as much as I wanted to turn back, I knew I was already in too deep. I was back on the road, my mind a storm of questions and unease. The mechanic's words had added fuel to the fire of my curiosity, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. I needed answers, and I knew where to find them. That damned hill. I drove past Evans, my eyes darting to the mechanic shop as I passed. It was empty, the lights off, but I could almost feel the owner's eyes on me, watching as I drove by. I shook off the feeling and focused on the road ahead. The hill was coming up, and I needed to be ready. As I approached, my heart pounding in my chest, I saw it, the streetlight at the bottom of the hill casting its feeble glow on the asphalt. I slowed down, my eyes scanning the darkness beyond. Then I pulled over, my tires crunching on the gravel at the side of the road. I took a deep breath, bracing myself for what was to come, and stepped out of the car. The air was thick with that strange smell, stronger now, almost overpowering. I fought back the urge to gag and started walking, my phone's flashlight cutting through the darkness. The hill seemed steeper now, more menacing, as if it had changed since my last visit. 
I pushed on, my legs burning with each step, my mind racing with thoughts of what lay ahead. I was about halfway up when I heard it, a rustling in the trees, followed by a low growl that sent shivers down my spine. I froze, my flashlight trembling in my hand, and scanned the darkness. Nothing. I took a shaky breath and continued, my steps quickening as I neared the top. And then I saw it, the hut, dilapidated and crumbling, standing at the edge of the road like a sentinel. I approached cautiously, my flashlight illuminating its broken windows and rotting wood. It looked abandoned, but something told me that appearances could be deceiving. I circled around it, my eyes peeled for any sign of life, and then stepped inside. The air was stale, heavy with the smell of decay and dampness. I shone my flashlight around, revealing a small empty room with a dirt floor and walls that looked like they could collapse at any moment. But it was what was in the center of the room that caught my eye. A circle of stones, arranged in a pattern that I couldn't quite make out, surrounded by what looked like dried blood. I stared at it, my mind struggling to make sense of what I was seeing. And then it hit me. The realization that I was standing in the middle of something far darker and more dangerous than I could have ever imagined. I turned and ran, my footsteps echoing in the night, my mind screaming at me to get as far away as possible. I reached my car and fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking as I started the engine and sped away. But as I drove, my eyes glued to the rearview mirror, I knew that I had crossed a line, that I had ventured into a world that I couldn't easily escape. And as much as I wanted to forget what I had seen, to go back to my old life and pretend that none of this had ever happened, I knew that it was too late. I was in too deep, and there was no turning back. I'd been driving for what felt like hours, my mind a labyrinth of dread and confusion. The hill, the mechanic, the hut, all of it swirled in my thoughts like a dark cloud. I needed to clear my head, to make sense of what was happening. So I did what any sane person would do. I pulled into a gas station, parked at the far end of the lot, and just sat there, staring into the void. I thought about calling someone, anyone, to share the burden of what I'd discovered. But who would believe me? Hell, I barely believed it myself. I was about to start the car and head back home when my phone buzzed. A text message. Unknown number. Don't come back to the hill. You won't like what you find. My blood ran cold. Who could have sent that? The mechanic? Some other unseen watcher? I looked around, half expecting to see someone lurking in the shadows, but there was no one. Just the flickering lights of the gas station and the distant hum of the highway. I couldn't just sit there. I needed to do something, anything, to get to the bottom of this. So, I made a decision, one that I knew I might regret. I was going back to the hill, not to explore or to find answers, but to confront whatever it was that was pulling me into its web. The drive back was a blur, the road empty and the night sky devoid of stars. It was as if the world was holding its breath, waiting for what was to come. I reached the hill and parked at the bottom, my heart pounding in my chest like a drum. I took a deep breath, grabbed the flashlight, and stepped out of the car. The smell hit me immediately, stronger now, almost suffocating. I fought back the urge to vomit and started up the hill, my flashlight cutting through the darkness like a knife. I was almost at the top when I heard it, a low growl followed by the sound of footsteps, heavy footsteps coming from behind me. I turned around, my flashlight trembling in my hand, and there it was, the creature. It was massive, its body covered in pale, rotting flesh, its eyes empty sockets that seemed to stare into my soul, and on its head, a human face twisted into a grotesque smile. I was paralyzed, my mind screaming at me to run but my legs refusing to move. And then it spoke, its voice a guttural growl that shook me to my core. You shouldn't have come back. I found my voice, though it was barely a whisper. What are you? It grinned, its teeth razor sharp and stained with blood. Something you can't escape. Something you'll never forget. It took a step toward me, and that's when I broke free from my paralysis. I turned and ran my legs carrying me down the hill faster than I'd ever run before. I reached the car, fumbled with the keys, and sped away, not daring to look back. As I drove, my mind a whirlwind of terror and disbelief, I knew that my life had changed forever. I had stared into the abyss, and the abyss had stared back. And though I didn't know what the future held, one thing was clear. I was in too deep, and there was no way out. I'd been avoiding that road, 
That hill, like the plague. My new route to work added an extra hour each way, but it was a small price to pay for avoiding whatever that thing was. I even started seeing a therapist to talk about the stress I was under, though I never mentioned the real reason. How could I? It was unbelievable, even to me. Days turned into weeks, and the memory of that nightmarish encounter began to fade, like the remnants of a bad dream upon waking. I almost started to believe it was all in my head. That is, until the package arrived. It was a small, unmarked box left on my doorstep. Inside was a piece of paper with a single sentence written in shaky handwriting. You can't escape what you've seen. Underneath the paper was a small object wrapped in cloth. I unwrapped it and gasped. It was a stone, one of the stones from the circle in the hut. I dropped it as if it were on fire, my heart pounding in my chest. This was impossible. How did it get here? Who sent it? My mind raced through the possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. I had to get rid of it. I grabbed the stone, wrapped it back up, and drove to the nearest river. With a sense of finality, I hurled it into the water and watched as it sank out of sight. That had to be the end of it, right? I drove back home, my nerves frayed, but my spirit lifted. Maybe now I could finally move on. But as I pulled into my driveway, my headlights illuminated something that made my blood run cold. There, sitting on my doorstep, was another box, identical to the first. I got out of the car, my legs shaky, and approached the box. I already knew what was inside, but I had to see it for myself. I opened it up and there it was, the stone back in its place, as if mocking me. But that wasn't the worst part. On the paper, a new sentence had appeared below the first. You're part of this now. I looked up, my eyes scanning the darkness, and that's when I saw it. Standing at the edge of my property, barely visible in the shadows, was the creature. It was watching me, its human-like face twisted into that same grotesque smile. And as our eyes met, I heard its voice in my head, as clear as if it were standing next to me. You can't escape. You're part of this now. I ran inside, locked all the doors, and collapsed on the floor, my body shaking uncontrollably. I knew then that there was no escape, no way out. I was part of something far darker and more terrifying than I could ever have imagined, and it was never going to let me go. As I sat there alone in the darkness, I heard a sound that made my skin crawl, a low growl coming from just outside the window. I looked up, and there it was, its face pressed against the glass, its eyes meeting mine, and as I stared into that abyss, I knew that my life as I knew it was over. I was part of this now, and there was no turning back. I've always been a city girl, born and bred on the East Coast, where skyscrapers touch the heavens, and the closest thing to wildlife is a stray cat darting between alleyways. But when Annette, my college roommate and lifelong friend, announced her bachelorette party would be a week-long camping trip in Yosemite National Park, I couldn't say no. Annette was always the adventurous type, the kind of woman who'd choose a hiking trail over a shopping mall any day. Think about it, Laura she'd said, her eyes gleaming with excitement. A week under the stars, surrounded by the most breathtaking scenery you can imagine. It's going to be epic. So here I was, crammed into a rented SUV with Annette, Sarah, Emily, and Megan, driving through the heart of California. The landscape changed as we moved, from the sprawling suburbs to rolling hills, and finally to the jagged peaks of the Sierra Nevada. I felt a sense of awe creep over me a feeling I hadn't experienced since I was a kid visiting the ocean for the first time. We reached the park in the late afternoon, the sun casting long shadows over the valley as we drove in. The first sight of Yosemite Valley was like stepping into a cathedral, a sacred place where every towering cliff and cascading waterfall felt like an altar. Even Annette, who'd seen her fair share of national parks, was speechless. We're not staying down here, she finally said, breaking the silence. Too touristy. We're heading up to the high country. Trust me, it's the real Yosemite experience. I glanced at Sarah, Emily, and Megan in the rearview mirror. We were all city girls, more accustomed to the concrete jungle than an actual one. But we nodded in agreement, captivated by Annette's enthusiasm. 
The drive up to the high country was a winding journey through narrow roads and hairpin turns. By the time we reached our campsite near the iconic half dome, the sun had dipped below the horizon and the first stars were appearing in the sky. We set up our tents in the fading light, each of us claiming a spot on the forest floor. Five's an odd number for tents, Annette observed. They're all two-person tents. Laura, you okay bunking alone? I hesitated for a moment, my mind flashing back to every horror movie I'd ever seen. But then I looked around at the towering redwoods, the distant peaks silhouetted against the night sky, and felt a sense of peace wash over me. Yeah, I'm good, I said, unrolling my sleeping bag inside my tent. It's not like we're really alone out here anyway. Annette laughed. That's the spirit. Just wait, Laura. This trip is going to change your life. As I zipped up my tent and settled in for the night, I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease. It was as if the forest itself was watching us, its ancient eyes hidden in the shadows. I told myself it was just my imagination, the city girl in me not used to the sounds and sights of the wilderness. But as I lay there, listening to the distant howl of a coyote and the rustling of leaves in the wind, I couldn't help but wonder what else was out there, in the dark, watching and waiting. And so began our dream vacation, a journey into the heart of one of America's most beautiful landscapes. But as I would soon discover, even the most breathtaking beauty can hide the darkest secrets. Sleep didn't come easy that first night. Every rustle of leaves, every distant animal call, seemed to reverberate through my tent like a warning. I lay there, eyes wide open, staring at the nylon ceiling as if it could offer some sort of protection. When dawn finally broke, I felt more exhausted than when I'd crawled into my sleeping bag. I unzipped my tent and stepped out into the morning light. Annette and the others were already up, gathered around the remnants of last night's campfire. Their faces were tense, eyes darting around the campsite. Morning, I mumbled, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. What's going on? Something got into our supplies, Annette said, her voice tinged with frustration. Tore right through the cloth bag and scattered food wrappers everywhere. I looked over at the hanging bear bag, still intact, swaying gently from the tree branch where we'd hoisted it. But the bear bag's fine. How's that possible? Annette shrugged. I don't know. Maybe it was a raccoon or something. Either way, we need to clean this up and report it to the park rangers. We spent the next hour picking up the scattered remnants of our food supplies. The mood was somber, the earlier excitement replaced by a sense of vulnerability. We were no longer just visitors in this wilderness. We were intruders, and something had marked its territory. After cleaning up, we made our way to the nearest ranger station to report the incident. The ranger behind the desk listened to our story with a practiced air of concern, nodding at all the right moments. Sounds like you had a run-in with a nuisance bear, he said, filling out a report. Best to move your campsite. We'll issue you a permit for a different spot. A bear? I asked, my voice tinged with disbelief. Wouldn't we have heard it? Seen it? The ranger looked up, meeting my eyes for the first time. Bears can be surprisingly stealthy, especially if they're used to human food. Don't take any chances. Move your camp. We thanked him and left, a new camping permit in hand. The drive to the new campsite was quiet, each of us lost in our thoughts. When we finally arrived and began setting up our tents again, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. It was as if the forest had eyes, and they were fixed squarely on us. Hey, you okay? Annette asked, snapping me out of my reverie. Yeah, I said, forcing a smile. Just a little on edge, I guess. Annette chuckled. You're such a city girl. This is all part of the adventure. Trust me, there's nothing out here that wants to hurt us. I wanted to believe her, I really did. But as we settled into our new campsite, the sun dipping below the horizon and casting long shadows through the trees, I couldn't escape the feeling that something was out there, lurking in the dark and so we bedded down for another night, a thin layer of nylon the only thing separating us from the untamed wilderness beyond. But as I lay there, listening to the sounds of the night, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone, and whatever was out there, it knew we were here. Day four rolled around, and the tension from the previous day's incident had somewhat dissipated. Annette and the girls were all set to go canoeing on a nearby lake. I opted out, my body was sore and my mind was still reeling from the unsettling events. I needed a break, 
a moment to breathe. I'm going to stay back and sunbathe, I told Annette as they prepared to leave. She looked at me, her eyes narrowing slightly. You sure you're okay? Yeah, I said, forcing a smile. Just need some me time, you know? Annette nodded, her face relaxing. All right, enjoy your day. We'll catch up later. I watched them leave, their laughter and chatter fading into the distance. I was alone, but it was a different kind of solitude, one I had chosen. I spread my towel on the sandy shore of the lake, put on my sunglasses and lay down. The sun felt good on my skin, and for a moment, I forgot about the lurking fears and unsettling noises. I was lost in the beauty of the place, the way the sunlight danced on the water, the distant sound of birdsong. That's when I noticed him. A man, around my age, sunbathing a few yards away. He had a rugged look about him, with hazel eyes that seemed to sparkle in the sunlight. Our eyes met, and he smiled. Beautiful day, isn't it? He said, breaking the silence. I smiled back. It is. Absolutely perfect. He got up and walked over, extending his hand. I'm Rowan. Laura, I replied, shaking his hand. We got to talking. Rowan was from Colorado, an avid hiker and outdoorsman. He'd been coming to Yosemite every summer since he was a kid. We talked about the beauty of the park, our favorite trails, and the serenity that comes from being in nature. Somehow being out here makes all the problems of the real world seem insignificant, don't you think? He said, his eyes meeting mine. I nodded. I know what you mean. It's like an escape. Our conversation shifted to the strange occurrences at our camp. I told him about the raided food supplies, the move to a new campsite, and the unsettling feeling of being watched. Rowan's face grew serious. Sounds like a mountain lion to me. A mountain lion? I asked, my heart skipping a beat. Yeah, he said. They're elusive creatures. You'll only see one if it wants to be seen. If you can't see it, that's when you should be worried. His words sent a chill down my spine. The thought of a mountain lion stalking us was terrifying, but somehow coming from Rowan, it felt like a warning, not a threat. Be careful out here, he said, his eyes locking onto mine. Yosemite is beautiful, but it's also wild, and in the wilderness, you're never truly alone. As he spoke, I felt a strange sense of comfort. Maybe it was his confidence, or maybe it was the sincerity in his eyes. Either way, for the first time since arriving at Yosemite, I felt like maybe, just maybe, everything was going to be all right. Would you like to have dinner tonight? He asked, breaking the silence. I looked at him, my heart pounding in my chest. I'd love to, I said, and for a moment all my fears seemed to melt away. Dinner with Rowan was like a scene from a movie. We met at one of the park's restaurants, a rustic place with wooden beams and a roaring fireplace. The atmosphere was cozy, the food surprisingly good. Rowan was charming, attentive, and funny. For a few hours, I forgot about the lurking fears and unsettling events. I was just a woman on a date with a man who seemed almost too good to be true. As the evening wore on, Rowan suggested we head back to his campsite. I've got some wine back there, he said, his eyes meeting mine. What do you say? I hesitated for a moment, my mind flashing back to the warnings about mountain lions and the strange occurrences at our camp. But then I looked at Rowan, his eyes filled with warmth and sincerity, and I pushed those fears aside. Sure, I said smiling, let's go. We left the restaurant and made our way up the winding trail to his campsite. The night was clear, the sky filled with stars, and the air crisp with the scent of pine. As we walked, Rowan slipped his arm around my waist, pulling me close. It felt good, comforting. I let myself believe that maybe, just maybe, everything really was going to be all right. We reached his campsite, a secluded spot surrounded by towering trees. Rowan lit a campfire and we sat on a log, sipping wine and talking. The firelight flickered on his face, casting shadows that made him look both boyish and rugged at the same time. I'm a little cold, I said, shivering slightly. Rowan looked at me, his eyes twinkling. Would you like a sleeping bag? I nodded, standing up. I'll get it, I said, walking towards his tent. That's when I heard him. Laura, wait. I unzipped the tent and froze. There, in the sleeping bag, was a woman. Her auburn hair was spread out like a halo, her face peaceful in sleep. I turned, my face flushed with anger and humiliation. You have a girlfriend, and you brought me here? Rowan's face was a mask of confusion and panic. Laura, it's not what you think. She's not... I don't care, I yelled, cutting him off. I can't believe I fell for this. 
I turned and stormed off, my heart pounding with betrayal and rage. Rowan called after me, but I didn't look back. I just wanted to get as far away from him as possible. As I made my way through the dark forest, my mind was a whirlwind of emotion. How could I have been so stupid, so naive? But as I walked, something else began to creep into my consciousness. The sound of footsteps, soft but deliberate, echoing my own. The rustling of leaves, the snapping of twigs. The feeling of eyes on me, watching, following. I stopped, my heart in my throat. Rowan's words echoed in my mind. In the wilderness, you're never truly alone. And as I stood there, in the dark, I realized just how terrifyingly true that was. I was disoriented, my mind clouded by betrayal and the wine from dinner. But as I stood there in the dark, the reality of my situation began to sink in. I was alone, in the middle of the wilderness, and something was stalking me. I reached for my phone fumbling in the dark. No service, but the flashlight app would have to do. I turned it on, the beam cutting through the darkness, revealing nothing but trees and shadows. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my racing heart, and started to walk. That's when I heard it again. The soft, deliberate footsteps, mirroring my own. The rustling of leaves, closer now. My skin prickled with fear, my senses on high alert. I remembered Rowan's warning. A mountain lion will only be seen when it wants to be seen. I turned off my flashlight, plunging myself back into darkness. My eyes strained, trying to adjust, searching for any sign of movement. And then I saw it. A shadow, darker than the rest, moving between the trees. I felt a surge of adrenaline, my fight-or-flight instincts kicking in. I chose flight. Ignoring the voice in my head telling me not to run, I bolted, my feet pounding against the forest floor, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I didn't know where I was going, didn't have a plan. All I knew was that I needed to put as much distance between me and whatever was stalking me as possible. I dodged trees, leapt over rocks, my body fueled by pure adrenaline, but I couldn't keep it up forever. My legs began to ache, my lungs burning with each breath. In a desperate bid for safety, I spotted a redwood tree with low-hanging branches and scrambled up, my hands gripping the bark, pulling myself higher and higher until I was at least ten feet off the ground. I sat there, my body trembling, my eyes scanning the forest below. I heard it before I saw it, the soft, deliberate footsteps circling the tree. And then silence. I held my breath, my body tense, waiting. Minutes passed, each one feeling like an eternity. And then just as suddenly as it had started, it was over. The footsteps moved away, fading into the distance. I waited, my body rigid until the first rays of dawn began to filter through the trees. Only then did I allow myself to climb down, my legs shaky, my entire body sore. I had no idea where I was, but I knew I needed to find my way back. Using the morning light as my guide, I started to walk. Hours passed. I was dehydrated, exhausted, and on the verge of collapse when I finally stumbled upon a trail. I followed it, each step a struggle, until I saw something that made my heart sore. A sign pointing the way to the campgrounds. I quickened my pace, my body running on fumes but fueled by the promise of safety. And then, just as I rounded a bend, I saw them, Annette and the others, their faces filled with relief and disbelief. We thought you were dead, Annette said, rushing over to hug me. I wanted to cry, to laugh, to collapse. But all I could think about was the shadow in the forest, the feeling of being hunted. And as I stood there, surrounded by friends, I realized something. I may have escaped, but I would never be free. I was back at camp, but the relief was short-lived. Annette's face was ashen, her eyes red from crying. Two uniformed officers stood nearby, their expression stern. We need to talk, one of them said, motioning for me to follow. They led me to a makeshift table where a couple of photos were laid out. The first was of Rowan, or as they called him, David Michael Whittle. The second was of a woman with auburn hair, the same woman I'd seen in the sleeping bag. Do you recognize these individuals? The officer asked. Yes, I said, my voice shaky. The man told me his name was Rowan. We had dinner last night. The woman was in his tent. The officer's face hardened. That woman is Alexis Fletcher, a park employee. She's been missing for a week. The man you dined with was the last person seen talking to her. We found her body this morning. She was murdered. My stomach churned, my head spinning 
But I saw her in his tent. She was sleeping. The officer shook his head. She couldn't have been sleeping, ma'am. She was dead. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. I had been inches away from a murderer, from his victim. I felt sick, violated. We need to search your camp, the officer continued. This man is dangerous, and we have reason to believe he might have been stalking you. The search turned up nothing, but the damage was done. The trip was cut short, everyone too shaken to continue. We packed up, our movements robotic, our conversations strained. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, the terror that had gripped me in the forest. As we drove out of Yosemite, I looked back at the towering trees, the majestic peaks, and felt a shiver run down my spine. This place had promised an escape, a refuge. Instead, it had become a hunting ground, a place of nightmares. Weeks passed, but the fear remained. I triple-checked my locks at night, jumped at every sound. My therapist said it was PTSD, that it would take time to heal. But deep down, I knew the truth. I would never be the same. Then one night, as I was lying in bed, I heard it. A soft, deliberate footstep outside my window. My heart stopped, my body frozen in terror. I mustered the courage to look, pulling back the curtain just an inch. And there he was, standing in the moonlight. Rowan, or David, or whatever his name was. His eyes met mine and he smiled, that same charming smile that had once made me feel special. As I reached for my phone to call 911, I noticed something in his hand. It was a photo, the same one the police had shown me. Only this time it wasn't just Alexis in the picture. It was me, standing next to her, both of us smiling, unaware. My scream was swallowed by the night, a chilling realization settling in. I had escaped, but he had found me, and in that moment, I knew. The hunt was far from over. I've always had a knack for finding trouble, or maybe trouble has a way of finding me. Either way, when I told my folks about the camping trip to Kosia National Park, their faces turned a shade paler. Romania isn't exactly the poster child for safety, and they knew it. My mom's eyes narrowed, a sure sign she was about to launch into one of her cautionary tales. Romania, you know people disappear there, right? Kidnapped, murdered, who knows what else, she said, her voice tinged with that maternal worry I'd come to know so well. My dad chimed in, Your mother's right, why can't you pick a safer place? Somewhere without a reputation for, well, you know. I had my counter-argument ready. We're staying in a hotel, okay? Right near the park. It's a tourist area. What could go wrong? The lie slid off my tongue easier than I'd like to admit. A hotel stay was far from our rugged, back-to-nature plan, but it was the only way to get them off my back. They exchanged glances, and I could see the gears turning in their heads, weighing the odds. Finally, they nodded, their faces still etched with concern. All right, but promise you'll be careful my mom said, her eyes searching mine for sincerity. I promise, I replied, crossing my fingers behind my back. Two days later, my boyfriend and I were on a train departing from Bucharest, our backpacks stuffed with everything we'd need for a four-day adventure in the wilderness. The train was a relic, its compartments worn and tired, but it was our ticket to freedom. As we settled into our compartment, I couldn't help but feel a sense of elation. The compartment was empty, a rare luxury on Romanian trains. I looked at my boyfriend, his eyes mirroring my excitement. Looks like we've got the place to ourselves, I said, stretching my legs out. He grinned. Yeah, let's enjoy it while it lasts. We both knew the solitude wouldn't last long. Romanian trains are notorious for being overcrowded. But for those first few minutes, it felt like the universe was giving us a break, a small pocket of peace before whatever awaited us at Cozia National Park. As the train chugged along, the landscape outside the window shifted from the urban sprawl of Bucharest to the rolling hills and dense forests that make up much of Romania's countryside. I felt a sense of anticipation building within me, each mile taking us closer to the unknown. And then, just when I'd started to think we'd won the lottery with our empty compartment, the door slid open. A man stepped in, followed by a German shepherd that looked more like a wolf than a dog. My heart sank a little, but I had no idea just how much that encounter would change everything. As the door closed behind them, sealing us in with our new companions, 
I couldn't shake the feeling that we were on the edge of something, a precipice beyond which lay things I couldn't yet see or understand. And whether it was the thrill of adventure or a premonition of dangers to come, I knew one thing for sure. This trip was going to be anything but ordinary. The door slid shut with a finality that made my stomach churn. The man who just entered was tall, his face unreadable, framed by a curtain of dark hair. His eyes, however, were what caught my attention, cold, calculating, as if sizing us up. The German shepherd at his side was equally unsettling, its eyes almost human in their intelligence. Mind if we join you? The man's voice was smooth, almost too smooth, like river stones worn down by years of flowing water. Of course not, I replied, forcing a smile. It's a public train, after all. He nodded and took the seat across from us, his dog obediently settling at his feet. There was something about that dog, a stillness, an intensity, that made me uneasy. What's his name? I asked, nodding toward the dog, trying to break the ice. Yuchi Gashul, he said, his eyes never leaving mine. The killer? I translated, my eyes widening. That's an unusual name for a dog. He's trained to kill. It's what he's good at, the man replied, his voice devoid of emotion. I glanced at my boyfriend, who shot me a look that clearly said, Let's not go there. I took the hint. So, you're familiar with Kosha National Park? I ventured, steering the conversation toward safer ground. The man's eyes lit up, a spark of enthusiasm breaking through his otherwise stoic demeanor. Ah, yes, beautiful place. You should visit the monastery at the base of the mountain. And don't miss the Latery Shore, a waterfall with a cave behind it. There's also a local restaurant you might want to try. His sudden chattiness was disconcerting, but also a relief. Maybe he was just a nature enthusiast, I thought, trying to reassure myself. Thanks for the tips, I said, genuinely grateful for the information. We're new to the area, so any advice is welcome. He nodded, seemingly satisfied, and then fell silent. The rest of the journey passed in an uncomfortable quiet, punctuated only by the rhythmic clatter of the train on the tracks. I found myself counting the minutes, eager to reach our destination and put some distance between us and our unsettling travel companion. Finally, the train began to slow, the scenery outside the window coalescing into the recognizable shapes of buildings and roads. We had arrived. I felt a sense of relief wash over me, as if I'd been holding my breath and could finally exhale. We're here, I said, looking at my boyfriend, then back at the man and his dog. It was nice meeting you. The man nodded, his eyes unreadable once again. Enjoy your stay, he said, his voice tinged with something I couldn't quite place. Was it a warning, a threat, or just my imagination running wild? As we grabbed our backpacks and stepped off the train, I took one last look back. The man and his dog were gone, vanished as if they'd never been there at all. It was as if the universe had swallowed them whole, leaving me to wonder if they were ever real to begin with. And yet, as we made our way toward Kosha National Park, I couldn't shake the feeling that our paths would cross again. And next time, I feared, the stakes might be much higher. The train station was a blur of activity, a hive of travelers and locals, each absorbed in their own world. We stepped off the platform, our backpacks heavy but our spirits light. The mysterious man and his dog were behind us, or so I hoped. Now it was just us in the wilderness, a blank canvas waiting to be painted with our adventures. We started our trek toward Kosha National Park, the map in my boyfriend's hand our only guide. The landscape was breathtaking, rolling hills giving way to dense forests, the air tinged with the earthy scent of pine and damp soil. It was a different world, far removed from the hustle and bustle of Bucharest, and I felt a sense of freedom I hadn't felt in years. That's when we heard it, a soft whimper, a cry of distress that seemed to echo through the trees. My boyfriend looked at me, his eyes saying, don't even think about it. But I was already moving toward the sound, my instincts overriding any sense of caution. And there he was, a chubby puppy, his fur a patchwork of white and brown, lying in the middle of the road as if he'd given up on life. His eyes met mine, and in that moment, I knew our trip had just taken an unexpected turn. We can't leave him, I said, already scooping the puppy into my arms. My boyfriend sighed, a mixture of resignation and affection. What are we going to call him? Rudolph, I said, looking into the puppy's eyes. He looks like a Rudolph. 
Just when we thought our adventure had reached its quota of surprises, we heard another whimper, this one softer, more desperate. Following the sound, we found another puppy, probably Rudolph's sister, half submerged in a nearby river. Someone had tried to drown her, a thought that made my blood boil. We're taking her too, I said, my voice leaving no room for argument. And so, we became a party of four, two humans and two puppies, each with a story to tell. We continued our trek, our new companions adding a layer of complexity, but also a sense of purpose to our journey. As we walked, we came upon the monastery the man on the train had mentioned. It was an imposing structure, its stone walls weathered by time, a testament to faith and endurance. We wanted to go in, but the stern look from the priest told us that our four-legged friends were not welcome. Let's keep moving, my boyfriend said, his eyes scanning the map. We circled the monastery, taking in its gardens and the sense of peace that seemed to permeate the air. Soon, we reached the base of the mountain, the first leg of our journey complete. That's when we saw it, the Three Anitza, a small religious landmark tucked away in the woods. It was a simple structure, a roof and four walls, but inside was an icon and a Bible. I picked up the Bible, its pages torn and weathered, and saw the words that sent a chill down my spine. I will find you. I looked at my boyfriend, then back at our two puppies. We were a long way from home, in a land of beauty and mystery, and I couldn't shake the feeling that our adventure was just beginning. But as I closed the Bible and we resumed our trek, I also knew one thing. We weren't alone. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows that danced and flickered in the dying light. We had set up camp near the Three Anitza, its religious icon and that haunting Bible now a stone's throw away. I tried to shake off the unease that clung to me like a second skin, but it was easier said than done. We should get the fire going, my boyfriend said, breaking the silence that had settled over us. I nodded, my thoughts still on the words I'd read in that Bible. I will find you. Who had written them? And why? Questions swirled in my mind, each unanswered, each adding a layer of complexity to an already puzzling situation. As the first flames of our campfire flickered to life, casting a warm glow on our makeshift home, I felt a momentary sense of relief. Fire has a way of doing that, pushing back the darkness, both literal and metaphorical. But that relief was short-lived. A guttural grunt echoed through the forest, a sound so out of place it made my heart skip a beat. My boyfriend and I locked eyes, a silent communication that needed no words. Something was out there, watching us, studying us. Did you hear that? I whispered, my voice barely rising above the crackling of the fire. He nodded, his hand inching toward the pocket knife he always carried. Stay close, he said, his eyes scanning the darkness beyond the firelight. And then we saw it, a slithery figure, its form barely discernible, darting between the trees. It moved with a speed that seemed unnatural, its outline blurring and shifting as if not entirely of this world. What the hell was that? My boyfriend muttered, his voice tinged with disbelief. I don't know, I replied, my mind racing, but it's gone now. We both knew that was wishful thinking. Whatever it was, it was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to reveal itself. As if on cue, the fire let out a series of sparks each one soaring into the night sky before disappearing into the forest. But something was off. The sparks didn't fade away like they should have. Instead, they seemed to hang in the air, their glow intensifying, changing color from a hellish red to an eerie green. Are you seeing this? I asked, my eyes fixed on the spectacle unfolding before us. My boyfriend nodded, his face a mask of confusion and awe. I've never seen anything like it. It was as if the fire was beckoning us, urging us to venture deeper into the forest, into the heart of the unknown, and for a moment I was tempted, tempted to follow the sparks, to unravel the mystery that had ensnared us from the moment we'd stepped off that train. But then I looked at the trees surrounding our camp, their trunks marked by shapes that looked eerily like eyes, hundreds of them, all staring at us, all watching our every move. We're not alone, I whispered, my voice tinged with a fear I couldn't quite shake. My boyfriend took my hand, his grip firm and reassuring. No, we're not, he said, his eyes meeting mine. But whatever's out there, we'll face it together. 
and as the fire continued its ghostly dance, casting shadows that seemed to come alive in the darkness, I knew he was right. We would face it, whatever it was, and come what may. But as the night stretched on, each minute an eternity, I couldn't help but wonder, what were we up against, and would we make it through the night? The fire had dwindled to embers, its once vibrant flames now reduced to a soft glow. My boyfriend had dozed off, his breathing steady, a counterpoint to the erratic rhythm of my own heart. The puppies, Rudolph and his sister, were curled up beside him, their tiny bodies rising and falling in sync with his breaths. I should have felt comforted, but I didn't. The night was too still, too quiet, as if holding its breath in anticipation. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes, a sound so soft it could have been the wind. But I knew better. My eyes darted to the spot, my body tensing, every instinct screaming at me to run, to hide, to do something. But I was paralyzed, caught in the grip of a fear so primal it defied logic. I nudged my boyfriend awake, my fingers trembling as they touched his arm. Listen, I whispered, my voice barely audible. He stirred, his eyes meeting mine, and in that instant he knew. Something was out there, something that didn't belong, something that had no place in the natural order of things. We both peered through a small opening in the tent, our eyes straining to make sense of the darkness. And then we saw it, a human head, emerging from the very bush that had caught my attention. Slowly, almost painfully, the figure revealed itself, its body lit by the moon and the dying embers of our fire. It was him, the man from the train, his face twisted into a grotesque mask, his eyes devoid of humanity, and he was naked, his body exposed as if daring us to look, to bear witness to his madness. My heart was pounding, each beat a drum roll in my ears, drowning out all other sounds. The man moved closer to our fire, his hands reaching down to pick up branches and rocks, methodically dismantling the very thing that had given us a semblance of security. And then as if satisfied with his work, he retreated, his body disappearing into the bush, swallowed by the darkness. I looked at my boyfriend, my eyes wide with disbelief. Did that just happen? I asked, my voice shaky. He nodded, his face pale, his eyes haunted. It did, and we need to do something about it. We unzipped the tent, our movements cautious, deliberate. The fire was out, its embers cold, its warmth a distant memory. We gathered more wood, our hands working in unison, each piece a building block in our fortress against the unknown. As the fire roared back to life, its flames licking the night sky, I felt a sense of defiance wash over me. We were still here, still standing, still fighting. But as I looked into the flames, their dance a mesmerizing blend of light and shadow, I knew we weren't out of the woods yet, literally and figuratively. We'll stay awake, my boyfriend said, his voice tinged with resolve. We'll keep this fire going and we'll make it through the night. I nodded, my eyes meeting his, and in that moment, I knew we would. We had to, because whatever was out there, Whatever had visited us on this godforsaken night, it wasn't done with us yet. And as the fire cast its glow on our faces, revealing but also concealing, I couldn't help but wonder, what would the dawn bring? And were we ready to face it? The first rays of dawn should have been a relief, a promise of a new day, and an end to the night's terrors. But the sky remained dark, as if the sun itself had forsaken this patch of Romanian wilderness. The fire was our only source of light its flames now more necessity than comfort. We should have seen daylight by now, my boyfriend said, his voice tinged with an unease that mirrored my own. I nodded, my eyes scanning the horizon for any sign of morning's approach. But there was nothing, just an endless expanse of darkness that seemed to stretch on forever. That's not possible, I whispered, my voice barely rising above the crackling of the fire. The sun has to rise. It's just how it works. He looked at me, his eyes filled with a fear that needed no words. Maybe we're not where we think we are, he said, his voice heavy with implication. Before I could respond, a sound pierced the air, a howl, guttural and primal, echoing through the trees like a death knell. It was answered by another, and then another, a chorus of voices that seemed to come from all directions at once. They're closing in, my boyfriend said, 
his hand gripping the pocket knife as if it could ward off the impending doom. The puppies, Rudolph and his sister, were awake now, their eyes wide, their bodies trembling. They seemed to sense the danger, their instincts a warning we couldn't ignore. And then, as if on cue, the figures emerged from the forest, their forms barely visible in the firelight. Wolves, at least half a dozen, their eyes glowing an unnatural red, their snouts pulled back in a snarl. But there was something off about them, something that defied explanation. They moved in unison, their steps perfectly synchronized, as if controlled by a single malevolent will. We need to go now, my boyfriend said, his voice tinged with desperation. I nodded, my body already in motion, my mind racing through scenarios, each more terrifying than the last. We grabbed the puppies, their tiny forms pressed against our chests, and made a run for it, our feet pounding the earth in a frantic rhythm. But we didn't get far. A figure stepped into our path, his form illuminated by the dying embers of our fire. It was the man from the train, his eyes now a glowing red that matched those of the wolves, his grin a grotesque parody of human emotion. You can't run from what's in you, he said, his voice a low growl that seemed to come from the very depths of the earth. And as the wolves closed in, their eyes fixed on us, their snouts dripping with anticipation, I realized the horrifying truth. We were never meant to leave this place, this patch of wilderness that existed outside of time, outside of reality. We were part of it now, part of its eternal darkness, its insatiable hunger. As the first set of jaws closed around my arm, its bite a searing pain that shot through my body, I let out a scream that seemed to echo through the ages, a final, desperate cry that went unanswered. Because in that moment, as the darkness closed in, I knew there would be no dawn, no escape, no end to the nightmare that had claimed us. And as my vision blurred, the last thing I saw was the man from the train, his eyes glowing brighter than ever, his grin widening in triumph. I have a habit of daydreaming, not the kind where you're half listening to a teacher drone on about algebra while you're mentally on a beach somewhere. No, I'm talking about daydreams so vivid you can smell the salt in the air, feel the sand between your toes, and hear the waves crashing. It's a gift and a curse, really. A gift because it makes long road trips bearable, and a curse because sometimes the line between what's in my head and what's real gets a little too blurry for comfort. We were packed into our new RV, a hulking beast of a vehicle that my dad was still figuring out how to maneuver. Best investment I ever made, he declared gripping the wheel like he was wrestling an alligator. Mom was in the passenger seat, her eyes scanning the road ahead, probably contemplating the wisdom of letting Dad drive this monstrosity. I was in the back, my younger sister next to me, her nose buried in some teen romance novel. Florida, here we come, Dad announced, his voice tinged with that kind of forced enthusiasm parents muster when they're trying to make something sound more fun than it actually is. We'd been driving for hours, the landscape outside shifting from the familiar to the increasingly foreign. The sky was a dull gray, the kind that makes you forget the sun ever existed. But we were heading south, towards warmth and sunshine, and that was enough to keep everyone's spirits up. Eventually, we pulled into a rest stop near Lake City. The place was a hive of activity, buzzing with travelers, truckers, and families with screaming kids. All right, everyone out, Dad said, parking the RV with a finality that suggested he was glad to be done with driving, even if it was just for a little while. I stepped out and stretched, my muscles aching from hours of sitting. The air smelled like gasoline and fast food, a combination that was oddly comforting. I made my way to the vending machines, my eyes scanning the options. Just as I was about to make my selection, a man sidled up next to me. He was middle-aged but fit, his skin tanned to a shade that suggested he spent a lot of time outdoors. I like those Snickers bars the best. Leave me a couple, would you? He said, flashing a grin that was all teeth. Sure, I replied, making small talk as I punched in the numbers on the vending machine. His name was Alex, he told me, a businessman from Arizona. Everyone needs a vacation, he said, waving away my questions about what brought him to Florida. Something about the way he looked at me made my skin crawl. It was like he was sizing me up, cataloging details for some purpose I couldn't fathom. 
I felt like a specimen under a microscope, and I didn't like it one bit. Time to go. Mom's voice cut through the air, pulling me out of my thoughts. Nice meeting you, I said, taking a step back from Alex. The pleasure was all mine, he replied, his eyes locking onto mine for a moment too long. As I walked back to the RV, a shiver ran down my spine. Something about that encounter felt off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Shaking off the uneasy feeling, I climbed back into the RV. Little did I know that wouldn't be the last I'd see of Alex, and the line between my vivid daydreams and reality was about to get a whole lot blurrier. The RV rumbled into the campground, a patchwork of tents, trailers, and outdoor enthusiasts trying to escape the grind. Dad backed the behemoth into our rented lot with the precision of a surgeon, or at least he liked to think so. Like a glove, he announced, stepping out of the driver's seat as if he'd just landed a plane. Mom was already flipping through a campground brochure, her eyes darting over the activities listed. There's a nature trail that leads to a conservation area, she said, looking up. We should explore it. I was already ahead of her, my new digital camera in hand. I was thinking the same thing, I said, eager to capture the raw beauty of Florida's wilderness. My sister rolled her eyes, more interested in the campground's Wi-Fi password than the great outdoors. We're coming too, Dad declared, pulling out a pair of binoculars from an overhead compartment. Can't let you have all the fun? I hid my disappointment. I'd been looking forward to some alone time, maybe even sneaking off to smoke a bowl or two. But with my parents tagging along, that plan was as good as dead. We set off on the trail, a narrow path that wound through towering trees and thick underbrush. The air was heavy with the scent of damp earth and decaying leaves, a smell I found oddly comforting. Birds sang from hidden perches, their melodies filling the air. Dad was in full explorer mode, his binoculars pressed to his eyes as he scanned the treetops for exotic birds. Mom was a few steps ahead, her pace brisk, her eyes set on the path ahead. I lagged behind, my camera ready waiting for the perfect shot. We reached a fork in the trail, a wooden sign pointing the way to the conservation area. This way, Mom said, leading us down the path. As we walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. My eyes darted from tree to tree, half expecting to see Alex lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing, just the rustling of leaves and the distant sound of a creek. We reached the conservation area, a sprawling expanse of wetlands that stretched as far as the eye could see. Wow, I breathed, lifting my camera to capture the scene. Beautiful, isn't it? Mom said, her eyes taking in the view. It's something, Dad agreed, lowering his binoculars. I snapped a few photos, my finger pressing the shutter as I tried to capture the essence of the place. It was wild, untamed, a slice of Florida that had somehow escaped the relentless march of progress. As I looked through the lens, my mind began to drift. I imagined the people who had once called this place home, their lives intertwined with the land in ways I could barely comprehend. It was a daydream I knew, but it felt real, almost tangible. And then, just as I was about to lose myself in the fantasy, I heard it, a voice calling out from the trail behind us. I lowered my camera, my heart sinking as I turned to see who it was. It was a voice I recognized, a voice I'd hoped I'd never hear again. And as I stood there, my camera hanging limply from my neck, I knew that the line between my daydreams and reality was about to be shattered. We were on a footbridge that spanned a murky stretch of swamp water, the wooden planks creaking under our weight. Dad was squinting at a map, trying to figure out where we were, while Mom was busy snapping photos of a heron in the distance. I was leaning on the railing, my eyes scanning the water below for any sign of alligators. Look at this! Dad said, pointing to a spot on the map. There's a lookout tower not far from here. We should check it out. Before I could respond, a movement in the water caught my eye. A ripple, then a flash of scales, and for a brief moment I saw it. An alligator, lurking just below the surface. Holy moly, that's a big one, Dad exclaimed, following my gaze. I raised my camera, but the creature had already vanished, leaving only a trail of bubbles in its wake. Missed it. I muttered, lowering the camera in disappointment. Just then, I heard footsteps approaching. I turned and felt my blood run cold. It was him, Alex, the man from the rest stop. He was talking to a park ranger, a woman who looked utterly captivated by whatever he was saying. Come on, kiddo, Mom said, tugging at my arm. 
Let's go get eaten alive in this dirty damn swamp. I let her pull me away, but my eyes stayed on Alex. He was watching me, his gaze unsettlingly intense. As we walked off, I saw him say something to the park ranger, who then handed him a red hairband she'd been wearing. The moment we were out of earshot, I turned to my parents. I think we should head back, I said, my voice tinged with urgency. Why, we're just getting started, Dad protested. I don't feel well, I lied, hoping they'd take the bait. Mom looked at me, her eyes narrowing. You're not trying to sneak off and smoke that stuff again, are you? No, Mom, I swear, I just don't feel good. She sighed, her face softening. All right, let's head back. As we retraced our steps, I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible was about to happen. My mind kept drifting back to Alex, to the way he'd looked at me, to the red hairband he'd taken from the park ranger. It all felt wrong, like pieces of a puzzle I couldn't quite put together. We reached the RV and I practically sprinted inside, locking the door behind me. My parents exchanged puzzled glances but didn't say anything. I collapsed on the couch, my heart pounding in my chest. For a moment I considered telling them about Alex, about the unsettling feeling he gave me, but then I thought better of it. They'd think I was paranoid, overreacting, so I kept it to myself, hoping I was wrong, hoping it was all just a figment of my overactive imagination, but deep down, I knew it wasn't. Something was off, something I couldn't quite put my finger on, and as I sat there, staring out the window at the fading light, I had the sinking feeling that our trip to Florida had just taken a dark and dangerous turn. The next morning, I woke up with a sense of dread hanging over me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, that we were in danger. I tried to push the thought out of my mind as I stepped out of the RV, the Florida sun already beating down. Morning, sleepyhead, Mom greeted, flipping pancakes on a portable grill. Want some breakfast? I forced a smile. Sure, thanks. As I sat down to eat, my eyes scanned the campground. Families were out and about, kids riding bikes, parents setting up lawn chairs. Everything seemed normal, but the feeling of unease wouldn't go away. We're going to the beach today, Dad announced, sipping his coffee. You coming? I hesitated. The thought of being out in the open made me nervous, but staying behind alone seemed even worse. Yeah, I'll come, I finally said. We packed up and headed to the beach, a short drive from the campground. As we spread out our towels and set up our umbrella, I couldn't help but feel like we were being watched. I looked around, half expecting to see Alex lurking nearby, but there was no sign of him. Let's hit the water, Dad suggested, already in his swim trunks. I followed him to the shoreline, the waves crashing at our feet. For a moment, I forgot about my worries, lost in the simple joy of the ocean, but then, as I was wading into the water, I saw him. Alex was standing on the beach, not far from where we'd set up. He was staring at me, his eyes cold and calculating. A shiver ran down my spine. I turned and hurried back to our spot. We need to go, I told my parents, my voice tinged with panic. What's wrong? Mom asked, concerned. I just saw that guy from the rest stop, Alex. He's here and he's watching us. Dad looked skeptical. Are you sure it's him? I'm positive. We can't just pack up because you're feeling paranoid, Dad argued. I'm not being paranoid, I insisted. Something's not right about that guy. We need to leave now. Mom looked at Dad, her eyes filled with worry. Maybe we should go, she said softly. Dad sighed, clearly frustrated. Fine, let's pack up. As we hurriedly gathered our things, I kept an eye on Alex. He was still there, watching us. And as we headed back to the car, I saw him pull out his phone and make a call. The drive back to the campground was tense, no one speaking. As we pulled in, I noticed a police car parked near the entrance. My heart sank. We need to talk to them, I said, pointing to the police car. Dad nodded. All right, let's see what they have to say. As we approached the officers, I felt a mix of relief and dread. Maybe they could help us, or maybe we were already too late. But as I looked back at the campground, at the people going about their day, Oblivious to the danger lurking among them, I knew we had to try. We approached the police officers, their uniforms crisp and their faces stern. Dad took the lead, explaining that we'd seen someone suspicious, someone we'd encountered before. Alex, I added, from Arizona. He's been following us. The officers exchanged glances. We've had a report of a missing park ranger, one of them said. You think this Alex is involved? 
I can't say for sure, Dad replied, but something about him doesn't sit right. The officers took down our information and promised to look into it. As we walked back to the RV, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were running out of time. We should leave, I said, my voice urgent. We should pack up and go now. Dad hesitated, looking at Mom. What do you think? I think our son is scared, she said softly, and that scares me. We started packing, throwing our things into the RV with a sense of urgency. I kept looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see Alex at any moment, but he was nowhere to be seen, and that somehow made it worse. Finally, we were ready to go. Dad started the engine, and I felt a wave of relief wash over me. Maybe we'd dodged a bullet. Maybe we were going to be okay. And then I saw her, the park ranger who'd been talking to Alex. She was standing at the edge of the campground, her eyes vacant, her face expressionless. And she was holding something in her hand, a red hairband. My heart stopped. Dad, wait. He slammed on the brakes, looking at me in confusion. What is it? Her, I said, pointing to the ranger. She's not herself. Alex did something to her. Dad looked at the ranger, then back at me. You can't know that. I do, I insisted. I can feel it. Suddenly the ranger moved, her hand reaching up to touch the hairband. And then, in a voice that was not her own, she spoke. I could have taught you, she said, her voice dripping with malice. But you chose to run. A bad choice. My blood ran cold. It was Alex's voice coming from her mouth. He'd taken her over, just like he'd said he could. Dad floored the accelerator and we sped away, leaving the possessed ranger standing alone. No one spoke for a long time, each of us lost in our own thoughts, our own fears. Finally, Dad broke the silence. What was that? What the hell just happened? I looked at him, my eyes filled with tears. I think we just escaped something terrible, something evil. He nodded, his face pale. I think you're right. As we drove, I couldn't help but wonder what would have happened if we'd stayed, if we'd ignored that feeling of dread. And as I looked out the window, watching the Florida landscape speed by, I knew one thing for certain, we were lucky to be alive. But I also knew that Alex was still out there, and that thought filled me with a dread I couldn't shake. We drove for hours, the tension in the RV as thick as the humid Florida air outside. No one wanted to talk about what had happened, as if speaking it aloud would make it more real, more terrifying than it already was. But the silence was its own kind of horror, each of us alone with our thoughts, our fears. Finally, we crossed the state line, leaving Florida behind. I felt a small sense of relief, as if we'd put a physical distance between us and the evil we'd encountered. But I knew it wasn't that simple. Whatever Alex, or the thing that had been Alex, was... It wasn't confined to one place, one state. It was something older, darker, something that couldn't be outrun. We stopped at a rest area, the first we'd seen in miles. I need to stretch my legs, Dad said, his voice shaky. Anyone else coming? I'll stay here, Mom replied, her eyes never leaving the road ahead, as if she could see something we couldn't. I got out of the RV, my legs stiff, my body aching. I walked around the rest area, my eyes scanning the faces of the other travelers. Were they who they appeared to be? Or were they like Alex, something else wearing a human face? As I was about to head back to the RV, my phone buzzed in my pocket. A text message. I pulled it out, my hands trembling as I read the words on the screen. I'm disappointed in you, it read. We could have had so much fun together. It was from an unknown number, but I knew who it was from. My heart pounding, I looked around half expecting to see Alex standing there, watching me. But there was no one, just families on their way to vacations, truckers on long hauls, people living their lives, unaware of the darkness that lurked among them. I got back in the RV, my hands shaking as I showed the text to my parents. We need to go to the police, Dad said, his voice tinged with fear. We need to tell them everything. And then what? I asked, my voice hollow. Do you think they'll believe us? Do you think they can stop him? Dad didn't answer, and he didn't need to. We both knew the truth. There was no stopping Alex, no escaping him. He was out there, somewhere, and he would find us, no matter where we went, no matter what we did. As we got back on the road, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that we were never truly alone. And as I looked out the window, 
At the endless road stretching out before us, I knew that we were heading into a darkness far deeper than the night, a darkness that would never end. And somewhere, out there in that endless dark, Alex was waiting. I've always had a soft spot for the wilderness, a kind of sanctuary where the world's chaos takes a back seat. That's why I became a park ranger. The year was 1986, and let me tell you, it was a time unlike any other. Neon lights, cassette tapes, and movies that have now become classics. But even in that vivid era, the park was my refuge. It was a place where time seemed to slow down, where the air was crisp and the pine trees stood tall and proud like sentinels guarding a sacred place. My colleagues and I had a routine. After a long day of patrolling, maintaining trails, and ensuring the park was as pristine as Mother Nature intended it to be, we'd gather at the ranger station. It was a humble building, but it was ours. We'd pop a VHS tape into the VCR and let the flickering screen take us to galaxies far, far away or to the heart of a love story. Those movie nights were a simple pleasure, but they meant the world to us. They were a slice of normalcy in a job that often reminded us how unpredictable nature could be. But even in the most serene settings, oddities have a way of creeping in. It was late spring, and the park was alive. The air was filled with the scent of freshly cut grass and pine, a combination that always made me feel more alive. I was walking past a cluster of picnic benches, lost in thought when something caught my eye. A Halloween mask, the kind that covers your entire head was lying on the ground as if discarded in haste. It was designed to look like a vampire, complete with exaggerated fangs and a menacing expression. I stood there for a moment, puzzled. Halloween was months away, and even if it weren't, what was a mask doing here, in a place where the only masks you'd expect to see were those of animals in their natural habitat? I radioed it in. Base, this is Stuart. Found something odd near the picnic area. Over. Go ahead, Stuart came the reply, crackling through the radio. It's a Halloween mask, a vampire to be exact, just lying here on the ground. There was a pause. Well, that's a new one. Log it and keep an eye out. Could be kids messing around. Will do, base, over and out. I picked up the mask, its plastic surface cold to the touch, and logged it as instructed. But as I went about the rest of my day, the mask stayed on my mind. We've all got stories, little oddities that punctuate our daily routines. But this felt different. Like the opening line of a story, I wasn't sure I wanted to read to the end. That night, as the credits rolled on another movie, I looked around at my colleagues, each lost in their thoughts or in casual conversation. I wondered if any of them felt it too. The subtle shift in the air, the sense that our sanctuary had been touched by something we didn't quite understand. And so, the mask became a part of our lore a small mystery in a place filled with ancient trees and timeless landscapes. But as I'd soon find out, some mysteries have a way of digging their claws in, refusing to be forgotten. Little did I know this was just the beginning. The lake had always been a place of solace for me. Tucked away and surrounded by a quarry, it was a hidden gem in the park. The water's surface was like a mirror reflecting the sky and the surrounding trees. It was a place where you could lose yourself in thought where the world's problems seemed far away. But that evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the water, the lake felt different. It felt like a place hiding a secret. I was making my rounds, the setting sun painting the sky in hues of orange and pink. The air was cooling down, a welcome respite from the day's heat. I drove my truck down the narrow path that led to the lake, the tires crunching on the gravel road. I parked and stepped out, taking a moment to breathe in the fresh air. That's when I saw it, a small object on the wooden dock that jutted out into the lake. Curiosity peaked. I reached for my binoculars. As I focused the lenses, the object became clearer. It was another mask, just sitting there, as if waiting to be discovered. My heart sank. This was no coincidence. Someone had been here, in a place that required a key to access, a place that was off limits to the public. I grabbed my radio. Base, this is Stuart. I found another mask. This time it's by the lake, on the dock. Are you sure? The voice on the other end sounded incredulous. As sure as I'm standing here, we've got a situation. 
This area is supposed to be locked up. Understood. We're sending a team to your location. Stay put and keep an eye out. Roger that. I stood there, watching the mask from a distance. It was unsettling this intrusion into a place I had always considered safe. I felt exposed, like a deer that senses a predator but can't see it. The team arrived, and we documented the find, snapping Polaroid photos and sealing the mask in an evidence bag. But the questions remained. How did it get here? Who had the audacity to breach a restricted area? As we left the lake, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I scanned the tree line, half expecting to see a figure lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing. Just the rustling of leaves and the distant call of a night bird. The lake had given up its secret, but it felt like there were more to come. Back at the ranger station, the mood was somber. We were all thinking the same thing, but no one wanted to say it out loud. This was more than a prank. It was a violation, a breach of the sanctuary we were sworn to protect. And it was my job, our job, to find out who was behind it. As I clocked out for the night, I looked back at the park, its dark silhouette framed against the night sky. It was still beautiful, still a place of refuge, but it had lost some of its innocence. And I couldn't help but wonder what else it was hiding, what other secrets were buried beneath its tranquil surface. This was no longer just about masks. This was about preserving the sanctity of a place I loved, and I was determined to get to the bottom of it, no matter what it took. Summer had settled over the park like a warm, comforting blanket. The days were long, the air was thick with the scent of blooming flowers, and the sound of laughter from families enjoying their vacations filled the air. But for me, the season had lost some of its luster. The masks had become a dark cloud hanging over the park, a riddle with no answer. I was driving my truck through a particularly dense section of pine trees, the air conditioning fighting a losing battle against the heat. The towering pines seemed to close in around me, their branches forming a natural tunnel. It was a part of the park that always made me feel like I was entering another world, a place untouched by time. But today it felt different. It felt like the trees were whispering secrets, secrets I was not privy to. I parked the truck and stepped out, my boots crunching on the bed of pine needles that carpeted the ground. I was about to head back when I saw it, a mask propped up against the trunk of a pine tree as if it were casually resting there. My stomach lurched. This mask was eerily similar to the first one I'd found, but distinct enough to be a different one altogether. I grabbed my radio. Base, it's Stuart. Found another mask. This one's near the pine grove. A sigh came through the speaker. Copy that, Stuart. Log it and bring it in. We'll have to discuss this at the next briefing. Will do. I approached the mask cautiously, as if it were a wild animal that might bolt. I picked it up, its plastic surface now warm from the sun. I looked around, half expecting to see someone watching me, but I was alone, or at least it felt like I was alone. Back at the ranger station, the mask was logged and sealed in an evidence bag, joining the others in a growing collection that no one wanted. The room was thick with tension as we discussed the finds. Halloween was still months away, and the nearest store that sold masks like these was miles away. The internet wasn't an option. This was 1986, after all. Someone had gone through a lot of trouble to place these masks, and the why of it was driving us all a little crazy. We need to increase patrols, said my supervisor, breaking the silence. And let's get some volunteers from the community to keep an eye out. We can't let this go on. Nods of agreement filled the room. We were all thinking the same thing. It was time to take action. As I left the station, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were missing something, something crucial. The masks were a message, a signal of something darker lurking in the shadows. And as much as I wanted to believe it was just a prank, a voice in the back of my mind kept whispering that it was something more. I looked out over the park, its beauty now tinged with an undercurrent of menace. The pine trees swayed in the wind, as if nodding in agreement. This was a mystery that refused to be ignored, and I had a sinking feeling that things were about to get a lot more complicated. I needed answers and I needed them fast. The park was my sanctuary, a place I'd devoted years to protecting. These masks were an intrusion, a violation that I couldn't let go unanswered. That's why I found myself driving to the local college, where a man named Eric Pierce was said to have the kind of knowledge that could shed light on our mystery. 
The campus was quiet, the academic year having ended a few weeks back. I parked my truck and made my way to the history building, a brick structure that had seen better days. The hallway smelled of old books and floor polish, a scent that took me back to my own college days. I found Pierce's office at the end of the hall, its door ajar. Come in, he said before I could knock, as if he'd been expecting me. Eric Pierce was a tall man, his hair graying at the temples. His office was a labyrinth of books and papers, a lifetime of knowledge crammed into a small space. He gestured for me to sit, and I took a seat across from his cluttered desk. Nick tells me you're dealing with a rather unusual situation, he began, getting straight to the point. That's one way to put it, I replied, recounting the events of the past weeks, the masks, and the growing sense of unease among the rangers. Pierce listened intently, nodding as if he'd heard this kind of story before. When I was done, he opened a drawer and pulled out a folder, handing it to me. Ever heard of James Finley? he asked. I opened the folder to find newspaper clippings about a local criminal who had vanished without a trace years ago. What caught my eye was a detail about Finley's modus operandi. He wore Halloween masks during his robberies. This is starting to make sense, I muttered, the pieces of the puzzle falling into place. Pierce nodded. Finley disappeared in the woods near your park. Some say he buried his loot there, but no one's ever found anything. So you think these masks could be connected to Finley? It's a possibility, he said, pushing another folder toward me. But there's more. I opened the second folder to find missing persons reports. Three men, all in their late 20s to early 30s, had gone missing in the area over the past few months. These men were last seen near the park, Pierce continued. Locals say they were looking for Finley's treasure. A chill ran down my spine. So you think they might have found something they shouldn't have? Pierce leaned back in his chair, his eyes meeting mine. When people go looking for things, they often find more than they bargained for. I thanked Pierce for his time and took the folders with me, my mind racing as I drove back to the ranger station. If Pierce was right, we were dealing with something far more sinister than a simple prank. These masks were a warning, a sign that the park's secrets were darker than any of us had imagined. And as I pulled into the station, I knew one thing for certain. It was time to dig deeper, to unearth the truth hiding beneath the surface, because whatever was going on, it was far from over. The ranger station was buzzing with activity when I walked in, folders in hand. I could feel the tension in the air, a palpable sense of urgency that had settled over us all. I briefed my colleagues on my meeting with Professor Pierce, laying out the clippings and missing persons reports on the table. The room fell silent as they absorbed the information, the weight of the situation sinking in. We need to involve the community, said my supervisor, breaking the silence. We can't keep this under wraps any longer. We need eyes and ears out there. And so, we organized a community watch, reaching out to locals who knew the park like the back of their hand. Hunters, fishermen, hikers, people who had a vested interest in keeping the park safe. We held a meeting at the ranger station, laying out the facts and asking for volunteers. The response was overwhelming. It seemed the masks had struck a nerve, turning a local oddity into a community-wide concern. Armed with flashlights and walkie-talkies, the volunteers patrolled the park in shifts, their eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. We set up a hotline for tips, and the calls started coming in. Most were dead ends, strange noises that turned out to be wildlife, shadows that were just tricks of the light. But then we got the call we'd been waiting for. A local fisherman was out on the lake, his boat drifting near the quarry, when he saw it. A figure standing on the dock, shrouded in darkness. He couldn't make out any features, but the figure seemed to be staring right at him. Then, as quickly as it appeared, it vanished into the trees. My heart pounded as I listened to the fisherman's account, my mind racing with possibilities. Could this be the person behind the masks? And if so, what were they up to? We organized a search party, combing the area around the lake and the dock, but it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Whoever this person was, they knew how to cover their tracks. We found nothing, not even a footprint. It was as if they'd vanished into thin air. The community watch continued, the volunteers more determined than ever. But as the days turned into weeks, the leads dried up. It was as if the park itself was keeping its secrets, refusing to give up the ghost. And then, 
Just when we thought it was over, another mask appeared. This time, it was found hanging from a tree near one of the hiking trails, its empty eyes staring down like some sort of twisted guardian. I stood there, looking up at the mask, a sense of dread washing over me. This was far from over, and the message was clear. We were not alone. Someone was watching us, toying with us, and there was nothing we could do but wait for their next move. As I drove back to the ranger station, the sun setting behind me, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were on the edge of something dark, something that threatened to consume us all. And as much as I wanted to believe we could stop it, a voice in the back of my mind whispered the chilling truth. We were in over our heads, and the worst was yet to come. The summer was drawing to a close, the days growing shorter, and the nights cooler. The community watch had been disbanded, the volunteers returning to their lives, the sense of urgency fading away like the setting sun. But for me, the mystery of the masks was a wound that refused to heal, a puzzle with missing pieces that haunted my every thought. I was on the night shift, the park bathed in the soft glow of the moonlight. I drove my truck down the winding roads, the headlights cutting through the darkness. I was about to call it a night when my radio crackled to life. Stuart, you there? It's Paula. I'm here, Paula. What's up? I think you should come to the station. There's something you need to see. Her voice was tinged with a note of urgency that sent a chill down my spine. I turned the truck around and headed back to the station, my mind racing with possibilities. When I walked in, Paula was standing by the table, a look of disbelief on her face. Laid out before her was a series of Polaroid photos, each one more unsettling than the last. They were pictures of us, the rangers, taken from a distance, our faces clearly visible in the frame. Where did you find these? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. In the mailbox, no return address. They were wrapped in a plastic bag, along with this. She handed me a note, its message scrawled in a shaky hand. Stop looking, or the masks won't be the only things you find. My blood ran cold. This was a threat, a warning that we were getting too close to something we weren't meant to see. We need to go to the police, said Paula, her voice tinged with fear. I agree, I replied, grabbing my jacket. Let's go now. We locked up the station and headed to the parking lot, our footsteps echoing in the empty night. And that's when we saw it, a mask, hanging from the rearview mirror of my truck, its hollow eyes staring back at us. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, my legs trembling beneath me. This was no longer a game, it was a hunt, and we were the prey. We need to get out of here, said Paula, her eyes wide with terror. But before we could move, the sound of footsteps echoed from the darkness, slow and deliberate, drawing closer with each passing second. We turned to look, and there, emerging from the shadows, was a figure wearing a mask, its face a grotesque parody of a smile. I reached for my radio, my hands shaking, but it was too late. The figure raised its hand, and in it was a camera, its flash bursting forth, blinding us in a burst of light. When my vision cleared, the figure was gone, vanished into the night. But the message was clear. We were not alone, and the eyes that watched us were not those of a friend, but of a predator, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. And as we stood there, trembling in the darkness, I knew that the masks were just the beginning, a prelude to something far more terrifying, something that lurked in the depths of the park, a darkness that now knew our names. I sat down at my old wooden desk, the one that seen more years of service than any piece of furniture should. The creaking chair beneath me felt like it was sharing my burden as I opened my laptop. I navigated to the online community that had become my confessional, my sanctuary. My fingers hesitated over the keys before I began to type. Hey everyone, it's Ryan again. I can't thank you enough for the support you've given me. Your words have been a lifeline in a sea of chaos. I finally told Jen, my wife, about everything. It was like lifting a boulder off my chest. But I've got more to share, and it's heavy. I paused, thinking about Lisa. She was a good ranger, one of the best, but she'd been different lately, haunted. I continued typing. First off, Lisa, my fellow ranger and friend, has resigned. She's been having nightmares, the kind that follow you into the waking world. Nightmares about the Whistler. 
I remembered the last time I saw her. She looked like she hadn't slept in weeks, her eyes ringed with dark circles, her skin pale as winter. She'd pulled me aside, her voice trembling. Ryan, it's getting worse. The whistler, it's like it's coming closer, even in my dreams. Last night it was right in front of me, whistling that god-awful tune. I felt calm, too calm, like it was lulling me into something terrible. I'd wanted to help her, but what could I do? We were rangers, not ghostbusters. And now she was gone, resigned and retreated from this cursed place. I couldn't blame her. I miss her, I typed, but I'm glad she's out of this hellhole. She deserves better. We all do. I thought about how I'd finally spilled everything to Jen. It was a hard conversation, filled with disbelief, fear, and finally, a quiet understanding. She didn't fully grasp it, how could she? But she knew I wasn't a man given to flights of fancy. The relief of sharing it with her made me feel like I'd shed a couple of decades. I told Jen everything I wrote. It was hard, but necessary. She's worried, but there's a newfound openness between us. Secrets are heavy, folks, and we're all carrying too many as it is. I wrapped up the letter. I'll be partnered with a new guy, Zach, starting tomorrow. He's young, fresh out of college, and I worry for him. This place, it changes you. I'll keep you all posted. Until then, stay safe and keep your eyes open. You never know what's lurking in the dark corners of the world or your mind. I hit submit and leaned back, staring at the screen as if expecting immediate answers to unasked questions. The room felt colder, as if acknowledging the weight of my words. I shut the laptop with a sigh. It was done, another chapter in a story that seemed increasingly like a horror novel. But this was no fiction, and the next chapter was waiting to be lived, whether I was ready or not. And so, in the dim light of my desk lamp, surrounded by the wilderness that was both my workplace and my haunting ground, I braced myself for whatever would come next. The night was darker than usual, the kind of dark that swallows up the stars and leaves you feeling like you're standing at the edge of an abyss. I was paired with Ranger Jack, a grizzled veteran who'd seen more years in the park than most of us combined. His eyes had that far-off look, like he was always seeing something the rest of us couldn't. Quiet night, I said, breaking the silence as we patrolled the trails. Quiet's not always good, Ryan, Jack replied, his voice tinged with a gravity that made my skin crawl. Sometimes quiet's just the deep breath before the storm. I glanced at him, intrigued and uneasy. You speak like a man who's seen that storm. He sighed, as if debating whether to open a door long kept shut. Finally, he spoke. Ever heard of the Whistler? I felt a chill run down my spine. I have. Lisa told me about her nightmares before she left. Jack nodded, his face a mask of grim understanding. Well, I've got a tale of my own. Happened back in the 90s. I was a rookie, eager to prove myself. Got a call about a bear near one of the cabins. Turned out it was no bear. He paused, as if reliving the memory. It was a stormy night, much like this one. I reached the cabin and found a family and a young couple all scared out of their wits. They told me about a creature, something that stood on two legs and had eyes like burning coals. And then, in the middle of the storm, it broke into the cabin. I felt my heart pounding in my chest. What happened? It took the young woman, Jack said, his voice barely above a whisper. Broke the glass door and took her just like that. We heard her screams and then nothing, just the wind and the rain. I was speechless. The weight of his words hung in the air, heavy and suffocating. And management? I finally asked, my voice tinged with anger and disbelief. What did they do? Jack chuckled, a dry, humorless sound. What they always do. Covered it up said it was a bear attack. But those of us who were there, we know the truth. We heard the whistling, that eerie tune that still haunts my dreams. I looked at him, seeing the years of burden etched into his face. Why are you telling me this? Because you need to know, he said, locking eyes with me. You need to know what you're up against, what we're all up against. I nodded, a newfound sense of dread settling over me. Thanks, Jack. I wish I could say it's good to know, but he cut me off. No need to say it. Some truths are better left unspoken. But now that you know, you can't unknow it. Remember that. As we continued our patrol, the silence returned. But it was a different kind of silence, filled with unspoken fears and haunting melodies. And somewhere, in the dark recesses of the night, I could almost hear the faint strains of a whistling tune, a lullaby from the depths of a nightmare. 
And so we walked on, two men bound by a secret, a terror that neither of us could escape. The night was thick with mist, the kind that blurs the line between the earth and the sky, making everything feel close yet infinitely far away. I was on patrol with Zach, my new partner. Young guy, fresh out of college, full of that kind of optimism that only comes from not knowing any better. Beautiful night, isn't it? Zach said, his eyes scanning the horizon. Depends on your definition of beautiful, I replied, my gaze fixed on the fog that was rolling in, thicker and faster than I'd ever seen. We got the call around midnight. A couple, Jared and Emily, experienced hikers, had gone missing. Their family was worried, and with good reason. This park, it's not like other places. It has a way of swallowing people whole. We need to find them, and fast, I said, my voice tinged with urgency. Zack nodded, his face serious. Let's do it. We followed the trail they were last seen on, our flashlights cutting through the fog like knives through butter. But the fog was relentless, swallowing up the light, the trees, the very path beneath our feet. And then we heard it, the whistling, a tune so eerie it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I stopped dead in my tracks, grabbing Zack's arm. Wait, I whispered, my eyes darting around trying to locate the source of the sound. What is it? Zack asked, his voice tinged with fear. The whistler, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. We need to go back, now. But before I could say another word, Zack broke free from my grip and ran into the fog, shouting the names of the missing couple. I cursed under my breath and ran after him, my heart pounding in my chest. I found him a few minutes later, standing still, his face pale as a ghost. He was staring at something, something I couldn't see, something hidden in the fog. What is it? I asked, my voice shaky. It's them, he said, pointing to a shape in the fog, or what's left of them. I looked closer and felt my stomach churn. It was Jared and Emily, or at least what was left of them. Their bodies were torn apart, as if by some wild animal. But I knew better. Animals don't whistle. We need to go, I said grabbing Zack's arm and pulling him away from the gruesome sight. But what about them? he asked, his eyes filled with tears. We can't help them now, I said, my voice filled with a sadness and resignation that comes from years of seeing things you can't unsee. But we can help ourselves. We made our way back to the cabin, our hearts heavy, our minds filled with images we'd rather forget. But some things you can't forget, no matter how hard you try. As we reached the cabin, I looked back one last time, half expecting to see a figure emerge from the fog, whistling that eerie tune. But there was nothing, just the fog, thick and impenetrable, like the mysteries that haunt this place. And so we walked on, two men forever changed, bound by a secret that neither of us wanted but couldn't escape. And somewhere, in the depths of that fog, I knew the whistler was watching, waiting for the next soul to claim. The morning after the fog, the park felt different, like a room where someone had rearranged the furniture while you slept. Zack and I were called into the office, a cramped space filled with the smell of stale coffee and old files. Management wanted to see us. Sit, said the man behind the desk, a faceless suit from the higher ups. His eyes were cold, calculating like he was sizing us up for coffins. We're reassigning you, he continued, shuffling some papers. Effective immediately. I looked at Zack. His face was a mask, but his eyes betrayed a flicker of relief. I couldn't blame him. After last night, the farther away from that trail, the better. Any questions? The suit asked, clearly uninterested in any questions we might have. Just one, I said. What's going to happen to that area? Are you closing it off? The man chuckled, a sound devoid of humor. This park is a business ranger. We can't afford to close off an entire section just because of some unfortunate incidents. I clenched my fists, biting back the words I wanted to say. Unfortunate incidents? Is that what we were calling it now? We're done here, the man said, dismissing us with a wave of his hand. As Zack and I walked out, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders, only to be replaced by another, heavier one. We were safe, for now. But what about the next pair of rangers assigned to that godforsaken trail? What about the hikers, the families, the kids? Hey, Zack said, breaking my train of thought. You okay? I looked at him, really looked at him, and saw a young man trying to make sense of a world that had just shown him its darkest corners. 
I'm fine, I said, forcing a smile. Just thinking about what's next. He nodded, understanding the unspoken words. We were both thinking it. Once you've seen the things we've seen, what's next seems like a question with no good answers. As we reached our new station, a cabin on the opposite side of the park, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. I scanned the trees, the trails, half expecting to see a figure emerge from the shadows. Let's go, I said, ushering Zack inside. We've got work to do. But as I closed the door behind us, I couldn't help but wonder, was it work we were doing or something else? Something darker, something that had nothing to do with trails and hikers and the great outdoors. I shook off the thought, focusing on the tasks at hand. There were trails to patrol, families to assist, a job to do. But as I settled into the routine, a thought kept nagging at me, a thought as persistent as the fog that rolled in that fateful night. We were safe for now, but the whistler was still out there, and something told me our paths would cross again, in this life or the next. I sat down at my computer, the screen glowing in the dim light of my cabin. My fingers hovered over the keyboard, hesitant. I had a story to tell, a warning to give, but how do you put into words something that defies all explanation? Finally I began to type, my fingers flying over the keys as I poured out the events of the past few weeks. The nightmares, the fog, the whistler. As I wrote, I felt a strange sense of relief, as if the very act of putting it into words made it less terrifying, less real. I hit send, my post disappearing into the ether of the online community I had come to think of as a second home. It was a place for people like me, people who had seen things, experienced things that defied all logic and reason. A place where the inexplicable was the norm and skeptics were shown the door. Almost immediately, the responses began to pour in. Words of support, of sympathy, of sheer disbelief. But among them, one caught my eye. A message from someone who claimed to have experienced something similar. A ranger from another park, miles away, but worlds apart. We need to talk, the message read. I think we're dealing with the same thing. My heart pounded as I read the words, my mind racing. Could it be? Could there be someone else out there who had seen what I had seen, who knew what I knew? I typed a quick reply, my fingers trembling with a mixture of fear and excitement. I'm listening, I wrote. Tell me everything. As I waited for a response, I couldn't help but think about Zack, about Ranger Jack, about all the others who had walked these trails, patrolled these woods. Were we all part of something bigger, something darker than any of us could have imagined? Finally, the reply came a detailed account of events so similar to my own that it sent chills down my spine. The fog, the disappearances, the eerie whistling that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. We need to meet, the message concluded. We need to figure out what this is and how to stop it. I sat back in my chair, my mind a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions. For the first time in weeks, I felt something I had almost forgotten, hope. Hope that there was an answer, a way to stop the nightmares from becoming reality. But as I sat there staring at the screen, another thought crept into my mind, unbidden but undeniable. What if we were wrong? What if this was something that couldn't be stopped? Something as old as the hills and as relentless as the fog that rolled in that night? I shook off the thought, focusing on the here and now. I had a meeting to arrange, a mystery to solve. But as I typed my reply, agreeing to meet in a neutral location, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were playing with fire, that we were about to step into a world from which there was no turning back. And somewhere, in the depths of that endless night, I knew the whistler was listening, waiting for the moment when we would venture too far, and the hunter would become the hunted. I sat down with a stack of old reports, newspaper clippings, and a map of the park. My eyes were bloodshot, my hands shaky, I had been up all night trying to find a pattern, a clue, anything that might tell us how to stop this thing. Jen walked in, her face etched with concern. You need to sleep, she said softly. I can't, I replied, my voice tinged with desperation. Not until I figure this out. She sighed, knowing better than to argue, and left me to my obsession. Hours passed in a blur as I pored over the documents, my eyes scanning the text for any mention of fog, whistling, or unexplained disappearances. Slowly, a pattern began to emerge, a series of incidents stretching back decades, each one occurring in a different part of the park, but
but all sharing the same eerie similarities. I grabbed a red marker and began to mark the locations on the map, my hand trembling as the dots connected, forming a shape that I couldn't quite place, a shape that seemed almost deliberate. My phone buzzed, snapping me out of my trance. It was a message from the ranger I had been in contact with, the one who had experienced something similar in another park. I found something, the message read. Something big. We need to meet. Now. I quickly typed a reply, agreeing to meet him at a location halfway between our parks. As I grabbed my coat and headed for the door, I took one last look at the map, my eyes widening in horror as I finally recognized the shape. It was a circle, almost perfect in its symmetry, and at its center was the trail where Zack and I had encountered the fog, the place where Jared and Emily had gone missing. I felt a chill run down my spine as the realization hit me. This wasn't random. It was a trap a web spun by something ancient and malevolent, and we were the flies. As I drove to the meeting point, my mind raced with questions. What was this thing? How could we stop it? And most importantly, what did it want? I arrived at the location, a deserted rest stop off the highway, and waited. Minutes turned into hours, but there was no sign of the other ranger. Finally, my phone buzzed, a new message lighting up the screen. Don't trust anyone, it read. It's not what it seems. Before I could process the words, a low, haunting whistle filled the air, echoing through the trees and sending a wave of terror through my body. I looked around, my eyes straining to see through the darkness, but there was nothing there. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the whistling stopped, replaced by a silence so complete it felt like a void, a nothingness that swallowed everything in its path. I sat there, paralyzed by fear, my mind screaming at me to run but my body refusing to move. And as I sat there staring into the abyss, I knew one thing with chilling certainty. It was here. And it was coming for me. I've always had a thing for the wilderness. The way the trees stand tall like ancient guardians. The way the wind whispers secrets through the leaves. It's like nature's own cathedral. So when I heard about Amica Lola Falls State Park, it wasn't a question of if I would go, but when. I spent the morning packing my gear. My old backpack, worn from years of adventures, seemed eager to be filled with camping essentials. A compact tent, a sleeping bag, a portable stove, and a can of bear spray, just in case. Maps of the park were spread across my kitchen table, trails and landmarks marked in red ink. I felt like a general preparing for battle. Only my enemy was the chaos of modern life, and my allies were the towering pines and cascading waterfalls. The drive to the park was uneventful, but the moment I stepped out of my truck and onto the soil of Amica Lola, I felt like I had crossed into another world. The air was different here, crisper, cleaner, as if purified by the trees themselves. I took a deep breath, letting the scent of pine and damp earth fill my lungs. It was like inhaling freedom. I shouldered my backpack and started my hike. The trail was well marked, but not overly manicured, a sign that this park still respected the wild's untamed nature. As I ventured deeper, the sounds of civilization faded away, replaced by the symphony of rustling leaves, chirping birds, and my own steady footsteps. It was as if the forest was welcoming me, pulling me further into its embrace. The sun hung low in the sky, casting golden rays that filtered through the canopy of leaves creating a mosaic of light and shadow on the forest floor. I felt a sense of peace wash over me, a tranquility that I hadn't felt in years. My worries, my stress, the never-ending to-do lists, they all seem trivial now, dwarfed by the majesty of the world around me. But as the sun dipped closer to the horizon, a thought nudged its way into my peaceful reverie. I still needed to set up camp. I looked at my watch and realized that time had slipped away from me. In the city, the setting sun was just a signal that the workday was ending, but out here, it was a deadline. Darkness in the wilderness was an entirely different beast. I quickened my pace, my eyes scanning the terrain for a suitable campsite. The forest seemed to sense my urgency, the trees whispering as if discussing my predicament. I knew I had to find a spot soon, somewhere I could pitch my tent and build a fire before the curtain of night fell. And just like that, as if answering my silent plea, I spotted it. A small clearing near a creek, the water glistening in the fading sunlight. 
It was as if the forest had presented me with a gift, a perfect sanctuary in the heart of the wild. As I stepped into the clearing, I felt a sense of accomplishment, but also a hint of apprehension. The sun was setting, and the forest was preparing for its nocturnal life. I shook off the uneasy feeling. After all, this was what I came for, to be one with nature, to find peace in the solitude. But as the sky darkened, I couldn't shake the feeling that the forest was holding its breath, waiting for something, or someone, to break the silence. And so, with the last rays of sunlight disappearing behind the trees, I began to set up camp, unaware that the tranquility I had found would soon be shattered. The clearing by the creek was a godsend, like a sanctuary carved out by Mother Nature herself. The water flowed gently, its surface shimmering in the dying light, as if winking at me. I dropped my backpack to the ground, its weight leaving my shoulders as if taking with it the burdens I'd carried into these woods. I unrolled my tent, its fabric rustling like the wings of some nocturnal bird. The stakes drove easily into the soft earth, each thud a confirmation that I was claiming this little piece of wilderness, if only for a night. The tent stood proud and firm when I was done, a synthetic cocoon that promised a barrier, however thin, between me and the untamed world outside. Next came the fire. I gathered twigs and branches, their forms twisted and gnarled like the arthritic fingers of some woodland giant. The fire pit was a circle of stones, an ancient and primal design that had served mankind since we first stepped out of the caves and into the world. I struck a match, its flame tiny but fierce. The kindling caught, and soon enough a fire was dancing in the pit, its flames licking the air as if tasting the night. I sat back and opened a can of soup, its contents lukewarm but hearty. As I ate, I looked around, taking in the beauty of my surroundings. The firelight cast flickering shadows on the trees, turning them into wraith-like figures that swayed in the wind. The creek murmured softly, a lullaby sung by the earth itself. For a moment, I felt like the last man in the world, as if I had stepped outside of time and history, into a place that was as ancient as the hills and as fleeting as the mist. But as the sky grew darker, the atmosphere changed. The silence that had been so comforting earlier now felt heavy, as if charged with an unspoken tension. The fire seemed less cheerful, its light struggling to hold back the encroaching darkness. The trees loomed larger, their forms less distinct and more menacing. The wind picked up, its gusts no longer gentle but forceful, as if warning me of something yet to come. I shook my head, trying to dispel the unease that had settled over me. I was an experienced outdoorsman, no stranger to the moods and whims of the wild. And yet I couldn't shake the feeling that the forest had changed, that it was no longer the welcoming sanctuary it had been just hours before. I reached for my book, its pages filled with tales of adventure and courage, of men and women who had faced far greater dangers than a night in the woods. I read by the light of the fire, its glow turning the pages gold, as if imbuing the stories with a warmth and life of their own. But as I read, I became aware of another sound, faint but unmistakable. Footsteps. Not the four-legged kind, mind you, but the deliberate two-legged steps of something, or someone, approaching my camp. I closed the book and listened, my senses sharpening as the footsteps grew louder. I was no longer alone, and as I sat there, staring into the darkness beyond the firelight, I felt a chill run down my spine, colder than any wind that had blown through these woods. And so, with my heart pounding in my chest, I braced myself for what was to come. The footsteps seemed to hang in the air, like an unfinished sentence. I strained my ears, trying to pick apart the sounds of the night, to separate the natural from the unnatural. But the forest was a cacophony now, its once peaceful whispers turned into a dissonant chorus of creaks and rustles. I grabbed my flashlight, its beam a lance of light that cut through the darkness. I swept it around the campsite, its glow turning the trees into pillars of light and shadow. But there was nothing there, no sign of whoever, or whatever, had been approaching my camp. Probably just an animal, I muttered to myself, trying to shake off the unease that had settled over me like a shroud. I was a rational man, a man of logic and science. I didn't believe in ghosts or monsters, in things that went bump in the night, and yet, as I sat there staring into the fire, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was not alone, 
that I was being watched by eyes I could not see. I retreated to my tent, its fabric walls suddenly feeling as flimsy as paper. I zipped it shut, sealing myself off from the world outside. I picked up my book again, its pages a welcome escape from the tension that gripped me. I read by the light of my flashlight, its beam steady and unwavering, a stark contrast to the flickering firelight outside. But as I read, I became aware of another sound, one that I couldn't easily dismiss, a creaking noise, like the groan of old wood straining under weight. It was coming from the trees, from the towering giants that surrounded my camp. I listened, my heart pounding in my chest, as the creaking grew louder, more insistent, as if the trees themselves were trying to communicate, to warn me of something yet to come. I put down my book and unzipped the tent, my curiosity getting the better of my fear. I stepped outside, my flashlight in hand, and shone it towards the trees. They stood there, tall and silent, their branches swaying gently in the wind. But there was something different about them now, something unsettling. They seemed to lean towards me, their forms twisted and gnarled, as if reaching out to grab me. I shook my head, trying to dispel the illusion. I was letting my imagination get the better of me, turning shadows into monsters, sounds into warnings. I was a grown man for God's sake, not a child scared of the dark. And yet as I stood there, staring into the depths of the forest, I heard it again. Footsteps, deliberate, measured, and undeniably human. They were coming closer, each step a punctuation mark in a sentence I did not want to read. I retreated to my tent, my hands shaking as I zipped it shut. I sat there, my back against the fabric wall, my flashlight gripped tightly in my hand. I listened, my breath shallow and ragged as the footsteps grew louder as they reached the edge of my camp. And so, with my heart pounding like a drum, I braced myself for the unknown, for the darkness that was about to step into the light. The footsteps stopped, as if hesitating at the edge of the firelight. My heart was a jackhammer in my chest, each beat echoing in the silence that had fallen over the camp. I clutched my flashlight like a weapon, its beam aimed at the tent's entrance, ready to reveal whatever intruder dared to step into its light. Minutes passed, but they felt like hours. The tension was a living thing, a palpable force that filled the tent, making it hard to breathe. I strained my ears, listening for any sign, any clue as to what was lurking outside. But the forest had gone silent, as if holding its breath, waiting for the moment to strike. Finally, unable to bear the suspense any longer, I unzipped the tent and stepped outside. My flashlight cut through the darkness, its beam sweeping across the campsite, turning the trees into ghostly figures that danced and swayed in the wind. But there was no sign of the intruder, no trace of the footsteps that had approached my camp. Must have been my imagination, I muttered, trying to convince myself. But even as I spoke, I knew it was a lie. Those footsteps had been real, as real as the fear that gripped me now. I turned back towards the tent, ready to retreat into its false sense of security. But as I did, my flashlight caught something in the distance, a shape that was darker than the night, a figure that seemed to absorb the light rather than reflect it. I froze, my breath catching in my throat. The figure was tall and hunched, its form indistinct but undeniably human, or at least humanoid. It stood at the edge of the forest, just beyond the reach of the firelight, as if hesitant to step into the open. For a moment, we were locked in a silent standoff, each of us waiting for the other to make the first move. I considered calling out, demanding to know who or what was out there, but something held me back, a primal instinct that screamed at me to stay silent, to not draw attention to myself. And then, as if sensing my fear, the figure began to move. It stepped forward, its movements slow and deliberate, as if savoring the moment. My heart pounded in my ears, drowning out all other sounds, as the figure crossed the boundary between darkness and light, between the unknown and the known. As it stepped into the firelight, I braced myself for the reveal, for the face that would haunt my nightmares for years to come. But just as it was about to step into the light, just as its features were about to be revealed, I felt a sudden rush of vertigo, a wave of nausea that swept over me like a tsunami. I staggered back, my vision blurring, my flashlight slipping from my grasp. I tried to scream, to shout, to make any sound at all, but before I could, the world went dark, and I felt myself falling, tumbling into an abyss that had no bottom. And then, 
Just as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. I blacked out, my consciousness slipping away like sand through my fingers, leaving me alone in the darkness, with the shadowy figure that had stepped out of my nightmares and into my life. I woke up to the sound of birdsong, a melody that seemed strangely out of place given the night's events. My eyes flickered open, squinting against the morning light that streamed through the tent's fabric. For a moment I lay there disoriented, my mind struggling to piece together the fragments of the night before. I sat up, my head pounding like a drum, each beat a reminder of the terror I had felt. I unzipped the tent and stepped outside, half expecting to see the shadowy figure still lurking in the woods. But there was nothing there, just the trees and the creek and the morning sun, all of it bathed in a golden light that seemed to mock my fear. I looked around, my eyes scanning the campsite for any signs of the intruder, but everything seemed to be in its place, just as I had left it. My backpack lay next to the tent, its contents untouched. The fire pit was a circle of ashes, its flames long since extinguished. Even the creek seemed unchanged, its waters flowing gently, as if the night's events had been nothing but a bad dream. But as I started to pack up my gear, I noticed something that sent a chill down my spine. My camping supplies were scattered across the ground, their contents spilled out like the entrails of some gutted animal. My food was gone, my water bottles empty, even my map was missing, as if stolen by some phantom thief. I stood there staring at the mess, my mind racing. Had it been an animal? A bear, perhaps, or some other woodland creature? But no, that didn't make sense. Animals didn't steal maps, didn't empty water bottles. No, this had been the work of something far more sinister, something that walked on two legs and knew how to cover its tracks. I packed up what was left of my gear, my hands shaking as I folded the tent and shouldered my backpack. I felt violated, as if the forest had turned against me, had shown me its darker side. I wanted nothing more than to leave, to put as much distance between me and this cursed place as possible. As I started to hike back to civilization, my steps quick and purposeful, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the shadowy figure was still out there, lurking in the woods. I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see it emerge from the trees, to hear its footsteps echoing in the wind. But there was nothing there, just the forest and the sky and the path that led back to the world I had left behind. And yet as I walked, I couldn't help but wonder, what had happened last night? What had I seen? What had I heard? And most importantly, why had it let me go? As I reached the edge of the forest, the trees giving way to open fields and paved roads, I felt a sense of relief wash over me, as if I had escaped some great danger. But even as I stepped back into the world of men, I knew that I would never be the same, that the events of that night would haunt me for the rest of my life, a dark shadow that I could never escape. I finally reached the ranger station, its wooden structure a symbol of order and safety in the midst of the wild. I pushed open the door, its bell chiming softly, a sound that seemed almost alien after the silence of the forest. The ranger looked up from his desk, his eyes meeting mine. You look like you've seen a ghost, he said, half joking, half serious. I hesitated, my words catching in my throat. How could I explain what had happened? How could I put into words the terror that still gripped me? I had an encounter, I finally said, my voice barely above a whisper. The ranger leaned back in his chair, his eyes narrowing. An encounter with what? A bear? A mountain lion? I shook my head, my hands trembling as I recounted the events of the night before. The footsteps, the shadowy figure, the blackout, all of it spilled out, like water from a broken dam. The ranger listened, his expression unreadable. When I was done, he sighed, as if weighing his words carefully. Look, it's easy to let your imagination run wild out there. The forest can play tricks on you, make you see and hear things that aren't really there. I stared at him, my heart sinking. He didn't believe me, didn't understand the gravity of what had happened. You think I'm making this up? I said, my voice tinged with desperation. You think I imagined all of this? The ranger shrugged, his eyes meeting mine. All I'm saying is that the wilderness is a strange place. People go missing all the time, swallowed up by the forest, never to be seen again. But most of the time, it's just a case of getting lost, of letting fear get the better of you. I stood up, 
my body trembling with a mixture of relief and frustration. He didn't believe me, but maybe that was for the best. Maybe it was better to let the world think I was crazy, rather than face the terrifying truth. As I turned to leave, the ranger spoke again, his voice low and serious. You said your map was missing, right? I nodded, my hand on the doorknob. He reached into his desk and pulled out a folded piece of paper, its edges worn and frayed. Found this a few miles from here, near an old trail that's been closed for years. Thought you might want it back. I took the map, my hands shaking as I unfolded it. It was mine, all right, but something was different. Something had been added, a symbol or a mark that I had never seen before. It was a circle, drawn in what looked like red ink, near the spot where I had camped. As I stared at the mark, a chill ran down my spine, colder than any wind that had blown through those woods. I looked up, my eyes meeting the rangers, but he was no longer there. The station was empty, as if he had vanished into thin air. And then, as if on cue, I heard it. The sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, echoing in the distance, growing louder with each passing second. I was not alone, and whatever had been watching me, whatever had let me go, had decided to come back, to finish what it had started. And as I stood there, staring into the abyss, I knew that this time, there would be no escape. I pulled my truck into the airport's short-term parking lot, the gravel crunching under the tires like dry bones. The sun was setting, casting long shadows that seemed to stretch out like the years since I'd last seen Riker. My nephew, a city boy, born and bred, but with a yearning for the great outdoors that I could only attribute to some dormant family gene. The terminal doors slid open, and there he was, a backpack slung over one shoulder and a look of weary excitement on his face. He'd grown taller, his features more defined, but the youthful glint in his eyes was as familiar as the mountain trails I called home. Uncle, he shouted, dropping his bag and rushing toward me. I braced myself for the impact of a bear hug. Man, it's been too long. Sure has, kid, I said, patting him on the back. You ready for a week in the wild? Born ready, he grinned, retrieving his bag. The drive back to my trailer was filled with talk of college, jobs, and the mundane intricacies of city life. I listened, nodding at the right moments. But my mind was on the week ahead. The Appalachian Mountains were a different beast altogether. Beautiful but unforgiving, like a siren you couldn't ignore even when you knew better. We reached the trailer as darkness settled in, the outline of the mountains barely visible against the night sky. I fired up the grill, the sizzle of steak filling the air with a rustic aroma, potatoes wrapped in foil cooked on the side, a humble but hearty meal for the journey ahead. So what's the plan? Riker asked, digging into his steak with gusto. We'll hit the trail first thing tomorrow, I said. Got a few spots in mind that offer the best views and a good challenge. Can't wait he replied, his eyes lighting up at the prospect. As the night wore on, the conversation shifted from the mundane to the mysterious. The mountains had their own set of rules, a code that every hiker should know but few ever did. I could see the skepticism in Riker's eyes, a city-bred disbelief in the inexplicable. But he'd learn. They all did. Hey, I said as he got up to retire for the night. Make sure you close the curtains in your room, all right? He looked puzzled. We're in the middle of nowhere, Uncle. Who's going to be peeping through the windows? Just trust me on this one, I said, my voice tinged with a seriousness that made him pause. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Riker nodded, his expression a mix of confusion and curiosity. All right, if you say so. As I lay in bed that night, the curtains tightly drawn, I thought about the red eyes I'd seen years ago, peering through the window like a malevolent force from a world we're not supposed to know. I thought about Dan Williams, a fellow ranger who'd laughed off the warnings and paid the price. And as I drifted off to sleep, I couldn't shake the feeling that the mountains were watching us, waiting to see if we'd play by their rules or defy them at our peril. And so, with the dawn of a new day, our journey into the unknown was about to begin. The aroma of freshly brewed coffee filled the trailer, mingling with the crisp morning air that seeped in through the cracks in the windows. I glanced at the clock, 5 a.m. Early, but the mountains didn't wait for anyone. I poured myself a cup and took a sip, 
the bitterness jolting me awake. I heard Riker stir in the guest room, the creaking of the bed frame cutting through the silence. A few minutes later he emerged, his eyes still heavy with sleep, but a smile on his face. Morning, uncle, he greeted, sniffing the air appreciatively. That coffee smells like heaven. Help yourself, I said, nodding toward the pot. We've got a long day ahead. As Riker poured his coffee, I started on breakfast. Scrambled eggs, bacon, and some toast. Simple, but it'd give us the energy we needed. We ate in companionable silence, both of us eager to hit the trail but savoring these quiet moments before the day's challenges. Just as we were finishing up, Riker's eyes darted to the sliding glass door leading to the front porch. Hey, looks like Barkley wants in, he said, getting up and heading toward the door. My heart skipped a beat. Wait, I yelled, louder than I intended. Riker froze, his hand inches from the door handle. What's wrong? I motioned for him to follow me into the living room, my eyes never leaving the figure outside the glass door. It looked like Barkley, all right, but something was off. The eyes were too vacant, the posture too stiff. I pointed to the corner of the room where Barkley lay on his dog bed, snoring softly. That's Barkley, I whispered, my voice tinged with an urgency I couldn't fully explain. Don't open that door. Riker looked from the real Barkley to the imposter outside, his eyes widening in disbelief. Is that a stray? I shook my head. No, it's something else, something you don't want to invite inside. As if on cue, the figure outside the door vanished, melting into the shadows like a wisp of smoke. Riker let out a shaky breath. What was that? It's hard to explain, I said, choosing my words carefully. Let's just say the mountains have their own set of rules. One of them is to make damn sure it's really your pet trying to get in. Riker stared at me, his eyes searching for a hint of jest. Finding none, he nodded slowly. All right, uncle, I'll remember that. We spent the next half hour getting our gear ready, the atmosphere tinged with a newfound sense of urgency. As I double-checked the straps on my backpack, my thoughts drifted to the red eyes I'd seen years ago and the doppelganger dog that had just tried to enter my home. The mountains were a place of beauty, but they were also a realm of mysteries that defied explanation. And as we stepped out the door, leaving the safety of my trailer behind, I couldn't help but wonder what other lessons the Appalachian Trail had in store for us. One thing was certain, Riker's education had just begun, and so had our journey into the heart of the unknown. The morning sun was a golden disk in the sky, casting its light over the undulating hills and dense forests of the Appalachian Trail. The air was crisp, tinged with the scent of pine and damp earth. It was the kind of day that made you grateful to be alive, and even more grateful to be miles away from the concrete jungle. Riker and I set out, our boots crunching on the gravel path that soon gave way to a dirt trail. We were surrounded by towering trees, their leaves forming a canopy that dappled the ground with shifting patterns of light and shadow. It was peaceful, the kind of peace you can only find in the heart of nature. So what's the plan for today? Riker asked, his eyes scanning the trail ahead as if expecting it to reveal its secrets. We'll head up to Eagle's Peak, I said. It's a bit of a climb, but the view from the top is worth every step. Riker grinned, his earlier apprehension replaced by the thrill of adventure. Lead the way, uncle. We hiked in companionable silence, each lost in our own thoughts, but united by the rhythm of our steps and the beauty that surrounded us. Every now and then, Riker would stop to take a photo or simply stand and breathe, his eyes wide with wonder. It was during one of these moments that I noticed the change. Riker's face grew tense, his eyes narrowing as he scanned the trees around us. You hear that? He asked, his voice barely above a whisper. I strained my ears, listening past the rustle of leaves and the distant calls of birds. And then I heard it, a low droning sound, like a siren but distorted as if being played through a broken speaker. We need to get as far away from that noise as possible, I said, my voice tinged with an urgency that made Riker's eyes widen. But what if it's a weather alert or something, he protested. It's not, I said, cutting him off. Trust me, we need to move, now. We turned and started running, our boots pounding the earth as we retraced our steps. The siren grew louder, then softer, as if playing a cruel game of hide and seek. Just when I thought we'd put enough distance between us and the noise, it blared again, this time so close it felt like it was right on top of us. What the hell? 
Riker yelled, his hands clamped over his ears. And then we saw it. A towering structure that looked like an old vine-covered telephone pole, but with speakers at the top. It was moving, its base dragging along the ground as if propelled by some unseen force. The siren wailed, a deafening sound that seemed to shake the very air around us. Without a word, Riker and I turned and bolted, adrenaline fueling our steps as we ran like our lives depended on it. Because they did. As we put distance between us and that monstrosity, the siren's wail grew fainter, until it was swallowed by the sounds of the forest. We didn't stop running until we were sure it was gone, our breaths coming in ragged gasps, our bodies drenched in sweat. Riker looked at me, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and disbelief. What was that? I took a deep breath, my mind racing as I tried to find the words to explain the unexplainable. Welcome to the Appalachian Trail, I said finally. You're not in the city anymore. We found a clearing a good distance away from where the siren had nearly cornered us. Our breaths were still ragged, our hearts pounding like drumbeats in a war dance. I set down my backpack and took a swig from my water bottle, the liquid barely quenching the dryness in my throat. Riker was pacing, his eyes darting around as if expecting the trees to come alive. All right, uncle, spill it. What the hell is going on here? I sighed, looking at him squarely. Sit down, Riker. We need to have the talk. He hesitated, then sat on a fallen log, his eyes never leaving mine. Is this where you tell me about the birds and the bees of the Appalachian Trail? In a manner of speaking, I said, taking a seat beside him. Except these birds and bees can be deadly. I began with the curtains, recounting the night I'd seen those red eyes staring through my window. I told him about Dan Williams, a fellow ranger who'd scoffed at the old tales and ended up a lifeless husk, his face twisted in eternal horror. Riker listened, his eyes widening with each tale. And you're sure this wasn't some animal? Or maybe a trick of the light? I've been a ranger for over two decades, I said, my voice tinged with a hardness that made him wince. I know every animal in these parts and none of them have red eyes that can bore into your soul. He nodded, swallowing hard. Okay, what about that siren thing? What was that? That, I said, choosing my words carefully is something you don't ever want to get close to. It's a cryptid, a creature that defies explanation. It lures you in with that siren sound, and if it catches you, well, let's just say you don't want to find out. Riker looked at me, his eyes searching for a hint of exaggeration. You're serious, aren't you? As a heart attack, I said. There are things in these mountains that defy logic and explanation. Old folks call them spirits, demons, cryptids, whatever you want to name them. They're real, and they're dangerous. He took a deep breath, letting it out slowly as if exhaling his disbelief. So, what do we do? We follow the rules, I said. Always sleep with your curtains closed. Make sure it's really your pet trying to get in, and never ever get close to that siren. He nodded, his face set in grim determination. Anything else? I hesitated, then decided he was ready. There's a creature called the Wampus Cat, six-legged feline, bigger than a lion, with eyes that can hypnotize you. If you see it, avoid eye contact at all costs. Riker chuckled, then stopped when he saw my face. You're not joking, are you? No, Riker, I'm not, I said, standing up and shouldering my backpack. These mountains are beautiful, but they're also a minefield of the unexplained. Stick with me, follow the rules, and you'll get through this. He stood up, his eyes meeting mine. I'm with you, Uncle. Let's do this. As we resumed our hike, I couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding. We'd escaped the siren, but the mountains had more lessons to teach, more rules to enforce, and we were just getting started. We made camp as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple that no artist could ever truly capture. The beauty of it was almost enough to make you forget the dangers lurking in the shadows, almost enough to lull you into a false sense of security. Almost. As Riker set up the tent, I gathered firewood, my eyes scanning the darkening woods. The rules were clear in my mind, each one a lifeline that could mean the difference between life and death. But there were other rules, other dangers that I hadn't shared with Riker yet. How could I, when I barely understood them myself? Fire's ready, Riker called, snapping me out of my thoughts. I returned to camp and sat by the fire, its warmth seeping into my bones as the temperature dropped. 
Riker joined me, a can of beans in one hand and a look of contentment on his face. This is amazing, uncle, he said, staring into the flames. I can't believe I've been missing out on this my whole life. It's a different world out here, I said, my eyes meeting his. One that can be both beautiful and terrifying. He nodded, his expression growing serious. You mentioned other dangers earlier. What were you talking about? I took a deep breath, choosing my words carefully. There's a creature known as the Wampus Cat. It's a six-legged feline, larger than any lion or tiger you've ever seen. It has golden eyes that can hypnotize you if you're not careful. Riker chuckled, then stopped when he saw my face. You're not kidding, are you? No, I said, my voice tinged with a gravity that made him sit up straight. Making eye contact with a wampus cat can put you in a trance, make you unable to move, and then, well, you become its dinner. He swallowed hard, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and fascination. What do we do if we encounter one? Your best bet is to catch it off guard and shoot it, I said, patting the rifle that lay beside me. If you don't have a gun, hide and pray it doesn't find you. Running is not an option. He nodded, his face set in grim determination. Anything else I should know? I hesitated, then decided it was time. There are other things. Things I can't even begin to explain. Lights that dance in the sky but aren't stars. Whispers that come from nowhere. Shadows that move on their own. The key is to respect the mountains, to understand that we're merely visitors in a world we can't fully comprehend. He looked at me, his eyes filled with a newfound sense of respect. I understand, Uncle. I'll follow the rules, all of them. I nodded, satisfied. Good. That's the only way to survive out here. As we settled into our sleeping bags, the curtains of our tent tightly closed. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that the mountains were testing us waiting to see if we'd abide by their rules or pay the price for our ignorance. And as I drifted off to sleep, one thought echoed in my mind. The real journey was just beginning, and there was no turning back. The morning sun broke through the canopy of leaves, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. We were up early, packing our gear and dousing the fire, leaving no trace of our presence. The mountains demanded respect, and we gave it willingly, knowing the price of arrogance. We've got a long hike ahead, I said, shouldering my backpack. We'll head down to the valley, then make our way to the waterfall. It's a sight to behold. Riker nodded, his eyes shining with anticipation. I can't wait, Uncle. This has been the most incredible experience of my life. I smiled, touched by his enthusiasm, but also wary of the dangers that still lay ahead. It's not over yet, kid. Remember, always stay alert. We set off the trail winding its way through towering trees and overgrown bushes, each step taking us deeper into the heart of the mountains. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and decaying leaves, a smell that I'd come to associate with both life and death. As we walked, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone, that something was watching us from the shadows. I glanced at Riker, who seemed blissfully unaware, lost in the beauty of the moment. I envied him, wished I could see the world through his eyes if only for a moment. And then I heard it, a soft rustling in the bushes, a sound that was almost drowned out by the chirping of birds and the rustle of leaves. Almost. I stopped, my hand going to the rifle slung over my shoulder. Did you hear that? Riker paused, his eyes scanning the trees. Hear what? Before I could answer, a low growl echoed through the forest, a sound so deep and guttural it seemed to come from the bowels of the earth. I turned, my eyes meeting a pair of golden orbs that glinted from the shadows. Wampus cat, I whispered, my voice tinged with a dread that sent a chill down my spine. Riker looked at me, his eyes wide with terror. What do we do? Remember the rules, I said, my eyes never leaving those golden orbs. Avoid eye contact, and whatever you do, don't run. As if sensing our fear, the creature stepped into the light its six-legged frame towering over us like a demon from the darkest corners of our nightmares. It growled again, a sound that shook us to our very core, then turned and vanished into the forest, leaving us trembling in its wake. We need to go, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Now. We resumed our hike, each step weighed down by the knowledge of what lurked in the shadows. And as we made our way through the forest, one thought echoed in my mind. The mountains had let us go, but the rules had changed. 
the stakes raised in a game we were only beginning to understand. And somewhere in the depths of the Appalachian Trail, the golden eyes of the wampus cat watched and waited, its growl a chilling reminder that we were merely visitors in a world we could never truly belong. The end was just the beginning, and the real journey had yet to come. I've always been a night owl, something about the darkness, the solitude, and the quiet hum of the engine against the backdrop of an endless sky full of stars. It's like a drug to me. I've been driving these roads for years, long enough to know that the night isn't just a time, it's a place. A place I call the Evernight. The Evernight isn't for everyone, it's a realm where the line between the living and the dead, the known and the unknown, gets blurred. It's a stretch of time and space where you're more likely to encounter the inexplicable than the mundane. You might think it's romantic, poetic even, but let me tell you, it's anything but. It's a place where your thoughts are your only companions and sometimes they're the worst kind to have. I eased my truck into a gas station that looked like it had seen better days. The neon sign flickered erratically, casting eerie shadows on the cracked pavement. The place was a relic a leftover from a time when road trips were the epitome of American freedom. Now, it stood as a monument to a bygone era, and perhaps to the forgotten souls who still roamed these roads. I killed the engine and sat there for a moment, listening to the ticking of the cooling metal, a lullaby for the restless. I glanced at the rearview mirror, half expecting to see something, or someone, staring back. But it was just me my eyes betraying the years and miles I'd put between myself and the world I used to know. I got out of the truck, my boots crunching on the gravel as I made my way to the cafe adjoining the gas station. The bell above the door jingled as I entered, announcing my presence to no one in particular. The place was empty, save for a lone waitress who looked as worn out as the vinyl booth she was cleaning. Coffee? she asked, not bothering to look up. Black, I replied, taking a seat at the counter. She poured the coffee, the dark liquid steaming as it hit the bottom of the chipped mug. I wrapped my hands around it, welcoming the warmth. Why are you out here? She finally asked, breaking the silence. I looked up, meeting her eyes. I could ask you the same, she shrugged. It's a job, it pays the bills. And you, she pressed. I paused, considering my answer. I guess I'm looking for something. Something or someone? Maybe both, I said, taking a sip of the coffee. But mostly, I'm trying to understand the Evernight. She looked puzzled. The Evernight? It's what I call this time, this place. The middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night. She nodded as if she understood but didn't want to say it out loud. Just then, the door jingled again, and a young man walked in. He looked out of place, like a character from a different story who had accidentally stumbled into this one. Mind if I join you? He asked his eyes meeting mine. I gestured to the seat next to me. Be my guest. As he sat down, I couldn't help but feel that the Evernight had just delivered something, or someone, entirely unexpected. And in that moment, I knew that the line between reality and nightmare was about to blur once again. Little did I know it was more than just a line that would be crossed that night. The young man slid into the seat next to me, his eyes bright and eager. He looked like he'd just stepped out of a college campus, not someone you'd expect to find in a rundown cafe in the middle of the Evernight. Name's Marcus, he said, extending a hand. His grip was firm, confident. I'm Jack, I replied, sizing him up. You look a little young to be out here in the middle of nowhere. He grinned, revealing a set of perfectly white teeth. I get that a lot, but age is just a number, right? Sometimes it's more than that, I said, taking a sip of my coffee. Sometimes it's a collection of choices, experiences, and scars. Marcus chuckled. You sound like a philosopher. Or a guy who's seen too much, I replied, setting down my mug. The waitress came over, her eyes meeting Marcus's. Coffee? Tea, actually, he said, surprising me again. Green, if you have it. She nodded and went about preparing his drink. Marcus turned back to me, his eyes alight with curiosity. So, what brings you out here, Jack? business or pleasure? A bit of both, I said cautiously. I drive these roads for a living, but I also find a certain satisfaction in it. What about you? What's a guy like you doing out here? Marcus leaned back, 
his eyes twinkling. Podcasts, he said, as if that explained everything. I raised an eyebrow. Podcasts? Yeah, man. Creepypastas, horror stories, true crime. You name it, I listen to it. Ever heard of Corpse Husband? I nodded. I've come across his stuff. Dark, unsettling tales. Exactly, Marcus exclaimed. I used to listen to those stories while driving home from my old job. Got me thinking. Why not make a career out of it? Drive through the night, listen to creepy stories, and maybe even experience one for myself. I looked at him, trying to gauge if he was serious. You want to experience a horror story? He shrugged. Not like, get murdered or anything, but something spooky, something I can talk about, post online. You know, for the clicks. I shook my head, incredulous. You're braver than most, or maybe just more foolish. Marcus laughed. Could be a bit of both. The waitress set a cup of steaming green tea in front of Marcus. He took a sip and sighed contentedly. So, any interesting stories to share? He asked, looking at me expectantly. I paused, considering whether to open up to this stranger. The Evernight had a way of making people reveal more than they intended. Let's just say I've seen things, I finally said. Things that would make your creepy pastas seem like bedtime stories. Marcus leaned in, his eyes wide. Do tell. I looked at my watch. It was 2.23 a.m. Time was slipping away, and I had miles to go. But something told me that Marcus, or whatever he represented, was an encounter I couldn't just drive away from. Maybe another time, I said, finishing my coffee. The night is long, but the road is longer. Marcus nodded, seemingly understanding. Until then, safe travels, Jack. As I got up to leave, I couldn't shake the feeling that Marcus was more than just a curious young man. He was a harbinger, a sign of the unsettling experiences that lay ahead. And as I stepped out into the Evernight, I knew that the line between reality and nightmare was about to get a whole lot thinner. I climbed back into my truck, the engine roaring to life with a comforting familiarity. But as I pulled out of the gas station, my mind kept drifting back to Marcus. His youthful enthusiasm for the macabre was unsettling, yet oddly captivating. I found myself intrigued, despite my better judgment. My phone buzzed, a message lighting up the screen. It was from Marcus. Forgot to share my story. Meet up next rest stop? I hesitated, my thumb hovering over the screen. This was the Evernight, a realm where caution was often the only thing standing between you and the inexplicable. But curiosity got the better of me. I tapped out a quick sure and set the phone down. Twenty minutes later, I pulled into a rest stop, the kind that promised scenic views but delivered only darkness and a couple of worn-out picnic tables. Marcus's truck was already there, parked under the dim glow of a flickering streetlight. I got out and walked over. Marcus was leaning against his truck, a steaming cup of what I assumed was green tea in his hands. Thought you'd chicken out, he said, grinning. I've faced worse than a guy who listens to podcasts, I replied, leaning against my own truck. Marcus chuckled, then his expression turned serious. So, you wanted a story, right? Something to rival those creepy pastas? I nodded, bracing myself for whatever tale he had to spin. It happened three days ago, he began, his voice tinged with a nervous energy. I was driving through the bayous, somewhere between Oklahoma and Louisiana, middle of nowhere just the way I like it. I listened, the night air thickening with tension as Marcus recounted his experience. He described pulling over to relieve himself, the unsettling silence that enveloped him, and the sudden snap of a twig that shattered the quiet. I couldn't see anything, he continued, his eyes narrowing. The truck's lights were too bright, blinding me, so I stepped further out, trying to see what made that noise. And, I prompted my own senses on high alert. Nothing, just darkness and that eerie silence. But then, as I turned back to my truck, I heard it. A soft thud, like something hitting the ground. I didn't wait to find out what it was. I bolted, jumped into my truck, and floored it. Marcus paused taking a shaky sip of his tea. As I drove away, I glanced in the rearview mirror. That's when I saw them, deer, standing on their hind legs, staring at me as I sped off. I looked at Marcus, trying to gauge his sincerity. His eyes met mine, wide and unblinking. So what do you think? He asked, a hint of vulnerability creeping into his voice. I considered my words carefully. 
I think the Evernight has a way of making our deepest fears and fantasies come to life. Sometimes it's hard to tell which is which. Marcus nodded, seemingly relieved. Well, whatever it was, it's a hell of a story, right? It is, I agreed, my mind racing with questions and doubts. But remember, Marcus, stories are like roads in the Evernight. Follow them too far and you might not like where they lead. As I climbed back into my truck, I couldn't shake the feeling that Marcus's tale was far from over. And as I drove off into the enveloping darkness, I wondered which of us was really chasing stories and which was being chased. I hit the road again, the truck's headlights cutting through the darkness like a knife. My mind was a swirl of thoughts, Marcus's story mingling with my own experiences in the Evernight. The young man had a tale all right, but something about it didn't sit well with me. Maybe it was the way he told it, or maybe it was the tale itself. Either way, it left me uneasy. As I drove, my eyes caught sight of something in the rearview mirror. Marcus's truck was following me, a distant pair of headlights in the enveloping black. I felt a twinge of apprehension. Was this part of his thrill-seeking adventure, or was there something more sinister at play? I decided to pull over at the next gas station, a rundown place that looked like it had been forgotten by time. Marcus pulled in behind me, parking his truck under a flickering streetlight. I got out, pretending to check my tires, but my eyes were on Marcus's truck. That's when I saw it. The deer antlers lodged in the grill of his truck, stained with a dark rusty color that could only be blood. My mind raced back to his story. He'd said the deer stood on their hind legs as he drove away, so how did he end up with antlers stuck in his grill? I walked over, feigning casual interest. Nice truck. Those antlers add a certain... character. Marcus looked up, his eyes meeting mine. Yeah, picked them up on one of my drives. Adds to the whole experience, don't you think? I nodded, my mind screaming that something was off. Sure does. Just then my eyes caught something else. A hand, barely visible, sticking out from a gap in the tailgate of Marcus's truck. My heart pounded in my chest as I moved closer, pretending to admire his truck. Mind if I take a closer look? I asked, my voice steady despite the adrenaline surging through me. Be my guest, Marcus replied, though I detected a note of hesitation. I walked around to the back, my eyes locked onto that small gap. And then I saw them, the eyes, staring back at me, filled with a terror that words couldn't describe. They were human eyes, and they weren't Marcus's. I stepped back, my mind racing. You've got quite a setup here, I said, forcing a smile. Marcus nodded, his eyes never leaving mine. It's perfect for what I need. I walked back to my truck, my thoughts a whirlwind of suspicion and fear. Marcus, or whatever he was, was hiding something, something dark and twisted. As I climbed into my truck, I took one last look at Marcus. He was standing there, watching me, his eyes now a dark void that seemed to swallow all light. I hit the gas, my truck roaring to life as I sped away. In my rearview mirror, I saw Marcus climb into his truck, but he didn't follow. Maybe he'd found what he was looking for, or maybe he was still searching. Either way, I knew one thing for sure. The line between reality and nightmare had just been shattered, and I was driving blind into the Evernight, where anything was possible, and nothing was as it seemed. I drove for what felt like hours, the road stretching endlessly before me. The Evernight had a way of distorting time, making minutes feel like hours and hours like seconds. My mind was a labyrinth of thoughts, each one more unsettling than the last. Who, or what, was Marcus? And what had I just narrowly escaped? I considered going to the authorities, but what would I tell them? That I'd met a man who might not be a man, in a place that defied all logic? They'd lock me up before Marcus, that was for sure. As I drove, my phone buzzed, a new message. My heart skipped a beat as I glanced at the screen. It was an anonymous email, the subject line reading, The Truth About Marcus. I pulled over, my hands trembling as I opened the email. It was a news article, dated a few weeks back. The headline sent chills down my spine. Local man, Marcus Thompson missing, feared dead. The article went on to describe Marcus, a 25-year-old who had recently taken up long-haul trucking. He was last seen at a gas station, the very one where we'd met. The police had no leads, no suspects, nothing. He had simply vanished into the Evernight. I sat there, the weight of the revelation sinking in. The Marcus I'd met was not Marcus at all, 
but something far more sinister. And the real Marcus, it seemed, had paid the price for venturing too far into the unknown. I thought about his family, who were probably still searching for him, clinging to the hope that he might come back. But I knew better. The Evernight didn't give back what it took. I deleted the email, not wanting any trace of this nightmare on my phone. But as I drove on, I couldn't shake the feeling of guilt. Had my encounter with the imposter given it the confidence to continue its charade? Had I, in some twisted way, become an accomplice to its dark deeds? The road ahead was a blur. The lines between right and wrong, real and unreal, merging into a murky gray. I thought about Marcus's enthusiasm for horror stories his desire for a life less ordinary. In the end, he had gotten his wish, though not in the way he'd hoped. As I drove through the Evernight, I realized that the realm had claimed another victim, adding another chapter to its never-ending story. But this chapter was different. It was a cautionary tale, a grim reminder of the dangers that lurked in the dark corners of the world and within ourselves. I couldn't bring Marcus back, but I could share his story as he'd wanted. It was a poor substitute for the life he'd lost, but it was all I could offer. And so, as I drove on, I made a vow to myself. I would write this story, not for the thrill or the fame, but as a warning. Because sometimes, the most terrifying stories are not those that we listen to, but those that we live. And in the Evernight, we're all just characters in a story that's still being written, each of us teetering on the edge of becoming the next cautionary tale. I was back on the road, the dashboard clock reading 3.47 a.m. The Evernight stretched out before me, an endless tapestry of darkness. My mind was still reeling from the revelations about Marcus, or the thing that had worn his face. I had narrowly escaped, but the real Marcus hadn't been so lucky. I thought about sharing this story, warning others about the dangers that lurked in the Evernight. But who would believe me? I could already hear the skepticism, the dismissive laughs, and yet the tale was too important, too horrifying to keep to myself. My phone buzzed again, snapping me out of my thoughts. Another anonymous email. My heart sank as I read the subject line. You're next. I pulled over, my hands shaking as I opened the email. It was a video file. I hit play, and my blood ran cold. It was footage of me, taken from a distance, at the very rest stop where I'd met Marcus. I watched in horror as the camera zoomed in on my truck, then on me, talking to Marcus. The video ended with a shot of my license plate. I was being watched, stalked by something that could wear human faces, something that had claimed Marcus and was now coming for me. I deleted the email, my mind racing as I considered my options. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The Evernight was everywhere, and it had set its sights on me. I started the truck and floored it, my eyes darting to the rearview mirror. No headlights, no sign of Marcus's truck. But that didn't mean I was alone. In the Evernight, you're never truly alone. As I sped down the highway, my headlights flickered, then went out. I slammed on the brakes, my heart pounding as darkness enveloped me. I fumbled for my phone, using its dim light to navigate the inky blackness. And that's when I heard it, a soft, whispering voice coming from the back of the truck. Looking for this, it said, and I turned to see my own face, smiling back at me from the darkness. But the eyes were all wrong, empty voids of blackness that seemed to swallow all light. I screamed, throwing the truck door open and stumbling out into the Evernight. I ran, my breath ragged, my legs heavy with exhaustion. But no matter how fast I ran, the whispering voice followed, always just a step behind. As I reached a fork in the road, I realized the horrifying truth. There was no escape, no way out. The Evernight had claimed me just as it had claimed Marcus and countless others before him. And as I stood there, paralyzed with fear, I felt a cold hand on my shoulder, its grip tightening as it pulled me back into the darkness. The last thing I heard was my own voice whispering in my ear, Welcome to the Evernight. And then, there was nothing, only darkness stretching on forever, a never-ending tale of horror and despair. I had become the Evernight's final tale, a cautionary story that would never be told lost in the depths of a realm where nightmares come to life and where the line between the living and the dead no longer exists. I'd always been drawn to the quiet, 
the kind of quiet you can only find miles away from the nearest town, where the only sounds are the rustling of leaves and the distant calls of animals. That's why I moved out here, to this old house surrounded by nothing but woods and open fields. A place where I could breathe, think, and live without the constant hum of civilization. The first year was exactly what I'd hoped for, tranquil and uneventful. I spent my days tending to my garden, caring for a few farm animals, and soaking in the solitude. But then, one evening as the sun dipped below the horizon, it happened. A knock. Not on my door, but from the woods behind my house. A single, resonant thud that echoed through the trees and into the very core of my being. I stood there, garden hoe in hand, staring into the dense foliage. The woods had always been a source of peace for me, but in that moment, they felt like an impenetrable wall hiding something unknown. I waited for another knock, but it never came. Instead, a strange vocalization filled the air, a whoop, a sound so distinct and out of place that it sent a shiver down my spine. I didn't sleep much that night. My mind raced with possibilities. Was it an animal, a person, or something else entirely? I had no answers, only questions and a growing sense of unease. Days turned into weeks, and the knocking returned. Always once, sometimes twice, but never more than that, and always accompanied by that eerie whoop. I tried to catch a glimpse of whatever was making the noise, even setting up trail cameras at the edge of the woods, but the photos showed nothing, just empty frames of trees and darkness. Whatever it was, it was smart enough to avoid detection. I took to calling it Whoop, a name as good as any for something I knew so little about, and despite the mystery, I found myself growing accustomed to its presence. It was like we had an unspoken agreement, a boundary neither of us would cross. I stayed out of the woods, and it stayed out of my life. Or so I thought. It wasn't long before I noticed something else. My garden and animal pens were being raided, carrots pulled from the ground, chicken feed scattered, and once, even a missing goat. I fortified the fences, double-checked the locks, but still, the raids continued. And always on the nights when the knocking occurred, I couldn't shake the feeling that Whoop was responsible, that it was sending me a message, a warning perhaps. But a warning of what? I had no idea. All I knew was that the boundary had been crossed, and the quiet life I'd sought was no longer as quiet as it seemed. As the weeks passed, the knocking became a part of my life, a haunting melody in the otherwise peaceful symphony of my rural existence. I didn't know what Whoop was, or what it wanted, but I knew it was out there, lurking in the shadows, watching. And so, I watched back, waiting for the next knock, the next whoop, the next piece of the puzzle. But as I would soon discover, some puzzles are better left unsolved. Patterns are the language of the wilderness. The way a hawk circles its prey, the tracks a deer leaves in the mud, the way the wind shifts before a storm. I'd always been good at reading those signs, but this was different. This was a pattern I couldn't ignore, a pattern that seemed to be communicating something far more complex than the simple rhythms of nature. The knocking returned as I knew it would, but this time I was ready. I'd spent the days since the last knock fortifying my property, setting up more trail cameras, even installing motion-activated lights at the edge of the woods. But Whoop was elusive, always staying just out of sight, just out of reach. That's when I noticed it, the pattern. One knock and my garden would be raided. Two knocks, and something would be missing from the animal pens. It was like clockwork, a schedule that Whoop seemed to be adhering to with almost human-like precision. So I decided to test a theory. The next time I heard a single knock, I filled a bowl with fruits and vegetables and set it on a flat rock about 20 yards into the tree line. It felt like a peace offering, a way to communicate that I understood the message, even if I didn't fully understand the messenger. The next morning, the bowl was empty, and my garden was untouched. For the first time in weeks, I felt a sense of relief, a glimmer of hope that maybe, just maybe, I could coexist with this mysterious presence. Emboldened, I continued the ritual. Two knocks meant a bowl filled with scraps of meat and fish, set out near the animal pens. And each time the offering was accepted, the raid ceased and the boundary seemed to be re-established. But as the days turned into weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was playing a dangerous game. That by acknowledging Whoop, by feeding it, I was inviting it further into my life, 
crossing a line that should never be crossed. I even tried to capture it on film. I set up more trail cameras, positioning them near the offering sites, hoping to catch a glimpse of Whoop in the act. But the photos showed nothing, just empty frames of darkness and trees. It was like Whoop knew it was being watched, and it didn't like it. So I stopped trying to capture it, stopped trying to solve the mystery. Instead, I focused on maintaining the boundary, on keeping the peace. I continued to leave offerings, continued to listen for the knocks, continued to live my life in this uneasy state of coexistence. But deep down, I knew it couldn't last. That sooner or later, the pattern would break, the boundary would be crossed, and the life I'd built in this quiet corner of the wilderness would be shattered. And as I lay in bed each night, listening to the sounds of the woods, waiting for the next knock, the next whoop, I couldn't help but wonder, what happens when the pattern breaks? What happens when Whoop decides it wants more than just a bowl of food? And what happens when the hunter becomes the hunted? Jesse was a man of the road, a truck driver who found solace in the hum of an engine and the stretch of endless highway. When he moved in, he brought with him the scent of diesel and the promise of companionship. I thought maybe, just maybe, life would get back to normal, or as normal as it could be with Whoop lurking in the woods. For a while, it seemed like I was right. The knocking stopped, the raids ceased, and the woods returned to their peaceful, silent state. Jesse was skeptical when I told him about Whoop, about the knocks and the offerings. He laughed it off, said I'd been alone out here too long, that my imagination was playing tricks on me. But then he surprised me. One evening, he came home with a small box wrapped in a bow. Inside was a necklace, a silver chain with a heart-shaped diamond that glimmered in the fading light. It was beautiful and for a moment I forgot about the knocks, the raids, the unsettling presence in the woods. Consider it a peace offering, Jesse said, smiling as he clasped it around my neck, a way to bring a little light into this place. I wanted to believe him, wanted to believe that the necklace could somehow banish the darkness that had settled over my life. But deep down, I knew better. I knew that Whoop was still out there, that the boundary was still fragile, that the peace was still uneasy, as the weeks passed, I found myself listening for the knocks, waiting for the whoop, half expecting to find another empty bowl or raided garden. But nothing happened. The woods remained silent, and I began to question my own sanity. Had I imagined it all? Had the loneliness and isolation finally gotten to me? Jesse seemed to think so. He settled into life here easily, taking on odd jobs when he wasn't on the road, filling the house with laughter and warmth. But he never ventured into the woods, never crossed that invisible boundary that I'd come to both fear and respect. I don't know what you think is out there, he'd say, but I've seen enough to know that the real monsters are human, not some mythical creature in the woods. I wanted to argue, wanted to tell him that sometimes the monsters are closer than we think, that sometimes the boundary is not between human and creature, but between the known and the unknown. But I didn't. Instead, I let the silence speak for me, let the absence of knocks, the absence of raids, lull me into a false sense of security. And so, life continued, a delicate balance of peace and tension, of known and unknown, of human and creature. Jesse and I lived our lives, each in our own way, each respecting the other's boundaries, each pretending that the woods were just woods, that the knocks were just knocks, that whoop was just a figment of my imagination. But as I would soon discover, some boundaries are meant to be crossed, some knocks are meant to be answered, and some monsters are all too real. The evening was settling in, a soft blanket of twilight that usually brought me comfort. I was on the back patio, the diamond necklace Jesse had given me, catching the last rays of the setting sun. It was a beautiful piece, and for a moment I allowed myself to get lost in its sparkle, to forget about the lurking enigma of the woods. Then it came, knock, knock, knock. Three knocks, clear as day, each one a punch to my gut. The first two were almost back to back, but the third had a pause, a hesitation that threw me off. My heart raced, my palms sweated. Three knocks? What did three mean? I looked back at the house, half expecting to see Jesse at the window, sharing my concern. But he was nowhere to be seen. I was alone, facing whatever new message Whoop was sending. I went into overdrive. I filled a bowl with fruits, vegetables, fish, even sweets, anything I could think of that might satisfy whatever craving had prompted the third knock. 
I set the bowl on the flat rock, 20 yards into the tree line, just like before. Then I waited, my eyes straining to pierce the gathering darkness, my ears tuned to the slightest sound. The night passed without incident. No more knocks, no more whoops, no more raids. I went to bed cautiously optimistic, hoping that the offering had been enough, that the boundary had been re-established, that the peace had been restored. But when I stepped outside the next morning, my heart sank. The bowl was untouched, still filled with the food I'd left out. And there, on my back patio, was something that made my blood run cold, a clump of hair, dark and knotted with a streak of pink highlighting. I picked it up, my hands trembling, and then I saw it. It wasn't just hair, it was a scalp, a human scalp. I dropped it, stumbling back into the house, my mind racing, my stomach churning. I had to find Jesse, had to tell him what I'd found, had to make sense of this new horrifying development. I found him in the living room, his face pale, his eyes distant. Jesse, you need to see this, I stammered, struggling to find the words, to convey the urgency, the danger. He looked at me, his eyes meeting mine, and for a moment I saw something there, a flicker of fear, a glimmer of recognition. I'll be right there, he said, his voice steady, but his hands trembling. I led him to the patio, my heart pounding, my mind screaming. But when we got there, the scalp was gone, vanished, as if it had never been there at all. Jesse looked at me, his eyes searching mine, his face a mask of confusion and concern. There's nothing here, he said, his voice tinged with doubt, with suspicion. But I knew what I'd seen, I knew what it meant. And as I stood there, staring into the empty woods, listening for the knocks that never came, I knew that the boundary had been shattered, that the peace had been broken, and that something human or creature, had crossed a line that could never be uncrossed. The morning air was thick with the scent of damp earth when the police cars rolled up my driveway. Their lights cut through the fog, casting eerie shadows on the ground. An officer approached me, his face stern, his eyes avoiding mine. We need to access the woods behind your property, he said. There's been a discovery, a crime scene. My heart sank. A crime scene? In my woods? the same woods where Whoop had been knocking, raiding, and leaving offerings? I nodded, granting them access, but my mind was racing. Had they found evidence of Whoop or something worse? Hours later, the officer returned, his face ashen, his eyes haunted. We found bodies, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Five of them. They were buried, but something dug them up. Eight parts of them. I felt my knees buckle. Whoop, I thought. It had to be Whoop. What else could it be? What else could dig up bodies, consume human flesh, and leave a scalp on my patio? The officer handed me a photo. Do you recognize her? He asked. I looked down and gasped. It was a young woman, her eyes bright, her hair dark brown with a streak of pink. The same pink I'd seen on the scalp. My scalp. No, I stammered, my voice shaky. I've never seen her before. The officer nodded, his eyes searching mine. We've identified all five victims, he said. They're from different parts of the country. No connection to this area. But they were all strangled, beaten. We're looking for a serial killer. A serial killer? My mind reeled. Could Jesse be involved? The thought seemed absurd, impossible. And yet there was that necklace. The one he'd given me. The one that matched the one in the photo. I had to know. I went inside, my hands trembling, my heart pounding. I searched through Jesse's things looking for any sign, any clue. And then I found it, a stash of items hidden away, each one a grim trophy. Jewelry, clothing, trinkets, and among them, another necklace, identical to the one he'd given me. The room spun. I stumbled back, my mind a whirlwind of horror and disbelief. Jesse was the killer. He'd brought these women here, killed them, buried them, and Whoop had dug them up, consumed them, left their remains on my patio, I went to the police, told them what I'd found. They searched the house, confirmed my suspicions. Jesse was their prime suspect wanted for multiple murders, but he was gone, vanished into thin air, leaving behind only questions, only darkness. As I sat there in my empty house, staring into the empty woods, I realized the horrifying truth. Whoop wasn't the monster, Jesse was. And I had been living with him, sleeping beside him all along. But as the sun set, casting long shadows on the ground, I heard it again, knock, knock, knock. 
and I knew that while one monster had been unmasked, another still lurked in the woods, waiting for its next offering, its next victim. And so, I waited too, my heart heavy, my soul shattered, knowing that the boundary between human and creature, between known and unknown, had been forever broken, and wondering which was worse, the monster you know, or the one you don't. Jesse was gone, a phantom on the run, leaving behind a trail of horror that the police were still piecing together. They believed he was connected to other unsolved murders, a serial killer who had been hiding in plain sight. The house felt hollow without him, but not empty, because I knew I wasn't alone. Whoop was still out there, somewhere in the dark recesses of the woods. I thought about leaving, about packing up and running as far away as possible, but where could I go that whoop or another Jesse couldn't find me? No, running wasn't the answer. I had to face whatever was coming even if it chilled me to my core. Days turned into a blur, each one tinged with a sense of impending doom. Then, one night it happened. A news report flashed across my TV screen. A camper had gone missing in the woods behind my house. My blood ran cold. The same stretch of woods where Whoop had been, where Jesse had buried his victims. And then, as if on cue, I heard it, knock, knock, knock. Three knocks, louder than ever, each one a hammer blow to my soul. I knew what it meant now. Whoop had tasted human flesh and it wanted more, and with Jesse gone, I was the only offering left. I sat there, paralyzed by fear, my eyes locked on the back door. I could bolt it, barricade it, but would that stop Whoop? Could anything? I thought about the police, about calling them, but what would I say? That the creature in the woods was coming for me? They'd think I was crazy, just like Jesse had. So I did the only thing I could think of. I prepared an offering. I filled a bowl with meat, the last remnants from my fridge, and set it on the back patio. Then I went back inside, locked every door, every window, and waited. Hours passed, each one an eternity. I sat in the dark, listening, praying that Whoop would take the offering and leave. And then, just as the first rays of dawn began to break, I heard it. A soft, almost inaudible whoop, followed by the sound of something retreating into the woods. I waited until the sun was fully up before I ventured outside. The bowl was empty, the offering taken. I let out a sigh of relief, my body trembling. Had I just negotiated with a monster? And if so, what did that make me? I turned to go back inside and froze. There on the patio was another clump of hair, dark and knotted, just like before. But this time there was something else. A piece of fabric, torn and bloodied, unmistakably human. My mind raced. The missing camper, the empty bowl, the torn fabric. It all added up to one horrifying conclusion. Whoop had claimed another victim, and it had left me a gruesome reminder. I looked into the woods, their depths darker than ever, and felt a shiver run down my spine. Because I knew, deep down, that the boundary had been shattered, that the peace had been broken, and that Whoop was no longer content with offerings. It wanted more. And as I stood there, staring into the abyss, I heard it again. Knock, knock, knock. Only this time it wasn't coming from the woods. It was coming from my back door. I've always found a certain kind of peace in the wilderness. A silence that's not really silent at all when you tune into the rustle of leaves, the chirping of crickets, and the distant howl of a coyote. I've been maintaining these trails for years, long enough to know every twist and turn, every creek and cliff. But there's one thing about these woods that's as unsettling as it is unspoken. You never, ever respond to voices calling your name if you can't see who's calling. Sounds like a superstition, right? Well. Sometimes superstitions are soaked in truth. It was a crisp autumn afternoon, the kind where the air smells like damp earth and decaying leaves. I was clearing some fallen branches off the trail when I heard the frantic footsteps. My hand instinctively went to the handle of my utility knife. In a job like this, you learn to be cautious. She burst through the trees like a deer escaping a predator, her eyes wide with terror and her face flushed. Help, please, you have to help me. Whoa, slow down, I said, my grip loosening on the knife. What happened? Her name was Jenny and her words tumbled out in a torrent. She and her husband had been hiking, enjoying the day just like any other couple. 
But then he started acting off, pausing every few steps, his eyes darting around as if he were searching for something or someone. What's wrong? She'd asked him. I thought I heard Brandon, he'd replied. Brandon was their son, was. He'd been hit by a car while riding his bike last year, a parent's worst nightmare, the kind of thing that leaves a hole you can't ever fill. Jenny had tried to reason with him, told him it couldn't be Brandon, but her husband was as stubborn as the old pines that lined the trail. He was convinced that he had to follow the voice, and he'd gone off the trail to do just that. As she told me this, I felt a chill that had nothing to do with the autumn air. You did right coming to me, I said, recalling the warning that had been passed down from the old timers who'd been maintaining these trails long before I took up the mantle. We need to find him, and fast. Jenny nodded, her face a mixture of relief and lingering dread. Please, let's hurry. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were already too late, that the unspoken rule had claimed another victim. But there was no choice but to try. I radioed my base to inform them we had a situation, and then Jenny and I plunged back into the forest, calling out her husband's name. As we moved deeper into the woods, I couldn't help but think about the warning, the one about not responding to voices. It's the kind of thing you hear and file away under local lore, right next to stories of Bigfoot and the Chupacabra. But standing there, in the gathering gloom with a desperate woman beside me, it felt as real as the ground beneath my boots. And so we pressed on, two souls in a forest full of whispers, hoping against hope that we'd find one soul who'd ignored the unspoken rule and lived to tell the tale. The forest has a way of swallowing sounds, of muffling cries for help, and whispers of despair. As Jenny and I ventured deeper into the woods, each shout for her husband seemed to die the moment it left our lips, absorbed by the towering pines and thick underbrush. The sun was sinking fast, casting long shadows that seemed to reach for us like skeletal fingers. Jenny was a wreck, and who could blame her? He's never done anything like this before, she said, her voice tinged with a desperation that cut through the forest's natural hush. After Brandon, after we lost him, we've been careful, you know? We've clung to each other like life preservers in a storm, I nodded, not knowing what to say. What can you say? The loss of a child is a chasm most of us can't even fathom, let alone cross. And now her husband had heard the voice of their dead son. I couldn't begin to imagine the emotional turmoil that must have been tearing through him. As we moved further, I felt the atmosphere change. It was subtle, like the first hint of winter in the air. The forest grew quieter, as if holding its breath. Even the wind seemed to hesitate its soft rustle through the leaves turning into an almost inaudible whisper. Something's not right, I said, stopping in my tracks. I reached for my radio and called in for backup. We need more eyes and ears out here. We're running out of daylight, and God knows what else we're running out of. Within an hour, the cavalry arrived. Search dogs, a couple of helicopters buzzing overhead, and volunteers from the local community. They fanned out in a coordinated grid pattern, their flashlights cutting through the growing darkness like lances of hope. But as the hours ticked by, that hope began to wane. The dogs picked up scents that led nowhere. The helicopters reported zero visibility beneath the canopy of trees. The volunteers found nothing but their own growing sense of unease. We'll have to call it off for the night, the sheriff finally said, his face lined with the same frustration and helplessness we all felt. We'll resume at first light. Jenny looked at me, her eyes brimming with tears. What happens now? I put a hand on her shoulder, wishing I had an answer that could lift the heavy shroud of despair that had settled over us. We keep looking, Jenny, as long as it takes. But as we headed back to the makeshift command center, I couldn't shake the gnawing feeling in my gut. It was as if the forest itself was warning us, telling us that some mysteries are better left unsolved, some voices better left unanswered. And yet, as I looked at Jenny, her face a canvas of unimaginable pain and fear. I knew we had no choice but to plunge back into the whispering woods, to defy the unspoken rule that had hung over this forest for generations. Because sometimes, even in the face of unspeakable odds, you have to hold on to that sliver of hope. Even when every fiber of your being is telling you to turn back, to let the forest keep its secrets, you press on. And so we would. At first light, we would press on. 
dawn broke with a reluctant light, as if the sun itself hesitated to illuminate the secrets of these woods. We resumed the search, but the atmosphere had changed. The forest seemed to watch us, its silence a heavy weight that pressed down on our spirits. I could see it in the faces of the volunteers, hear it in the terse exchanges between the sheriff and his deputies. Even the search dogs seemed uneasy, their usual eagerness replaced by a skittish caution. Then, one of the dogs began to bark, its howls echoing through the trees like a mournful cry. We followed it to a steep drop-off, a sheer cliff that plummeted into a dark ravine. My heart sank as I peered over the edge. At the bottom lay the crumpled form of Jenny's husband. The descent was treacherous, each step a calculated risk. When we finally reached him, it was clear there was no hope, no signs of life, no signs of struggle either, just a man lying there as if he'd simply stepped off the edge of the world. Jenny was inconsolable. She fell to her knees beside him, her cries a raw wound in the morning air. Why? she sobbed. Why did he follow the voice? Why didn't he listen? I had no answers for her, only the heavy burden of a truth I couldn't fully understand myself. As the sheriff coordinated the grim task of recovering the body, I stood there, staring at the place where he'd fallen. It was as if the forest had claimed him, swallowed him whole the moment he'd broken the unspoken rule. And then I heard it, a whisper, so soft it was almost drowned out by the rustling leaves and the distant murmur of the search team, my name. The voice was faint but unmistakable. It was my own voice, calling to me from the depths of the ravine, from the shadows that lay beyond the reach of the morning light. I felt a chill that cut deeper than any winter wind, a terror that gripped me with claws of ice. I knew then that the unspoken rule was more than just a cautionary tale, more than just a warning passed down through generations. It was a boundary, a line drawn by forces we couldn't comprehend let alone defy, and I realized something else as I stood there, on the edge of that steep drop-off, staring into the abyss that had claimed Jenny's husband and threatened to claim me. The forest wasn't just a place of beauty and solitude, of towering trees and hidden trails. It was a living entity, ancient and malevolent, and it was aware of us, aware of me. I stepped back from the edge, my heart pounding, my soul shaken to its core. As we made our way back to the world of men and machines, of logic and reason, I knew that I would never be the same. I knew that I would never again walk these trails without hearing that whisper, without feeling those eyes upon me. And I knew that the forest would be waiting, always waiting, for the next soul brave or foolish enough to ignore the unspoken rule, to answer the call that should never be answered, to follow the voice that leads only to darkness and death. And so it waits. And so it whispers, and so it watches, its eyes filled with a hunger as old as the hills, as eternal as the night. I've always been a man of the mountains, a seeker of solitude. The Wyoming wilderness is my cathedral, and Rex, my old German shepherd, was my loyal acolyte. We'd been through a lot together, snowstorms, close encounters with bears, and the loneliness that only a vast expanse of untouched nature can bring. Rex was more than a pet. He was my confidant, my one constant in a life that shunned the noise of civilization. That particular day had been a good one. The sun was generous, the trail forgiving, and the air smelled like freedom. I had my backpack filled with essentials, a flask of bourbon, some canned beans, and a sleeping bag. Rex trotted beside me, his tongue hanging out, his eyes alert but content. We were miles away from the nearest human soul, and that's just how I liked it. As we descended into a small clearing to set up camp, I ran into a couple of forest workers. They were gruff, bearded men, the kind who looked like they'd been born with axes in their hands. We exchanged nods, the universal language of mountain men. Then one of them, a guy named Joe with crow's feet etched deep into his sunburned face, leaned in. Hey, buddy, he said, his voice tinged with a seriousness that caught my attention. You planning on staying the night? Yeah, I replied. Why? He glanced at Rex, then back at me. Just a word of advice. Don't whistle at night. Bad things happen to folks who do. I chuckled. Old wives' tale? He didn't smile. Call it what you want. Just don't. 
I nodded, more to end the conversation than out of any real conviction. Rex and I continued to our campsite, a cozy spot near a stream. I pitched my tent, started a fire, and sat down with my flask of bourbon. The sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky with shades of orange and purple. Rex wandered off, sniffing around doing his dog things. I felt the warmth of the fire and the bourbon mix, a comforting haze settling over me. As darkness enveloped the clearing, a sudden thought pierced my mellow mood. Rex had wandered off farther than usual. I looked around, my eyes straining in the dim light. No sign of him. A knot tightened in my stomach. Rex was well trained. He always came back when called. But what if he'd gotten himself into trouble? A twisted ankle, a confrontation with a wild animal. My mind began to race with possibilities. I remembered Joe's warning. A silly superstition, I thought. What harm could a whistle do? I put two fingers to my lips and let out a sharp, piercing whistle, the kind that had always brought Rex running back to me. But this time, there was no immediate rustle of paws against leaves, no joyful bark echoing in the distance. My heart pounded in my chest. What had I done? And that's when I realized the forest around me had gone eerily silent, as if holding its breath, waiting for something or someone to break the stillness. I felt a chill run down my spine. This was no ordinary night, and I had just invited something into my world with that whistle. Something I didn't understand. I waited, each second stretching into an eternity. And then, finally, I heard it. A faint rustle in the bushes, growing louder. But it wasn't just Rex's footsteps I heard. There was something else, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Rex burst into the clearing, but he wasn't alone. Something was out there with us, lurking in the shadows, and whatever it was, it had just heard my call. Rex barreled into the clearing like a bat out of hell, his eyes wide, his fur bristling. I'd never seen him like this before. He circled around me, growling low, his gaze fixed on the dark wall of trees surrounding us. Easy, boy, I said, my voice tinged with a nervousness I didn't want to admit to. I reached for my flashlight, clicked it on, and swept the beam across the woods. Nothing. Just the usual play of light and shadow, the trees standing like silent sentinels. But Rex wasn't convinced, and frankly neither was I. I sat back down by the fire, my hand involuntarily reaching for the flask. I unscrewed the cap and took a long swig, feeling the bourbon burn its way down my throat. Rex settled next to me, but he was still on high alert, his ears perked up, his body tense. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone. It was as if the air had thickened, as if the night itself was watching us. I shook my head, trying to dispel the thought. I was letting my imagination run wild, fueled by Joe's warning and the isolation of the wilderness. I finished the last of the bourbon and decided it was time to turn in. I doused the fire, making sure to scatter the ashes. Come on, Rex, I said, patting my thigh. He followed me into the tent, still uneasy but obedient. I zipped up the entrance, settled into my sleeping bag, and closed my eyes. I don't know how long I slept, but I woke up with a start. My heart was pounding, my skin slick with sweat. Something was off. I felt it before I understood it. A prickling sensation at the back of my neck, a gut feeling that screamed at me to wake up, to be alert. I unzipped the sleeping bag and reached for my flashlight. I clicked it on, but the beam was weak, flickering. Damn it, I muttered, smacking the side of the flashlight. It brightened for a moment before dimming again. I looked around the tent. Rex was gone. Panic surged through me. Rex! I called out, my voice tinged with desperation. No response. I unzipped the tent and stepped out, my bare feet cold against the ground. I raised the flashlight, sweeping it around the clearing. Still nothing against my better judgment, against the warning that now echoed ominously in my mind, I whistled, a sharp piercing sound that cut through the silence of the night. The moment the sound left my lips, the flashlight flickered and died, plunging me into darkness. My breath caught in my throat. I heard it then, a distant crunching of leaves and branches, a sound that was decidedly not Rex. It was heavier, deliberate, and it was getting closer. I fumbled with the flashlight, smacking it hard, praying for it to come back to life. It flickered on, casting a feeble beam into the darkness, and that's when I saw it, an outline, a shape, 
something lurking just beyond the reach of the light. My blood turned to ice. Rex was still missing. My flashlight was barely working. And now, there was definitely something out there with me. And it had heard my whistle. The outline of the figure was a blur of white and shadow, like a smudge on the canvas of the night. It was tall, unnaturally so, and hunched over, as if burdened by its own existence. My flashlight flickered, threatening to die again, but in that brief moment of illumination, I saw its neck. Long, sinewy, and twisted. I stood there frozen, my mind racing but my body paralyzed. The thing, whatever it was, moved in a slow, distorted crawl, its gait a mockery of human movement. My hand tightened around the flashlight, my other hand instinctively reaching for the knife strapped to my belt. What the... I whispered, my voice barely audible, even to myself. That's when it happened. The creature's head snapped toward me, turning at an angle that defied anatomy. And then it screeched, a sound so horrifying it felt like it could tear the fabric of the night. It was a scream, but not just any scream. It was a distorted, guttural wail, like a human voice being strangled through the throat of some injured animal. I bolted back into the tent, my heart pounding like a drum in my chest. I grabbed the can of bear repellent and my knife, cursing myself for not bringing a gun on this trip. The screeching continued, now accompanied by the sound of heavy, dragging footsteps. It was coming closer. I braced myself, gripping the knife tightly, ready to fight for my life. And then, just as the shadow of the creature loomed over the fabric of my tent, I heard it, a snarl, a bark, and then another screech, this one tinged with what sounded like fear. Rex, the creature let out one final ear-piercing wail and retreated, its screech fading into the distance. I unzipped the tent cautiously, my knife still in hand, and stepped out. Rex was there, his fur matted, his muzzle covered in what looked like blood, but he was unharmed, his eyes still filled with that mix of loyalty and love that only a dog can give. Good boy, I said, my voice trembling as I hugged him. I checked him over, making sure he was truly okay. He was nervous, his body still tense, but he was unscathed. I looked around the clearing, my flashlight now mysteriously working perfectly. There was no sign of the creature, but the air felt lighter, as if the forest itself had exhaled in relief. I packed up my gear, doused the remains of the fire, and with Rex by my side, started the long trek back to civilization. As we walked, the first rays of dawn breaking through the canopy of trees, I couldn't shake off the feeling that we had escaped something ancient, something malevolent. I remembered Joe's warning, and a shiver ran down my spine. Some old wives' tales are rooted in truths too horrifying to comprehend, and some warnings are better heeded. I don't whistle in the woods anymore, and if you ever find yourself lost in the wilderness, remember this. Not everything that answers to a call is something you want to meet. I love the wilderness, the smell of pine needles, the crunch of leaves under my boots, the way the forest seems to breathe around you. It's like a drug to me. But don't get me wrong, I'm no fool. I know that for all its beauty, the forest can be a merciless place. One wrong step, one missed sign, and you could find yourself in a world of trouble. That's why when I heard about the legend of the woman with the silver eyeglasses, I was more intrigued than skeptical. It was Jim from accounting who told me about her. We were both clocking some overtime, and he was looking for an excuse to procrastinate. You ever hike up by Whispering Pines? He asked, leaning back in his chair. Sure, a few times, I said, not looking up from my screen. Will you ever run into a woman? Probably in her 60s, wearing silver eyeglasses? I paused, finally giving him my attention. Can't say that I have. Why? Jim leaned in, dropping his voice as if he were about to share state secrets. Well, they say she's a spirit. Got lost out there years ago and never made it back. But here's the kicker. If you help her find her way, you'll have good luck for the next seven years. I chuckled. You believe that? He shrugged. I don't know but a buddy of mine swears he met her. Said they walked together for hours, talking about life and all. When they finally found the trail, he turned around to thank her, and she was gone. Just like that. I leaned back, intrigued despite myself. And did his luck turn? Guy won a small lottery the next week, so you tell me. I shook my head, smiling. 
Well, if I ever meet her, I'll be sure to point her in the right direction. But as I drove up to Whispering Pines the following weekend, Jim's story stuck with me. The forest was its usual captivating self, a labyrinth of towering trees and hidden trails. But today, it felt like the woods were holding their breath, waiting for something, or someone, to break the silence. I hiked for hours, losing myself in the natural rhythm of the forest. And then, as the sun dipped below the horizon, I saw her. A woman in her sixties, silver eyeglasses perched on her nose, standing off the trail and looking utterly lost. Excuse me, she said, her voice tinged with relief. Could you help me find my way back to the trail? I looked into her eyes and saw a kind of quiet desperation, a yearning to be found. And in that moment, I made my choice. Of course, I said, offering her a smile. Let's find that trail. As we walked together, I couldn't help but feel like I'd stepped into a story, one that was as old as the hills around us. And as we finally found the trail, I turned to thank her, only to find that she had vanished, leaving nothing but the whispering pines to keep me company. I stood there for a long moment, pondering the enigma that was the woman with the silver eyeglasses. Then with a newfound sense of purpose, I continued down the trail, wondering what other mysteries these woods held and whether I was ready to face them. Seven years of good luck or not, one thing was clear. In these woods, you're never truly alone. And maybe, just maybe, that's a good thing. I've always said that the woods have a language of their own. The rustle of leaves, the chatter of birds, the distant murmur of a stream. It's like a symphony that only those who listen can hear. But sometimes, just sometimes, the woods go quiet, dead quiet. And let me tell you, that's when you need to be on your toes. I was about a mile deep into the forest, the day after my encounter with the woman in silver eyeglasses. The sun was high, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. Everything seemed normal, just another day in paradise. But then, as if someone had hit the mute button on the world, everything went silent. I stopped dead in my tracks. No bird song, no wind, not even the distant sound of water. It was like stepping into a vacuum. I've been in some tight spots before, cornered by a mountain lion lost in a snowstorm. But this was different. This was eerie. You see, there's an unwritten rule among those who know these woods. If the forest goes silent, you don't stick around to find out why. You move and you make damn sure you make some noise while you're at it. I picked up my pace, my boots crunching loudly against the dry leaves. I hummed a tune, any tune, just to break the silence. My skin prickled with the sensation of being watched, but I didn't dare look back. I kept moving, my eyes scanning the path ahead, my ears straining for any sign of life. After what felt like an eternity, I heard it. The distant sound of a stream, the soft rustle of leaves in the wind. The forest was speaking again, and its voice was like music to my ears. I slowed down, my heartbeat gradually returning to normal. But as I walked on, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd dodged a bullet. You might call it superstition, folklore, or even an old wives' tale, but I know what I felt. It was a warning, as clear as day. Respect the woods, or pay the price. And it's a lesson I took to heart. As I made my way back to the trailhead, I couldn't help but think about the woman with the silver eyeglasses. Had she experienced the silence too? Is that what led her astray all those years ago? I couldn't say for sure, but one thing was clear. Her spirit was a guardian, a beacon of light in a world that could turn dark in an instant. So if you ever find yourself in whispering pines and the woods go quiet, don't ignore it. Move, make some noise, and whatever you do, don't look back. Because in these woods, silence isn't just golden, it's a warning, and it's one you'd do well to heed. We set up camp as the sun dipped below the horizon painting the sky with hues of orange and purple. The fire crackled, its warm glow casting dancing shadows on the faces of my friends. We were deep into whispering pines, far enough from civilization to feel truly alone, or so we thought. Just as I was about to dig into my dinner, I saw him, an old man with a long beard and a walking stick, materializing from the darkness like a ghost. He didn't say a word as he approached, his eyes locked onto the fire as if hypnotized. My gut told me something was off. I was about to ask if anyone knew him when my buddy Mark put his hand over his mouth and shook his head. He gave me a look, 
a serious, no-nonsense look that told me all I needed to know. I kept my mouth shut. The old man took a seat on an empty log, his eyes still fixed on the fire. Then, as if he'd rehearsed it a thousand times, he began to tell a story. It was a tale of love and loss, of a man who ventured into these very woods and never returned. His voice was hypnotic, each word carefully chosen, each sentence a thread in a larger tapestry. As he spoke, the forest seemed to listen. The wind died down, the fire flickered, and for a brief moment time stood still. I glanced at Mark, who was hanging onto every word, his eyes wide with a mixture of awe and fear. Finally, the old man finished his story. He looked up, his eyes meeting mine, and for a split second I saw something, a flicker of sadness, a glimmer of relief. Then without a word, he stood up and walked back into the darkness, his figure blending into the night until he was nothing but a shadow. We sat in silence for a long moment, each of us processing what had just happened. Finally, Mark spoke up. You know the legend, right? About the old man? I nodded. Yeah, I've heard it. Never thought I'd live it. Mark chuckled. Well, we just did. And we're all still here, aren't we? I looked around at my friends, their faces illuminated by the dying embers of the fire. Yeah, I said, we are. As we packed up the next morning, I couldn't help but think about the spirits of whispering pines, the woman with the silver eyeglasses, the old man with his haunting tail. They were guardians of a sort, keepers of the forest's many secrets. And as I made my way back to civilization, I realized something. In these woods, you're never truly alone. There are eyes that watch you, voices that whisper in the wind, stories that beg to be told. So if you ever find yourself in whispering pines, remember this. Respect the forest, heed its warnings, and listen to its stories. Because in this world of mystery and magic, you're just a visitor, and it's always wise to respect your hosts.